Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Destination Dead End, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If your life's going into a tailspin and the odds are against you, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, I cannot pay big fee for your services. That would mean I would have to go to my son for the money. That I would never do. But no matter what my son has done, he is still my own flesh and blood and I must help him. He is in trouble. I know it. I feel it. Because I have... If during the day, would you come and talk to me tonight? Maybe I can still save him. And it's signed Sophie Pevelman, 93 River Street. Pevelman? Pevelman? Do you know him, George? Yeah. Yeah, he's that glamorized private eye who's been trading information with the biggest racketeers in town. Talking his little head off or keeping quiet for a price. Oh, golly. George, I don't think we belong in this picture with Dickie Boy. I wasn't thinking of him, Brooksy. Well, then think of yourself. Logic tells me you're right, Angel. But shouldn't somebody be thinking of a mother who can sense that her son is playing with dynamite? I can tell you everything later, Mr. Valentine. But right now you must go to Richard. Hey, wait now. I know something is going to happen to him tonight. Look, uh, have a heart, Mrs. Pevelman. I haven't even had a chance to think about it. Oh, I was praying for you to get here. It was like a knife turning around in my heart to hear my son on the phone. Well, try to calm down. He Just me, what did he say? He told me he was having dinner at the Richelieu restaurant. Well, the worst that could happen to him there would be drowning in a finger bowl. He said he ordered everything the best and had to talk to me this last time. That wasn't all he said. No. One more thing that makes me sure he is in terrible danger, Miss Brooks. What's that? When Richard was a little boy, sometimes he would get into bad trouble and run away. It is not easy for young people to be good in this neighborhood. Go on, go on. When the trouble was real bad, he would say, Goodbye, Mom. See you day after tomorrow. Then I never knew when he would come back. And is that what he said tonight? Yes. Don't you see? He was trying to tell me he did not know when I would see him again. Just like when he was a boy. All right, Mrs. Pebbleman, you stay put. If it'll make you feel any better, we'll get over to the Richelieu and see what's bothering your son. Knowing the spot you're on doesn't seem to interfere with your appetite, Pebbleman. <laughs> And the condemned man ate a hearty meal. Well, if you know that Downey's thugs are waiting outside to shoot you down, why don't you call the police? Because it would be tomorrow night, and the night after that, 
And even I can't afford fabulous feasts like this every night. Your mother isn't going to take this as nonchalantly as you are. She'll get over it. Hey, look. Yeah? How'd you ever get in a jam like this? <laughs> you just don't buy Charvet ties, suits from Bond Street, and peel shoes just being another private dick who turns in a report and forgets it. All right, so you don't. But the boy from River Street in the slums, he wanted these things. In my job, I picked up a lot of useful information that nobody else could get. I traded it in like a broker. What information about Matt Downey's operations have you been selling? And to whom? Scalati. And Matt has just decided to put a stop to it. It's as simple as that. Yeah? Pevelman of River Street. Connoisseur, Epicurean par excellence. A private eye with a PhD, his mother slave to get him. <laughs> it's been a long road just to wind up at a dead end. Hey, look, stop being dramatic, will you? I gotta dream up a way of getting you out of here alive. For your mother's sake. Yeah. Mm. Hello, Mom. This is your boy, Richard. The inauguration is over, and I'm calling you from the White House. Very glib, very glib. Look, Valentine, before you knock yourself out on my behalf, I ought to tell you. Over there, that's Downey, my nemesis himself. The punk with him is a trigger-happy character named Jinx. They're not going to knock you off in here. Oh, nothing as crude as that. I get it out on a public thoroughfare by some hired gunsels while they sit the alibi out where everybody can see them. I'll be back in a few minutes. You going to pass a miracle? Maybe. See you in a while. Find about McQuick. Hey, please, this is the chef at the Richelieu restaurant on Carlton. Fire in the kitchen, everything. She is burning down. Hurry, right there, way. Quick, quick. Oh, now if my phony French accent didn't get in the way, something ought to happen. Hey, Johnny. Those your hoods draped all over the street outside? What? Who asked you over? Me. Wanted me to get rid of them, Matt? Take that toothpick out of your mouth, Jinx. All right, friends, you're dealing. Go ahead. You heard the question. I don't know what you're peddling, but I don't want any. Don't play innocent, Downey. You're not dressed for it. Be that comic arms trade. Disappear. And give my love to Pebbleman. Hey, there must be a fire out there. Yeah, is... Hey, now, take it easy, everybody. There's just a small fire back in the kitchen. What are you trying to pull, funny boy? I'll let you know when you wake up, dude. Ah! And you're never going to... Over here, George. Yeah. Hang on, Brooksy. Come on, Pebbleman. We're getting out of here. Valentine, what's going to be next with you, huh? From day to day, the suspense kills me. Now you're turning in phony fire alarms. Look, Lieutenant, how about Pevelman? You say you want me to keep him stashed away, huh? Well, what do I charge him with, pal? And how do I keep somebody from bailing him out? Pevelman will be happy to be charged with anything just to keep down the office to you. Well, you could have found him jaywalking or talking sassy to an officer or uh, putting mustaches on paintings in the museum. Oh, don't be so helpful, Miss Brooks. And to keep him from being bailed out by certain interested parties, you can shut him around from one precinct to another. Just don't let him get slammed out. Why should I protect him? He never cooperates with us. He won't tell us a thing. If Downey and his hoodlums are gunning for him, we ought to know why. Riley, you'd like to get something on Downey, wouldn't you? <laughs> what do you think? All right, then. It's a bargain. Before the night's over, I expect I'll be seeing a lot of Mr. Downey. Look, Valentine, let's stop the potsy. 
We can make a deal. Okay, name it, Tony. I'll even listen. Forget you're working for Pebbleman, and I'll forget I owe you something for that fancy shuffle at the wrist flu. I ain't forgetting it. Close your head, Jinx. Yeah. I'll make it interesting. A wallet full of shin plasters with big numbers on them. I got an old lady with a strong sense of justice paying me off. It wouldn't be ethical to shack up with you. Why do you want to bother with Pebbleman? You know he's a rat. Now, where is he? In Durance Vile. You gonna let him talk to you that way, Matt? Oh, jail to you, Jinx. Jail, your old alma mater. Okay, Valentine. We'll find a way to bail that double-crosser out. It's gonna take you some time. I made a little game out of it. It's called Pebbleman, Pebbleman. Who's got Pebbleman? I've got time. You better have plenty. Our friend can plead guilty to a charge that'll keep him in the can until I can find out what'll put you where he is. Okay. Now let's stop being cute. Look, get Pebbleman out in the open. That's okay for sound, but you're repeating yourself. You got no choice, Valentine. You see, I got the old lady where nobody can get to her. What's that? Yeah. It's either the son or the mother. Now make up your mind. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word of advice from a fellow motorist. One of the worst enemies anyone's car can have is interior engine corrosion. And probably no one is more aware of this fact than a man who looks after a railroad's diesel engines. The man I have in mind is Mr. George L. Higgs, diesel locomotive supervisor for the Spokane, Portland, Seattle Railroad. Having had excellent results with RPM Delo oil in locomotives for years... It was natural for Mr. Higgs to use compounded RPM motor oil in his automobile and in his pleasure boat. Among other advantages of RPM motor oil, Mr. Higgs points out, quote, it's one oil that prevents corrosion and increases bearing life, unquote. Well, you don't have to run a railroad to find out that RPM motor oil gives your car protection you trust. All you have to do is get a crankcase drain and a refill with RPM. For proof of how this premium motor oil keeps your engine clean... Just watch how dirt drains out with the oil after a service period. All the time, RPM is lubricating your engine. It's keeping internal contaminants dispersed in the oil, where they'll drain out when the oil is changed. So for longer car life, get RPM motor oil tomorrow at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations, where they say and mean, we take better care of your car. strong-willed but humble woman tells you she fears her son is in trouble and brother she isn't wrong a private detective who thinks ethics is just another word in the dictionary has been peddling combustible information to two rival racketeers and one of them matt downey is about to give him a permanent wave if your glandular makeup is anything like george valentine's you play along And Downey comes up with this fine-fingered gimmick. Yeah, it's either the son or the mother, Valentine. Now make up your mind. I'll play ball. How can I be sure I can trust you? You can't. You'll just have to coast on the deal. You like to make things tough, don't you? You know how much I trust you, Downey? As far as I can throw that baby Grant with both hands tied behind my back. Jinx. Yeah, Matt? Call Frankie out of the lake. Tell him to put Mrs. Pebbleman on the phone. You know what'll happen if you cross me. Oh, I'll be careful, all right. I'm not one of those morons who thinks it's a trend to be brave. No, you're being Frankie, smart. This is Jinx. I'd want you to I'll even let you go out door. and pick her up yourself. She'll be in a car with Frankie right near my place. Hold it a minute. There she is. Go ahead, Valentine. You all right, Mrs. Pebbleman? Mr. Valentine. Uh-huh. Where is Richard? How is he? He's safe. Now, listen... I'm coming right out there to get you. You? Coming here? That's right. I... I will be waiting, Mr. Valentine. See you day after tomorrow. Day after... Yeah, right away. Now, don't worry about a thing. Goodbye. All right, Valentine. I'm taking your word that you'll contact your connections and let Pebbleman be sprung. Let's put it this way. My word is as good as yours. (laughs) Take Route 22. About a mile past that big drive-in theater. Frank, you'll be waiting at the bottom of the hill. 
Blow your horn twice so he'll know it's you. Yeah, just like in the movies. Be seen. Come on, Matt, what's the offbeat? Very simple. Valentine isn't coming back. You saw how troublesome he can be. But I thought you were... We're holding on to Mrs. Pebbleman. As long as I have her, I can smoke Sonny Boy out any time. This is a spot, Brooksy. Did you manage Pebbleman's car all right? Oh, yeah. But golly, George, I could hardly follow you in this fog. Good girl. You got everything straight? Yeah, I think so. Okay, now here we go. Here's the signal. Yeah. Hey, look, that fog light's just went on down there. Yeah, and that light over there. Downey's house. Now, give me five minutes to cut across and get there. Then start up Pebbleman's car. Let it roll down the hill. The closer to those fog lights she piles up, the better. Okay, George. I'll be waiting here in our car with the motor running. Good luck, honey. What's going on out All right, Jinx. Silent. Hands time. behind your back. I don't want to use this gun. There's enough noise out here. Oh, Mr. Valentine, they were waiting there for you, all those men. They were going to kill you. Yeah, I know. Come on, get your things, Mrs. Pebbleman. we got to get moving. I tried to warn you on the phone. You did. I told Matt not to get fancy. Too bad he didn't listen, Jinx. Because i got to put you out of circulation. <laughs> all right, come on, Mrs. Pebbleman. You're going to sit this out in Brooksy's apartment while I talk it over with Lieutenant Riley. What do you mean? Pebbleman is out. You heard me. He wanted out. So he put up his own bed. But wait a minute. I don't get it, Lieutenant. The gears don't mesh. He knows what town he has scheduled for him. Well, maybe he's tired of breathing. Anyway, all I had against him was hitching a ride on a fire truck. Holy. Something must have conked out. Why did he change his mind? Look, pal. I did a little checking. I know Pebbleman's racket, see? He's been acting as an information pipeline for every mob in this town. Now, why didn't you tell me that in the first place? Well, what would you use for proof? Have you got any, even now? And right at this moment, he's a walking target. Because he sold out Downey so Scarlatti can move into the River Flats District first with the numbers right. I don't want to repeat myself, Riley, but where's the proof? Well, it... well, give me time. But I'll tell you this much. If we get our hands on Pebbleman again, I'll find a rat that'll really stick He's no better than Downey Scarlatti or any of those other muck Okay, heels. okay. I won't argue about that. And Valentine, I uh, seem to remember you promised me something to nail Downey with. I got that, Lieutenant. But I can't deliver it until morning. Morning? <laughs> well, that's only a couple of hours away. Yeah, you're right. But remember what SC almost did to Notre Dame in a couple of hours. <laughs> You don't expect to find Pebbleman at his house, do you? Frankly, no, Angel. Yeah? Hello? Hello? Say, who is this? He's there, all right. But that would be the first place Downey would look for him. Brooks, see, I don't know what Pebbleman is up to. But if he wants to play it this way, I'll help grease the skids for him. Listen, Valentine, I'm tired. I don't feel like answering questions. Oh, what do you think we've been doing all night? Looking at stereopticon slides? Just what made you suddenly decide it was safe to walk the streets again, Mr. Pepperman? Let's say I just drew a couple of high cards since I saw you two last. Now, if you'll excuse me, You know, please. for one optimistic moment, I thought you heard about what happened to your mother and were willing to risk your neck to help her. Yeah, I heard about that over my usual grapevine. I was also told she wouldn't need my help with a smart operator like you working for her. Well, I don't see how all this makes you any better off. Oh, but it does, Miss Brooks. So you can just stop worrying about... Well, aren't you going to answer that? 
I suppose I'll have to. Richard. Oh, you're all right. Mrs. Pebbleman. You shouldn't have come here. I told you not to take one step out of my apartment, Mrs. Pebbleman. It's not safe. I know, my dear, but that's... Now, look, look. Let's pick this meeting up some other time. I got a lot of things to do. Valentine, take care of my mother. Hey, wait a minute. Is that all you got to say, Buster? You know what she's had to go through because of you? Doesn't that mean anything to you? All right, all right. I'm grateful to you, Valentine. I'll see that you get paid for your trouble. Well, why don't you try being grateful to your mother? Will you stop sermonizing? Go on, get out. I've got it all figured now how I can deal with Donnie, but I've got to do it by myself. Now, leave me alone, Ollie. Richard. Yeah, ma. Of course, I'm glad that nothing has happened to you. But there's something else I must say. Now, look, don't you start preaching Your to Your father and I, we worked hard. Not so you could grow up and make a lot of money, but so that you would grow up and be a good man. Tonight I found out how you help people who break the law. Oh, please, Mom. You look. find out things that make it easy for them. I am glad I worked every day this last year instead of taking one penny from you. Your money is dirty, Richard. Dirty. Oh, this is great, great. I Wait told a minute, Buster. You. I know who you're expecting. Now listen. Open the door. Let him come in. But be natural. Now, wait a minute. Look, I'll be against the wall and back of the door. Leave the rest to me. And I have no compulsion about using this gun after what he did to your mother. Okay. Claire, you stay right where you are with Mrs. Pebbleman. Oh. Come in, Tommy. Thanks. I didn't think you'd be calling me. Put that gun away. What? Do you want to have it to you? you? I hope I didn't break your wrist. Pick his gun up. So you pulled another fast one, eh, Pebbleman? Now, look, this was Valentine's idea. I had a proposition to make, but I, I couldn't talk back to him. He had a gun. So I see. Go on, Downey. Go on, sit down. Now, Brooksy, get on the phone and call Riley. Tell him it's nearly morning. He'll know what I mean. Yes, George. How do you do, Mrs. Pebbleman? Please don't talk to me. George, there's something wrong. I don't get any connection at all. May as well give up, lady. We took care of that phone. What kind of a sucker do you think I am? Do you think I came over here alone? Oh, I suppose you got Jinx and his playmates cluttering out the doorway outside. You're so right. Well, funny boy, what's the next move? You can't call the police and you can't leave the house. And after a while, Jinx is going to get worried about me. Look, let, let's talk about my deal. Won't be any trouble at all to pin a kidnapping charge on you, Donnie. But on the other hand, I can see that my mother doesn't talk. Yeah? All you have to do is forget that you don't like me. Well... Fair enough. Why not? I might even make it worth your while to come over to me from Scarlatti. You can start telling me a few things. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure, Donnie. Then everything will be all right again, see? And nobody's going to get hurt. Oh, you're one sweet boy, Buster. Richard, do not even talk to that man. Tonight I heard what he does. He takes nickels and dimes from poor people to play numbers. He wants to do that in our neighborhood where you were born to people you know. Richard! Look, Mom. I always had to look after myself. I can't stop now. I'd better go outside and talk to the boys, Tony. Tell them we made a deal. Stay where you are, Buster. What are you going to do? Shoot me down in front of my mother? <laughs> oh, here, Valentine. Take this envelope, huh? Give it to a lady. She'll need it. Why don't you give it to her yourself? After the night, she won't have anything to do with me or mine. You know that. Be right back. Mr. Valentine, Richard has been gone so long. Yeah, too long. Maybe when the boys saw him, they didn't understand. Didn't give him a chance to explain. That'd be too bad. But we didn't hear anything. I'm going out there. George! Brooksy, I hate to ask you this, but do you think you can keep this gun on Johnny? Why? Oh, yeah, I think so. Good girl. And don't mind being a little nervous. That'll remind him he's only half a breath from kingdom come. Hey, come on, let me 
help here. Get back in the door where you get blood. Hey, your arm, you're bleeding. Yeah, yeah. But look at that monkey sprawl out in the gutter. Okay. Now we'll just stay where we are. After those shots, the cops will be here any minute. No, they won't be in time. Jinx another guy are in that hall across the street. I'm going after him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't be crazy. Then I'm going upstairs and get down. Come on. Go with that fool. Pebble, is, is it bad? It took all he had to give. What? What about them? You don't hear any more shots, do you? Swell. I had to get mom and your people off the spot. Now look, take it easy. Don't try to talk. We'll get you to a hospital soon now. I made up for a lot, didn't I? That envelope. Take care of it. Yeah, yeah, sure, fella. I'll see that you take some money. Wasn't money. Gonna cook Downey. That envelope. Lots of names. Places. Make a good story for the papers. I'm just gonna like reading. I, I wasn't a complete washout, was I? No, fella. Now with the kind of comeback you made. Well, good morning, Brooksy. What's this? Oh, just a heart-shaped box. You know what day it is, don't you? <laughs> I'll be real sharp and say it's Monday. Oh. Well, how do you like... Say, what are these things? Well, they're socks, darling. Argyles. I knitted them myself. Oh, you did? Well, although they don't seem to match, they really do once you get them on. Mmm, yeah. Well, I thought you'd like something bright for a change. Maybe they're a little too bright, huh? Oh, no, no, Angel. Maybe you did use 20 shades of red, but uh, at least you stuck to one color. Well... Oh, Brooksy, I was only kidding. With my moniker, how could I forget this was Valentine's Day? Yes, And of all people, I should respond with some wild and passionate gesture, and I'm going to do that. Do what? Well, no matter what anybody says, I'm going to wear these things. Tonight, I'd like to tell you about a friend of mine who has a brand new car. Can't blame him for wanting to demonstrate it to me. And I can't blame him either for getting embarrassed when his new car wouldn't take an ordinary hill in high gear. Look, pal, I said, what you better put in this here car is command performance. Command performance, he said. Oh, you mean Chevron Supreme gasoline. Well, that's exactly what I meant, so I told him. For Chevron Supreme puts command performance in any car, new or old. That's because special blending agents in Chevron Supreme command fast start, speedy pickup. And all the power your car needs to make it great on hills. What's more, no matter where you drive in the West, you can be sure of command performance with this premium quality gasoline. For it's climate tailored to each different altitude and temperature zone. So in mountains, at sea level, or in the desert, rely on Chevron Supreme to put command performance in your car. Ask for it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean... We take better care of your car. Next week at the same time, you'll find George Valentine not in his office, but far away on a tiny Hawaiian island, and Brooksy will be saying... George! George, the boat's gone. Somebody's taken it. Yeah, so I noticed. Look. Well, how will we get off this island? What do we do? Right now, I think we need a little protection. Well, how do you like that? What's the matter, George? Something else is going, Brooksy, out of my suitcase. Your gun? Yeah. Oh, fine. So this weird little drama calls for us being permanent guests in this tropical paradise. Unless we're very smart, Brooksy. Or very lucky.
Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Tony Barrett as Pebbleman, Jeanette Nolan as Mrs. Pebbleman, Joe Forte as Downey, and Jim Nusser as Jinx. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Journey into Hate, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're in a jam, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, some dreadful shadow has come over my sister's life. From thousands of miles away, she cries for help. If you knew me, you'd understand how little help I can be alone. I'm turning to you because I can't think of anyone else. The trip will take a great deal of your time. Great deal of your time and may even prove fruitless. But I can assure you I'll make it worth your while. And it's signed, uh, Janice Gibson. I wonder what kind of letters we'd get, Angel, if our ad didn't say write full details. Well, I'd hate to think probably communiques in Morse code. Yeah. But Janice here doesn't sound like she's in a mental state for details. Here, yeah, let me see that letter. Here. Maybe I can get something out of her over the phone. Thousands of miles away. I wonder in what direction. Do I wear an Eskimo parka or just a thin coat of suntan lotion? <laughs> Hello, uh, Janice Gibson, please. Miss Gibson, this is George Valentine. Well, say now, wait a minute. Don't get so excited. I... Uh-huh. Leave on the Eudora. Now, have a heart. I have a business here. I, I can't just throw things in a knapsack and be off to Honolulu. Honolulu? George, I know where we can get a very big knapsack. Hold on, will you, Brooks? Uh, Miss Gibson, I'm afraid it's out of the question. You see, I... Yeah, well, all right, now... Well, okay, there's no need to cry. Yes, yes, I believe everything you say about your sister, but... All right, you win, Miss Gibson. I'll be there. Darling, don't you think you ought to warn the lady? Oh, yeah. One last thing, Miss Gibson. Better reserve two cabins. My assistant will be along. No, I won't disappoint you. Yes, I got it, Pier 17. Goodbye. Hey, Brooksy, where are you going? Well, don't be masculine, darling. If we're going to l- be leaving in a few days, I've got to get some shopping done. Oh, no, I'm afraid this is really going to be a knapsack deal. Huh? Yeah. The Eudora leaves at 11 o'clock tonight. <laughs> oh, Stuart. Yes, sir. Which way is stateroom 209? Straight down that corridor, sir. It's going to take an ocean voyage to rest up after this mad oh, rush. Just one minute, sir. Huh? Yeah? I'm the ship's doctor, sir. I just heard you ask about 209. Friends of Miss Gibson's? Well, yeah, that's right. Why? Is anything wrong? Well, thank heavens she has friends aboard. Uh, here, th- this way. Miss Gibson isn't very well. Well, I know. She sounded a little hysterical on the phone today, but Emotional I... strain may have something to do with it, but... Uh... 
I suppose you know she has heart trouble. No, we didn't. I gave her something to quiet her down. Uh, when I came back later, she was in there sobbing. She wouldn't open the door. I had to go and get the key. Oh, that's dreadful. <laughs> oh, now, Miss Gibson, try to pull yourself together. Your friends are here to see you. Friends? Oh, Mr. Valentine. Sure. We made a deal, didn't we? Oh, it was getting late. I was so frightened. I thought you'd changed your mind. Well, we're here now, and there's nothing to worry about. I'm Miss Brooke. Oh, I'll be all right now, Doctor. I'm sure you will. I'll arrange with a doctor in Honolulu to keep track of you and see that you're sure to get digitalis whenever you need it. Thank you. And mind you, young lady, I don't want any more emotional shenanigans from you. I've made arrangements for both of you, Mr. Valentine. You just have to see the person. Well, never mind that now. You feel up to talking? Oh, I must explain. Okay. Suppose we begin with your sister. Uh, Yes, uh... Eileen's cablegram, it's somewhere here. Yes, in my purse. Oh, don't get up. It's right here on the table. Eileen is my twin sister. We haven't seen each other in four years. I see. She went on a holiday to Hawaii and married an artist named Marcel Millet. They bought a tiny island not far from Honolulu, and they've lived there ever since. I think this is the cable. Oh, well, let's see, Brooks. Uh, this must be our secret, Janice, because I'm not sure this horrible thing is happening to me. And if it is, I couldn't bear anyone else knowing it. Please get here quickly. You're my only salvation. Love, Eileen. I haven't told anyone else but you, and I had to do that. If I'm going to help her... Yes, we understand. Well, I'm not going to pretend I understand this message. Now, suppose we skip on to your sister's husband. Well, I've never even seen a picture of Marcel. I've often wondered why she never sent me one, but... As long as Eileen sounded happy in her letters, that was all that mattered. And then this, this cable is so strange, and it's not... It's not like Eileen. She was always the strong one, never hysterical. Well, now, Janice, I think maybe you ought to rest. People always wondered about that difference in us, since we are identical twins. Oh, Mr. Valentine... Okay, I... okay. We'll have days to talk about all this. Good night, Janice. Why Eileen isn't here, Mr. Valentine. I cabled her that I'd arrive on the Eudora. Eileen's usually so punctual. How it would take a magician to spot us in this crowd. Come on, let's get down to the end of the dock. Here, hold on to me, Janice. Johnny! Johnny! Oh, of course. There you are. What? I beg your pardon. Well, you I... might at least kiss me. Please, don't... Hey, now, wait a minute, Buster. Well, you needn't look so shocked, Jenny. I know I'm not the handsome specimen you probably expected, but you might try to bring yourself to... Kiss your brother-in-law. Marcel? What's that? But don't be so taken aback, my dear. <laughs> After a while, people get used to uh, ugliness. Especially when they realize that very often it has uh, compensating qualities. Huh? Oh, I didn't mean... I know what you meant, but it doesn't matter. I must say it was the easiest thing for me to spot you. <laughs> you look exactly like Eileen. It's uncanny. Oh, come along. I'll have someone take care of your baggage. Huh? I... Hope you don't mind, Marcel, but I brought two friends along. You, uh... Oh, oh these people, uh, your friends. Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks, I want you to meet Marcel Millet, Eileen's husband. Hello, how, how do you do? do? I understand you and your wife have a whole island to yourselves. Hope there's room enough to fit us on. Well, we weren't expecting visitors, but <laughs> we'll make out somehow. Besides, as an artist, I'm grateful to have beauty around me. Welcome to Hawaii, Miss Brooks. Why, thank you. Oh, wait, there's a Filipino chap over there who takes pictures of tourists. I'm sure Eileen would love to have one of you and me, Janice, huh? A memento of this happy occasion. Oh, Juan! Over here, quickly! Where is Eileen? How is she? Oh, she's waiting for you on the island. Wants everything to be just right for Very a sister. Very nice picture, yes, sir. Uh, how many, please, Mr. Millet? Oh, uh, half a dozen. Juan, just you and I, my dear, huh? Excuse us, Valentine, Miss Brooks. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Very good. All right, now, you smile nice for one. He make beautiful picture. And with my arm around a beautiful lady, that makes us even, Juan. All right, you hold still now. There, oh, that's fine. Very nice, I, there. Eh? Couldn't we hurry, Marcel? Oh, immediately. Well done, very soon. We 
you no wait for pictures? No, Juan. My wife and I will be in from the island in a couple of days uh, to show these people the sights. All right, everybody. My car is just over there by the warehouse. Uh, thank you, Mr. Millet. You must be a happy man today. Please, you've got to tell me. I can't wait any longer. What's wrong with Eileen? In time, Janice. Then you can see for yourself. Oh, now, wait a minute. Why put it off, Marcel? Is it something you can't talk about? Uh, no, but Janice I... Janice has a right to know she's been so worried. Apparently, you do know your wife, Cable, or you wouldn't be here. Yes. I ought to know about the cable. I sent it. You what? had no right to do that. You made me think all kinds of things. I had to find some way to bring you here. Well, couldn't you have used a few more words in your cable to be more specific? You didn't have to indulge your flair for the melodramatic and scare Janice half to death. Unfortunately, what I said is the truth. For heaven's sake, what's wrong with her? Well, at the risk of being uh, melodramatic, my wife imagines things, fanciful, uh, grotesque things. Oh, no. Yeah, she thinks everyone is plotting against her, just, just waiting to kill her. Yeah, she won't see a doctor, and, well, you are my only hope, Janice. I see. Yes. Now, really, we must be going. After, as it is, we won't reach the island till after dark. Easy, easy now. You can't see a thing when the landing light's off. Okay, you better go first, Janice. All right. Where's that tropical moon people write songs about? Hiding tonight, Miss Brooks. I think we've got a storm coming up. Now, you just wait till I get on the dock. Hey. What's that? Oh, it's just an overgrown mongrel Eileen insisted on bringing to the island. <laughs> Lord knows we don't need any protection. There's just the two of us. I should say you'd welcome the company. Though I must admit he's devoted to my wife. But I'd prefer if he kept tied up. He's a vicious beast. Oh, the house is right up here. Oh, George. Oh, now what's wrong with her? You can't mean that's Eileen. I think I saw her run around that side of the house. Well, Marcel, don't just stand there. Well, if she intends to hide, as she usually does, we'll never find her till morning. But we've got to do something. Uh, Valentine, there's a flashlight on the porch in the back. You and Miss Brooks can look for her out there near the cliff. Okay. You come with me, Johnny, son. Huh? But first I want to tie this animal up. Brooks, no matter what Millet says, the first thing we're going to do is get a light on in that house. Now, you do that and I'll go around and get the flash. Oh, c- c- couldn't we kind of do those things together? No time, Angel. I'll oh. make it snap. Oh, golly. Oh. Better let her light that lamp. You might burn the place. Uh, this house is nothing more than an oversized thatch hut anyway. There. You're pretty, aren't you? Uh, who are you? That's my question to you. Why did Marcel bring you here? Are you one of those simpering ladies he trips off to see now and then? Get away from me. You know, he does have a strange fascination, that ugly Casanova. If I thought you and he I'd were... hate to haul off and hit a stranger, but I could force myself. You better listen to her, sister. What? The young lady's quite capable of taking care of herself. Yeah. Huh? Looks as though Marcel's decided to turn this place into a resort. Now, look, I've been fumbling around in the dark long enough. Since you're not Eileen Millet, who are you? How did you get here? Miriam Denton's the name. House guest, model. Lately, I've turned into a nurse for Marcel's mad wife. If you want to know anything else about me, ask him. <sighs> Well, George, what are we going to do? Well, right now, Angel, we're going down to the boat landing and get my gun out of the luggage. George, the boat's gone. I wouldn't mind that so much, Brooksy. But that means there's something else missing, too. Huh? My gun. Oh, fine. Yeah. This weird little drama calls for us being permanent guests in this tropical paradise. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. You know, in every town, when 5 p.m. rolls around, there's a big parade. 
A traffic parade of folks who are homeward bound. If you're part of this daily parade, and if your car has so little pep that you have to stay in the creep-along lane, better switch to Chevron Supreme gasoline. It's a high-octane fuel blended to put command performance in your car. You'll find Chevron Supreme commands speedy pickup at every green light, smooth acceleration on the open highway, and all the extra power to make your car great on hills. A premium quality gasoline, it also commands fast starts every time you use the starter. For Chevron Supreme is climate tailored, tailored to the different altitude and temperature zones between Canada and Mexico. So wherever you drive in the West, Rely on Chevron Supreme to give your car command performance. Try a tank full tomorrow at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. In answer to her twin sister's plea, Janice Gibson comes to you with a strange assignment, namely to travel thousands of miles to a tiny island just off Honolulu. If you have George Valentine's keen instinct, something about the whole journey bothers you. You see how right you were when you arrive at the island and hear a piercing scream in the night, Janice Gibson's sister disappearing into the jungle. Can anyone hear the storm out there? Doesn't anyone care if my sister's out in it? We all care. Very deeply, Janice. But we'll never find Eileen if she doesn't want to be found, huh? Oh, I'd tonight. like to disagree with Malay, Janice, but I'm afraid he's right. You've seen what it's like out there. Incidentally, Mr. Malay, what happened to the boat? And why did you leave Janice alone? Yes, you asked me to wait and never came back. I thought it might be a good idea to circle the island. But don't worry, the boat is quite safe where it is. Yeah, I'm sure it's well hidden. What that's... Skip it, Buster. I'm going to look for her. Hey, Janice, stop. Listen to me. No, now let go of me. Proxy, take her upstairs and stay with her. Any one of the guest rooms makes no difference. Come on, honey. You've got to think of yourself, too. Think of myself alone, Janice. I've got to get rid of that blasted dog. What's the matter, Marcel? You seem nervous. You shouldn't be. You've got a gun. My gun, to be exact. What do you mean? It's missing from my luggage. Valentine, I don't know what you're talking about. And I don't like your insinuation. I'm not insinuating anymore. I'm going to find out the reason for everything that's happened. There's only one reason. I was at my rope's end. The only person I could think of with Eileen was her sister. Huh? What's happened tonight may have upset you and Miss Brooks, but I did not ask you to share in it. Well, listen to me, my friend, and listen carefully. I have no choice. Why don't you hit me? Don't tempt me. It happens I don't want to bring things to a head because I have my own plans for tomorrow. Really? If I made a cup of tea, could I persuade you gentlemen to be civilized? Here's your persuasion on my cell here, Miss Denton. And while you're at it, you might persuade him not to let those fancy maneuvers with the gun and the boat go to his head. Marcel, what are you waiting for? I didn't expect her to bring those people. It changes our plans. But he suspects something. You think I'm a fool? I know that. But I've got to have a chance to think. You wouldn't stop to think if you really loved me. You do, don't you? What a woman. Love and murder in the same breath. I told you, Miriam, give me a chance to think. George, did you see Janice this morning? No, Brooksy, I thought she was still upstairs with you. Well, I left her for a few minutes, but when I came back, she wasn't there. Oh, I thought you knew, Mr. Valentine. Knew what? Miss Gibson went out with Marcel. Naturally, she's anxious to find her sister. Well, isn't that something we're all going to do together? I didn't know what your plans were. Not much, you didn't. You know darn Stay well... Brooksy, come on. Oh. Hey, George. Well, no, easy, easy. What's the matter, fella? What's bothering you? Easy, boy. Well, we're going to go for a little walk. What are you talking about, George? That's what I said, Angel. Wait a minute. Hey, I'll probably take a whiff of this. What have you got there, George? One of Eileen's handkerchiefs. Yeah, and I think our canine friend here knows what I mean. Come on, boy. Now we can go for that walk. George, keeps coming. 
coming back to this spot. Yeah, I know, I know. But there's nothing here but the beach. What if I hold it? There seems to be some kind of a cave in the side of this tomb. Yeah, that's where he wants to go. Look at him. Here, hold him, Angel. Okay. Well, I see if I can tear away some of these vines. George, I don't know if I can hold it. It'll just be a minute. I want to see if... What is it? Oh, good Lord. No, Brooksy, stay where you are. Yeah, if this dog will only let me... Take him, I'll take him. But don't go in there. George, is it... Eileen. A bullet in her head. Oh, no. But, George, last night she was alive, all somewhere by herself. Nobody could even find That's her. That's where we were all wrong. Last night, Eileen was already dead. But, but we heard her scream. That was Miriam who put on that little act. She was also the shadow we saw disappear around the side of the house. Oh. Well, what does Marcel expect to gain by all this? He's probably turning that over in his mind right now. And that's why we have to find him and Janice before he has a chance to make another move. so useless, George. There are so many places on this island he could have taken Janice. Well, there's only one thing in our favor, Brooksy. Marcel has to make this piece of mayhem look like an accident. That's the whole idea. Yeah, I know. You keep saying it. Easy now, quiet fellow. Don't you see, Brooksy, he intends to pass Janice off as Eileen. He did it very successfully yesterday. That photographer took it for granted Janice was his wife. Uh-huh. Well, I can see how he could have given everybody that impression. Yeah, the loving couple returned to the island. Wife has an unfortunate accident. He can report it as such to the police and collect the insurance because there's no sign of violence. Something he couldn't do with Eileen, who sports a prominent bullet. Wait a minute. I wonder what's eating him. George! Hey, up there on that cliff. Yeah, but see, come on. No! Oh, he's going to kill me! Oh, golly, George! Okay, Malay. See if you got an answer for this. All right, fella, go get him. Hey, I've got an answer. I've been waiting a long time to do this. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Come down here. He's gone, man. You can't follow. Mr. Rose, Here, Brooksy, you take care of him. Okay. I want to see what he intends to do next. Claire, he told me about Eileen. Yes, I know, honey. He was going to push me into the ocean. Make it look like an accident. Hey, where you are. Three of you. You're riding for a fall, Buster. You make another move toward me and I let the women have it first. You know I have no compunction about it either. Yeah, I know. You're a brave boy when it comes to shooting dogs and women. Keep you away from me. Oh, please. Don't, please. Thomas, don't. Once more, your intrusion interfere with my plans, Valentine. It breaks my heart. I suppose the best way to do it, after all, is to get rid of the three of you at once. I think we're going to have another little storm tonight. It's the time of year, you know. We can do it without the weather report. Oh, yes, yes. The story will go something like this. Despite my urgent pleas, the three of you insisted on taking the boat out into the storm. Aren't you satisfied you killed my sister? What else do you of want? Of course, I shall be interested in recovering the body of only one of the foolhardy trio. The one the police will accept as my late, beloved wife. Doesn't Miriam Denton understand that she may be next on your list someday? What does she see in you, anyway? She sees in me a man who won't let anything stand between him and his dream. Now, let's go back to the house and make the best of this waiting. Oh, for heaven's sake, Marcel, get this over with. In a few minutes, I think we can be ready. Of course, Valentine, I shall have to shoot you and Miss Wilkes. I couldn't expect you to jump into the water at my command, eh? Why don't you stop posturing? No, no, let him go on, Miriam. He just wants to show you how much power he has. All because he didn't turn out to be a Clark Gable. Shut up, Valentine. I'm as good as any man. Better. You're not a man. You're something that crawls. I'm something that uses his brain, Miss Wilkes. Since no one knows Janice is here... The insurance company will ever question a routine police report on my wife's death. We'll be able to do a lot of things with $50,000. Won't we, Miriam? Yes, if you'll only stop talking. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm just sorry I got you and Claire into this thing. I'm so glad to see you take this philosophically, Janice. I doubt if I would have had many more years to live anyway. He kept telling me it could be Don't years. say any more, Janice. Why do you stop her? What was she going to say? 
She was just going to crack a very grim joke, Marcel. And it happens to be on you. What do you mean? And don't get up. Stay where you are. No, I feel like walking around. You know what I'll do if I try... You're not going to do anything. What's more, you're not going to live to spend that 50000 Be careful, Marcel. Something's happened in the last four years that you don't know anything about. Something that's going to hang a crepe on that rosy future of yours. You don't say. Yeah. Janice has been ill, very ill. Under constant care of a doctor. What's that to do with me? Now, let's get started. Come on. Andre Boyard, M.D. What? Uh-huh. I thought you'd recognize the name. Dr. Boyard. The best heart specialist in Honolulu. Of course. The one the ship's doctor mentioned. What is this? He more than mentioned him, Marcel. He gave the doctor specific instructions to locate Janice. Very soon now, he'll do just that. You're lying. And the picture you were so anxious to have taken... It'll only prove that it was Eileen's twin sister who arrived. Miriam, you heard what he said. Look at Janice. There's nothing wrong with her, is there? Is there? Marcel! You're as good as cook, brother, and you did it yourself. No, no! Watch out for him! Don't, no. let, uh, let go. Don't let me break your arm. Let go of the gun! I've got it, George. Yeah. Well, Marcel, what is it now that stands between the man and his dream... Hey, look, Brooksy, why the purse's office? Oh, I told you. A friend of mine wanted me to inquire about a honeymoon cruise on the Eudora. Honeymoon cruise, huh? Mm-hmm. Friend, huh? What friend? Oh, you wouldn't know him. But he has nice broad shoulders. Just about your height. Uh-huh. And he uh, calls his girlfriend Angel. <laughs> One of those gooey characters, huh? Uh-huh. Yes, uh, what can I do for you folks? <laughs> well, we want to find out about a honeymoon cruise. Something in the near future. Oh, I think we can accommodate you now. Just what would you like? Well, darling, I just described the potential groom to you. What do you think he'd like? Yeah. Uh, look, friend, do you have a nice long cruise scheduled for, uh, let's say, 1952 or 3? Now, really, if this is some kind of a joke. Right? Well, please, mister, don't play so fast and loose with my life. I beg your pardon. This is the nearest to first base I've gotten yet. I think everyone will agree that cutting down the cost of car operation is an economy step in the right direction. And if there's anyone who hears more about budgeting and economizing than a grocer, who is he? Mr. J.W. Hogan of 301 H Street, Bakersfield, California, is a grocer. And here's his statement about RPM motor oil. Quote, I must confess I don't know much about a car, but there's one thing I'm sure of. I haven't had to spend one cent for repair since I started using RPM motor oil in 1945. And thousands of other users of RPM, folks in all walks of life, have had the same success with this premium motor oil. For RPM is specially compounded to keep your car's engine clean, to fight off internal rust and corrosion, to keep cylinder walls cool when engine temperatures get hottest. So for protection you trust, and the finest wear-saving lubrication. Give your car a break by giving it RPM motor oil. Ask for it at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Next week, when the telephone wakes George Valentine out of a sound sleep, you'll hear him saying... Yeah? George, wake up! Uh, huh? We got a letter this morning you're uh, going to love. Harger is right in the middle of it. Uh, Harger? Yeah. Oh, I hope it's something big. I'd like to nail him good. Well, if you can, it will be good. Meet me at Molly's Cafe, 12 Sharp. Yeah, got it. Hey, you know, Angel, I was just thinking... How nice it'd be to have your dulcet voice wake me up every morning. Oh, well, I got news for you, Mr. Valentine. That could be arranged. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. 
Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg as Janice, Gerald Moore as Marcel Millet, Louise Arthur as Miriam, Jack Crucian as Juan, and Earl Keane as the purser. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Since America began, from all of the world have come men and women of every race, every religion, every cultural background. And into this land they brought a stirring concept, brotherhood. Let's remember that, especially now, during Brotherhood Week. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil invite you to Let George Do It. The Adventures of George Valentine, brought to you on behalf of Chevron Gas Stations and Standard Stations throughout the West. Tonight's adventure begins as George, feeling very safe after making a special trip downtown to pay the premium on his accident policy, walks briskly down an isolated street to where he has parked his car. Suddenly, from the open stairway of a building, a cascade of small round pellets bounces to the pavement, followed closely by a young woman in great haste. There is a collision, and George hits the sidewalk with the force of a blockbuster. <laughs> Are you hurt? Oh, you don't have an extra sacroilla yak on you. Can you get up? I, I think so. Well, then, do you mind? Do I mind what? Getting up off the pavement. Well, if I'm in your way, couldn't I just slide over? You're lying on my pearls. Pearls? Oh, good. I thought those lumps were misplaced vertebrae. No. Oh. Hey, uh. Oh, thank you. Now, let me see. That makes 32, 33, 4. Yeah, here's a few in the gutter. Oh, good. Yes, 35, 36, 36. Hey, have you seen any teeth down there? They're mine. Oh, I'm sorry. You fell down 38, 39. Oh, here's one of my trouser cups. Thanks. 40. I see you, you little rascal. 41. 41. 41. Lots of 41s, aren't there? I've lost one. There were 42. I've lost one. Oh, good Lord, what'll I do now? They'll kill me for this. Oh, come now, lady. Where is it? Where is it? There were 42 of them. What have you done with uh, it? Well, I, I'm afraid I've kicked it down that sewer drain. What? You kicked my pearl down the... Where? I don't see it. All over there, see? Here, through the grating. Oh, were you lucky? Landed right in that Sunday cup. Oh, I see it. Oh, yes, there it is. Oh, thank heaven. But how do we get it out of there? Well, it's a very delicate engineering problem. I need a long stick and, uh, and a chewing gum if you're through with it. Here. Thanks. Now, let's see. Oh, that's lucky. Here's a stick. That's why I do it. Uh-huh. Can you reach it? Uh, no. No, not long enough. You know, that's quite a drop down there. Oh, good Lord, if anything happens to that pearl. Well, I hate to do this, but... Are you going down there? Uh, huh? Here, hold my coat, will you, lady? All right. There's a ladder in here. Don't fall down and hurt the pearl. Oh, thanks a lot. I'll be careful. Uh-huh. Got it. Oh, give it to me, quickly. All right. Catch. Oh. Ah, nice one. Thanks. Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing thanks with that ladder? Thanks a lot, Hess. You've been very helpful. Hey, what is this? Put that ladder back. <laughs> The least we can do is leave things like we find them. Hey, come back here, you. What's the matter with Don't you? Don't worry, lover. A heavy rain out of you right up to the top. Sorry, I just can't stand saying goodbye or answering questions. Well, I'll be a... Hey, help! Yes? Something for you, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah, this looks like the right place. Are you Mr. Zagetti? To be precise, 
Bela Zigetti. I am he. Oh, Mr. Zigetti, I can see by the layout here you're a jeweler. Now, I wonder if... To be uh... precise, I am not a jeweler. I manufacture artificial gems. Uh, to put it this way, I do my small part to brighten the lives of those who otherwise are not very bright. Is this exact? Yeah, probably. Well, what I want to know is, have you recently brightened the life of a young lady with a string of artificial pearls? To be precise, a blonde, Miss Dale Quidden. Yeah, that's right. I saw her coming out of this building, and I thought that... A uh... beautiful job. Beautiful job. Smooth and pink and utterly perfect. Yes, she was. To correct myself, I refer to the string of matched imitation pearls. Ah. Pink one, 42 on a rope. She was pretty particular about the specification. Oh, yes. They were a duplication of... But if I may ask you a question... Sure, of course. Uh, to put the question in this way, why do you ask this question? Well, I, uh... I admired her set. I was interested in buying it, but she wouldn't sell. I wondered if you could arrange for me to have a duplicate set. Oh, it would take many months. How much would it cost? It, to be precise, three hundred dollars. <laughs> well, that's a little too precise. She told me you made hers for two hundred. But no, it was the same. The price is no different. Oh well, maybe I misunderstood. But I'd like to check. Not that I disagree. But no, there is no doubt. I am an honorable man. Please verify this. Yeah, I'll do that. If. You'd like to give me her address. But, of course, I have a record of my sales. You will find out. That's all I want, Mr. Zaghetti. I just want to find out. George, anybody who'd go down into a sewer pipe after a blonde deserves everything... Oh, now listen, Brooksy, I didn't follow her into the sewer. I was doing my good deed for the day, and she ran off with my coat and wallet. Hmm. What were you looking for, a merit badge? Oh, now, Brooksy, listen. Well, it's a nice way to meet a girl, I must say. Sprawled senseless in the gutter. And all she has to do is blink those big brown eyes and... Blue eyes. Blue eyes. And you go scurrying down the drain pipe like a... Like a... Rat. Rat. Thank you. And then because you're caught in your own trap... Well, that'll teach me to keep my trap shut. You come cringing back to me like a... Like good a... Good puppy. Puppy. And you expect me to feel sorry for you. So she jilted you. Good for her. What were you trying to prove anyway? Well, I guess I was just trying to prove I was willing to start at the bottom and work up. Brooksy. What? You're not mad. Oh, George, of course not. But I hate to see a woman make a fool out of a man like you. Another woman, that is. Well, don't you worry. I'm going to prove to her I'm nobody's fool. I know you're not, darling. Yes. Huh? But I'm working on it. Hey, wait a minute. Here we are. Yeah, you're right. There's the number. 7700. Uh-oh, is right. Sure you want me to come along? Unless you're afraid of the competition. What? Oh, aren't you smug. Lead on, Macduff. Yeah, here's her name on the box. Miss Dale Quillen. I'd like to give her a piece of my mind. Now, Brooksy, let me do the talking. Yeah? Miss Dale Quillen? You're kidding? I mean, I mean, she means, is Dale Quillen at home? You're kidding? Well... Is he kidding? Well, someone is. Hey, did you get a look at that house? What, through that solid wall of muscle? Well, the place is a wreck. Furniture turned over, paper scattered on the floor. Poor housekeeper as well as a crook. What are you going to do? What is this, a gag? Um, we've decided to wait. What are you, a mad character or something? Blow. Oh, come off it now, handsome. Anybody can see you've got a heart as big as all outdoors. Yeah? Then stay outdoors. Hey, character, get your foot out of the door, I'll chop it off. You know, you could be a lot of company for us while we're waiting. Yes, sir. A lot of company. Yeah? Give me your address and I'll drop you a postcard. If you want it any clearer, I'll step outside. Come on, I dare hey, you. Take it easy, Claire. I warned you, Joker. Oh, uh, let it go, Nobin. You're too quick with the fist. The old <sighs> friends now. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great little equalizer you got there. It is small but persuasive. Bring him in, Nobin. I think we have interest in coming. Come on, you. In come... one piece, Nobin. Perhaps you can take him apart later. Inside, kiddo. Easy. Yes, Nubbin is just a big, playful child. He loves to take things apart, but he has never quite learned how to put them together again. Now, shall we talk? We'll return.
return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, let's go from assault and battery to just plain battery. For thousands of Western motorists, October means a lot of weekend driving, like football games and hunting trips. But for the battery in your car, October means extra work and power drainage because of the colder weather and lots of stop-and-go driving. So let me give you a two-way economy tip. First, depend on the men at your standard station or independent Chevron gas station for periodic battery checkups. They have all the equipment and know-how for keeping up your battery's maximum power and for giving it longer life. Second, when you fill up your tank, ask for Chevron Supreme gasoline. Tailor-made for each different climate and altitude zone, high-octane Chevron Supreme assures instant starts, eliminates grinding on the starter, and drain on the battery. So for definite battery economy in colder weather, just remember, regular battery checkups at any Chevron gas station or standard station and Chevron Supreme gasoline. Now back to the second part of 42 on a Rope, tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, it seems that George's curiosity following his strange encounter with a mysterious girl and a broken string of pearls has landed him in a tight spot. For minutes now, Baptiste and Nubin have been questioning George and Claire until... I've told you everything I know. This girl, this stale Quillen, made me look silly. So I came here for an explanation. Now I feel even sillier. You have come here looking for something. So have we. Naturally, we are all sincere people. Perhaps we can help one another, uh, Monsieur... Valentine. George Valentine. And that depends on what we're looking for. Naturally. Pink pearls, no? Forty-two on a rope, is it not? We're looking for Dale Quillen, remember? Naturally. Because when we find Miss Quillen, Baptiste Lavon also finds his pearls, n'est-ce pas? I wouldn't know. Who's Baptiste Lavon? Oh, my apology. It is I. Oh, I see. Well, what makes a string of phony oyster fruit so important anyway? Phony? <laughs> I do not know this phony. Ringers, fakes, dupes. Artificial, counterfeit, paste. Ah, the replicas. You refer to this fraudulent string, huh? Uh huh. Yeah, that's it. Where'd you get them? Uh, they were left by Miss Quillen at the check room of the Union Station. She sent me the claim check. At the same time, no doubt, boarding a train for some distant city. Why would she do that? Because they are worthless. Good imitations, no more. Value, perhaps $300. As you say, phony. You're trying to say she pulled a switch on you? Ran off with the real pearls, your pearls, and left you the ringers? That is correct. As always, Baptiste Lavon was sincere. I trusted her with 42 exquisite gems. Gems collected by no other than Louis XIV to give to his Antoinette. Tell me, Lavon, where did you get hold of Marie Antoinette's choker? Ah, spoils of war, Monsieur Valentine. As an officer of the Vichy government in France, my job was to appraise and catalog war prizes for the victorious Nazi. Naturally, the sincerity and integrity of Baptiste Lavon were above approach. Naturally. So you held out the match picks. Naturally. Oh, when the fortunes of war were reversed, Baptiste Lavon reversed too. Uh, Miss Quillen came to Paris with an entertainment unit and uh, we became uh, friends. And she smuggled them into the States for you. Well, that is correct. That'll teach you not to be so sincere. Are you kidding? Well, hello. Now, uh, you are friends of Miss Quillen. You see my predicament. Uh, I must know where she is. You will tell me? I've told you. I don't even know the girl. Your mode of entry contradicts you. You are a confederate. We are not quite fools here. Yeah, we ain't no dopes, you know. You do not help, Nubbin. Well, mm, they're stubborn. Now you may take the men apart. The girl adores him. She will weaken first. You may proceed. Yeah. I'll loosen him up first with my belt. Then I'll get technical. No, don't. He doesn't know anything. Let go of my arm, lady. Stop it. Let him alone, you fool. Can't you see he doesn't know anything? You won't let go, Baptiste. Hey, I would advise you to do as nothing said. Claire, better sit this one out, honey. I won't let them. I... Who's that? Uh, I don't know. It seems to be a messenger of some sort with a package. package. Package? I will not insult your intelligence by warning you to keep quiet. Answer it, Nubbin. Yeah. I've got a package here addressed to uh, Handsome. <laughs> handsome, that's all the name it's got. That's me. I'm Handsome. You? 
Are you sure? You're kidding? Give me the package. Well, can you uh, identify yourself? Sure. Take a good look at me. Now, wouldn't you say I was handsome? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. You got pretty eyes, too. Okay, give me the package and dust. <laughs> handsome, is it? This is surely not Nubbin. Nor is it Baptiste Lavon. Handsome, then, is Monsieur Valentine. Oh, no, not me. No, it's Oh, not. yes, Monsieur Valentine. I will open the package for you. Sacre bleu. They're not here. It's nothing but a map. Yes, but a large map of the city. With four small crosses marked on it. And these words, X marks the spot. But there are four X's. Yeah. One at High and 23rd. And one at Elm and Valley. And 14th and Underhill. And Cast and Granite. Four spots marked with X. What does this mean, Monsieur Valentine? Well, how should I Oh, know? go ahead, handsome. Tell them. They'll find out anyway. What? What are you... Oh, yeah, okay. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? She planted the 42 real pearls in different places. So even if you found one hideout, she still have three quarters of them hidden away at other places. Excellent. You know these hiding places? Naturally. Excellent. We will all go hunting. Nubbin, the young lady, you and I, and the gun. Please do not forget the gun. Well, here's the first stop, Costa and Granite. Where am I going to park? Pull up to the curb now in Lettons out. And drive around the block and pick us up here. Okay. Now, where, where is it? Quickly. I cannot control myself. Well, you see that big office building there? Y- yes, yes. You see that window up there with the jeweler's sign? Well, I, I don't see it. Higher. Look higher. No, no. Where is it? No, it's higher yet. That's higher. No. Oh. Come on, Brooksy, run for it. Into that theater. Oh, George, we haven't been to a movie in ages. Oh, it's a cartoon. Good, I could stand a laugh. We didn't come in here for laughs, Brooksy. Do you think LeBon saw where we went? I don't know. It's pretty dark in here. Can you see? Oh, a little. It's crowded. <laughs> Maybe we'd better take singles. You leave me alone and I'll scream the place down. Okay, okay. Hey, that looks like two in the middle there. Good. Excuse us, will you? Pardon me. I beg your pardon. Oh, this is fine. We can hold hands. Oh, George, are you all right? I think so. Oh, did you see that? That was very funny. The monster's run over by a steamroller. I know just how he felt. Shh. What's it all about, George? What did those four X's on the map really mean? I don't know, but I'm working on it. You think we're safe in here? Well, there are four X's in right in the Wait a minute. Shh. Quiet, I please. got it, Claire. That's it. The four X's and us in the middle. Shh, quiet. What, you two? No, look, George. There's LeBon coming down the aisle. Yeah, Nubbin's coming down the other aisle. I don't think they've seen him. Let's get out of here. Oh, George. Oh, gosh, now I'll never know how the mouse got out of the cement mixer. Anybody following us now, George? No, I think we've shaken them. Driver? Yes, sir? Got a map of the city? Yeah, here you are. Good, thanks. Say, pull over to the curb a minute, will you? Sure. What is it, George? I only hope LeVon doesn't figure it out as fast as I did. Hey, you got a pencil, Brooksy? Uh, yeah, an eyebrow pencil. Good, thanks. Hey, now look. You remember the four intersections where the X's were? Yes, now, I fold the paper here yeah. and draw a straight line from this X to this X. Fold it again and draw another from here to here. And you get a big X. Yeah, Brooksy. X marks the spot intersecting at DeLong and King Avenue. And that's where we'll find Miss Dale Quillen. You, you made it. Hello. And you did mean me. Of course, who else? I don't believe we've met before. 
I'm Claire Brooks, George's fiance. Uh, secretary. Oh, practically the same thing. Looking at you, I guess it would be. How'd you know I was in your house? How'd you know I'd get your message? I knew Baptiste and Nubbin were inside. I was watching from the vacant house across the street. I saw them take you in and knew they'd make it tough for you. What made you think I'd catch that X marks the spot routine? Well, you'd gotten that far with a lot less to go on. Also, I found your business card in your wallet. You're George Valentine, aren't you? Well, perhaps I should introduce you two. I figured you'd know the score because you're a professional troubleshooter. And brother, have I got trouble. Well, if I can be of any Now, help. wait a minute. Remember the sewer, George. Oh, I'm awfully sorry about that. I was panicky. It, it won't happen again. Darn white of you. Come on, let's get away from here. First of all, suppose you tell us what you did with Marie Antoinette's necklace. After you. Uh, I haven't got it. I don't know where it is. Oh, well, that helps a lot. Take off, driver. Any of it here. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this. All we know is that you smuggled the pearls into the States. Now you tell us you don't know where they are. Take it from there. I know I had them. Levon concealed the pearls in a bottle of wine. I saw him do it. They were stuck to the bottom of the bottle with wax so they wouldn't rattle. Then he filled the bottle and sealed the top. I paid customs duty on the wine and got them through. Very smooth. Go on. Well, when I, when I got here, the seal was still unbroken, but... Well, you won't believe this, but when I opened the bottle, the pearls were gone. Somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, somebody had made a switch. You're telling me the pearls were hijacked from you? It's true, I swear it. But do you think Yvonne would believe that? He'd say I double-crossed it. Men are so skeptical. Do you believe me? Well... Say you do. Say you'll help me. All right, I do, and I'll help you. Oh, swell. Now, all we've got to do is find the person who stole the pearls from the girl who smuggled them in for the boy who stole them in the first place. <laughs> It's okay, Dale. This is my office. You'll be safe here. Yes, I'll see to that. Come on in, Claire, and shut the door. Better lock it. Should I swallow the key? Why did we have to stop at the library? Why did you have to take out a book at a time like this? Well, I'll tell you. And listen carefully. Levon's desperate. We've got to have some answers ready for him before he catches up with us. Oh, I have a feeling he's close by. You don't know him like I do. He's closing in on me. I know he is. Look, Dale, look. Keep calm. He's not in the filing cabinet or under the desk. Hey, Brooks, he opened the closet door and showed Dale he's not in there pointing a gun at her head. Okay. I have a surprise for you. He is. Huh? Keep your hands away from that desk, Monsieur Valentine. Back up, please, both of you. Miss Quillen, remain where you are. Oh, no. No, I knew it. I knew it. Face the wall, both of you. Your hands high. Higher. Nubbin? Yeah, Baptiste? Keep them covered. If either one makes a move to interfere... Squeeze the trigger twice. I'll do that thing. And that's no gag, Joker. And now, we come to you, Sherry, at long last, eh? Baptiste, listen, you've got to listen. You've got to give me a break. You made a fool of Baptiste Lavon once. For that alone, I hate you. Should you do it twice, I would hate myself. No, Sherry, your luck has run out. I didn't double-cross you, Baptiste. I swear I didn't. No? What do you call these? Pearls? You rotten little cheat. No, listen, I had them made, but... Give me a chance. I can explain. No, Sherry, they're phonies. Phony like yourself. That piece of pearls, they were, they were gone when I opened the bottle. Somebody took them. You've got to believe me. You carry the light to the end, eh, Sherry? <laughs> Your last chance, my darling. Where are the pearls? I don't know. Don't move. Stay just as you are. I want to remember you like this forever. Bonsoir, Sherry. Come on. Quiet, Joker. I know where the pearls I are. I said quiet. Wait. What was that, Monsieur Valentine? Call off your dog, Levon. I'm ready to talk. Don't listen, Baptiste. He's a kidder. You can talk, Monsieur Valentine, from where you are. All right. Your story about Marie Antoinette's necklace got me interested in famous jewels. I've been to the library and picked up a book. That's it on my desk there, the red one. Now go on, open it. To the page I have marked. If this Wait, is a nothing. Thing. The book, yes. Jewels of history. Go on, read it. Read what it says. I am reading. What is it, George? It's Dale's life insurance, Claire. Uh-huh. I have read it. Well? Well, I guess you win, Valentine. Can we put our hands down now, Levon? <sighs> of course. Let them alone, Nubbin. You have very nearly made a tragic mistake. I thank you, Monsieur Valentine. Baptiste Lavon thanks you. I don't get this, Baptiste. Come, Nubbin. We've worn out our welcome. Monsieur Valentine, 
We will trouble you no more. You will never see us again. Bonsoir, chérie. Now I will remember you always as you were in Paris. Oh, well, the miracle, that's all it was, just a miracle. What did you do to him, George? What was in that book? Read it, Claire, out loud. Oh, yes. Cleopatra's pearl. Cleopatra, to impress Mark Antony, once dissolved a pearl in vinegar and drank it to his health. Dissolved Now, wait a minute. Listen. Go ahead, Claire. Pearls which consist of carbonate of lime are extremely soluble in weak acids. They will dissolve in vinegar containing 6% or more of acetic acid or in wine which is turned sour. It was the wine that did it. The wine in the bottle. According to the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry and Soils, pearls consist of 91 and 7 tenths percent. Never mind the rest, Claire. That's enough. Well, how do you feel now, Dale? Oh, completely dazed. Levine didn't have an argument in the world. He knew he planted the pearls in that wine bottle himself. He had nobody to blame but himself. I can't believe it. You saved my life and I... Oh, George. Now what? Now I have to go to jail. Well, it's going to be kind of hard to hold you there. Why? Well, technically, since there weren't any pearls in the bottle when you brought it through the customs station, you actually didn't smuggle anything in, even though you meant to. Levon filched the pearls from the Nazis, but I doubt if any of them will turn up to claim them. No, it was all a wild goose chase for something that simply didn't exist. Well, I'm going to confess my part of it and take what's coming to me. First, George. Yeah? May I kiss you? <clears throat> you saved my life, Miss Brooks. May I? Where I'm going, it'll be a long time between kisses. Well, things aren't much better around here, but... Oh, all right, go ahead. Honestly, I think I must be going loony. Goodbye, George. Uh, Dale. <laughs> Just a minute. Yes? Be a nice girl and hand it over. What? Oh, come on, Dale. You certainly haven't forgotten why I got into this in the first place. And if you think I'm going to let you walk out of that door with my wallet, you're loony. <laughs> If your family car is the kind that does all-around duty, like taking mother shopping, dropping the children off at school, picking up father after work, you can't choose your tires too carefully. That's why I'd like to talk to you tonight about Atlas Grip-Safe Tires. The Atlas tire has a specially designed tread that actually grips the road and brings you to a sure, safe stop whenever you apply the brake. Tomorrow... Ask at your independent Chevron gas station or standard station about the built-in safety features of Atlas tires. Then try them on your car for extra protection and extra riding comfort. Best of all, when you buy an Atlas passenger car tire, you get a written one-year guarantee against the cuts, bruises, and blowouts that threaten the life of ordinary tires. While you're talking tire safety and comfort at the standard station or independent Chevron gas station... Ask for those two other motor car friends, Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Motor Oil. Next week, when you tune our way for The Joke Was on the Killer, another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear George saying, Some joke, I'd say. Brooksy, see what's happened to Mrs. Ralston, will you? Well, sure, George. Glenn, he made me go through with this farce and shoot those blanks. Well, he's not going to do anything like that to you again, Agnes. Wait a minute. Listen, everybody. This man is dead. We've had enough of this vicious nonsense. You're part of this, too. This act, Valentine. Now I know it. And you, get up. Oh, leave him alone. Come and help me with Mrs. Ralston, George. Now stop this, all of you. What Just do you... what do I have to do to make myself clear? This started out as a joke, but it's no longer funny. This man is completely, hopelessly dead. Clinic Care, Hospital Care, a visiting nurse in your home. They are made possible by funds from Community Chest. Thousands of persons, old and young, benefit each year from health services of Community Chest. 
So give generously this October for your community's health and welfare. Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West invite you to be with us again next week for The Joke Was on the Killer, another adventure of George Valentine, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by Doug Hayes and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were George Sorrell, Jim Nusser, Betty Moran, Jack Crucian, Victor Rodman, and Dick Ryan. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. KHJ Los Angeles, memo from stationers. Here are ballpoint pens for every purse or pocket. California, on behalf of Standard Stations and independent Chevron gas stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you need the kind of help you couldn't get from a cautious man, then you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine... You may have forgotten the one time we met. You were the best man at my wedding. Yes, I'm Joe Burke's wife. You won't believe what's happened to him. Easygoing, happy-go-lucky Joe. He's a pitiful mental case, and they've got him in a sanitarium. You were so close to Joe in the army, I thought maybe if he saw you again, it might do more than the doctors have been able to do. I thought of this when I saw your ad in the paper, like a ray of hope. Won't you try to help me? It's signed anxiously, Laura Burke. Joe, a mental case? Oh, no, not the Sergeant Burke I knew. Well, George's wife would hardly make up anything like this. But Brooksy at Palermo, when everybody else was either cussing or praying, that hard-headed Irishman just sat around playing a harmonica. Danny boy. It's funny I never heard you talk about him. Well, you know how those things are, Angel. You swear on your G.I. dog tag that you're going to be sure to keep in touch with each other, but... As Tempest fugits, old Lang Syne becomes just the name of a song. But you were his best man. This kid, Laura, came down to camp. We hopped the jeep over to the chaplain, and it took 15 minutes for the tender vows. A minute for me to kiss the bride, and they were off. All Joe had was a 48-hour pass. Golly, she sounds so desperate in this letter. Yeah. What's that address, Brooksy? We'd better get right over there. <laughs> Maybe it's only one chance in a thousand. But I had to turn to you, Mr. Valentine. The name is George, remember? He's in that place, getting worse every day. How he doesn't even recognize me. Laura, we do want to help you. But, honey, you're making it so much harder. Here, sit down. I'm sorry. I know this is tough on you, Laura, but try to tell us the whole thing from the beginning. How did this happen to Joe? When? Well, about a month ago, they brought him home from Egypt. Egypt? What was he doing there? Well, after he got out of the army, he got a job with an export company, Kessling Limited. The money was so good he couldn't refuse it. He planned to keep it for two years so so we could put some money aside. Oh, it must have been terrible being separated again. Did Joe uh, begin to lose his grip while he was abroad? Oh, he sent letters regularly, wonderful, cheerful letters about the future. And a couple of months ago, he stopped writing. Yes, Laura? And then, then one day he walked in with Dr. Tarouk. Oh, wait a minute, who's Dr. Tarouk? Some kind of psychiatrist the company sent back with Joe to take care of him. Mr. Kessling, he's the president of the company. He's been very kind. What did they say happened? Some kind of an explosion outside the city. Joe happened to be around, and when he came to in the hospital, he... He... he now, was... take it easy, Laura. Hey, you want to knock off and have a cup of coffee? No, go on, I'm all right. I'll never forget it. Dr. Tarouk left us alone for a minute. Joe just stood there. Right where you are. Looking at me. Looking through me. He tried to talk, but it seemed to hurt too much, so he just kept staring and staring. Oh, George. Yeah. He took a box of face powder from his pocket and handed it to me. Powder? 
I guess he meant it as a gift. So pathetic. A box of cheap powder. It was horrible to watch. Okay, Laura. I think we've heard enough to begin with. Uh, where have they got Joe? The Hillcrest Sanitarium. His company's paying all the expenses, and Dr. Daruk says, and Tommy hopes Joe will be all right. Yeah. But he's getting worse, you see. I, I thought if you saw him and talked to him, maybe... Maybe by some miracle he'd begin to remember things. He thought so much of I you. I know. All right, Laura. You want to come along with us? No, I... I always seem to upset him. Okay. Yeah, Claire and I'll drop in on Joe. And here's hoping it'll do some good. A sanitarium should have peace and quiet, but they should build it where people can find it. Yes, it is out of the way. Gosh, and every time I look down in that valley, I get dizzy. Kind of unusual, isn't it, Brooksy? What? A company going to quite so much trouble for one of their people. Sanitarium special psychiatrist who seems to stay on and on. Well, darling, maybe the milk of human kindness doesn't curdle as easily as most people think. Ah, uh, maybe not. Brooksy, I've been in some tough spots. But I think seeing Joe like this is going to be just about the toughest. In dealing with the mind, Mr. Valentine, one is never sure what will be good or bad for the patient. Yeah, I think I know what you mean, Dr. Turok. Perhaps this visit from a dear friend out of the past may do Mr. Burke a world of good. However, on the other hand... Will we be able to see him soon? In a few moments. But perhaps it would be wiser for a young lady like you, Miss Brooks, not to see him at all. Huh? There are just a few things I want to know, Doctor, before... Uh, Dr. Taruk. Uh... Oh, Rodney, will you come here? Yes. This imposing but very competent gentleman is the male nurse I've hired to be with Mr. Burke, when it is impossible for me to be present. Uh, oh, yeah. He's acting quiet now, Doctor. Good. Very good. We can go in uh, this way, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. There he is. Uh, Hey, Joe. Danny boy. (laughs) Don't you have anything to say for yourself? What did you do? Lose your harmonica? (laughs) Oh, George. Yeah. Rodney, wipe Mr. Burke's forehead. Yes, Doctor. You can see, Mr. Valentine, what an effort it costs your friend to try to speak. I'm not blind, Doctor. Permit me to explain. The blow he must have received in that accident has injured the tiny wires that crisscross in the brain. His thoughts cannot get through a form of motor aphasia. Well, that's good to know, but it doesn't help Joe. Doctor, does he know what we're talking about? I am quite sure he does not. You see, the wires of the brain that are blocked make it more difficult for him to get his thoughts through. The theory is... Okay, Doctor, but look... Uh, Yes, Mr. Valentine. I'm quite sure you're a very competent psychiatrist, but I... I know you won't mind if I have Dr. Hunter, a friend of mine, come in and have a look at Joe. Just a consultation. Very well, if you feel that way. And it might help to look a little more into that accident... Anything to help your friend, Mr. Valentine. Uh, Rodney. Yes, doctor? The other case downstairs I was so interested in, I think the crisis may come even before I expected. Uh, Would you mind being there to do what is necessary? Then let me know exactly what happens. I'll take care of everything, doctor. Try talking to him again, George. Hey, look, you big oaf. Stop holding on to me. You know who I am. Hey, we got a lot of old times to talk about. You know me, Valentine. (laughs) Oh, I suppose it's no use. Hey, how is it, Dr. Taruk, that Joe was able to walk when he came home to his wife, and now he's flat on his back and can't use his hands or his legs? I thought he was being cured. It is my hope to arrest the progress of the paralysis. Yeah? To shield him from emotional disturbances. Rid his mind of fear. Fear? What fear? Joe was never afraid of anything in his life. This is a different kind of fear. The fear of becoming a mental basket case with no future and no hope. Oh, cut it out, Doctor. Mr. Valentine, I was just stating the facts. To have and to hold from this day forward. 
till death us do part. What are you trying to say, darling? I'm just a best man with a photographic memory. Oh, I know how you feel about Joe this and Laura. This is death, Brooksy. Those two should be together. Something's got to be done about it. Look, do yourself a favor, George, and listen to me. This is something you don't know anything about. You're no psych- psychiatrist. No, no, you listen to me, Angel. I know Joe looks as though his head was full of nuts and bolts, but he recognized me. What do you mean? We used to have a way of winking at each other, just to say, keep your skin on, brother. This man's war will be over someday. Well? Well, that's what he was giving me back there. I know it. Are you sure you aren't imagining something you want to believe? I don't care for that oily Dr. Brooksy, and I care less for that overgrown meatball Rodney hovering over Joe every minute of the day. I just have a feeling he's not getting the right chance. You can't let it be a question of feelings, darling. Believe me. George! Wow. Golly, me too. Oh, a fine place to get a blowout. A few more yards and we would have gone pitching into that valley. Let's hey, wait a minute, Brooksy. Don't open that door. Get down. George, what's the matter with you? Maybe that wasn't a blowout. What? Just playing safe. Well, there doesn't seem to be anyone around now. You stay where you are, Angel. I'll take a look-see. Did you find anything? Yeah. A neat bullet hole in our tire. What? Somebody shot at us from those rocks up there. But who could it be? It'd have to be somebody who knew we'd be coming back this way. Brilliant deduction, Brooksy. But we'll go into that later. Right now, we fix a flat and then get back to town. <laughs> Yes, he's here. Just huh? a moment. It's Walker, financial editor of the Bulletin, good, returning good, your call. Good. Yeah, uh huh. You uh, hold it a second, Walker. Huh? Look, Claire, take this down as I give it to you. Okay. Go on, shoot. Uh huh. Yeah. Kessling, export and import, fine fifty thousand dollars six weeks ago, smuggling diamonds. What? And a shipment of face powder. Since then, out of business, gave up corporate charter. Yeah, thank you, Walker. That was very helpful. Goodbye. George, what have we gotten into? A very touching little situation, Brooksy. The great big corporate heart of Kessling Limited bleeding for one of its employees was hurt. Yeah. In fact, it keeps on bleeding now, long after it ceased to exist, because it was caught smuggling diamonds, no less. Well, how do you think Joe fits into all this? I don't know yet. But right now, we're picking up Dr. Hunter and going back to Hillcrest Sanitarium. Let him take a look at Joe. <laughs> Doc. What'd you find out, Dr. Hunter? I took a good look at your friend, George, and had a long talk with Dr. Taruk. Well, Frank? In Taruk's place, I, uh, I'd have to diagnose the case exactly as he has. Oh. Motor aphasia. Now, progressive paralysis. The whole thing apparently started from some severe shock. I see. Well, now I don't know what to do. His wife told me if we found anything wrong to get him out of here. He's getting all the proper care, as far as I can see. Frankly, I wouldn't suggest that he be moved in his present condition. Okay. Okay, Frank, you know what you know, and I know what I know. Now, Maybe George... I'm wrong about Taruk, as a doctor, I mean. But there are too many other things wrong about this setup, including that bullet in my tire. Yes, and I still say Joe Burke was winking at me. <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about the great American pastime. Batter up, it's baseball season again. And here's a seasonal gift for you. It's a 48-page handbook of baseball. The title is Batter Up. To get your free copy, just ask for Batter Up at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. This guide to baseball fundamentals was written by Bert Dunn, former pro. It has 45 illustrations and photos. Boys will be keen about it. Batter Up tells how to play each position, pitching, catching, fielding, and how to bat. Girls will go for the chapter on softball. Lefty O'Doul of the San Francisco Seals and Joe Cronin of the Boston Red Sox give their views in this grand book. Another article was written by Clarence Rowland, president of the Pacific Coast League. Here's baseball written by a recognized authority. Get your free copy tomorrow. Batter Up is available at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And 
Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, you go through the war with a fellow who becomes your buddy. You lose sight of him, and suddenly his wife shows up saying he's in a sanitarium, a mental case. You try to see what it's all about, a bullet comes at you from nowhere. More than that, you're told your buddy is getting the best possible care. You're not convinced, so you decide to dig deeper. In George's case, that means going with Claire to the Customs Service to have a chat with one of the agents. Well, there really isn't much to it, Mr. Valentine, just what you see in this folder. Uh Uh-huh. What does it say, George? Nothing we didn't know before, Brooksy. Kessling Limited tried to smuggle in diamonds, caught with their carrots down and so forth. Well, I don't know what you expected to find, but compared to some of the stunts we run up against, this wasn't anything too brilliant. Apparently not. The company's out of business now. Now, We've had people trying to get diamonds through in glass eyes and wads of chewing gum almost every way. Hiding them in boxes of face powder. Well, (laughs) maybe they thought it was so obvious they'd get by. Yeah, maybe. Face powder, Brooksy. Why didn't it hit us before? Of course. Joe gave Laura a box of face powder. What's that? Yeah, it's not important, at least not yet. Uh, say, tell me something, Craven. Yes? What happens to the rest of the cargo when you catch people smuggling? We have regular custom sales like an auction. In fact, there's one tomorrow. Oh, that's very interesting. It'll be held in one of those loft buildings down on Fayette Street. There's a public notice in the papers today. Good enough. Come on, Brooksy. Uh, thanks a lot for your trouble. Oh, don't mention it. George, I think when Joe gave Laura that box of powder, he was trying to tell her about the smuggling his company was doing. Could be, Brooksy, could be. But maybe we'll know more about that tomorrow. Young lady, you and I are going to an auction. All right, right over here, everybody. Lot 114, 3,000 boxes of face powder, quality second grade, trade name, Cleopatra's Secret. Sorted shades. Now, well, what do I hear for? The whole lot isn't worth 100 bucks, Brooksy, but here I go and we'll see what happens. $300, Mr. Auctioneer. How uh, much did you say? 300 If you get stuck with all that powder, I don't know how we're going to get it out of here. Well, I don't suppose there'll be any more bids, so, uh... Four hundred. George! Yeah, no, Angel. I'm going to hit it again, just to make sure. Five hundred! Six hundred. What is it? The, uh, gentleman who said five hundred, you, uh, got another bid, sir? Not me. Count me out. Okay, if the gentleman who bid six hundred is just dead right over No one ever did find out Cleopatra's secret, Brooksy. What do you say we go downstairs and see if we can't make history? George, it's getting dark. Let's make believe it's dinner, and I'll go down to that lunch wagon and get us a couple of containers of coffee. Okay, but... Hey, hold it, Brooksy. Huh? That little black truck over there. They're loading something into it. Cleopatra's secret. Hey, you see any name on the truck? I can't. Oh, no, there isn't any name. Oh, I should have known better than to ask. They would have thought of that. Okay, take it away. Brooksy, we're off again. We'll keep a good half a block behind them, just like this. Darling, I never want to see another warehouse as long as I live. They could at least put some lights in the windows. Yeah, and some fluffy organy curtains. The only light I'm interested in right now, Angel, is that little red one up ahead. It's turning the corner. Hey, a dead-end street, no truck. But we were right behind them. Truck can't just disappear into thin air. There's only one warehouse on this whole street. Yeah, and it's all boarded up. Hey, that big overhead door could have been up. Just waiting for that truck to get in and then close down. Well, I can't think of any other explanation except magic. Yeah, well, we're not going to go ringing any doorbells and tip our mitt. <laughs> Look out! Anyway, we're getting out of here. That shot came from that warehouse. This is getting monotonous. Being used for clay pigeons twice in two days. Hey, Brooksy. Yes? Take a good look at that street sign under the lamp and yes. remember it. Listen to this, Brooksy, all the dope on that warehouse on Barrow Street. It's owned by the Fallon Trading Company. So? And the officers and stockholders of Fallon are the same as those of the late Kessling Limited, including the very kindly Mr. Kessling Laura told us about. George, I can't make head or tails out of this. Why would they go and buy up all that old worthless face powder? I don't have the answer, Brooksy, but maybe Laura has. That's why we're going over and see her right now. Laura! 
happened to you? Uh, I don't know, really. Claire, something hit me. Well, didn't you see who it was? No, I, I was sitting here waiting for a call from you. and Then I, I don't remember anything except waking up on the floor. George, this place is in a shower. Well, they didn't take anything. What's that? No, I, I looked all around. My pocketbook with almost $100 in it. Oh, my jewelry. Oh, that's still there on the dresser. Uh-huh. Oh, what about Joe? Tell me what that doctor friend of yours said. Did he think there was any hope? Of course there's hope. You've got to believe that. There's every hope, Laura. But tell me something. Where did you put that box of face powder Joe gave you? Powder? Yes, yes, you remember. You told us about it. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I just opened it and then I put it in that drawer over there. Yeah, I'm sure of it. It isn't here now. Laura, listen. That firm Joe worked for was a smuggling ring. Diamonds. What are you saying? Joe'd never be mixed up in anything like that. I didn't say he was. But as far as we know, there could have been a fortune in gems in that box of powder he gave you in the one moment Dr. Tarouk left you two alone. What does all this have to do with Joe? That's all I care about. George, you don't think the sanitarium, the auction sale, the warehouse, all that was a part of a search for something that was here all the time? Oh, Claire, I'm tired of guessing. I feel like a dime being pushed around on a shuffleboard. What do you mean? Somebody is in an awful hurry about getting something done, trying to meet a deadline. What about Joe? That's what makes me think. Taruk wasn't too worried about me bringing in another doctor to look at Joe. How does visit prove that? The important thing was to keep me from snooping around, interfering with their schedule. That was the reason for the double talk with Rodney and the pot shot at us. What schedule, George? What are you talking about? Something's coming off and coming off soon. Look, stay here with Laura, Angel. I've developed a sudden interest in boats. Incoming and outgoing. Oh, you again, Valentine. Yeah, Craven, the custom service and I are getting to be just like that. I'll be right with you as soon as I clear this manifesto. All right, Daugherty, you can put that shipment through. Right. Hey, look, fella, this is really important, and time is what we don't have the most of. Huh? Oh, if you've still got that Kessling deal on no, your mind, No, no, I... no. Same people, but a different name. As far as you know, is there anything coming through for the company known as uh, Farland Trading? No, I don't know, but I can soon find out. Here, just a minute. Here, Farland. Well... No, I don't see anything. Are yet. you sure? Everything points. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, here it is. I missed it because the boat's already in. Uh huh. Tank it out there in the harbor. Has the cargo been cleared yet? No, that's scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, what's Farland bringing in? Uh, three crates of powdered cocoa beans from the West Indies. Shipping in on the Pandora, Peruvian registry. Captain Martin. No, no, we can skip that, Craven. How soon can we get out to the Pandora? Why tomorrow? We'll I be told unloaded. you, Kessling and Farland are one and the same trading company. Hey, I think I see what you mean, Valentine. We'll take a speedboat, get right out there to the Pandora. Ahoy there! Custom service, Captain, we're coming aboard. Come on, Valentine. Yeah, what can I do for you? I thought you weren't ready for us until tomorrow. Yeah, something special turned up, Skipper. Yeah, specifically powdered cocoa beans from Farland Company. Mm, Wait, good Lord, this trip. Those are some of their crates right here on deck. Okay, let's try this one for a start. Oh, Say, what are you fellas looking for anyway? Carrots, Captain. Huh? Are you kidding? Diamonds, Captain. Oh, now, you feel around that side, Valentine. I'll take this. Okay. Farland, eh? I thought I knew them all. That's new one on me. All right, Craven. Here we are. Huh? Yeah, it's a beauty, too. Take a look at it. Hey! Oh, nice size. I wonder how many more we're going to find. Oh, just enough, but not too many. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, look, Craven. Can I take a sample of this cocoa? Just enough for a cup, let's say? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Help yourself. I doubt if they'll miss it when we auction the stuff off. Uh, thanks again for the tip, Valentine. Oh, you're very welcome. But... Don't be surprised if I get in touch with you again. Well, Mr. Ross, what's the verdict? What does the chemical analysis show? <laughs> Powdered cocoa, huh? Oh, never mind the suspense. What did you find? Oh, there is cocoa here, all right, but mixed with something that sells for roughly $7,000 a pound. Dope. $7,000 a pound. No wonder Kessling and the boys could afford to use diamonds for window dressing. Uh, what's that? Oh, it'd take too long to explain. Thanks. 
And remind me to submit your name for the Nobel Prize. What do you want, Valentine? Out of my way, Rodney. You can't go in there. Nobody sees Burke. Dr. Taruk's orders. You're a sucker for Taruk's orders, aren't you? Uh. You shouldn't have missed me when you took a shot at my car on the road yesterday. Huh? I was just waiting for that big yap to open like that so I could... Do it right, Hello, Rodney. What is all this? Greetings, Dr. Taruk. What have you done, Mr. Valentine? The scene should speak for itself. And if you don't want to join Rodney, you'll just sit right down on that bench. Maybe you should be a patient here, Mr. Valentine. Oh, yeah, sure. I got a persecution complex. I can't rest. I can't sleep. I see things. Have bad dreams. I'm afraid there's no hope for me until I hear you and your friends try to explain more than a million bucks worth of dope. I... I... I have nothing to say. When the police and the customs men get here, Dr. Taruk, you'll have plenty to say. Oh, can you beat that, Valentine? Using diamonds for a smokescreen. Yep, Craven, that was the racket. They plant the diamonds, not too expensive ones, of course, in case the shipment is open. If they're found, nobody looks any further. And they pay the fine. And they buy up the supposedly worthless stuff at the auction for peanuts and make themselves a million. Uh, tell me, uh, how did that friend of yours in the sanitarium fit into all this, Valentine? Well, as I get it, Joe found out what Kessling was doing and was going to talk. All that stuff about an accident in Egypt was a bunk. Now, they gave him a brutal going over. When he came out of it, he had what a psychiatrist so pompously called functional neuroses induced by severe blows on the head. Of course, they probably meant to kill him. Sure, but why take chances? There might be investigations. Now, they figured it was better this way. Taruk could see to it that Joe didn't snap out of it until this shipment came through, then they'd all take it on the lam. That was their deadline. <laughs> Well, how do you like your new barracks, soldier? Oh, don't try too hard to talk, Joe. We always used to understand each other without too many words. I don't know how we'll ever be able to thank you and Claire. Dr. Hunter says Joe's going to be all right. Uh, George, what about that wedding present? You know, the one the best man forgot to give? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, Joe. You and Laura ran out on me so fast that day in camp, I didn't get a chance to give you the usual set of doilies or a percolator or something. Well, uh, now he can at least be the messenger of some good news that may make up for that. This customs man told us. It says right in the book, anyone instrumental in thwarting a smuggling attempt is entitled to 25% of what the Treasury gets on dutiable goods. Yeah. And those diamonds don't come cheap, you know. That's right, Joe. You're really the guy who was uh, instrumental. <laughs> at ease, soldier. Hey, you know, Brooksy, this time I'm sure he winked. <laughs> Now, a message of importance to motorists. It's a safe bet that along with these first days of spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love, but it's also a safe bet that every motorist's fancy has already turned to thoughts of the open road. If you're making weekend trips at this season with frequent starts and stops for the family car, here's something worth knowing. When you've got Chevron Supreme gasoline in your tank, you get instant action every time you press the starter. It's a premium gasoline that's tailored to the season of the year and to each different altitude zone in the West. Besides saving you a lot of grinding, starting wear, Chevron Supreme gives your car speedy pickup in your stop-and-go traffic, and it assures full power for rugged hill climbing. Best of all, you're never far from Chevron Supreme gasoline. Throughout the West, you can get it at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations, where they say and mean... We'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Well, here we are. Now, out you go, Brooksy. You know what you're supposed to do. Yes, George. But you don't know what you're asking of me. That Rene woman brings out the fishwife in me. Anything can happen. Well, go on now, Angel. That gal in there didn't tell us half what she really knows. Maybe because you do rub her the wrong way, we can find out some more. Well, okay. So good to me. Well, 
Alpha Rene. I wish I'd let my fingernails grow. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Paul Fries, Jack Crucian, Dick Ryan, Herb Vigran, and Joe Duvall. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of Standard Stations and independent Chevron gas stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you have something that must be handled with complete confidence, then you need me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine... Hatred between brothers is an old and tragic story. More tragic in my case because in all the years we haven't seen each other, my brother Phil hasn't been exactly a model of virtue. I feel I'm at least partially responsible and I'd like to make it up to him somehow. I think I finally succeeded. Finally succeeded in locating him, but at this point I need your help. You can reach me at the Hotel Stapleton. It's signed, Sincerely Yours, Martin Bettner. Hmm. Gosh, I think in a way this is, well, touching. One brother realizing his error and trying oh, to... Oh, Brooksy, you're a dyed-in-the-wool sentimentalist. I bet you still have your first doll and your first dance program stashed away somewhere. Yes, along with some other sentimental relics I've collected since I met you. Oh? A blackjack, an old and faded poison pen letter, one sawed-off <laughs> touché, shotgun... Touche, Angel, touche. <laughs> now, what do you say we call this Mr. Bettner at the Stapleton and see just what he has on his mind? I called you in, Mr. Valentine, because, well, in a way, you're my neighbor. Uh, what do you mean by that, Mr. Bettner? Well, look here, uh, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. Yes? Uh, here in the personal notice column in the paper, your ad is just under mine. Oh, yes, now I remember your ad. You've been running this for a week or so. That's right, Miss Brooks. Oh, I just didn't tie it up with your letter. Oh, let me see that. Uh, Philip, let's forget the past. If you'll meet me halfway, we can make up for all that bitterness. Uh, there's even a place waiting for you in the family business. I'm at the stable in Martin Bettner. You said you'd located your brother, Mr. Bettner. He must have gotten in touch with you. I said I think I've located my brother. But if Phil has seen my ad, uh, he hasn't answered it. I got only one reply from a uh, Renee Clemens. Uh, take a look at it, Mr. Valentine. Huh? What does it say, George? Uh-huh. Well, it seems Miss Clemens knows where Phil Bettner, quote, the rat, unquote, is now holed up. She's willing to part with that information for a price for you to be arrived at. Well, what's the problem, Bettner? Well, back in Waynesville, I know my way around, but here in this town, I'm like a fish out of water. Back home, I've got my own hardware business. I know everybody to look at, and they know me, but here it's different. Oh, I see. Well, why don't you just drive the best bargain you can with this gal, pay her off with a dated check, then see if her information is the real thing. Oh, it, it isn't just the money. I don't know the kind of people Phil's been associating with in the last five years. This could be some kind of trap. Feel an awful lot better if you came along with me to see this, Miss Clemens. All right, good enough. But look, Bettner, you've been hinting that your brother has been operating a little on the uh, shady side. Well, I'm afraid so. Well, then the police could tell you where he was, just like that, if you got in touch with them. I checked. Phil has no police record, thank heavens. He's been mixed up in gambling, mostly horse racing, and so far he's been lucky. Two weeks ago, some people in Detroit told me he left for here, and that's all I know. Well, assuming Miss Clemens is a local girl, your 
brother must have worked pretty fast to make such a, an indelible impression in two weeks. I don't know what to think. But I've got to find Phil and talk to him. Well, first, let's have a talk with Renee. She may know whereof she speaks, but I'm afraid her price won't be reasonable. <laughs> It'll cost you 500 bucks. Now, wait a minute, sister. The name is Miss Clemens. And I should up the price, seeing that all of a sudden I'm dealing with three people. Uh, please, Miss Clemens, I asked Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, to come along with me. 500 bucks. But Mr. Bettner only wants his brother's address. He doesn't want to make a down payment on the house. Oh, I see we've got a Vassar girl here. All right, ladies, enough of this banter. The price is too high, Miss Clemens. Sorry. Come on, Bettner. Yes, Let's get I... going. Uh, no, uh, wait a minute. Well, what uh, kind of a deal would you go for? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll be lavish with Mr. Bettner's money. Two fifty cash. I have that much right here with me. What do you say? Well, Miss Brooks still doesn't seem to approve of the price. <laughs> All I can say is you're lucky you're dealing with men. Yeah, some girls are lucky to have what it takes to get what they want. All you've got is an address, and it's not even your own. Listen here, you Break little... clean, girls. Two hundred and fifty dollars, Miss Clemens. All right. Let's have it. Certainly. Here you are. Now, where can I find my brother? It's 356 Moreno Street. A grimy, broken-down rooming house. It's so dark you need a seeing-eyed dog to get up the stairs. I got you. Just a cottage small by a waterfall. Thanks. We'll find our way. Just be sure you tell him Rene sent you. <laughs> I wish I could be there to see the look on his face. Well, if you know Philip is so dead set against getting in touch with me, why are you doing this? Mm, let's be charitable and... Say, I wouldn't mind if he dropped dead. And it'd be a pleasure to spend the 250 bucks on flowers for his funeral. Oh, I knew she had a kind heart. Well, we may as well be going, Valentine. I know if I can just speak to Phil, everything will be all right. Yeah, 356 Reno Street, eh, Miss Clemens? You heard me. That better be Phil Bettner's place. Or you'll find his brother is just an Indian giver. Get what I mean? This is it. Number seven. He's got his card tacked up on the door. Hmm. Philip Bettner. Investments. Huh. Who's kidding whom? Oh, this is worse than I thought. Oh, looks like nobody's home. We'll wait right here till he comes back. I don't think that'll be very comfortable. Uh, do you mind paying for a lock, Bettner? What? What do you mean, George? Just this. <laughs> wait a minute. Please sit down. Phew. Oh, golly, where's the window? This place hasn't been aired out in a week. <laughs> the eternal feminine. I I don't know what I'll say to Philip. I don't want to hurt his pride. Uh-huh. What have you got there, Valentine? Well, it looks like this desk is your brother's investment office. His favorite and only investment being horses. I knew it was something like that. What's up, darling? December 20th, $2,000, Henning. January 3rd, 3500 Henning, et cetera, et cetera. And all to Henning. What's that supposed to mean? No wonder your brother Phil is living in a dump like this. From the way this stacks up, he owes about 25 grand to Lou Henning. Oh, George. Wait a minute, Angel. You see, Bettner, this character Lou Henning is the big shot bookie in this town. You don't go around owing him 25,000 bucks for too long. Oh. George, please. I was just trying to explain to Bettner. What's the matter with you, Brooksy? That. that red spot under the closet door. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? What's wrong? Yeah, it's all dried up. Blood, George? It's not red ink. Well, do you think that... Could be. Henning has his own way of collecting debts. Well, there's one sure way to find out. <gasps> yeah. That's not Phil. Who is it? This, my friend, is Lou Henning. Just about as dead as you can get with a knife stuck in your back. Phil wouldn't do a thing like this. He might have been a lot of things, but he's not a killer. I wouldn't know, Brooksy. Yes, George. There's no phone here. Beat it down the corner and call Lieutenant Johnson. Oh, I won't mind getting out of here at all. Valentine, couldn't we close that closet door? Sorry. From now on, we can't touch anything. Oh. I, uh, I suppose the police will just take it for granted that Phil did this killing. What would you think in their place? I guess you're right. Now, but... look, Bettner, I'm not saying your brother did this. But as soon as Henning's mob finds out what's happened, they're going to jump to their own conclusions. 
What I'm trying to say is, let's hope the police find him first. I see. Uh, Valentine. Yeah? You're still working for me, aren't you? I was, but things are a little different now. No, they aren't. You You still have to find my oh, brother. Hold on, wait a find minute. Find him before he's shot down in cold blood. But the police, at least, will have a chance to explain all this, if there is an explanation. You're putting me on a tight rope, Betna. The police on one side, Henning's boys on the other. If it's a question of money, whatever you Looks say... Looks like I... Henning's been in that closet a couple of days. It's not going to be easy picking up your brother's trail. I'm not asking you to promise me anything, but, but try, will you? Okay. Okay, it's a deal. But if Henning's mob gets to Phil first, that Clemens dame will be spending that two fifty on flowers for your brother's funeral. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about gears. Most folks just couldn't say whether the gears in their cars are spur, worm, spiral, or hypoid, but the men at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations know the minute you drive in. And because there are so many different kinds of gears in today's cars, all these service stations carry a variety of lubricants to meet their special needs. RPM lubricants. Each one tailor-made to carry away heat, to keep gears shifting easily, to do a better wear-saving job. Make sure you get an RPM lubricant next time you get that 5,000-mile change for your transmission and differential gears. While you're at the independent Chevron gas station or standard station, ask for a free copy of Batter Up, the new illustrated handbook on baseball. It's a gift to you from the service stations that say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Am I my brother's keeper? Martin Bettner thought so, and hired George to help him locate his black sheep brother, Philip. But when they arrived in Phil Bettner's room, they found a body in the closet. The body of Lou Henning, a big shot bookie. George has just sent Claire to the corner drugstore to call Lieutenant Johnson. Be reasonable, Bettner. I promised you I'd look for your brother, but I can't leave until Lieutenant Johnson gets here. He's going to have an awful lot of questions to ask. But Phil won't have a chance if Lou Henning's men get to him first. You said so yourself. I know, I know. All right, there's one thing I will do, though. Make a phone call. I think I know just the character who might be able to give me a lead on Phil. I'll be back in a few minutes. Oh, uh, say, I, I just remembered. I think I saw a phone down in the hall when we came in. You could have thought of that before. <laughs> I wouldn't be calling you, Art Bose, if I wasn't willing to pay for the information. Yeah, the name's Bettner, Phil Bettner. Doesn't mean anything to you, huh? Now look, Art Bose, you're my favorite pawnbroker. You know everything that goes on in this part of town. He's probably hiding out. Okay, I'll drop around your place in an hour or so. Out. Hey, what goes here? Hey, Bettner, open the door so we can have some light out here in the hall, will you? Come on, before I break my neck. Na- Hold up. Wait a minute. I... Oh! Yeah. Now, you stay right there by the head of the stairs, George, till I put on this light. Never mind that angel. Open the door. George! Uh, Mr. Bettner, he's... Yeah. Looks like he got the same treatment I did. Hey, see how he is, will you, Brooksy? I couldn't bend down now to pick up a $1,000 bill. Mr. Bettner. Mr. Bettner, are you all right? Oh. Good. At least he's making a noise. George, he was knocked out, too. Uh, it it was Phil. I, I was standing there, and he... He came in the door and then... Let me help you get up, Mr. Bettner. Yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Are you sure it was Phil? I... I tried to talk to him, but... He picked up that desk lamp and hit me with it. You better sit down. Thank you. Your brother. So that's the one who threw me down the stairs. 
Why did he come back? What was he looking for? Valentine, at least we know that Phil can't be very far from here. That should help you find him. I mean, you're still interested in finding that brother of yours? He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't even give me a chance to talk to him. You stay here in the hall, Hennessy. Okay, let's go. Say, what is this? The St. James Infirmary? Oh, Lieutenant Johnson. Yeah, I get your point, Lieutenant. Bettany here and I took a little of the worse for the wear. But we managed to outlive the corpse. Where is it, Valentine? Over there. Yeah, what do you know? It is Henny. Let you in on a little secret, Miss Brooks. I didn't believe you when you called me. Why do you think I kept screaming at you over the phone? Ah. Uh, oh, Hennessy. Yeah, Lieutenant? Get the fingerprint, boys, and the photographer, and we'll go to work. Yes, sir. Still can't believe it. Believe what? Lou Henning with his $25 silk shirts, and look at him. Pulled it up like a jackknife in the bottom of a closet in a crummy rooming house and killed by a cheap little gambler. Oh, Lieutenant, I don't think you heard. This is Philip Bettner's brother, Martin. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. Lieutenant, I, I know there's only one thing you can think, but I still insist my brother didn't kill this man. Look, I may as well tell you, Mr. Bettner, we've got a general alarm out for your brother. Yes? I suppose, as usual, Mr. Valentine, you've got an altogether different theory about this thing. On the contrary, Lieutenant. I'm in complete agreement with you for once. Well, we dropped Bettner off safely at the Stapleton, and I bought you a nice, juicy hamburger. So now... Out you go, Brooksy. You know what you're supposed to do. Yes, George. But you don't know what you're asking of me. Rene brings out the fishwife in me. The Black Mariah will be taking us both away. Go on, now, Angel. That gal in there didn't tell us half what she really knows. Maybe because you do rub her the wrong way, we can find out some more. Well, okay. And when you're through, wait for me in the lobby of the stapler. Mm-hmm. If I don't get there, I'll give you a call. Mm-hmm. He's so good to me. Well, now for Rene. Wish I'd let my fingernails grow. Uh, yes, miss? What, but... Well, well. Now all you have to do is whistle. Yeah? And I'll send you my grandfather's OU kid button. Huh? Oh, never mind, Bogart. Get on your switchboard and call Miss Clemens. Tell her I'm coming up to see her. Sorry, miss. She just left. Um... I'll be leaving in an hour myself. Does that uh, mean anything to you? Listen, Junior. Did Miss Clemens say where she was going, and was there anybody with her? Sorry, I don't know a thing about the affairs of our tenants. Oh, I get it. Oh, now a bright, good-looking boy like you must notice everything. I could tell that the way you looked at me as soon as I came in. Well, knowing yourself as you do, can you blame me, Clemens? Oh, if you keep saying those things, you're going to spoil me, sure thing. <laughs> uh, the name's Tommy. Yes, Thomas. Now, about Miss Clemens. Uh, she left about five minutes before you came in. She had a couple of bags with her. She was with a big, tall guy. Yes, Tommy? He had kind of wavy hair, and I, I think she called him Phil. Huh? Oh, that's fine, Tommy. That's just what I wanted to know. How can I ever thank you? Well, I told you I'll be off in an hour. Uh, uh, say, uh, wait, uh, what was your name again? I'll mail it to you on your 21st birthday. And that's a promise, Tommy. <laughs> Now, look, Advos, why are you making like a clam all of a sudden? <laughs> Is that what I was doing? Oh, don't give me that. You've been selling information about people for years. Why the sudden... Oh, I get it. You already know about Lou Henning. Uh, who doesn't? Now, look, Valentine. Why don't you forget you ever heard of Phil Bettner? If I'm afraid to talk to you, who will? <laughs> Side pocket, three ball. Uh, sorry to interrupt your pool game, friend, but Whitey Sanderson said you might know where I might find Phil. Look, brother, you're a stranger to me. Let's keep it that way. Okay, boys, here's the last race. Hialeah. Queen Meg. Win, 880, place 663, 40 for show. Say, mister, hey, tell me you're looking for information. Who tells you? Oh, word gets around. It's about PB, ain't it? Yeah, that's right. Got anything I can use? If you're willing to pay for it. 
What do you say we step out here? All right, come on, Gib. You know, you took the words right out of my mouth, mister. Okay, okay, mister. Here's five tens. And don't try chiseling for more because it won't work. I wouldn't do this to my best friend, except I had a bad day at the track. Never mind that. Now, where do I find Phil Bettner? Twenty-two and a half Jackson Place. <laughs> Okay, Valentine. I got your call. Where's Phil Bettner? Uh, mm. Yeah, Lieutenant, that's your boy. What's left of him? So Henning's mob did catch up with him first. That's about as neat a job as I've ever seen. Yeah. It's been right cozy sitting here waiting for you. I know. You lead an awful tough life, Valentine. Look, we're going to get him down to the morgue. You get his brother down there to identify him. Yeah, I'll do that. You don't mind if I make a telephone call first. What for? I promised Brooksy faithfully I wouldn't leave her sitting in that lobby all night. Up. Then I suppose what I wanted to tell you isn't too important now. Rene left her apartment with Phil a few hours ago. Yeah, yeah, but look, Angel, tell Martin Bettner to meet me at headquarters. He has to identify his brother. But don't tell him why. I'll take care of that myself. Well, sorry, George, you're going to have to call him yourself. Huh? I just saw something walk across the lobby, and I'm going to follow what it. What are you talking about? Tell you about it later, Angel. I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Going somewhere, Miss Clemens? Oh, the Vassar girl again. Yeah. Now, look, dearie, how about you and me going to the morgue together? What are you talking about? Oh, they'll probably want to ask you some questions about Phil. And I'd hate to see you take this bus and have to come all the way back. I'm taking this bus. You're just making things very difficult. And what are you going to do about it? Oh, I'm just going to tear your hair out and scream all over the place. Then they'll slap us both in jail for disorderly conduct. And the jail is right next door to the morgue. You wouldn't dare. Oh, no? Ah! Stop it! Hmm? Okay, you win. I knew you'd be reasonable. Where's that client of yours anyway, Valentine? Please, Lieutenant, be compassionate. Yeah. I just told Bettner his brother's lying here in the morgue. He's having a cup of black coffee. He'll be here in a minute. Oh. Uh, Swanson. Yes, Lieutenant? Got the tag on Bettner all filled out? Just got through making it out. Bettner, Philip, age 36, Caucasian, height 6 foot 2, weight 190, identifying marks of any... Right arm withered, appendicitis scar, port wine birthmark of the left knee. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Where have you got him? Down the aisle there, number 302. Yeah. When you get through identifying him, let me know and I'll put him away. Come on, Valentine. Hmm? Oh, sure, sure, that's right. Now, don't tell me this place is getting you down. A tough-minded character like you. Oh, no, no, I was just thinking. Yeah, let's see, 302. Right down there, sir. I think they're waiting for you now. Hmm? Thank you. Oh, there's Bettner now. Yeah. Are you okay now? Yes, I I think so. Could we make this as quick as possible? I know, I, I know, of course. Just necessary routine. Here. Is this your brother? Yes, that's Phil. Well, that's all there is to it, Mr. Bettner. We'll just put the sheet back over. Lieutenant Johnson, he's down there, miss, but... Uh, wait a minute, Can I miss. Can this way, Miss Clemens? Now what gives? Yeah, what is it, Brooksy? Look who I found, George. Well, we meet again, Miss Clemens. So that's what you saw walking across the lobby. Who's this? She's the young lady who gave us the information about my brother. Oh. Well, you might as well identify him, too, miss. Just for the record. Oh, oh Phil. Phil. I... Yes, that clinches it. I tried to tell him he wouldn't have a chance against Henning, but he wouldn't listen to me. How am I going to go on without him? 
I can't. Isn't this a sudden reversal, Miss Clemens? Not long ago, you were willing to sell him out to his brother for $250. Yes, and even spend that money on flowers for his funeral. What's that? I didn't know what I was saying. I was sore. I, I guess I loved him too much. He said he was going to walk out on me. and I, I, Well, that's why I answered that ad of yours, Mr. Bettner. It doesn't really matter now, does it? Lieutenant Johnson, I suppose I can call down here and make all the necessary arrangements about the body. Just talk to Swanson, that's all. I'd like Phil to be buried in Waynesville in the family plot. Don't worry about a thing. You don't look too well. You better get back to your hotel, get some rest. I'll see you about the bill before I leave, Valentine. Oh, we won't have to wait for it that long. I got it for you right now. Hey, Valentine! Hey, 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 hey. What are you doing? Yes, I didn't make myself very clear. Oh, John, um, did you hurt what's him? What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? Come on, come on. Get up, Edna. Hey, what's the idea? Uh-huh. A nice 38 you're packing, bub. Is this what you mean by the hardware business? Well, are I... you going to do some talking, or do I have to knock your ears off with this gun? Phil, don't let him. Shut up, you fool. Yes, baby. It is Phil. What's that? Then who's this guy on the slab? Martin Bettner, I think, huh, George? Right, Brooksy. Now, what do you got to say to that, Phil? Nothing. Okay, then I'll put the words in your mouth. You had a fight with Henning and you killed him. You knew that between the police and Henning's boys, you were as good as dead. Oh, Phil. But you also knew your brother, Martin, was in town looking for you, the brother you always hated. So you got in touch with him, killed him in gangster style in that room on Jackson Place. Then hired me for this fancy runaround. You don't know what you're talking about. It's beginning to make sense to me. Go on, Valentine. You outsmarted yourself, Phil. You should never have put that light out and throw me down those stairs. You see, that's something Martin couldn't have done in a million years. Why, Why what do you see for yourself? About... His right arm. We heard the report of Swanson. There was nothing wrong with Phil. But Martin Bettner had a withered arm. Oh, I wonder, Brooksy... Why is it that when brothers hate each other, it's worse than all the Hatfields and the McCoys locked in one closet? Didn't you suspect anything about Phil before Swanson read that tag at the morgue? Well, when that character in the bookie joint sidled up, volunteering information, it was a little too good to be true. You mean Phil planted him there? Uh-huh. But, sweet face, blood is thicker than water. Brothers should love each other. Well, I, I thought it was pretty unfeminine for Renee to rat on Phil one moment, then leave with him the way Tommy told me she did. You didn't even listen to me, did you, when I was telling you about that on the phone? Well, uh, maybe with one ear. Then when I saw her in the lobby of the same hotel where Martin was staying, well, I had a hunch, too. Oh, of course, it wasn't one of those scientific hunches you get. Yeah, yeah. But about brothers, Brooksy, do you think it's familiarity that sometimes breeds such man? Oh, not necessarily. Now, look at husbands and wives. Huh? They go on for years and years living together, oh. and, well, they never think of murdering each other. <laughs> oh, Brooksy, you just haven't lived. And now, a message of importance to motorists. Can you imagine our friend George Valentine driving into a station and saying his car needed oil? Uh-uh. You wouldn't catch George that way. He'd be sure to specify RPM motor oil, the great modern lubricant that's tailor-made to keep cars young. of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If the trouble you're in is way off the beaten track and you need help that's strictly confidential, you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear sir, you employed the word confidential in your advertisement. Uh, well, I need confidential help. My enthusiasm for birds has led me into a predicament. I was watching starlings, but I saw something that was never meant to be seen, and it keeps haunting me, if I really saw it, unless my eyes deceive me. My eyes deceive me? I was the witness, the only witness, to an outrageous crime. There's nothing more I can say in a letter. Please contact me at once, and it's signed Elliot, 
Wormsley. <laughs> Wormsley. That sounds like a name on a Dickens. Elliot Wormsley, MS, PhD, Statistical Services, Baxter Building. Birdwatcher, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of canaries is this statistician interested in anyway? Oh, stop kidding, George. <laughs> That's a pretty grim phrase. I was the only witness to an outrageous crime. Yeah, and he's in a predicament. That's a twist. What was it he could have seen? I don't know, Brooksy, but let's see what we can see. Let's drop in on Dr. Wormsley. <laughs> These are the binoculars, Mr. Valentine. Uh, the ones I use to watch starlings on that penthouse roof down there. Uh-huh. But that's almost three blocks away, Dr. Wormsley. Yeah, I know. The river house, huh? Pretty swanky. Golly, George. You can see halfway around the world with these binoculars. All right, Angel. Stop playing. Uh, back to you, Dr. Wormsley. So you looked for starlings and saw a killer hawk. Eh? Uh, something like that, Mr. Valentine. Okay. Now, just what was this outrageous crime? What did you see that you shouldn't have seen? Uh, murder. I guess I dropped your binoculars, Doctor. Did you say murder? Uh, I, I can't be sure. Uh, but I just trained my eyes down there, as I've been doing for weeks. And in that instant, I'm almost certain I saw a man push another man off the roof. Uh, of course, he had his back to me. What do you mean, almost certain, Dr. Wormsley? Well, it, it, it was over in a second. And I, I didn't expect to see what I think I saw. Besides, uh, statistics show that the element of error in visualization over a hundred yards is 14 to a thousand. Yeah, well, we'll take your word for that. But why didn't you go to the police with this story? Oh, no, no, Mr. Valentine. I'm a modest man, and I don't like publicity. Besides, I'm coming up for the presidency of my club. And, uh, well, so many people think bird watching is, uh, well, uh, a little peculiar. Yes, I know. You wouldn't make it. But murder is a very serious business. Uh, Mr. Valentine... If I had seen any mention of what I suspected in the newspapers, I would have volunteered this information to the police. But as it is, no crime has been reported. Well, that's right, George. I didn't see anything about it. Still, the picture of those two men keeps haunting me. I I'm thinking of my reputation, but I, I do have some public spirit, and I have to make sure. My conscience wouldn't let me rest if I didn't. Oh, I see. And you want me to check at the River House and soothe your conscience? Uh, that's it, young man, precisely. It uh, shouldn't take you more than a day, and I'm uh, willing to pay your usual fee. <laughs> okay, it's a deal, Wormsley. Oh, Brooksy. Yes, George? Just on a hunch, get out of the Bureau of Missing Persons. See Finley. Okay. Find out if anybody's been reported missing from the River House. Uh, you will keep my name out of this, won't you? Oh, yes, we'll do our best, Professor. I'll meet you back here later, Brooksy. Okay, George. I'm going over to the River House. <laughs> Oh, you're very fortunate, Mr. Valentine. Penthouse B is vacant, and it's only $5,400 a year. Yeah, a point of information, Mr. Stevens. As I get it, the uh, sun deck of this wing facing the river is for the exclusive use of Penthouse A and B. Oh, it's very private. And Penthouse A is occupied by the Dunlaps, Philip Dunlap, the broker. So that would put you in very good company, and only $5,400 a year. Well, I was thinking of something a little better, but uh, I'll let you know. and rang my doorbell. Wouldn't be the full of brush man, would you? <laughs> Not unless my samples are showing. <laughs> well, come on in anyway. I hope you'll pardon the sunsuit. I wasn't expecting company. Oh, it's nothing at all. <laughs> I mean, practically. I was out on the roof sunbathing. Uh, I'm Mrs. Dunlap. That's right. Well, I'm the chap. It's been a dull afternoon. Suppose we wait a while before you tell me what you want. Hmm? Well, as a matter of fact... You aren't going to stand there, are you? Here, sit down. <clears throat> Uh, the truth is, Mrs. Dunlap, I may be your next-door neighbor in Penthouse B. Oh? Well, that would be the first improvement they've made in River House without raising our rent. <laughs> I thought it'd be a nice gesture to sort of drop in on my possible neighbors and introduce myself. Hmm. There is a Mr. Dunlap, isn't there? Uh, yes, but you needn't worry about him. He hasn't been home for two days. Oh, just like that, huh? Well, that's Philip for you. <laughs> Thank heavens. He must have decided to go up to our cabin in the mountains to brood. Or he may be staying at his club. Mm. But as I said, this looked like a dull afternoon. We're not going to let it be one, are we? Ah. Uh. Oh, fine. That wouldn't be Philip. He has his key. Well, whoever it is, just explain I'm looking at the penthouse next door. 
hotel. Listen, Paula, we haven't heard from Philip yet, and there are letters and contracts he has to sign downtown. All right, Hal, I'm not my husband's keeper. Oh, just the same, I thought you might be worried. Oh. Oh, I didn't know you were having company. Well, this gentleman may be our next-door neighbor, I hope. Uh, Mr. The name's Valentine. Really, Paula? At least now you know his name. Oh, Mr. Valentine, this intense young man is my husband's secretary, Hal Sterrett. How do you do? I don't know what you're going to do, Paula, but I'm going to call the police and report Philip missing. Please do that, Hal. I'd feel so much better. Lord, how I hate righteous men, especially when they're young. So petulant. Well, where were we, Mr. Valentine? Uh, I was just about to leave. Uh, A mood is a very fragile thing, isn't it? (laughs) Oh, you've been right neighborly, Mm ma'am. Goodbye. I don't think it's goodbye. Anyway, it was very nice even not having known you. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine. Mm. Oh, Dr. Wormsley. I, I was waiting for you to come out of the river house. But why? I thought you made it a point you were to be the unknown factor in this deal. Uh, well, uh, after you left, I, I did some calculating. Yeah, good for you, good for you. There must be a way of getting into this empty lot without climbing over that fence. And in my calculations, I, I discovered that the odds against anything as extraordinary as this happening to an ordinary man like me would be about uh, uh, 14,000 to one. Mm, you don't say. Uh, so if you don't mind, Mr. Valentine, I'd, I'd sort of like to uh, tag along with you and see if I'm uh, really that one in 14,000. Uh-huh. Looks as though there's a gate in this fence. If we can get these dash cans out of the way... Hey, Brooksy, you should have brought a friend. We'd have a fourth for bridge. Oh, oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Oh, George, there's been no report of anyone missing in this district. Oh, thanks. I was on my way to your office, Dr. Wormsley, when I saw you heading for the river house. So here I am. Well, kids, let's see what we shall see. It's just an overgrown lot. Uh, That's right. George, you think that if Dr. Wormsley is right, the man would be... Nothing like checking, Brooksy. Dr. Dr. Wormsley, you did say that when you saw a man pushing another one off the roof, his back was towards you? If I saw what I thought I saw. That's right. Uh Uh-huh. That would mean he was facing away from you, toward the river. Uh, Yes, yes. Well, there's the river behind that high-board fence. And on this side of the building, there are only the windows and the elevator shafts and the stairway. So no one would have seen him fall. Mr. Valentine, over here, over here, look. That's a man. I mean, it was. Uh Uh-huh. Past tense is putting it my way. Oh, George. Then it, it, it wasn't my imagination after all. No. No, Dr. Wormsley, it wasn't. And just to quote a few more odds, it's at least a million to one this is the body of Philip Dunlap. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about the great American pastime. If you're a baseball fan, check these two tips for getting the most out of this season. Number one, when you're driving to and from the game, use fast-starting Chevron Supreme gasoline. Special blending agents in Chevron Supreme give your car speedy warm-up and quick pickup for traffic getaways. And when it comes to hill climbing, premium quality Chevron Supreme gasoline takes you smoothly over the steepest ones. Number two, At independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where you can get Chevron Supreme gasoline, there's a grand gift for you. It's a 48-page book about baseball written by Bert Dunn. You'll find in your free copy of Batter Up the fundamentals about this great American sport. One illustrated section shows how to play each different position. Ask for a free copy of Batter Up tomorrow. It's yours at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean... We'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. It's only natural for a member of the Bird Watcher Society, even when he's a professional statistician like Dr. Wormsley, to be watching starlings on a penthouse roof. But when instead his binoculars reveal one man pushing another off that selfsame roof... Well, that's just sort of a case George would get involved in. It's about an hour since George found Philip Dunlap's body in the weed-covered lot back of the apartment building. 
And now we join George and Claire talking to Lieutenant Riley at Homicide. Yeah, what is it? Uh, Lieutenant Riley, Donnelly just brought Hal Starrett in. Do you want to see him now? No. Let him cool his heels out there a while with Mrs. Dunlap. Yes, sir. Now, about Dr. Wormsley, Lieutenant Riley. Okay, if... Valentine, okay. When Lieutenant Johnson turned the case over to me, I didn't know what I was getting in for, but I'll do my best to keep your client's name out of the case. Ah, oh, you're a pal. Well, as a matter of fact, Lieutenant, you owe our little bird watcher a debt. He did uncover a murder. Miss Brooks, I don't want to appear ungrateful. Oh, no. I can always use a new murder. Uh oh. I'm overjoyed that when you and Valentine stumbled over this homicide, you were uh, thoughtful enough to let me know about it. Oh, well, it's nothing at all. If you hadn't, I'd lock both of you up and throw the key away. Well, now that you're back your own sweet self, would you mind telling us what you found out from Mrs. Dunlap? Uh, well, she said she was out shopping all that afternoon, and the doorman is alibying her. When she got back, this kid, uh, Starrett, was still there, waiting to see his boss, Mr. Dunlap. He hung around a little longer and then beat it. Uh -huh. Did uh, Mrs. Dunlap suggest that there might have been any bad blood between Starrett and her husband? Well, she wasn't too anxious to admit it, but it seems young Starrett was being fired. Yeah, but what was the reason? Bad spelling or making Google eyes at the boss's wife? I wouldn't know. Not yet. Mrs. Dunlap was too broken up to go into every little <laughs> detail. <laughs> broken up, huh? I can just see her tears flowing like wine. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, just thinking out loud. You can send Starrett in here now. Yes, sir. Well, it looks to me as though Mr. Starrett has some explaining to do, or else. Well, we know that he was there that afternoon, and your Dr. Wormsley saw a man push Dunlap off the roof. Uh, come in, son. Come in, come in. Lieutenant, Sit I down. don't understand any of this. I. Oh, you. Hello, Starrett. What are you doing here? Just a neighborly mm. interest in the fate of your late employer. Say, what is this? Yes, George, I didn't know you two had met. Well, never mind. Now, what's this about Dunlap deciding to fire you, Starrett? Well, I, uh... Why? He, uh... He didn't like my work, I guess. That's the usual reason, isn't it? You'll save a lot of time if you tell us the truth. You asked me a question, and I gave you the only answer you're going to get. You had a fight with your boss, didn't you? No. In the struggle, you pushed him off the roof. No. A man saw you from an office building. He couldn't have. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Donnelly. Can I see you a minute? Yeah, okay. Mm. I'll be right back. Hey, tell me something, Starrett. Yes, if you were already fired, why were you so worried about Dunlap? Even going to the Bureau of Missing Persons yourself? Because he was the best friend I ever had. It hardly jives with the story Lieutenant Riley is building up. Hey, Starrett. Yes? You're a college man, aren't you? Well, what of it? Syracuse, 1942. What? Why, well, yes, but, but how did you know? This, um, Phi, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, too, aren't you? That's right. But what are you driving at, Lieutenant? Well, uh, this Phi Beta Kappa key. The medical examiner found it clenched in Dunlap's fist. It's yours. I... I don't know how it could have gotten there. He must have ripped the key off your chain as he fell off the roof. Okay, Starrett, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. It's nice of you to visit me in jail, Valentine. But what's the use of going over the same story again? Well, let's say it intrigues me, Stuart. Paula would go right on denying I ever gave her that key. I can't prove it. Why should you believe me any more than anyone else? Because I happen to know a little more about the lady in question. Now, look, friend, let's stop being delicate. Paula decided she liked your type and made you the odd man in the triangle. That's why Dunlap was giving you the gate. Oh, I, I tried to break off with her. But she always managed to be around, taunting me. She had me spinning on my head. Yeah, I know what you mean. Say, did you have a fight with Dunlap when he fired you? No, I, I wish there had been. That would have been easier than the way it was. Go on. He was hurt, and I was sick and ashamed of myself. He knew there were others, and that made the whole thing even cheaper. Now, surely just firing you, Starrett, wasn't the answer for Dunlap. Oh, he knew that. One of my last acts as his secretary was drawing up the papers that cut her out of his will. Hey, now, wait a minute. That just puts you in deeper. That means Paula had no motive. Hey, how about insurance? Well, uh... There was a big policy Philip took out recently with Paula's beneficiary. He didn't change that. Oh, wasn't that kind of strange? Oh, it wasn't something he overlooked. There was a funny smile on his face when he told me he was leaving that as is. That's very interesting. Oh, look, Valentine, I didn't kill Philip. When I was there, I didn't even know he was out on the roof. Okay, I'll just take it easy. I'll do what I can. What can you do? You'll never get the truth about that key out of Paula. And Dr. Wor uh, Wormsley swears there was a man out there struggling with Philip. What man? A burglar? One of Paula's ex-boyfriends? 
or possibly the man on the moon. I think I'll drop in on Paula again. I don't know what I expect to find, but with a gal like that, the unexpected is bound to be interesting. <laughs> It isn't my next-door neighbor. What now? Cup of sugar? Couple of eggs? Well, maybe I did make a little fib, but you didn't believe me anyway, did you, Mrs. Dunlap? Paula. Okay, Paula. Too bad about young Starrett, isn't it? What a thing to say to a grief-stricken widow. Can I get you anything? We may as well make ourselves comfortable. <laughs> You've got a head start in those lounging pajamas. They're really something. <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to notice them. Hey, you know... I never appreciated before what lounging pajamas can do for a woman. Didn't you? No, no. I might say if she were out on a roof and someone happened to see her from Dr. Wormsley's window, he might mistake her for a man. Hmm, if he'd never seen a woman before. His office is more than two blocks away. But uh, to get back to our hypothetical woman, yes. how much do you guess she'd have coming to her if her husband were murdered and there was a nice fat insurance policy, the only thing he didn't cut her out of? You've gotten a long way from lounging pajamas. Oh, I don't know. And I can't help wondering what the lady in question would do if she had a perfect patsy and a difficult young man who was suffering pangs of conscience. She might even do something brash if she happened to remember the Phi Beta Kappa key he gave her in a tender moment. Tell me, have you confided these flights of fancy to anyone else? Oh, no, my sweet. I wanted you to be the first to know. And you, my sweet, will ruin your eyes reading all those pulp magazines. There's another angle to this lady of the rooftop. Oh, what's that? Hmm, with all the insurance money she's sure to get, and with an admiring eye for a certain broad-shouldered character who seems to know what it's all about, oh, she might make life very pleasant for him. Very. Hmm. Uh, you couldn't say he knew what it was all about if he fell for a pitch like that now, could you? Oh. I'd better get my cigarette before we go on with this little game. Well, you can quit playing any time you want to. My dear old father used to play a lot of poker. He used to say the game was never over till the last bluff was called. Uh-huh. Didn't your old man tell you that even one of those effeminate-looking automatics make a loud noise and leave holes when they go off? I have a permit for this gun. Uh-oh. Come on now, Paula. Let's see if you can answer that phone with one hand. You know, Georgie, that could be your next to the last glib remark. When that phone stops ringing, you're going to worry yourself into a tizzy, trying to guess who it was. We've been supposing a lot of things here tonight. Now, let me top it off. Suppose they found you draped on the floor there with a bullet in your head. Okay, what then? I was in bed when I heard sounds in the living room. I opened the door. There was a figure in the darkness. After everything I'd been through, I didn't stop to think. I shot the prowler. I gotta hand it to you, Paula. Skip it. Just sit there on the couch a few minutes till I get my story straight. When I shoot you, I may have to tell the story a dozen times tonight, so it's got to be perfect. Okay, you stalled too long. You missed your chance, beautiful. It'd be a mistake to shoot me now. What are you talking about? Behind you, there's somebody out there on the penthouse roof. Ah, you know I'm smarter than that. Whoa! I'll take the toy now. Oh, you Drop it. it. Oh, that's you. Oh, George, there you are. I tried to call, and then I remembered about the empty penthouse next door and the adjoining sun deck, and... Oh, for Pete's sake, somebody say something. Oh, just a little parlor game, Brooksy. Uh, yes, yes. I, I was just showing Mr. Valentine how I almost mistook him for an intruder. Oh. Uh, Lieutenant Raleigh will probably find it very amusing when we tell him about it. Oh, <laughs> That ain't the way I see it. For the time being, Angel, we have to see things Paula's way. But more important right now is to see if we can get a man out of bed. No trouble at all, Valentine. Don't mind selling a little insurance any time of the night. Are these all representative policies, Bennett? Yes, sir. Anything you want, we've got it. Life. Accident, comprehensive liability, tornado insurance, plate glass. Any insurance against fatality during parlor games? Uh, what's that, Miss Brooks? Uh, just a private joke. This life insurance policy. Oh, any amount you want. Just a simple physical... Well, these family. clauses at the beginning, they're pretty standard in all life insurance policies, aren't oh, they? Yes, indeed. Each one of them meant to protect policyholder and the company. Uh -huh. What's up, George? Well, uh, thanks a lot, Bennett. You've been a great help. Yeah, but look, old man. Sorry, I'm shopping around, but I'll keep you in mind. Let's go, Brooksy. 
Brooksy, first thing in the morning, I want you to check with all the druggists in this section of town around River House, Dr. Wormsley's office, 20 or 30 blocks in each direction. Oh, my aching feet. I'm going to be with Lieutenant Riley. I hate to think of his blood pressure when I mention one little word. Autopsy. That's the word. Valentine, if I had any hair, I'd tear it out. What are you talking about? Well, now, look, it can't do any harm, Lieutenant. No one in his right mind can doubt how Dunlap died. This Wormsley saw him shoved off the roof. Then the body was found sprawled all over an empty lot, 12 floors below. Cause and effect. I have every reason to doubt that Sterrett killed Dunlap. Uh, I suppose you're going to tell me Mrs. Dunlap killed him, huh? That she used to be the strong woman in the circus. I didn't say she killed him. Then who... What? Ah, for the love of heaven. How about that autopsy, Lieutenant? All right, Doctor. Will you tell Valentine here that he's just been wasting our time? I wouldn't say that, Lieutenant. Huh? What'd you find? Enough poison in Dunlap to stop an army dead in its tracks. All right. All right, I can't argue with the laboratory. But I don't get it, Valentine. How many times do you kill a man, poison, throw him off the roof? Ah, it's a wonder we didn't find a knife in his back, too. Doctor, just how does this particular poison work? Instantly. Every muscle in the body becomes rigid all at once and stays that way. Uh-huh. Then it's possible that after a couple of days, the effects of the poison could be mistaken for rigor mortis. Not only possible, Mr. Valentine. It seems just what happened. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If Dunlap's fist was clenched like that the moment the poison took effect, how did that five beta copper key get in his hand? That's the point, Lieutenant. It was forced into it. And certainly Hal Sterrett didn't do it. That does it. That does it. I'm going to have Paula Dunlap picked up and she'd better have all the answers. <laughs> Oh, no. No, Mrs. Dunlap, you're going to have to do better than that. I know how it looks, Lieutenant Raleigh, but you're wrong. Believe me. Paula, you had to be the one who put that key in your husband's hand. Sterrett wouldn't sign his own death warrant. I know, but Here I... are the facts the jury will hear. You were the man Wormsley saw wearing lounging pajamas. You had the motive, the insurance money, so you poisoned Mr. Dunlap, then pushed him off the roof to implicate an innocent man. All right. All right, I'll tell you just what happened. Remember, Mrs. Dunlap, you're doing this of your own free will. Hal Sterrett left that afternoon. I went out on the roof for a moment. Philip was there. An empty highball glass next to him. He was dead. Well, don't look at me that way. He was already dead. He'd committed suicide. How do you know that? There was a note. A cruel note. Saying that I was the cause of all the unhappiness in his life. He was leaving me without a cent. Okay. I suppose you have the note. No. No, I destroyed it. Oh, no, that wasn't very smart. Don't you see? I had to. So no one would ever find out it was suicide. Now, wait a minute. There was a clause in his policy. It's in most policies. Saying that if he killed himself within the first year, the beneficiary wouldn't get a cent. That much is true, Lieutenant. What I did was wrong, but I wasn't going to let Philip leave me without a cent. That'll stand up in court, won't it? Even though I did destroy the note, they'll believe me, won't they? Since you ask my opinion, the answer's No. But my job is finished now. Oh, no, no. George. I... George. Hey, how goes it, Brooksy? What luck? You were right. I found out what you wanted to know at the Gotham Pharmacy on Morton Boulevard. Now what? What am I going to do? I've got to find a way to prove I'm innocent. This isn't fair. Remembering that gun you held in my face and Hal Starrett, I'm tempted to keep my mouth shut and let you stew in your own juice. What do you mean? Me and you both. I don't know what charge you're going to hold her on, Lieutenant. But it won't be murder. What? Did you hear what he said, Lieutenant? What are you talking about, Valentine? Looks he just found out that Philip Dunlap bought that poison himself at the Gotham Pharmacy. On a doctor's prescription he forged. Oh, George. Oh, how can I ever thank you? Oh, that's easy. The next time you're up on that roof alone, see if you can prove the law of gravity really works. George, don't you think that was sort of a morbid joke for Dunlap to play on his wife? Well, Angel, Paula played a few pretty grim jokes herself. Yes, but to leave her name in that insurance policy, knowing that she wouldn't get a penny. Crime, punishment, so forth. Oh, uh, hello. Anybody here? Oh, oh Dr. Wormsley. I just thought I'd drop in and take care of that little bill I owe you. Oh, thanks. Um, how do the birds look these days, Doctor? Uh, what? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that reminds me. I must thank you, Valentine, for keeping my name out of the Dunlap case. After all, I was the key witness, and I... Uh, Oh, dear. Well, that's all washed up now. Uh, thank goodness. 
Oh, yes. Hmm? Uh, Mrs. Dunlap isn't living there anymore, you know. No? It seems three young ladies are sharing that apartment now. And yesterday... Why, Dr. Wormsley, oh. what kind of birds are you watching now? Oh, well, uh, they, uh, they were very wild canaries. Oh, goodness, <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> And now, a message of importance to motorists. If this is the time of year your family gets travel-minded, it's probably the time you start thinking about new tires. And you know which make of tire gives you a written warranty against ordinary road hazards? The answer is easy. Atlas Tires. That's right. Each new Atlas passenger tire is warrantied for 12 months against blowouts, cuts, and bruises that might happen to ordinary tires. And each Atlas tire has a double warranty. First, by the manufacturer, and second, by the distributor. Another thing to keep in mind when you're buying tires is a two or four wear better than an uneven number. Give you softer riding and easier car handling. For that extra margin of safety, get Atlas tires at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Well, Brooksy looks like playing Big Brother a la Spencer Tracy didn't work out. Eddie beat it while I was shaving. Oh, that crazy little kid. He only left this note. He's on the prowl. To quote, he's going after Stan Lucas. Oh, no. What can we do, George? I've got to stop him somehow. Hey, listen. You look up Emily. Maybe she can give us a clue on how we can find Eddie. Okay, George. And remember, Brooksy, it's a race against time. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Amair appeared as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louise Arthur, Fred Howard, Peter Leeds, Charles Seal, and Charles Lund. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Don't forget to listen again next week, one hour earlier, over the same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you're up against something you can't handle and it has to be kept strictly confidential, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, the day after tomorrow, a boy 16 is getting out of a work camp after a year. Instead of trying to get a new start, he swears he's going to do something that'll take him right back there again, or even worse. You've got to help him. You've got to save him from himself. I don't have much money. I'm only 16, too. Only 16, too. But I'll work the rest of my life paying you if you'll do everything you can to help Eddie. I'll be waiting for you tomorrow morning at 7 in front of the Lincoln statue in Chelsea Square Park. And it's just signed Emily, George. Yeah. Chelsea Square Park, huh? Brooksy, that's right in the middle of that slum jungle where those so-called wolf packs have been running wild. Yes, and kids just about this age. Always good for an editorial. Young hoodlums, a challenge to society. And well, that's where it usually ends. Brooksy, looks like we're going to be on the job early tomorrow morning. <laughs> George, wait a minute. What is it, Brooksy? Over there, sitting under the statue of Lincoln. There, feeding the pigeons. Oh, yeah. Looks like a girl, all right. Come on, Angel. 
Let's see how unlike an editorial we can be when we talk to her. Now, that's all the crumbs I have. No use hanging around. Go on, scoop, scoop, go on. <laughs> Emily? Yes? Oh, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, that's right. Gosh, I didn't really believe you'd come, and I... Hello, well, Emily. I... This is Miss Brooks. We work together. How do you do? Hello, Miss Brooks. If things weren't so terrible for Eddie, I'd... I'd feel pretty silly. I don't have anything in the world, and... There's no reason for you to help me. Well, let's just say you write a darn good letter. Now, what about Eddie, Emily? He's a boy I know. He gets out tomorrow. Why was he sent away? The police found him in a stolen car. I see. But he didn't steal it. He thought he was delivering the car to a second-hand dealer for somebody, just to make a little extra money. Well, didn't he tell that to the police? No. He just kept insisting over and over that he didn't steal it. He wouldn't even tell me who got him into that trouble. But he says that since everybody is so sure he's no good, he's going to prove they're right. You know what that means. Oh, now, Emily. Well, I know Eddie. He's lost his temper a lot of times, and he got into scrapes, but... Well, he's not bad, not really. Emily, you're pretty sure of that, aren't you? I suppose when you believe in somebody, you just do, that's all. All right. Now let's see what we can do. He has no place to go, Mr. Valentine. What do you mean? He only has his father, and Eddie was supporting Mr. Prokosh, selling papers. Yes? Well, when Eddie was arrested, Mr. Prokosh told him he never wanted to see him again. And Eddie's very proud. He'd never go back home now. Well, people change a lot in a year. Do they? My mother and father haven't. They still think Eddie's no good. And even now, when I went to help him, I have to meet you in the park before I go to school. All right, Emily, suppose you leave Eddie to me. I'm going to secretarial school now, and in another year I'll start working. And if you don't mind waiting, oh, I suppose could... you leave that to Mr. Valentine, too. Then you mean you'll do everything you can? <laughs> that and a little more, Emily. Now, suppose we go and have some breakfast so you can tell me all about Eddie. Then I'm going to have a talk with his father. I don't care who you are. I want to hear nothing about my son. I got no son. Now get out of my house. Now, just take it easy, Mr. Prokash. Look at me, mister. You see this crippled leg? I got that making honest living. Honest living. I know. That's dreadful, Mr. Prokash. But there's still Eddie to think about. I get few pennies from the company every month. I even bite my tongue and take charity from the Morrissey Association. But better I should hate myself than take one dirty penny my son steals. I don't need it. But maybe your son needs you. I told you, lady, I got no son. Okay. Okay, let's just call him another boy, age 16, a boy in trouble and headed for more. But not everybody sold off in the way you are, his own father. You know, Mr. Prokosh, you can worry so much about being right that you can be wrong. Right, Ruth. Such fancy talk I don't understand. Hey, Prokash, I want... Oh. So you get company, eh? What do you want in my house? Well, these characters are blow. There's something I want you to tell me. Uh, just who is this imitation Bogart? Huh? Uh, His look name is up. Dan Lucas. He's the worst hoodlum of them all. Look, Pop, Eddie's time's about up. When's he getting out? I gotta know. I tell you nothing. You heard me. I gotta know. Oh, and you're gonna tell me. Oh, I... You what? Let, let go. That flashy tie you're wearing. You don't knot it half tight enough, so I'm gonna help you. And it's not good manners for a tough guy like you to be pushing helpless people around. Stop it, will you? Now, you see what I mean, Stanley? George, look out. See the kind of knife he carries? Yeah. Not the kind you peel potatoes with. Why, I ought to... George, let go of him. I... I just got one thing to say to you, mister. Stay out of this neighborhood after dark if you want to live. Which way do you want to go downstairs? On your head or on your feet? He ain't through with you. You need a pro guy. Beat it. Take that collapsible stiletto with you. Let's hope the cops find it on you. Still have nothing to say to us about Eddie, Mr. Prokash? Nothing. You see the kind friends he has? I would rather die we than... Know. All right, let's go, Brooksy. There's one more place I'd like to stop before we meet Eddie tomorrow. What do I know about Eddie Prokosh? 
Just about everything, Mr. Valentine. Good, good. That's why we dropped in to see you, Mr. Morrissey. Mr. Prokar says you and the Chelsea Square Association have been helping him out every month. Well, Miss Brooks, we're sort of a political club, as you know. But we believe in really taking care of our own down here. So I understand. Naturally, we hope to win votes. But in a tough neighborhood like Chelsea Square, there are other things that are more important. Giving out turkeys come Thanksgiving and arranging a boat ride in the summer just aren't enough. Oh, we do much more than that. We cooperate with the police, even get to the judge when one of our boys gets into trouble. We've been talking about putting up a playground, too. Well, I could get the bare facts of what happened in juvenile court, but I thought a man like you, whose business it is to know what's going on, could tell us more than that. We understand Eddie didn't even try to defend himself on that stolen car charge. Yeah, I know, but I'm afraid there was very little he could say. He was caught red-handed. Very unfortunate case. But I'm afraid not at all unusual. Say, tell me, Morrissey... Why would a young hooligan like Stan Lucas be interested in knowing when Eddie gets out from the work camp? Lucas? Oh, that one. There's really a neighborhood problem. Mm, I can imagine. But Stan's almost a man now. I don't see what he could have had to do with Eddie Prokos. Apparently he had a lot to do with him, Morrissey. But it looks as though we won't get the real picture of Eddie till we talk to the boy himself. <laughs> How about a lift, mister, huh? Oh. You going in the town? How about a... Oh, I... Why knock yourself out, kid? I'm going back to town. I'll give you a lift. What? Huh? Oh, I didn't see you parked under that tree. Hop in, Eddie. Okay, thanks. What? How did you know my name? I've been waiting for you, kid. But we'll go into all that later. I don't listen to Emily. She's just a crazy kid. <laughs> and I suppose you're a brainy old man. Yeah, well, I know what I'm doing. And you can let me off with the next cross and I can get a bus, you know. Ah, no, just keep your shirt on, Eddie. Ah, that kid gets crazy ideas. I know what I'm doing. I don't need anybody's help. Okay, okay, so you're on your own. Well, let's set it up this way. Look, I live by myself. What do you say we go home and have some chow? You might decide to bunk over with me until you know what you want to do. I know what I want to do. Hey, uh, mister, you sure you're not a cop? <laughs> well, some of them are my best friends, Eddie, but I don't happen to be one. No, it's just like I said. I had a little talk with Emily while she was feeding the pigeons in the park. You and... mean Emily still sits by that statue and... Well, okay, I guess there's no reason why I shouldn't eat your food. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> There's only one thing a woman likes better than to see a man clean up that last drop of gravy on his plate. Oh, what's that, Lucy? Two men doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I sure packed away a lot, didn't That's I? That's why I was here, Eddie. Go on, rave some more about my cooking to Mr. Valentine. It may help. <sighs> see you in the office in the morning, George. Glad to met you, Eddie. Yeah, me too, Miss Brooks. Well, thanks, Angel, for being chief cook and bottle washer. I do see those dirty dishes in the sink. <laughs> Good night, George. <laughs> oh, what? Uh... Mr. Valentine. Yeah, Eddie. Thanks a lot for the meal, but I gotta get going now. No, Eddie, no. You're gonna stay right here tonight. Now, look, now, I look, said it. A... You're stewing about something. You can't wait to get it out of your system without thinking of the trouble it's gonna cause everybody, including yourself. Will you stop preaching at me? You got no right just because you give me a meal. I'm getting out of here. Not tonight, you're not. Now, look, kid, give yourself a chance to sleep on it. You may feel differently in the morning. I'm leaving by that door, so get out of my way. Now, I don't want to have to get tough with you, but yes. I'm... Okay, you asked for it. Sorry, Eddie. No. Oh. asked for it, too. Oh, what happened? Just a little judo oh. trick I had to learn once. Oh. Yeah, it came in pretty handy in Salerno. Hey. Hey, you mean you were in that fight in Salerno? That's right. And the guy coming at you wasn't supposed to land on a nice, soft couch like you just did. Oh. Well, Eddie, there's no reason why we shouldn't settle down and listen to the fights now. Oh, yes. What? When you do go to bed, just remember, I'm a very light sleeper. So? So, don't get any fancy ideas about running out on me. Oh. 
Okay, Eddie, time to get up. Hey, Eddie, did you hear me? Rise and shine. Oh, that's good. Say, Eddie, if you want to try my new electric razor, you can... Why, that little... Now, where... Oh, great. Well, he did leave me a note. That's something. I wasn't asleep like you thought when you went in to take your shower. I even washed the dishes to pay for my room and board. Now, you and Miss Brooks and Emily better stay away from me. You were so anxious to know what I was going to do, now I can tell you. I'm going to take care of Stan Lucas. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about wear and tear. Most motorists believe, and quite naturally, that automobile engines wear out faster when they're running. But that's not true. Your car faces its biggest danger when it's standing cold. For that's when rust, caused by condensed moisture inside cylinders, starts to work. And that's where RPM motor oil can help you avoid a repair bill. RPM's special compounds keep a rust-proof oil film on all engine parts all the time. Whether your car is running hot or standing cold, RPM clings stubbornly to vital wear points. And consequently, rust never has a chance to get started in your car. No wonder it's the two-to-one choice of Western motorists. Next time you need oil, ask for rust-fighting RPM motor oil at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. While you're there, ask for a free copy of Batter Up. It's a wonderful handbook on baseball, a gift to you from independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure, George Valentine, and to Chelsea Square, a jungle of tenements in the middle of the city and a wolf pack of boys stalking the streets. That's the background for George's present job. The specific challenge to keep 16-year-old Eddie Prokosh from committing a serious crime, as he promised. Good morning, George. Huh? Hey, you only shaved on one side of your face this morning. Okay, so that's the side you can kiss me on. <laughs> but look, we're in trouble, Angel. What? Yeah, playing Big Brother a la Spencer Tracy didn't work out. Eddie beat it while I was shaving. All right, darling, take it easy. Uh, he left this little note. He's out on the prowl. To quote, he's going after Stan Lucas. Oh, no. Yeah. I've got to stop him somehow, Brooksy. I only knew where to find him down there in that Chelsea district. What pool hall, what dark alley, what hallway. And stand with that knife. What can we do, George? Well, I'm going to have another talk with Eddie's father. Look, you find Emily. But where? Well, she gave us the name of the secretarial school. Call her. Get her to meet you in the park. Maybe she can give us a clue on how we can find Eddie. Okay, George. And remember, Brooksy, it's a race against time. <laughs> can't do that. He mustn't. Emily, stop crying. <laughs> yes, Miss Brooks. Emily, I'm not going to talk to you like a child. If you're old enough to fall in love with a boy, this is no time to let him down. I know. I know. You came to us for help. Now we need yours. Can you tell us some of the places where Eddie might be looking for Stan Lucas? It could be anywhere, but I... Yes, dear? I... I should have told you this before, but I couldn't. I mean about Stan. Stan? Did he have anything to do with that stolen car business? I'm not sure, but that's that's not what I meant. What did you mean? Miss Brooks, you said you weren't going to talk to me like a child. Well, I'm not going to talk to you like I was one either. All this year, Eddie was up in that work camp. I've been going around with Stan. Oh. But I had to. Everybody does what Stan tells them to. I wasn't afraid just for myself, but what he said he'd do to Eddie when he came out. Does Eddie know that? No, you know how men are. And I wouldn't want him to know. Oh, you poor kid. Well, what could I do, Miss Brooks? Stan said he could even stop the few dollars Mr. Prokosh gets from the association. And he needs that money to live on. Stan was just talking. But you don't have to worry about him anymore. Mr. Valentine knows how to take care of him. I'm only thinking of Eddie. If I could only talk to him, I've got to find him. Wait, Emily, I'll go with you. We'll both look for him.
All I want to know, Mr. Proconscious, whether Eddie's been here or not. He knows better than to come here. Oh, yeah. And I suppose that makes you a great father. Hey, look, Eddie's wandering around. A few words well chosen might save his whole life. And all he gets is a door slammed in his face. I got nothing more to say, Mr. Valentine. Well, I have one more thing to say. Your son's out to kill somebody. K-I-L-L. That's the kind of thing you get the big rap for. Even a kid of 16. My Eddie, he would not... Hurt a thief than a murderer. Okay, Prokash, I can't waste any more time on you. A 16-year-old girl had more faith in your son than you have. And I've got to keep faith with her. Oh, that stubborn old... Remember me, big shot? Well, at least I didn't have to look for you, Stan. Nah, you didn't. Because I was looking for you. Jump, boys, jump. Hold against that wall. Okay, Stan. Hold him. Ah, uh, twist his arms back, Slim. Yeah. Oh. I want to do this right. Hey. No. Oh. I owe this mug something. Uh. Imitation Bogart. Oh. 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 You had something to say about my knife, didn't you? No. Oh. How do you like it, Oh. Now? I had to carve my initials all over that face oh. of yours. Oh, hey, don't it do it, Stan. Oh, no, I won't do it. It's really going to be a pleasure to work him over so even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. I... I know my diction isn't very good, Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, what's the matter with you? Where are you? Just about got to the hall phone... Look, you got to do me a favor. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But what's wrong with you? I thought I could keep the police out of a boy's life, but it's way over my head now. I need your help, Lieutenant. Okay, shoot. Look, pick up two boys down in Chelsea Square fast. Eddie Prokosh, about 5'8", freckles on his nose, wears a leather jacket. And Stan Lucas, get it? Stan Lucas, yeah. He's a, a dirty, vicious little... Oh. Valentine, yes. you stay where you are. Don't worry, Lieutenant. I can't help myself. I know, I know what you mean. Guy doesn't look his best in these hospitals. Oh, darling, your face. Look, what about Eddie? Did they pick him up? Yes. Before he got to stand? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, good, good. Not quite so good. What happened, Brooksy? Lieutenant Riley has Eddie in jail. They found a gun on him. But if he didn't get to stand, The gun was taken from a watchman in a holdup this morning. Eddie! No question about that gun. But, Brooksy, with that guy's record, and now this... I know. But, George, what do you think you're doing? Where are you... Oh, I'm getting out of here and have a talk with Eddie in jail. Eddie, you gotta talk. What about you and that watchman? What difference does it make what I say? Nobody will believe me. Come on, Eddie, come on! Oh, I, I bought that gun from Swenson, the pawnbroker, just a couple hours ago. What? Yeah, I was gonna use it on Stan. Well, didn't Lieutenant Riley check with the pawnbroker to see if your story was right? Yeah, sure, but Swenson told him he hadn't seen me since I was sent away. Uh huh. Shouldn't be any surprise to me. I should be used to getting framed. Now, look, you told me the truth, huh, Eddie? I tell you, I was nowhere near that factory this morning. I was out looking for Stan. And it was Stan who framed you on that hot car deal. That's right. Well, why didn't you say so when you were arrested? Well, what proof did I have? He would have lied his way out of it. And he wanted to get rid of me so he could have Emily for himself. Yeah, I know all about her going on with him while I was away. One of the kids up at camp told me. Oh, now, wait a minute, Eddie. You got Emily all wrong. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know why Emily was going out with Stan? She explained all that to Miss Brooks. I'm not interested. She was afraid of what Stan would do to you when you got out. And he, he said he could stop the allowance your father was getting every month. What? He, what's that? You heard me, Eddie. If Emily were giving you a runaround, she wouldn't come to me to keep you from making a darn fool of yourself. Yeah, but... Uh, nobody does anything for anybody unless there's a payoff in it somewhere. Nobody gives a good hoot about me anyway. Look at me, tough guy. My face, I mean. Stan and my gang did give you a good going over, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. A very artistic job. You think I'd look like this if I didn't give a good hoot about you? Well, And I, I... suppose the payoff in this for me is going to be a million bucks. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Valentine. I... Okay. Okay, Eddie. We understand each other. Now, I'll show you how much I believe in you. Here, take this. 
A knife? Yeah, that's right. Wolfpack style. A la Lucas. I don't get it. I'm going to talk to Lieutenant Riley. And you're going to have a chance to talk to Stan alone in his cell when they bring him in. You, you mean you're going to let me loose with him with this? That's right, Eddie. Oh, that'll be just dandy with me. Now, look. We've got to get Stan to talk. And he's not giving out for the police or for me. You're the only one who can make him talk. Now, you listen closely. All right. All right, I don't mind playing ball with you, Valentine. I'm all for helping the kid. Thanks, Lieutenant. But you realize the spot I'm putting myself in, letting Eddie have a knife when he talks to Stan? We'll be right next to the cell door. Go right in, Mr. Morrison. We're coming waiting for you. Thank you. Well, it's good to see you, Morrissey. How are you, Lieutenant? Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Morrissey. I see. Hi, Morrissey. I see they're keeping you stepping down there at Chelsea Square. That's right, so, but we do our best. Well, Valentine, uh, thought you ought to be in on this Prokosh case. Eddie's one of your boys, you know. I know. Yeah, we're going to hear Eddie's side of the story. And if it sounds convincing, we know you'd want to help. I'm glad you thought of me. Okay, let's get going. Sergeant, bring the Prokosh boy to cell nine. We'll be right there. Okay, Eddie. The lieutenant says you can talk to this guy five minutes. Thanks. Well, well, well. well. Did you get out, Prokash? You didn't stay out very long, did you? No. You saw to that, Stan. Come on, you're talking through your head. Am I? You want me to give you regards to anybody when I get bailed out? Emily, for instance? You're not getting out of here. What are you doing? You ought to know this trick. How to hide a knife in your shoe so they don't find it when they search you. Hey, Eddie, put that thing away. I've been waiting to catch up with you, Stan. Look, stay away from me. You frame me. Running those stolen cars. Well, now you're going to pay for it. Look, kid, take take it easy, will you? Didn't you? Look, I I, I didn't mean to frame you, Eddie. It was was all a mistake. Help! Somebody help! He's going to... Stop him! Yeah, I was looking around for a gun, and sooner or later I'd wind up at Swenson's. So you planted that hot gun there. Yeah, 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 that's right. But look, kid... Help get this guy out of here, you hear me? Get him out of here! Well, get him out of here, all right. He was trying to murder me. Hey, what are you doing here? You got a good memory for faces, Stan, especially ones you've been working on. Gosh, Mr. Valentine, it worked. You heard him, didn't you? Yes, Eddie, we heard everything. Look what's going on here. You got no... Shut up! Mr. Morrissey, get me out of here. I didn't do nothing. Well, the less you say, the better, Stan. Look, you can't let him railroad me like that. I'll do everything I can, same as I would for everyone else from our district. I guess you're going to stay put, Lucas. And the rest of your gang will be sent to a place where they can learn to do something useful with their lives. Come on, everybody. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Huh? Isn't it going to be kind of crowded in here for Stan and Mr. Morrissey? What are you talking about, well, Valentine? Stan. What do you mean, George? That was some nice double talk between you and Stan a second ago. The less he says, the better. The better for you, you meant, didn't you, Morrissey? Now look, Lieutenant. And you, Stan, I... you said, you can't let them railroad me or I'll... Well, I, uh, or you'd I, give I, away I... the whole works, wouldn't you? Morrissey was the real guy behind the stolen car racket and a lot of other rackets down in Chelsea Square. Morrissey, you were using Stan to bully the other kids in the line. That's why Stan boasted he could cut off the little money Mr. Prokosh was getting from the association. Well, you don't seem to have much to say, Morrissey. Everybody knows my reputation. Oh, yeah, I... yeah, the big power of the neighborhood. Big enough to make Swenson, the pawnbroker, perjure himself so you could be rid of Eddie. I think you can get Swenson to talk now, Lieutenant. I told you he sold me that gun. You, you got this all wrong, Valentine. This Lucas boy here has caused all kinds of trouble. If he tries to implicate me, surely no one is going to believe Look, him. Marcy, you're not going to walk out and leave me holding the bag. Valentine is right. I got lots of proof. Keep quiet, you little rat. See what I mean, Lieutenant? On second thought, it wouldn't be safe to leave them both in the same cell. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, what's that saying about an old fool? <laughs> well, I don't know about that saying, Mr. Prokosh. Why not settle for another one? Better late than never. Except for you, I would have made a terrible mistake. Thank you. George, come here. Ah, oh, what is it, Brooksy? Look down there, out of the window. Huh? There's Emily and Eddie sitting on the stoop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Offhand, I'd call that romance, ain't you? And offhand, I remember a saying, too. Hmm? Speak for yourself, John, if you know what I mean. And 
And now, a message of importance to motorists. The merry month of May means a merry vacation for a lot of folks. And if you're one of them, here's the way to start out safe as well as happy. Just make sure your car gets a vacation check at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station. Do this a day or two before you start out. When the men at these service stations inspect your tires, battery, crankcase oil, spark plugs, all the vital parts, they give your car the same thoroughgoing care they'd give their own. While you're getting this important vacation check, get a new keyless gas cap, too. It has a simple combination lock, no key to lose. And it guarantees your gasoline is safe from theft during your vacation trip and whenever you park your car. Keyless, self-locking gas caps are another better motoring item available at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Oh, hello, Angel. Oh, darling, I thought you'd never open your eyes. Oh, why doesn't somebody turn that radiator off? It's hissing. We're back in the man lock at the tunnel, George. Yeah. Oh, what happened? Well, you were down here this morning, and you must have come up too quickly, and you got the bend. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Then coming up, and then everything went blank. There was another accident in the tunnel. What? Oh, hey, I'm beginning to remember a few things now. And I'm pretty sure I know what causes these accidents. Brooksy, quick, help me over to that phone. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Mary Lou Harrington as Emily, Jay Novello as Dr. Prokosh, Tommy Cook as Eddie, Tony Barrett as Stan, and Herbert Butterfield as Morrissey. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. The Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you're up against something over your head and need help that's strictly confidential, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, let's see if you're as good as your ad says. I am up against something that's over my head. A river. The river my company's trying to push a tunnel under. But we're getting nowhere fast. And I hate to think what the reason would be. If you figure you can help... If you figure you can be of help, I assure you we won't haggle about price. Hmm. It's signed, uh... William Kane, President. Kane and Bowers Tunnel Construction, huh? Now, I wonder where I could find a diving suit with a new look. <laughs> now, seriously, Brooksy, you must mean the West End Tunnel, the one they're having all the trouble with breakthroughs and cave-ins. I could drop in at the Globe Department store. Okay, Angel, okay. But this seems like a job for an engineer, not for me. Well, there's still no harm in talking to the nice man who insists he's not going to haggle about price. Huh. As long as you insist on being mercenary, let's get going. <laughs> Valentine, you don't know how much it means to a former sand hog like me to wind up building his own tunnel. I think I can imagine, Mr. Kane. It's like a kid with a chemistry set suddenly finding out he's discovered the atomic bomb. <laughs> I realize this tunnel project's a pretty big thing. 
And you've had more than your share of hard luck. Yeah, way more than my share. What did you mean in your letter that you hate to think what the reason for these accidents might be? Well? I, I suppose I've got to tell you. Oh, now look, Kane, if it comes that hard, maybe you want this letter back so we can forget the whole thing. No, no, it's just that it's tough putting it into words. Yeah? Yeah. Me and my partner, Jim Bowers, we drove tunnel all over the world. Started as muckers. Shoveling mud and slime. Got to be miners together. Using dynamite and drills when you didn't even know what was going to happen next under the river. You'd think you'd get to know a guy after going through all that with him. Well, let's be blunt and put it this way, Kane. You suspect your partner, Bowers, is holding up the works here, is that it? Yeah, but I gotta be sure. What makes you suspect him at all? I found out that the company we outbid to get this job made Jim a big offer to come with them. But if he's a partner here, what's the percentage for him in a deal like that? Well, Jim's always resented that I'm better suited to run the front office up here while he has to work with the men. Oh, I get it. So if he could bunch up this job, we lost it to the Cameron Construction Company. They'd take him in there as a big shot. Well, you certainly must have talked this over with Mr. Bowers. Yeah, I did miss, and he said that he turned the camera and offer down flat. But how can I be sure? Now all these accidents. With Bowers always on the spot to make them happen, if that's what he wanted. Uh, frankly, Valentine, I don't even know how you can help me. Sand hogs are a clannish crowd. You can't go wandering around down that tunnel snooping around. Well, Mr. Kane, suppose you let me give it some thought. Uh, George. Yeah, Brooksy. How'd you like to buy a for instance? Okay, Brooksy, I'll buy. Well, for instance, if you were a reporter and I were a photographer, we could be doing a story for a national magazine. That would get us down into the tunnel to snoop. Say, that might be an idea, that. Then you could look around. I'll tell Sanders to expect Oh, now, wait a minute. Hey, look, Brooksy, that's a good for instance, all right. But this business of we... Of course I meant we. Why do you think I came up with the idea? Okay, okay, you arrange it, Kane. I think we're going to take a crack at it. Just how far down does this elevator go, Mr. Sanders? Uh, About 30 feet, miss. Well, that's not too bad, is it, George? Oh, no, no. No, That part of it's all right. I'm thinking of what happens later. What are you so smug about? What do you know that I don't know? Hey, you want to tell the lady what happens next, mister? Well, miss, it's getting into the tunnel that you've got to worry about. Oh? There'll be about 40 pounds of pressure per square inch on you down there. That's why if we get to the bottom, you still got to sit a half hour in the manlock. Manlock? What's that? Oh, it's kind of a sealed up room, miss. We keep shooting pressure into that while you just sit. That's so it ain't so bad for you when you get into the tunnel. Get it? <sighs> I got it. To put it more concisely, my sweet, unless they're very, very careful, the pressure of the river would come down on you and flatten you out like a jellyfish. Oh, lovely thought. Well, here we are. (sighs) Hey, Charlie, come here. We got visitors. A reporter and a young lady to take pictures. Two visitors, huh? Yeah, it's okay. Mr. Kane knows about it. Mm. In that case... I'd better sit in the lock with them. Yeah, you better warn the boys. Put their shirts on, Charlie. <laughs> Ladies' day. Yeah. Right here, folks. Okay. All right, step in. Thank you. Hey, looks like a bank vault. Yeah, almost. Important thing is to seal it airtight. You'll see what I mean when I close this door. <laughs> George, what's that? Huh? That's the air from the tunnel coming in through this valve, lady. When the pressure in here is the same as it is out there, that big door opens by itself. Then you're ready to go on to the river. Hmm. Won't you sit down, Miss Brooks? Yeah, it usually takes about a half hour. Oh. Just about a minute more now. You all right, Brooksy? Oh, well, I, I'm just swell. But my ears... It's even worse coming out. You're in too much of a hurry. That's when you can get the chokes and the bends. 
Nothing like having things to look forward to. You'll have to put these little metal tags around your neck. Huh? What are these, Charlie? All sand hogs wear them. It's in case you're found staggering around. Tells the cops not to throw you in with the drunks, but to rush you back here to this decompression chamber. If they don't waste much time, you'll probably live. <laughs> oh, goody. Hey, you sound like an old sand hog yourself, Charlie. You can't stay away from tunnels, huh? Old, Mr. Valentine? I'm just like Jack Benny. I'm still 38. <laughs> <laughs> I was the same age when I helped build the Holland Tunnel back east. Just got out here a few months ago. Well, that's that. There goes the door. It's okay for you to go into the tunnel now. All right. Come on, Brooksy. Oh, it's... Oh, it's like the inside of a furnace in here. But there's all this nice water to slush through. Golly. That ought to help keep cool things off. <coughs> George. Hey, you can still put your bank in there with Charlie. Oh, no. I, I was just thinking of my nylons. Let's go. Okay, everybody, clear. We're blasting. Blasting, George. Go ahead, Hagen. All right, let her go. Good. Now we can go up to the other. Hey, where'd you two come from? You Bowers? Yeah, what are you doing down here? And with a girl to bring me more trouble. Trouble? Look, Mr. Kane said it was all right for me to do a story about the tunnel. The young lady is here to take the pictures. Story? That old Kane's got to think of up there? I'd like to go up and tell him a few hey, things. Powers. Hey, what's going on? Oh, Powers, George. yes. Got a breakthrough at the tunnel, head. What? Yes. Bad this time. The scaffolding came down with a lot of guys on it. Ah, uh, scaffolding come down on every job. Young Davis is down there, caught under all that rock and sand. We got to get him out. I'll get the ambulance, Hagen. But you get back there. Patch up that break. Go on. Davis wouldn't be there now, Bars. If you sent that gang up tunnel far enough when the blast come off. Look, Sandhog, don't tell me how to build a tunnel. I'll tell you anything I want. Okay, if you want to play tough. Oh, <laughs> ah, pick yourself up and do what I said. Okay, reporter, there's a story. How we lost another day. Yeah, what about the man you just lost? This is one accident they won't blame on me. A woman in the tunnel's the worst jinx there is. Kane knows that. And I got to phone upstairs for an ambulance. Well, I see the two partners are working late tonight. That's good. Oh, uh... Valentine. Did you get a good story out of that accident today? Now, look, let's stop kidding each other. You know I'm not a reporter, Bowers. I wasn't born yesterday. I know Kane had you checking on me. Why shouldn't I? Huh. You know we can't go on much longer this way, and you're in charge. A little bribe from the Cameron Company, and you... Another crack like that, and I'll okay, you. Okay, break it up, boys. Break it up. Let me do some talking. What I have to say will be short and to the point. Yeah? Yeah. I did some checking today. Bowers isn't the only one who might profit by these accidents. You could too, Kane. Huh? What are you talking about? Yeah, let's hear some more. I had a talk with a city engineer. He said he doesn't know how you can do this job on the bid you put in. I, uh, well, I admit I was figuring close to the line, but we would have made it if things went right. Ah, so the boy in the stiff shirt comes up with another bad deal, huh? And, Kane, you had the foresight to take out insurance to protect you in case you went broke building this tunnel. Well, that's a natural precaution. Oh, yeah. But it was a personal insurance policy taken out in your name. Not for the firm. What's that, Jim? I know how you've been spending money, so I paid the premiums, but I was only thinking of the company. Well, here's what I'm thinking, Kane. The insurance company would pay off if none of these accidents could be traced to you, and you'd be saved from ruinous, from a ruinous bid. Yeah, but that's how it might look, Look, Chairman, but... look. If there's one thing I don't like, it's to be kidded along. Now, do you still want me to find out what's behind those accidents? I have nothing to fear, Valentine. That's why I hired you. <laughs> I know I'm clean. Right ahead, Valentine. Okay. Okay. If you're sure that's what you want. Uh, of course. You heard what I said. Yeah, but just remember, if I dredge up something from the bottom of that river that you don't like, you're the guys who ordered it. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about parlor pastimes. Remember this game a few years ago? Somebody would say, knock, knock, and you'd say, who's there? Many a good gag and many a laugh came out of this game. But at the same time, there was another kind of knock, knock that was no laughing matter. 
for it was in your car's engine. And engine knocking often caused overstress of parts, severe temperatures, waste of power and gasoline. Today, motor fuel engineers have this problem under control. At Standard of California, they blended several different gasolines into one great motor fuel, Chevron Supreme Gasoline. Laboratory tests and road tests prove that premium quality Chevron Supreme burns smoothly, has high anti-knock value. In your new car or an older one, try Chevron Supreme yourself. Besides anti-knock value, you'll find it has all the qualities your car needs for good going. You can get Chevron Supreme gasoline at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine and a million-dollar tunnel burrowing deep under a riverbed. A series of unexplained accidents that stopped the job cold. Why? That's the answer George has to supply. But so far, all he's learned is the rather startling fact that both partners in the contracting firm of Kane and Bowers have their own good reasons for wanting to see the tunnel left unfinished. Right now, George and Claire have just entered Hogan's Hog Pen hang out of the Sand Hogs, where Big Bill Kane is talking to his workers. And I know we've been falling behind down in the tunnel. But you know, Jim Bowers and me were sand hogs ourselves. We can lick this job, and I've even hired Valentine here to make sure about them accidents. Now, here's an offer. You make up for lost time, and I paid time and a half to every man from then on. I could smell that better, Brooks, see if I didn't know about that insurance policy Kane took out. Yeah. Now, look, boys. That offer my partner just made you suits me, too. Just wanted you to know. Hmm, I could swallow that easier if I didn't know about the offer Bowers got from that other construction company. Well, I don't know about you boys, but I still have my doubts. Oh, it's our cheerful old friend from the manlock. Don't get me wrong, Mr. Kane. I like making extra money. But when a job like this gets off on the wrong foot, it never straightens out. All right, Charlie, you're just getting the jitters. <laughs> All right, go on and laugh. But I wouldn't be surprised that if we pushed that tunnel another 50 yards, we'd run into a ledge of gravel and hard pan. Boulders will never get past. Just more trouble. Now, what we want to know from you boys is, are you with us or not? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, fine. That's all we want to hear. The drinks are on Kane and Bowers. Go and get it. Oh. Oh. Come on, Brooksy. Where are we going, George? Just riding a hunch. We've got to be someplace before 5 o'clock. <laughs> I, uh, I wish you'd hurry, Mr. Valentine. You know the Bureau of Harbors and Waterways closes at 5 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll be through in a minute. Yeah, I think I found the map I want. Topographical survey, riverbed, section B, Oleander through Perry Street. Uh -huh. Well, that's just where the tunnel is being built, George. Uh-huh. Very interesting. Yeah, and this would be around Pier 19. What are you talking about? I'm not quite sure, Brooksy. But we're going to ride that hunch a little harder. <laughs> Hey, you the watchman on this pier, Pop? Yep, been here for the last 15 years. Huh? Hey, would you tell me something? Yeah? Those white bubbles coming up there in the river. Yeah, that's why they're working on a new tunnel, son. That's as far as they got in all these months. Yes, we read they're having a lot of trouble. Yeah, and they keep working day and night, too. Can always tell by the position of that trawler out there just where they're working. You don't say? Yep, she's there every night, too. Sort of keeps right ahead of the tunnel. I can tell that by the bubbles that come up out of the water. Hmm. I wonder what the trawler has to do with the tunnel. Yeah, I don't know. Man goes over the side in a diving suit every night. Suppose that's got something to do with the tunneling job, though. <laughs> Probably he's kind of a traffic cop down there. Clears out the fish so that they can go ahead. <laughs> traffic cop, huh? Hey, Pop, you've been a great help. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Now where, George? Angel, what do you say I hire a motorboat and we take a nice romantic ride on the river? Okay. 
Okay, George, I agree with you. A trawler on top of the river has nothing to do with the building of a tunnel under the river. Then, Brooksy, why is it here every night, always just ahead of the shield of the tunnel? Now, that's more than a coincidence. There it is, up ahead. Uh-huh. What are we going to say to whoever's aboard? May we drop up for a cup of old-fashioned clam chowder? Uh, if you don't mind, young lady, I'll do the talking. As always. Hey, up there. Hey, can we come aboard? Anybody home? No, and get away from oh, here. Well, uh, the truth is we ran out of gas. Didn't and we you thought... hear me? I said get on your way. Well, surely you can fare enough gasoline I just... I see you didn't understand what I said. George! Hey, what are you trying to do? Next time, I won't miss. Now get away from here and spare her. George, what's going on around here? Look, Brooksy, I caught the name on that trawler. It's the Martha M. Tomorrow morning, first thing, check on the registry. See who owns her. Then pick me up at the tunnel. tunnel early this morning, Mr. Valentine. I had to look around, Charlie. How long have I been sitting here in the man lock? Oh, just about 15 minutes. Seems like... like I just got in here. And Charlie, I don't feel so good. You'll be okay. You're an old hand at this now. You've been up and down here a couple of times. But it seems like I got hammers in my head, beating away. And you look like six guys lined up six miles away. You'll be okay when you get some fresh air. Hey, look, officer. I know. I know where I want to go. Help me, will you? Yeah, you need a lot of help, mister. I've been watching you weaving down the block. I, I'm very sick. I feel rotten. I wonder why. I think I got the bends. Yes, and you've been bending over the bar too much. Hey, take me back, officer. The, the tunnel. There's only one place I'm taking you, to jail, so you can sleep it off. Come along with you now. Mr. Kane, Mr. Bowers, I know Mr. Valentine was here at the tunnel this morning. Okay, but what you're so excited about, Miss Brooks? He was supposed to meet me at the shaft, and he never would have gone without leaving some kind of message. I wouldn't worry about Valentine. I found out what he wanted to know, and he was waiting for that information. Information about the tunnel? What kind of information? I'll let Mr. Valentine tell you. Do you mind if I use your phone? No, go right Charlie. ahead. Hello? Police headquarters? Let me talk to Lieutenant Riley. Okay, I'll wait. Look, we hired your boss so we could keep this thing confidential. Yeah, that's right. Let's forget about ethics, boys. The man who's among the missing is someone I happen to care a lot about. Hello? Oh, Lieutenant Riley, this is Brooksy. Oh, I need your help. I can't find George. Oh, look, Lieutenant, will you check the jails and the hospitals and see what you can come up with? Oh, believe me, Lieutenant, I know what I'm talking about. We traced him down for you, lady, but you're not taking him out of here. Okay. Brooksy. Brooksy, my oh, head. Oh, take it easy, darling. Best thing is to let him sleep it off. Can't you see this man is sick? Oh. He's got the chokes, the bends. We've got to get him back to that decompression chamber at the tunnel. Hmm? What are you talking about? Oh, well, I'll show you. Wait a minute. Look, this, this tag here I around his neck is... I can't breathe. Oh, so they took it off him. Brooksy. Well, here, they gave me one, too. Here, read it. Yeah. This man is a sand hog. See, the compression chamber. Rush. Yeah. Okay, lady, you win. And I hope we make it. Hello, Angel. Oh, darling, I thought you'd never open your eyes. Hey, why doesn't somebody turn that radiator off? It's hissing. We're back in the manlock, George. 
That's why you're feeling so much better. Oh. Hey, but what happened? Well, you were down in the tunnel this morning, and you must have come up too quickly. That's why they picked you up in the street wandering around. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember coming up. Then everything's suddenly going blank. I got all the dope on that trawler, the Martha M. Yeah? Well, it has nothing at all to do with the tunnel. It's registered in the name of C.W. Egan and his wife, Martha M. Egan. Oh, yeah, and the Egans were out fishing. C.W. in a diving suit and Martha M. with a rifle instead of a rod and reel. Mm. George, there's something else. No, there couldn't be. There was another accident in the tunnel. Oh, what kind of accident? I don't know. Let me get over to that phone on the wall, Brooksy. I want to talk to Ken. Okay, George. Hello, hello. Yeah? Hello. Bill Kane? Yeah. This is Valentine Kane. Yeah, Valentine. We're having a lot of trouble. You okay? Oh, sure. Just dandy. Heard you had a narrow escape. Oh, what kind of accident was it now? The whole tunnel nearly got flooded. Yeah? Yeah. Just a good thing the new ship wasn't in yet. Poor Charlie, the lock tender, got killed. Charlie? Nobody will ever know why he was down at the tunnel face with a drill, but when we found him, he was over his head in a muck pile. I see. I don't know what the answer is, but it's the end of old Charlie Egan. Egan? George, what is it? Sure, uh, you know Charlie? Egan. So that's the answer. Uh, what's that, Valentine? Look, Kane, get Bowers and wait for me in your office. First, I want to see a lady about a boat. Then I got something to say to you. Valentine, you don't know what you're saying. Just the same, gentlemen. It was Charlie Egan who was responsible for all the trouble here at the tunnel. That doesn't make sense. He was just a lock tender. He gave him the job more out of pity than anything else. Okay, okay, then listen to this. Do you remember what Charlie said at the hog pen? Ah, not particularly. He said if the tunnel went another 50 yards, it would run into a ledge of gravel, hard pan, and boulders. Well? Huh? Well, the map of the Bureau of Harbors and Waterways didn't show it. But Charlie knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, how, how would he know that? Uh, that's funny. I asked myself those same questions. How would an ordinary sand hog just in from Chicago know the exact to- topography of the riverbed? Yeah. He suspected I was getting wise and saw to it that I got a good case of the bends this morning. Just to make sure I was a dead duck, he took that tag from around my neck. Yeah, but why? Was he crazy? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Now, I didn't want to believe the reason myself when I found out. I talked to Mrs. Egan. She's the lady on the boat. Now, she's in the outer office right now. Suppose we have her in and see if it's any easier for you to believe her story. Anything you say, Valentine. Okay. Will you come in, please, Mrs. Egan? All right. I want you to repeat just what you told me. Well, what shall I tell them? The two people wasted their lives looking for a will-o'-the-wisp, a treasure you were always going to find the next day. Treasure? Yes. Sensible people don't believe in buried treasure. And sunken ships bulging with gold, but Charlie did. Now, wait he a minute. He was the eccentric uh... C.W. Egan, who spent a fortune and 20 years of his life looking for ships that had sunk with treasure aboard. And fantastic as it may seem, gentlemen, he found one. Didn't he, Mrs. Egan? Just a couple of months ago. He went down into the river every night. He kept prowling around the hull of that boat. He knew that there was gold there somewhere... He kept saying he'd find it any day now, his treasure. And then Kane and Bowers started to drive a tunnel. Yeah. Charlie knew it was going to meet head on with the Granada, the old Spanish galleon he knew was there. It became a race against time. That's why he got a job here. Did all he could to keep the tunnel from getting any farther. Yeah. And at night, every night, he'd go down to look some more. And I'd help him. And today was his last desperate attempt to flood us out. Yes, he wasn't going to see anybody get to his treasure as long as he lived. And he kept his word. Well, Brooksy, here's the check from Kane and Bowers. That's all washed up. So what do you say we go out stepping tonight? Oh, well, darling. Hey, did you see the paper this morning? No, why? Well, they raised the granada out of the river last night. They did? Uh-huh, and there was a treasure chest, just as Charlie knew all along. Oh, so old Charlie was right after all. Yep, a chest packed to the brim with old Spanish coins. George, how romantic. Oh, yeah, but old Charlie wouldn't have been too happy about it. No, why? No. The whole batch was worth about $100. And now, a 
a message of importance to motorists. Maybe you've got your vacation trip all mapped out, but how about the family car? Before you start out, better make sure it gets a thorough vacation check at your standard station or independent Chevron gas station. They'll inspect your tires, battery, spark plugs, and oil filter. They can tell whether there's any risk of your fan belt getting out of kilter. And they'll make sure that each vital lubrication spot is okay. Besides helping you get off to a good start on your vacation, there's another thing about independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations. Wherever you motor in the West, you're never far from their quality products and superior services. And don't forget... Whether you're on a vacation or just motoring around town, these are the service stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Brooksy, I want you to get down to headquarters as soon as possible. Have them get that whole crew together, all those pixies that were at the seance last night. Including the spirits, George? Including Miss Turner. Have them all brought back to the sanctuary. But why? If there really was a murder, Brooksy, I won't be able to live with myself until I find the reason for it. Right now, I got a date with a crystal ball. And maybe I'll get a preview. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Francis X. Bushman as Kane, Herbert Litton as Bowers, Ruth Parrott as Mrs. Egan, Joe Duvall as Charlie, Franklin Pinky Parker as Sanders, and Leo Cleary as Harrigan. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. If it's so fantastic you can do nothing about it yourself, then you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, the writing and rewriting of this letter has proved one thing to me, that I can't find the words to convey my desperation. Somehow, in a way I can't explain, my life has been touched by evil, pure, undiluted evil. There is something here too strange for me to comprehend, something unworldly almost. Unworldly almost. It is not only for my sake that I ask for your assistance, but for the continued sanity of my fiancé. Accept the enclosed check as a retainer, Mr. Valentine, and please call on me at once. And it's signed, uh, Gilbert Dressler. Oh, this doesn't make sense, George. Well, it makes enough sense to show that Gilbert Dressler is pretty panicky. I know, George, but this something too strange to comprehend, unworldly. Sounds like he's having trouble with banshees. <laughs> well, whatever his source of trouble, it's our source of income, Brooksy. But how do people let themselves get into this kind of situation? This kind of situation pays the rent. So let's go find out what's on Gilbert Dressler's unhappy mind. In my ten years on the desert, Mr. Valentine, I've witnessed events that would freeze the very marrow in your bones. Yes, I'm not doubting your word, Mr. Dressler, Terrifying but... events. Things that are only spoken about in whispers behind locked doors. Yes, but let's be a little more specific. Magic. Voodoo, if you will. An evil beyond evil. They're right here in your own city. But why are you hiring us? Yes, Mr. Dressler. You mentioned something about a fiancé in your letter. What about her? Yes, Gabrielle. I love her. Oh, we're sure of that, Mr. Dressler. But you also wrote something about fearing for her continued sanity. 
What makes you think her sanity won't continue? Margot. Hmm? Margot? What's that supposed to mean to me? Oh, forgive me. I was referring to Madame Margot. She claims she's a medium. I claim she's a purveyor of black magic. Well, now we're getting somewhere. You're trying to tell us Gabrielle, your fiancé, is somehow being influenced by this Madame Margot. Yes. How? Why, why, she's taking all her money away from her. Oh, how long has this been going on? Since Gabrielle's mother, Mrs. Turner, died. Oh, what happened? Maddie Turner was cleaning her hunting rifle, and it went off. Very unfortunate. The sporting world lost a great devotee because of Mrs. Turner's accident. All right, what do you want us to do? Expose Madame Margot. That's what I want you to do. Expose her? Certainly. I've arranged for you to visit Madame Margot this very afternoon. Here, this is her card. And tonight, you shall attend the seance at the Turner Mansion. A seance? Oh, George, there's nothing I like better than an evening cavorting with the spirit world. <laughs> okay, Brooksy, we'll give it a whirl. I never saw a ghost yet who didn't scream when it was pinched. <laughs> There's Madame Margot's place, George, 214. Yep, I'll pull up in front. Well, one thing I'll say for George, she's not squeamish about operating in a tough neighborhood. Uh-huh. Well, looks all very proper, Brooksy, even to the neat little sign on a window. Madame Margot, clairvoyant and medalist, seances by appointment. Okay, let's go. Well, ring the bell, George. Oh, that's a very good idea. Oh, great. <laughs> Listen to that local color, will you? In a joint like this, I'll settle for nothing less than a swami. Yeah. You have been expected. Please enter, Sahib. Sahib? This way, if you please. Madame Margot offers herself to meditation. However, she will receive you shortly. Straighten your turban, George. Uh, do you mind if we sit down, Mr. Uh... Hasim. Upon uh... this level, that is the name by which I am known. Please be seated. Yes, thanks. And now Hasim will leave you. Seek to attune yourself to the vibration of the sphere. Oh, sure, we'll do just that, Hasim. Well, there's your swami, George. <laughs> Wonder what bottle he floated out of. I'll bet when that towel around his head is unwrapped, it reads Oasis Motel. <laughs> hey, this Madame Margot must do all right. Look at the jade vases, carved teeth. Look at this rug. Oh, Brooksy, for a candy bar in North Africa during the war, I could have filled a barracks bag with this junk. Junk? Why, some of these things are priceless, Bargain George. basement gadgets, Brooksy, part of a pitch. Well, I don't want to argue with you, but look, I... Look, look, Claire. I haven't heard of a setup like this yet that wasn't phony. A shrewd operator in a bathrobe and a crystal ball can make a fortune feeding customers the things they want to hear. Yes, but this Madame Margot is supposed to be uncanny. Yeah. Anyway, that's what Mr. Dressler seems to think. Well, I don't know what her act is, Brooksy, but I'm making book that Margot's got a huge investment in trap doors and mirrors. And one of these days, she's going to trip over her own ectoplasm. Uh, George, huh? George. Oh. I know, of course, that Mr. Gilbert Dressler sent you to me. He gave no reason for the arrangement except that you were his friend. Oh, well, Mr. Dressler just likes to be mysterious. I understand that ten years on the desert can do that to a person. He is obsessed with the idea that I bring harm to Gabrielle Turner. He is a stupid man. Yeah. Well, uh, what about this crystal ball here? What can it tell you about me? Very well. Seek yourself in the past and the future. Margot will seek with you. Believe, Margot, and the dimness in the crystal will be swept away and will become as a sudden burst of light. Revealing all. See? Even now the shadow's clear. The image asserts itself. There has been violence and terror in your life. Well, I can't say you're wrong about that. As if many men had come together to do you harm. In a vastness too great for the eye to scan. A vastness? In a desert, perhaps. Many men and many machines. Yes, it is a desert. And you are wearing a uniform. George, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you tell me where this desert is? In what country? Oh, it is plain. Should it startle you that I know? To Margot, the crystal has no secret. It is the Sahara. Oh. <laughs> North Africa, huh? 
Of course, Mr. Valentine. What made you ask oh, that? Oh, oh. oh, come off it, kiddo. How gullible do you expect one man to be? What are you talking about, Mr. Valentine? Madame Wango, if you get paid for this sort of thing, I'm going out and rent a sarong and a Turkish towel. That's all I need for an easy life. That and a detective phone with a hidden mic. Get out of here. Now, wait a minute. I've got a couple of other things that I would... Get out of here. Hussein. Oh, why don't you let that poor guy alone, Margot? Making him stand behind those drapes all this time? Perhaps one day you will laugh yourself to death on your poor humor, Mr. Valentine. George, he's got a gun. Don't worry, Brooksy. Madame Margot can't afford to get rough. This kind of melodrama sometimes leads to scandal. That wouldn't be good business for her. He wearies me with his glibness, Hasim. You should have kept looking in your crystal ball, Margot. Then you could have warned your number one boy. <laughs> Always keep that gun close to his side. You fool. Let's get out of here, Brooksy. Okay, George. You will regret this. Oh, look, honey, don't go dramatic on me. Save those pear-shaped tones for Gabrielle Turner. I don't understand, George. How did she know you were in North Africa? Because she had us tuned in with her little detective phone before she came into the room. Oh. Brooksy, when I was telling you about it, I lied to you purposely. I saw North Africa once from an airplane 10,000 feet up at nighttime. Well, now that we know that Margot reads past, presents, and futures by direct wire, what are we going to do? Have dinner, Brooksy. Oh, fine. And we've got a date with a few assorted ghosts. Oh, fine. <laughs> But how about the rest of these people here, Mr. Dressler? Are they friends of the family, too? A cult of vultures, Mr. Valentine. Parasites of the late Maddie Turner, whose interest in spiritualism is heightened by the free champagne served before every seance. Oh, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, my dear. Uh, this is Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. How do you do? How do you do? I suppose you're welcome here, both of you. Even though you've come to sneer at us. Oh, I wouldn't put it that way, Gabriel. We're just here to take a look. There have been scoffers before. Please understand that you've been invited only because Gilbert insisted upon it. Uh, Gabrielle! Uh, oh. Oh, there you are. Have you explained to Gilbert's guests how stupid they are? Hey, where do you get all your information, lady? I am Gabrielle's aunt, young lady, Vida Patterson. Oh. I happen to concern myself with the caliber of people with whom Gabrielle is forced to associate. What makes you think Miss Brooks is a bad influence, Miss Patterson? Oh, Gabrielle is emotionally high-strung. People like you, people from the outside, upset her. Ah, from the outside. <clears throat> uh, my dear, uh, the rest of the party is going into the sanctuary. Madame Margot is waiting. Oh, George, not again. Yep. Let's give the old gal another rumble. Oh. Hey, George. The hair on the back of my neck is going to look funny with my permanent. This thing is scary. Yeah, with all the trimmings. This sanctuary is a great backdrop for Dracula. Candlelight and polka music for a vampire. Have the courtesy to be quiet. Nothing must disturb Madame Margot while she reaches her control. Control? What's that? A voice, Miss Brooks. Margot's link with the spirit world. You'll see, it's very weird. The voice with which Margot speaks will not be her voice at all. Gilbert, why did you bring these people here? Hush, child, hush. There are alien presences here. Contact has been difficult. But there is a message to one who has traveled from a far place to be here. George. Listen. So many years, so much time. Gilbert, listen to me, Gilbert. It's, it's Janice. This is impossible. Please listen to me, Gilbert. Janice, what are you doing here? I thought you ran off to Cairo with Cecil. Rid yourself of those who would bring harm to Margot. They are evil. Remember, Gilbert, I've always known what's best for you, my dear. You haven't changed a bit, have you, Janice? Always showing up at the wrong time and knowing what's best. Janice, go away. Get rid of them. Get rid of those who do us harm. You never told me about her, Gilbert. You never mentioned a girl named Janice. She was always interfering. Always. 
I hardly expected her to pop up again, my dear. There is another message here from one who has newly passed over. She is suffering greatly. Oh, no. She has been murdered, shot. She suffers from the anguish of knowing her murder. Oh, no. I couldn't help it. I couldn't. Gabriel, <laughs> what is it, child? Her murderer has not been avenged. There is blood on the hands of one who has shed it. Listen. She is trying. Stop it! Make her leave me alone. I killed her. Of course I killed her. Leave me alone, all of you. Oh, George. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Yeah, this time, Brooksy, the spirits have the right word for it. Murder. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about problems, major and minor. You know, a ring that refuses to come off a finger may seem like a major problem, but usually a bit of soap and water does the trick. Stuck rings in an automobile engine would be something else again, and could be very costly, in fact. But today, compounded RPM motor oil keeps the danger of stuck piston rings at just about zero. Even more important, the added compounds in RPM put a stop to the biggest bugaboo of engine wear, internal rust. They also prevent crankcase foaming and stop the formation of gum and lacquer in your car's engine. And a cleaner engine system means extra life for your car. Add up all these advantages of RPM motor oil, and it's easy to see why motorists choose RPM 2 to 1 over any other motor oil in the West. Try this premium quality motor oil tomorrow. Get RPM at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, there's an old saying that murder will out, but when it comes pointing its finger from the spirit world, then George finds himself tangled in one of the strangest cases he's ever come across. And at the precinct house, the day after the seance, Lieutenant Riley puts it this way. Valentine, ever since I heard that girl confess to murder while she was talking to a ghost, I've just been breathless waiting for you to drop around. Yeah, it's a weirdie, isn't it, Lieutenant? Well, maybe your boys just didn't feel like being clever the day Mrs. Turner was murdered. Is that why you called it a hunting accident? Now, look, Miss Brooks, I'm not perfect like your boyfriend, Valentine. And I'd be the first one to admit that. But as a matter of fact, I personally contribute to the support of you guys. A little thing called taxes. I'm just perfect enough to want a little action for my money. Dialed in time three months ago, we were called in by Vita Patterson to investigate the death of her sister, Maddie Turner. We called it an accident because that's the way the setup looked. Because there wasn't any reason to call it murder. Well, whatever happened to that suspicious nature of yours, Lieutenant? Yeah. A prominent society woman is found dead, shot. A woman who surrounds herself with a house full of sponging friends. Don't you remember what your correspondence course says about a situation like that, Lieutenant? Uh, look, look. When a person is found dead with her finger on the trigger, we consider the reports of ballistics, medical examiner, and a dozen other experts. Then we fumbling police arrive at certain conclusions. In the death of Mrs. Turner, that conclusion was accidental death. Here, here. Bravo, Lieutenant. But how could so many people fumble about the same thing? Uh, yeah. Does that confession mean that Gabrielle is going to stand trial for murder, Lieutenant? Well, I doubt it. In that household of crazy people, she's the squirreliest of the lot. Unless her aunt, Mrs. Patterson, isn't just a little bit ahead of her. Then Gabrielle will be committed to an institution. Yep. Uh, She's home now under the care of a physician and under police guard. She can't even remember confessing, much less how or why she killed anybody. Uh Uh-huh. You wouldn't mind if Claire and I dropped in on the Turner family, would you, Lieutenant? Well, sure, sure, go ahead. You'd be in good company. But uh, take my advice and hide when the wagon comes. Those young interns sometimes have trouble figuring who fits the straitjacket. Lieutenant, I secretly love all men who say nice things like that. Oh, it's you two. I'm beginning to hope that I'd only hired you in a dream. Look, Gilbert, let's both get real grown up and face facts. You really did hire me, and we're both stuck. I'm not in the habit of paying people to bungle their jobs. 
It must be quite obvious that I don't need your alleged services any longer. But we haven't finished our job, Mr. Dressler. So if you will return my fee, which you have not earned... Oh, what? yeah, yeah. Well, let's chat, Gilbert. Mind if we come inside? I certainly do. Thanks a lot. Close the door, Brooksy. Now, look, Gilbert, you hired me to do a job. I'm not backing out of it. Why should you? You admit you failed, don't you? You don't have much room to talk, Mr. Dressler. Who was that Janice you were talking to last night? Janice is dead. She died nearly ten years ago. Ten years? Then how did she... I dislike to say it, but even I am now convinced that Margot is not a fraud. How could she have known about Janice? Oh, it's very simple. You blurted out Janice's name as soon as Margot began to broaden her age. Yeah, it's a good thing Margot didn't drop her H's, Mr. Dresser. You might have come up with the name of some little barmaid in Soho. You're not very amusing, young lady. Now, what about Gabrielle? Where is she? They've taken her away, Mr. Valentine. Poor girl. I was deeply attached to her. Uh Uh-huh. I'll bet her aunt has overcome, too. Vida Patterson is a remarkable woman. She buries her sorrow in her books. Books, ledgers would be a better word. Where is she? In the library. She explicitly informed me that she wishes to grieve. Well, now, that's very touching. Come on, Claire. What is it, Gilbert? I told you I wanted no interruptions unless it's absolutely necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Oh. Oh, it's the intruders again. Yes, I hate to take you away from your tears, Miss Patterson, but there are a few questions I want to ask you. And by what right? You're not the police? Oh, this won't take long. Just a moment of your lonely time and you can go right back to eating your heart out. What is it you want? I want to know a little bit more about the murder of Maddie Turner. It was murder, wasn't it? Oh, imagine the ingratitude of the child. Killing my poor sister after all the wonderful things we've done for her. Oh, yes, yes. She was so overcome by those wonderful things, she can't even remember killing your sister. Oh, Gabrielle has lapses of memory. An unfortunate trait which she inherited from her father's side of the family. Oh, well, this wealth you were talking about, what happens to that? Oh, how could you mention money at a time like this? (laughs) Well, let's mention it anyhow. Who gets it? Well, of course. Gabrielle inherited the mother's estate, and now that she will be declared insane, why, I suppose I... Well, I don't know. I, I've never given it a thought. No, I'll just bet you haven't. Well, thanks a lot, Miss Patterson. I just know it'll kill you every time you spend a penny of all those thousands of dollars. Get out of here! Miss Patterson doesn't like us, George. Yeah, we've got crazy ideas, Brooksy. All right, come on. Let's go see whether one of them will pay off. makes people like that, George? Well, if you're talking about the zanies who wander in and out of the Turner Mansion, the answer is money. From here, that's the only way the rag makes sense. Well, I don't want to crowd you with funnies, George, but there's Hasim again. Huh? Yeah, he's planted up ahead there. The corner of the house this time. How do you like that? See him in the shadow? Yeah. Let's find out what he's got on his mind. <laughs> Still looks sinister, even in a pinstripe suit. Yeah. Well, Hasim. Doing a little snooping on your own? You go to great lengths to involve yourself in difficulty, my rash friend. Brace yourself, Hasim. You're no friend of mine. Furthermore, you are in our way. Georgie's and... still got that gun. Watch it, Brooksy. I'll take the gun quick. Here, yeah, George. Here you are. Yeah, you shouldn't carry such things around after dark, Hasim. And so it doesn't accidentally go off and hurt somebody, I'll just take out the clip. And the extra bullet in the chamber. You will be sorry you did this. There yeah, you are. Take your plaything. I'll keep the bullets. Now, why did Madame Margot send you here? I know nothing. You're so right. Okay, take off, nature boy. Beat it. I'm tired of playing patty cake with people out of storybooks. You know what? It adds up, Claire. It really does. It does? Huh? Brooksy, I want you to get down to headquarters as soon as possible. Tell Lieutenant Riley to get that whole crew together, all those pixies who were at the seance last night. Including the spirits, George? Including Gabrielle Turner. Tell the lieutenant to bring them all back to the sanctuary. But why? If there really was a murder, Brooksy, I won't be able to live with myself until I find out the reason for it. Right now, I've got a date with a crystal ball. And maybe I'll get a preview. Margot... In the jargon of the street, your chances aren't worth a dime. Stop speaking in riddles, Mr. Valentine. What's on your mind? You are, Margot. Madam, accessory after the fact, Margot. The fact being murder. If I were acquainted with your brand of humor, perhaps I would be amused. I doubt it. Look, you're worried, honey. That's why you tag that small-time Svengali on me. You can be sent to jail for years and years, and that's really something to worry about. What are you trying to say? Well, I hate to sully those shell-like ears of yours with nasty words, Margot, but... 
Just take my advice and be my buddy for the next few hours. Why do you speak to me like this? As if I'm... As if you're a phony, and you are. You can throw your voice pretty well, but last night you threw it a little too far. What do you want me to do? I want you to finish that seance you started. It never did get done. But for what reason? (laughs) So you can turn state's evidence. Now, a clever girl like you can appreciate a good twist. Mm, I think I understand. Yes, I think you do. So let's not keep the cult waiting, Margot. Besides, Lieutenant Riley is a very impatient man. Valentine, if you can figure out how this girl murdered Maddie Turner by asking Maddie Turner how she did it, I'm going to turn in my badge, buy a turban and a crystal ball, and apprehend criminals while I sit in my easy chair. <laughs> Just stick around, Lieutenant. This Margot will give you a lesson you'll never forget. <laughs> You know, that's the wonderful thing about being a police lieutenant. Every amateur I meet wants to give me lessons. But Margot's no amateur. All these people think she's the greatest thing that ever happened to them. They believe whatever Margot says. Valentine, haven't you been the cause of enough suffering for poor Miss Patterson? I feel it is my obligation to defend her against your ill manners. Yes, and I demand to know by what authority you have entered my house. Why have you brought Gabrielle here? I'll have the law. You already have it. Lieutenant, this is Miss Patterson. She lives here. You got troubles, Miss Patterson? Oh, I... Why, why, no, it's just that it's, it's Gabrielle. Gabrielle's okay. She's in the sanctuary with the doctor. I wouldn't worry about her. Maybe we'd better go in. Margot's had plenty of time to get wound up. Okay. Hello, Gabrielle. How do you feel? I don't understand. This all happened before, long ago. A very long time ago. Yes, now, you're all right. Just take it easy. I really didn't mean to. I didn't hate my mother, you know. Just sit tight, Gabrielle. Whatever happens, don't say anything. You understand? Don't say anything. Of course. Of course, I understand. I killed her, but I didn't mean to. Tonight, for the last time, we seek to journey together into a strange land. A strange land where familiar faces and forgotten dreams dwell without perishing. Already the vapors which cloud our way are cleared. There is someone here who is trying to get through. She wishes to speak. Is this why you dragged me here, Valentine? I know a ventriloquist when I hear one. They know a lot more than the rest of these people. Just get this pitch, Lieutenant. has been grievously wrong. There is so much that stands in her way of happiness here. She wishes to speak to us. She says an injustice has been done. The way is clear. Peace. Stop her. Peace. Can't you see this is a fraud? You don't know what you're doing. Send her back. Listen. You're breaking up the party, Miss Patterson. Why don't you relax? Have they harmed you, Gabrielle? Maddie. And you, Vida, all that blood, your sister's blood, mine, murder. Oh, stop it, stop it, please, please. Murder, you watch me die. Death becomes you, my sister. Oh, send her back. Oh, let's stop it. I did it, I did it, I killed her, I killed her. I'll take over from here, Valentine. Well, how about that, Brooksy? A killer trapped by a ghost. Only there wasn't any ghost. George, if I've got to say it, and I've got to say it, huh? you're a genius. Oh, that's okay, Brooks. You can say it. But all I had to know was that Marga was a phony, and Vita Patterson thought Marga was always on the level. Except once, that is. Astound me, genius. What do you mean, except once? Vita paid Margo to produce Maddie Turner and frighten Gabrielle into confessing. Why should Gabrielle confess to a murder she didn't do? Brooksy, there's a lot of evil people in this world. Vita Patterson is one of them. She knew her niece had a memory blank the night of the murder. So all this time, she's been making Gabrielle believe that she killed her own mother. So all you did was make Margo produce Maddie Turner again? Yep, only this time, Maddie smoked. When Vita heard an imitation of her sister's voice, she thought it was the real thing. It was too much for her. Oh, well, there's just one thing I still don't understand, George. What happened when you went back to see Margot? Oh, she read my palm. Yeah, she said I had a wonderful heart line. Oh? Uh-huh. Margot looked at my hand and said I was a lover. Oh. Well, I got a pretty good heart line myself. Yeah? Look at it, George. Yeah. Do you know what I think, George? No. Tell me what you think. 
Well, I think we ought to get our heart lines crossed and see what happens. And now, a word of importance to motorists. Maybe you've run into the kind of motorist who always says, Grease is grease, and it doesn't matter where you take your car for lubrication service. Well, don't you believe him. At independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations, they use many specialized grades of RPM greases and oils to give your car a thorough lubrication. And each one is tailor-made to do a wear-saving job at some vital wear point on your car. The regular 1,000-mile grease job at these stations is done by trained experts. They follow a lube chart approved by the manufacturer of your car. And they take pride in doing a spick-and-span clean job for you. Next time your car is due for lubrication service, rely on the standard station or the independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Hey, Brooksy, tell me something. Yes, George? How would you like to play Cigarette Girl at the Kit Kat Club tomorrow night? You mean in one of those fluffy short skirts and long black stockings? Yeah, the works. Yeah, but what are you talking about, George? We're going to stage a little drama, Brooksy, with a cast of two. A Carnation and Art Gary. And I have a hunch the Carnation will be the star of the show. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by Morton Fine and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Don Morrison as Gilbert, Irene Tedrow as Margot, Sarah Selby as Vida, Jean Bates as Gabrielle, and Lal Chan Mehra as Hasim. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. On behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If it's something you can't handle and it must remain strictly confidential, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine... I've worked very hard to get what I want out of life. A successful marriage. A husband who's highly respected in the community. Everything. Now, by one of her foolish whims, my own sister threatens to destroy all that. She's been missing for two days and must be found without any publicity. That's why I'm calling on you. Calling on you instead of the police. Call me this afternoon when my husband is sure not to be here. Tuxedo Lake, 673. I'll be at your office any time you say. Signed, uh, Edith Wilder. Tuxedo Lake, huh? Uh-huh. That little body of water's become very fashionable lately. Well, I don't want to sound grasping, George, but if the Wilders live on the exclusive island in Tuxedo yeah, Lake... Yeah, I know, Brooksy. The fee could be a thing of beauty. All right, call Mrs. Wilder for an appointment at the office tomorrow morning. <laughs> After thinking it over, Mr. Valentine, I decided to bring Angela's husband with me. Oh, Edith, you shouldn't have hired this man's services. Angela is free to do anything she chooses now. Leave this to me, Walter. Uh, this is my sister's husband, Mr. Philiston. Mr. Philiston, how do you do? My assistant, Miss Brooks. How do you do? Brooks. How do you do? Do you mind if she takes some notes? So far, I'm in the dark about this whole thing. Anytime you're ready. It'll take just a few not very pleasant words. 
Angela's disappeared again. This time, there's every reason to believe it'll cause a scandal none of us will ever live down. Oh, Edith. Uh, Mrs. Wilder, just how old is your sister? Well, she's two years younger than I am, 42. You'll get all the information you need, and I'm sure you'll know just how to proceed. You may as well tell him the whole truth, Edith, as long as you've gone this far. Walt, uh, do you want me to put all this down, George? No, no, Brooksy. I think we'll get to the point right now. Look, Mrs. Wilder, what about the whole truth? Oh, I wanted to avoid that. You see, Mr. Valentine, I'm Angela's third husband. Take it down from here, Brooksy. Right, George. The third man she's married through a matrimonial agency. And now corresponding with another man before she's even divorced from Walter. Oh, I see. No matter what happens, this must never come out. You don't know how people are out at Tuxedo Lake. Even if my own husband found this out... When I put the word confidential in my ad, Mrs. Wilder, I meant it. Now, Mr. Philiston, are you sure your wife was corresponding with another man? Yes, I found a letter from him and his picture in a bureau drawer. I tore it up right in front of her face and threw it in the fire. Well, that wasn't very smart. It might have helped you get a divorce without paying through the nose. Oh, I, I realize that now. What do you mean by that? Well, last Monday, I had lunch with Angela. She said she'd settled for 20000 in cash in our house on Tuxedo Island. And you mean you just shelled out $20,000 like that? Yes, that same afternoon, it... It seemed the easiest way. She threatened to sue me for desertion if I left her and take all the money I have if she took me to court and tied up my contracts. And Oh, I'm a builder, you know, and it would cost me much more than that. I just want you to bring Angela back here before she causes a scandal that will wreck all our lives. Mr. Philiston, would you recognize the man in that picture if you ever saw him? I, I can't be sure. I, I suppose so. I was so upset I don't even remember the name if, if there was one. Uh, George, don't you think we ought to get the name of that marriage club? I ought to know that. That's the way I met her. It's the Selby Friendship Club. Meet your companion for life. The important thing is this, Mr. Valentine. Walter is staying with me and my husband on the island. So far, we only told Richard that Angela is off visiting some friends. It must remain that way. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, you'd better give me the keys to your place, Philiston. Maybe I can pick up a lead there. Uh, here you are. Yeah, that's that. When a woman is just over 40, uh, well over 60... Oh, this is no time for you to feel sorry for yourself, Walter. Hey, yeah, Brooksy, take these keys. I'll meet you on the landing at Tuxedo Lake in a couple of hours. Then we'll go over to Mr. Philiston's house. Okay, George. Well, what are you going to do, Mr. Valentine? Pay a visit to the Selby Friendship Club. See what I can find out about Angela's unknown suitor. <laughs> No, Mr. Selby, I'm afraid I'm not mistaken. I can't believe it, Mr. Valentine. Not Angela Kramer Holloway, Philiston. Amazing how you remember the names of all her husbands. But, of course, you've been providing her with them for years. Young man, I don't like your cynical tone. So sorry. I guess I got out of the wrong side of the bed this morning. The Friendship Club serves a very definite purpose. Yeah, I know. Bringing together people with identical interests has proven much more successful than aimless courtships and haphazard romances. Our motto is meet your companion for life. Such as Mrs. Angela Kramer Holloway Philiston. <clears throat> Of course, there are exceptions, All right, but... let's skip the spiel, Cupid. It stands to reason that if Angela got the romantic urge again, she'd patronize the Friendship Club, which gave us such excellent service in the past. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, sir. I know of no correspondence between Mrs. Philiston and any of my clients. You sure about that? In fact, Mr. Valentine, I tore up Angela's card in our files. After a year, I assumed she was blissfully united with that nice elderly Mr. Philiston. Well, oh, don't get a nervous breakdown, friend. You can always type another card. Now, look, you put out a bulletin, don't you? Listing the different eager beavers bent on matrimony? Yes, indeed. Once every month. Well, if I could get a hold of your latest bulletin, maybe Mr. Philiston could spot the man he saw in that letter. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the new bulletin won't be off the press at the Bixby printers for another week. Then I shall be glad to let you see one. Thanks a lot. Oh, don't mention it. But if you think I'm just one of those fly-by-night marriage bureaus, you're sadly mistaken. I've spent 30 years bringing together people who thought they didn't have a soulmate in the world. Goodbye, world. Mr. Selby. <laughs> Well, George, it looks as though this trip to Philiston's house wasn't worth the boat ride across the lake. Yeah, Angel. Everything neat is a pin inside there. Not a sign of violence anywhere. Well, we don't have much to work on, do we? Well, I thought I could get something out of Selby. That was a complete washout. Oh, well, George. Yeah, Brooksy. May I say something? I mean, as a woman. <laughs> I wouldn't have you say it any other way. Oh. 
Well, did you notice Mrs. Philliston's closets? Like any other woman's, why? Stuffed to overflowing with furs, lined with dozens of dresses and racks of shoes. Look, this is no time to comment on feminine extravagance, Angel. Yeah, but how about feminine psychology? Huh? Well, members of our sex just don't leave all those frills and fripperies behind, especially when we're supposed to be running off with another man. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, Brooksy. You got something. Mm-hmm. Look, get to a phone. Okay, I saw one in the living room. Call the Wilders. If Edith doesn't want to walk over here, ask her for a quick inventory of her sister's things. Of course. She'll know if Angela took anything with her. How do you like that? She can't just be missing. Nothing is simple. never is, my friend. Hey, wh- where did you come from? Who are you, one of Angela's friends? <laughs> it's hard to tell. Sometimes they're young, sometimes they're old. What have you got to do with Angela? Oh, nothing. I'm just her son. Son? So you see, I speak with authority. Can I get your drink? Well, if you're her son, aren't you at all concerned about what's happened to her since Monday? I haven't been able to sleep one single night. Now, that's obvious. I have the greatest admiration for my mother and her assorted husband. I'm Bud Kramer. I spring from Mama's number one marriage club bargain. Are you going to be the fourth, Papa? The name's Valentine. I'm here to see if I can find your mother. Get out. Hey, now, wait a minute. I said get out. If you never find her, it'll be the best break I ever got. This house will belong to me and I'll come into some money. If you don't stop sticking your chin in my face, son, I'm going to have to do something about it. Oh, it's fine to have a mother you can respect. You know, you can always help her with her letters when she decides it's time for another husband. Well, didn't you hear me? Get out of here! Let's not be a problem, huh? Let's of my arm. You'd better go upstairs and go to bed. You've had a busy night. And you've been getting around today, too. Go on, sleep it off. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll sing myself to sleep with Brahms' lullaby. Or maybe I'll make it Mother McCree. Be sure to find my mother, Willa. Tell her how much a little boy needs her. George, who was that? What did he mean? We'll get to him later. What did Edith say? Hmm. Well, it's the strangest thing, darling. Yeah, what is? Edith says apparently Angela didn't take a stitch of clothing with her. And you know that blue plaid dress hanging over the chair in her bedroom? Yeah, I saw it. Well, Walter said that was the one she wore the day he gave her the $20,000 and she disappeared. With a towel around her or a bathing suit? Oh, no, Brooksy, this doesn't whack up at all. Yeah, I know. It's beginning to look more like something for homicide, not missing persons. Well, Lieutenant Riley is just going to love us when we present him with this case. Well, of course, we're not sure yet. Brooksy, I'm going to take one more stab at keeping this confidential. Meaning? A visit to Bixby Printers. I'd like to get a preview of next month's bulletin of the Friendship Club. I know Selby's bulletin hasn't come out yet, Mr. Bixby, but uh, could I take a look at the advance proofs? Well, I suppose I could do that for you. They're right over here. Oh, we'll have them back in the morning. We just want someone to take a look at. I, uh, I take it, Mr. Valentine, you're from the police. Well, uh, let's just say I'm working with the police. Well, okay, just so long I don't lose any time on the job. Yeah, they're right here in this file. I just had them out a couple hours ago. Selby called up and wanted something ripped out before he went to press. Oh. George, that would be after you talked to him. Yeah, okay, I know. Uh, look, Bixby, have you got that part Selby wanted left out? Was there a picture of a man in it? Mm, no, as I remember it, it was the listing of a lady. She must have changed her mind. Happens all the time. Sent the picture back to Mr. Selby by messenger. But uh, here, here's the copy that went with it, if you want to see it. Yeah. Friendship club member number 40. Young, attractive divorcee. Amiable, fun-loving, anxious to live life to the fullest. Major interests, good books, cooking, and so forth and so on. Well, that's a dead end. Yeah. All right, Mr. Bixby, we'll have these back to you in the morning first thing. I'll get back, Brooksy. You know, I'm beginning to feel like a tuxedo lake commuter. <laughs> Exclusive, George, but I'd hate to make this trip to the island every time I came home late. Yeah, it is kind of dark, Angel. But that green light way up ahead, that's the Philliston dock. Say, hey, what happens if Mr. Philliston doesn't recognize any of these Romeos in the bulletin as Angela's boyfriend? Well, suspecting what we do, Brooksy, we'll just have to dump the case in Lieutenant Riley's lap tomorrow morning. 
We won't be giving you much to work on, except our suspicions. And the fact that when a woman walks around with $20,000 in cash, she just naturally... Hey, Brooksy, that motorboat coming toward us. Well, they can see us. They've got their search right on us. Well, I, I can't see a thing with that glare. Turn, George, turn. They're coming right at us. Yeah, I'm trying. What's the matter with you? Oh, can you see it? Turn to tonight's adventure, George Valentine, in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about preparedness, and that summer holiday. If you're planning a vacation trip with the family car, here's a suggestion from a whole group of service folks, the men at Standard Stations and at Independent Chevron gas stations. As soon as you can, stop in. They'll be glad to give your car a troubleshooting vacation check. It's no fun to be way out in the middle of nowhere with a broken fan belt or sparkless spark plugs or a radiator that wants to be a geyser. To guard against that kind of mishap on your vacation, get a bumper-to-bumper inspection before you leave. Comes the day you're ready to start out, make sure your car has its two best highway friends, Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Motor Oil. Wherever your vacation takes you in the West, just keep in mind that the men at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations say... And mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. A small outboard motorboat heading toward the island in Tuxedo Lake. Suddenly, out of the darkness, roars a powerful motorboat. Its searchlight blinding George and Claire. A sudden, terrifying crash as the boat upsets, leaving its shaken occupants to struggle ashore. And now, a few minutes later, in front of the fireplace in the Philiston home, George and Claire are trying to puzzle out just what they might have stumbled on in this strange case of Angela Philiston. Angela, still married, but corresponding with a matrimonial club, and now missing for days. Oh, George, this fire feels wonderful. Yeah, it sure does. Well, there's one thing, sure... Whoever just tried to feed us to the fish is right here on Tuxedo Lake. Yeah, but what is it we know that we don't know we know? Oh, Brooksy, at this point, I don't know from nothing. The three people who might possibly want us out of the way are right here on this island. Bud Kramer, Angela's son who hates his own mother. Mr. Philiston, who got such a raw deal from Angela, the one and only time he used the services of the Friendship Club. Yeah, that's right. And Sister Edith, who said she'd do anything to keep a breath of scandal from the swank shores of Tuxedo Island. And all this doesn't exactly give you a comfortable feeling, does it? Brooksy, before we see Lieutenant Riley in the morning, we're going to check every boat tied up around this lake. George, where are you going? Hey, come here, Brooksy. Huh? George, the Philiston boat. Yeah, the Angela, tied up right here in front of the house, as innocent as you please. And look at this big dent right here on her nose, all the paint scraped off. Well, it looks more and more like it has to be one of those three. Hey. Hey, what the... There's somebody out there in the lake, George. Oh, what a night. Just hope whoever was using this boat tonight left the keys in it. Valentine, I've told you... I went into the village to celebrate. Sounds funny to me, bud. What have you got to celebrate with your mother missing? Well, that's what I was celebrating. Let's skip that routine. I was feeling pretty good, so I thought I'd swim across the lake. Clothes and all? Seemed like a good idea at the time. Suddenly I had to prove to myself that I was a reasonable facsimile of a man. Mm, Yeah. Guess I'm not in very good shape. How about this version, bud? You tied up the Angela after you plowed into us. And you were swimming away from the island toward the shore. Then you'd be in the clear. I don't know what you two are talking about. I'll see about that later. Now, you go upstairs to your room and stay there. Look, you can't order me around. I said go to your room. Yeah, go to your room, buddy. When I was a kid, whenever I was in the way, Angela would say, go to your room, buddy. My adoring mother. Fun-loving. Anxious to live life to the fullest. But where's my wondering mother tonight? Hmm. I can't help feeling sorry for that boy, George. To tell you the truth, I wasn't listening to him very hard. What? 
These red flagstones in front of the fireplace. Yeah, what about them? Red stains on red flagstones wouldn't show up very clearly ordinarily. But the light of the fire brings them out. Huh? Look at them, Brooksy. Is... is that blood? Could be. This might be the sign of violence we didn't find when we went over this place before. Well, if you're right, Lieutenant Riley will certainly have something to work on when we come back here in the morning. And if I'm right, Brooksy, it means Angela Philiston was murdered. All right, Valentine, where are these blood stains you dragged me out here to see? But, George, they're gone. Wait a minute, what is this? Someone scrubbed these flagstones clean during the night. You don't say. Oh, what a metal midget I turned out to be. I should have stayed right here while you went back to town, Brooksy. But how could anybody know what we found? Oh, well, at least I'm bright enough to know the answer to that one. Somebody knew every move we made last night. Ah, stop sounding like a bee picture. Next, you'll be talking about trap doors and hidden passages. Oh, that's not fair, Lieutenant. I get dragged out of bed. I bring the best men in the department out here with me. They dredge the lake, and all they're coming up with is some undernourished trap. All right, all right, Riley. Give me a chance to think, will you? Hayes here. Look at him. One of the best men in our lab, crawling around on his knees like a charwoman, looking for something that isn't here. I'll be through here in a minute, Lieutenant. Oh, I can't thank you enough for that bracing, invigorating trip across the lake, Valentine. But I've got better things to do with my time. Lieutenant, somebody tried to run us down on the lake last night. And he was using Philiston's boat. Yeah. Oh, uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, what is it, Hayes? These red particles between the cracks in the floor here. They might mean something. All right, be careful with those, Hayes. Very careful. Got them in this bottle. You want to initial the label, Lieutenant, in case we ever need it for evidence? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But just remember this, Valentine. If this proves to be ketchup from a weenie roast they had in this fireplace, I'll... I'll... So help me, I'll do it! What do you say we wait and see, Lieutenant? It may not be ketchup at all. Just barbecue sauce. The kind that's too hot to handle. Well, Valentine was right. It was blood, all right. Human blood. Angelus, I don't understand. Who'd want to kill her? Oh, I can't believe it. We found it's the same blood type as your sister's, Mrs. Wilder. Oh, no. No. Now, that's not going to help at all, Mrs. Wilder. I know I may have sounded selfish and petty, just thinking of the scandal Angela might cause, but now that it looks as though my sister was murdered, none of that matters. All right, folks, all right, let's settle down and do some straight talking, huh? Uh, Mr. Philiston. Yes, Lieutenant. Well, this is the way it shapes up. Your wife never left the island. If she did, she was carried out after she was murdered in front of that fireplace. And we'll find the body if we have to dig up every inch around Tuxedo Lake. Uh, Lieutenant, I admit I wanted to hate Angela when I found out what she was doing. Uh, but I'll give everything I own to find the man who killed her. Mr. Valentine, you were trying to track down the man Angela was corresponding with. What did you find out at that friendship club? I did have some pictures for Mr. Philiston to identify. But they're all at the bottom of the lake now. Yes, very convenient. Uh, about the $20,000, Mr. Philiston, that you were supposed to have given your wife. No, what about it? We checked into all of your accounts. There's no record of any withdrawal like that. Well, I, I took that money out of a safe deposit box. Well, that's not where most people keep that much money, is it, Mr. Philiston? Oh, no, but being in the building game, it pays to be able to put your hands on ready cash. All right, that's your story. Oh, I know what you're thinking, but you're wrong. Maybe it was foolish to resort to a marriage club. But I was lonely. I, she never brought me any happiness, but I... I never heard Angela. Well, we're going to stay right here at headquarters because we got a lot of things to talk about. I'm still checking on Bud Kramer's story. All he does is prattle about his amiable, fun-loving mother. Oh, he's still at it, huh? Look, Brooksy. Yes, George. You stick right here, Lieutenant... You don't mind if I duck out for a few minutes, do you? No, I won't waste time asking you why. Oh, but I'll tell you. There's a little angle to this case I overlooked. But I'm going to take care of it right now. Come on, Selby, give. You were holding out on me before, weren't you? Well, I... I answered all of your questions, to the best of my knowledge. You mean you just told me as much as you thought I should know. But now you got to open up, Selby. This is a murder case, and the police are in on it. 
Oh, dear. Well, come on, give. All right. You understand, I had to think of my business, what it might sound like if Angela's disappearance ever got into the papers. You know Never how... Never mind he... that, Cupid. Get to the point. Yes, yes, of course. <clears throat> I suppose I should have told you that Angela was the second wife of uh, Walter Phyllis and met through the Friendship Club. Well, well, surprise. That's the truth. Some names, Selby, some facts. Well, the name of Philiston's first wife was Frida Merritt. She was a widow, pretty well off. Yeah? They were married five years ago, and then she... Then what? She she was out alone fishing about two years ago. Her boat turned over, and she was drowned. But it was an accident, Mr. Valentine. The police said it was. Uh-huh. Better get your hat, Selby. Why? Why, where are we going? Police headquarters. I want you to repeat that story to Lieutenant Riley. I think we found the answer to just what's been happening over there on Tuxedo Island. Well, thanks, Mr. Selby. Now, uh, what about this, Philiston? I, I suppose I should have known this would have come out anyway. Why didn't you tell us before that you got your first wife through Selby's Friendship Club? Yes, you made us believe you were just a lonely man. And that was the first time you ever did anything like that. Uh, does any man ever want to admit that he was played for a fool twice? What's that supposed to mean? Frieda and I weren't too happy after a while. And, and were... she died. Well, believe me, we're going to check into that accident, and much more thoroughly this time, now that we know what we're looking for. That was an accident. And what about Angela? Oh, I don't know what happened to Angela after I gave her the $20,000. Of which we find no record. I'm sorry, Mr. Felliston, but I had to tell them what I knew. Oh, leave me alone. Oh, I do hope there'll be as little mention of the Friendship Club as possible in this affair. Is that all you've got to worry about, Mr. Selby? Of course, Miss Brooks. I've spent years and years building up this... Okay, Selby, okay, you can beat it now. We'll call you when we need you. Yes, Lieutenant. Of course. Just a minute, Lieutenant. Huh? Is it your usual practice to let a murderer walk out of your office? Oh. What are you talking about? You mean Selby? What kind of a joke is this supposed to be? I told you all I knew. Let me in on this, Valentine. Me too. I'd certainly like to know what you're talking about. You had me on the hook for a long time, Selby, until I started remembering a few things. Lieutenant, he doesn't know what he's saying. Well, uh, suppose we listen anyway. And stop squirming, Mr. Lonely Hearts. You can't talk your way out of this. It's there in black and white. Please, Mr. Valentine, tell us what you know. When I first walked into your office, Selby, you said you thought Mrs. Philiston was happily married. Well, uh, yes. You said you even took a card out of the file and tore it up. That's right. But then why did you have her name listed in your new bulletin as a likely marriage prospect? That's a lie. Friendship club member number 40, young, attractive divorcee, amiable, fun-loving, anxious to live life to the fullest. Of course. That was a description of Angela. We never thought of it because we were looking for a man. Those are the same words her son keeps repeating like a drunken parrot. Words he could never forget because they were the ones Angela always used when she was looking for a new husband. That's the same way she described herself in the ad I answered. Lieutenant, you don't Save think... it, Cupid. You just ran your business too well. And that's what's going to hang you. <laughs> George, I still don't understand what reason Selby had for killing Angela. Because Cupid got double-crossed, Angel. Double-crossed? Yep. According to Riley, Selby had quite a little racket on the side. Like Angela, for instance. Oh? He saw she was getting restless with a man so much older than herself. I see. So why not get a nice fat settlement from the old boy? The Friendship Club can always come up with a new husband. They would have split that 20000 Brooksy. But when she said, no, go, and if you do anything about it, I'll go to the police, he killed her and buried her body. Hmm. Selby didn't miss a trick, did he? Even to using Philiston's boat to run us down. Well, he knew what the police would think when they learned about how he married the first Mrs. Philiston and how she died. Which, by the way, was an accident. Oh, darling, I'm so glad. Hmm? That we met in a nice, normal way. Hmm? Oh, yeah. A USO canteen. Yeah, I remember. You were one of the hostesses. Yeah. yeah. You walked up and said demurely, what about it, soldier? Dance. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it beautiful? Yeah. And then I said, uh... And that was that. After all, no girl could resist such a pretty compliment. <laughs> Yes, 
It's after 8 o'clock, and every minute counts. Mary's going to lead the promenade at the senior ball, if she ever gets there. Right now, she's with Roger in his car, and there's a big silence. Roger choked the engine and flooded the carburetor. Too bad. He should have used Chevron Supreme gasoline in his car. Special blending agents in this premium quality gasoline assure instant starts. Speedy warm-up, powerful getaway in heavy traffic driving. Fast starts and all the power your car can handle wherever you're driving in the West. That's because Chevron Supreme is scientifically tailored to each different climate and altitude zone. Whether you're driving a new car or one that's many years old, you'll like the new get-up-and-go that Chevron Supreme gives your car. Ask for it tomorrow at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Ah! <laughs> oh, Mr. Jimmy, what was that? One of the many voices of darkness that echo through the tunnel of love. Oh, calm yourself, Claire. Well, what's that up ahead? Yeah, what is that dim light, Jimmy? It seems to be coming from the wall of the tunnel. It looks like a man. Maybe he's in trouble. You better hurry. Patience. We can travel only as fast as the water flows through the tunnel. It's like fate carrying us. That man's got a gun in his hand. Yeah, point it right at us. Down on the boat, everybody. That guy means business. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Irene Tedrow as Edith, Paul McVeigh as Walter, Jack Edwards as Bud, Joe Forte as Selby, and Stanley Farrar as Bixby. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If it's too hot for you to handle and far off the beaten track, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. My dear sir, if uh, you're a moviegoer at all, you must know me, Peter Murch, the small, ineffectual man everyone laughs at as soon as he appears on the screen. But uh, there's nothing humorous about my present dilemma. After 30 years, I'm to be starred in my next picture. But unless you can help me, I'll have to say no to this dream of a lifetime. This is hard to explain in so many words. But if you'll meet me at the Farm Food Vegetarian Restaurant at 1 o'clock today, I'll explain everything. Signed, urgently, Peter Murch. Oh, sure, Brooksy. You know, that gnome-like character from the movies? Oh, Casper Milk Toast himself. That's the guy. The hand-packed little man who puts galoshes over his rubbers when it rains. <laughs> George Valentine, maker of stars. Hey, I wonder how I fit into this program. Well, I can't wait to find out. Well, then, on to Mr. Murch. Oh, but just one thing, George. Yeah, what's that, Angel? Well, if we have to have lunch at a vegetarian restaurant, could we stop off for a, a hamburger first? <laughs> Veggie burgers. I insist we have veggie burgers for lunch.
Badger burgers? Yes, indeed, Miss Brooks. And if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know they were made of nuts and choice legumes. Peas, beans, uh, Yeah, and... I'm sure they're going to be real tasty. But uh, what about your letter? What's on your mind, Mr. Merch? Oh, dear. I knew that letter would sound confusing. To say the least. You see, Mr. Valentine, I had a long talk with my psychoanalyst. And you know what? What? I'm uh, schizophrenic. Oh, no. I'm not one person. I'm two. Battling furiously with each other. Who's winning? And I'm not really that mild, retiring little man that millions of people know. No. There's another side of me that craves excitement, even violence. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Merch. But it's quite true, young man. My psychoanalyst tells me I just can't go on being a house divided. No. I simply must involve myself in some kind of uh, exciting adventure. Well, what does your doctor expect you to do? Go out and kiss the first beautiful blonde you see on the street? Uh, oh, no, no, no. I'm serious, Mr. Valentine. Look at me. Practically a nervous wreck. I simply can't go on being the prim Peter Merch my public expects of me. When the director says, lights, camera, I begin to shake. So that's the other side of me coming out. Oh, that's bad. Yes, I break into a cold sweat. I, I feel like screaming right out there in front of everybody. Well, maybe all you need is a good scream. Oh, no, it isn't that simple. My psychoanalyst says I've been playing the timid soul in my personal life as well as on the screen. And it's affecting me. Anyway, I can't go into this new picture. Oh, but Mr. Merch, you've worked so hard all these years. And this is your first starring role. And it would be my first failure, too, in my mental condition. And uh, you want me to provide the excitement? Yes, Mr. Valentine. Uh, perhaps introduce me to some low, disreputable characters. Uh, take me to places where almost anything could happen, you know. You really think that would help? Well, my psychoanalyst seems to think so. Uh, you will help me, won't you, Mr. Valentine? Well, uh, uh, I'll pay your regular fee and whatever expenses we incur. Uh, well, okay, it's a deal. We'll see what forms of mild excitement we can find for you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Valentine. I'll be grateful to you as long as I live. Uh, can we start now? Oh, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to make some plans. Uh, what about 8 o'clock tonight? You see, I usually don't go out hunting excitement, Mr. Merch. As a rule, it just happens. Oh, no, George. You're not going to take poor Mr. Merch to Mark Logan's grotto. Well, he wants excitement. Yeah, but not that low dive. He'll faint as soon as he gets in the door. Oh, darling, Mark Logan is a respectable citizen these days. He's gone straight. Yeah, in a crooked sort of way. He's running a genteel pool parlor and so-called grill. And if a fight breaks out now and then, you can't blame Mark. <laughs> Try and hit me with a pool cue, are you? Ah, you had a comedy. I seen you move that number seven ball when you thought I wasn't looking. Why are you... Oh, 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 oh Mr. Valentine. Oh, my goodness. This will show you. Well, hey, you are, Mr. Merch. Life on the raw. Oh, my, this is exciting. Third brawl in one hour. Just what the doctor ordered. Okay, let that mug get up or beat his brains in. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you apart. Come on now, you two lugs. Break it up and get back to your game. I'm running a respectable joint here. Not yet, Logan. Not before I split his skull with his chair. <laughs> oh, 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 no. oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, another inch, oh. Mr. Merch, and that chair would have parted your head. Yeah, and permanently. Okay, beat it, both of you. Finish it out in the alley. All right, Logan, it won't take me long. I'll make you look like a pot of hamburger, brother. And I'll forget it. <laughs> you gotta excuse him, Mr. Valentine. The boys get kind of playful once in a while. Oh, sure, Mr. Logan. And you lose more pool cues that way. Oh, uh, Mr. Merch, we'd better get out of here before things really get rough. Oh, I wouldn't think of it for a moment. I I'm just beginning to feel better. Oh. Uh, Mr. Merch. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Here's a nickel. Well, thank you. Why don't you get something on the jukebox over there? I, uh, I want to talk to Mr. Logan a minute. Oh, this is very exciting. Evening, I've been waiting. Don't pay no attention to them numbers, Mr. Merch. Wherever you put your nickel, all you get is Mother McCree. That's my favorite. George, I'm afraid we've underestimated our timid soul. You can't get enough. Yeah, and you certainly did your best, Logan. Yeah, which brings up a point, Mr. Valentine. I don't want to be mercenary or nothing like that. Yeah? But there's a question of money. Joe and Alex just now almost killed themselves. There's the mother two fights we framed up. <laughs> okay, Logan, here you are. This ought to take care of the boys. Yeah, thanks. Say, if I knew you was willing to pay this much, I could have fixed up something real messy for the old boy. Oh, that song. Ain't it beautiful? 
Mother McCree. Yeah, sure. Got any other ideas for excitement, Logan? Well, that little guy don't scare easy. Now, wait. How about this? When you people leave the joint, I'll get the boys to drive up in a big black sedan. Yeah? They grab the little guy and take him out in the country for a spell. <laughs> you mean kidnap him? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't put it that way, Miss Brooks. They lock him in a cellar for a couple of days, keep him tied up. Ain't gonna hurt him, huh? Oh. Hey, hold it, Logan. That's going a little too far. Yeah. Eh. I've got an idea. Yeah. And I think it'll work, too. What's that? Here's what you do. You take Mr. Murch out to the seaside amusement park. Oh, after this, a ride on the Ferris wheel is going to leave him cold. Oh, it's nothing like that. You're going to take him through the tunnel of love. Oh, Mr. Logan, I'll admit you can find a certain kind of excitement in the tunnel of love. But I doubt if Peter Murch is my type. Uh, he was talking to me, Brooksy. He's not your type, either. Well, what I was thinking, Mr. Valentine, is uh, I happen to know the guy who runs the tunnel of love. His name is Len Dimmick. Oh, goody, George. Maybe we can get a special discount. What I mean is I'll call up Len and have him take the trip through the tunnel with you, personal. He's one of them practical jokers, so he'll play along with the gig. Now, dream up a couple of stunts. Leave it to Len to find a way to scare the pants off here, Mr. Murch. Well, it's worth a try, Logan, and the night's getting shorter. i got to earn my fee. You want to get out of that amusement park quick, better take Walton Boulevard. They're tearing up Grayson Avenue. Okay, thanks a lot, Logan. Oh, Mr. Murch. Hmm? Yes, Mr. Valentine? Uh, if you can drag yourself away from Mother McCree, we'd like you to join us in a blood-curdling journey through the Tunnel of Love. Oh, just think of it. The three of us, alone, together. This should be real exciting. Nice racket you got here, Jimmy. Selling five minutes worth of darkness? Darkness is a valuable commodity, Mr. Valentine. It... it is? Yeah. Just like I was telling Mr. Murch here. Well, uh, after all those gruesome things you've been telling us, I, I don't think I want to hear any more. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Murch. Jimmy is right. Now, could you find a cozier place for a murder than a tunnel of love? Yeah, that reminds me. I remember a happy couple who took a ride through here... Just for a little innocent smoochie. And then... Yes? Suddenly, death struck. A silent, cruel blow. I, uh, I wish we had some light in here. What? In the tunnel of love? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, Jimmy. It was an unsolved crime, wasn't it? Often wondered how the poor man was killed. And how the young lady felt when she heard him scream. Here, in the darkness. Oh, oh, Mr. Dimmick, what was that? Oh, one of the many voices of darkness that echo through the tunnel of love. Just calm yourself, Mr. Murch. Well, <laughs> I wasn't really frightened at all, Mr. Valentine. Uh -huh. You're a brave man, Mr. Murch. Nobody knows what the next step into the darkness may lead to. Nobody knows... Oh. Mr. Dimmick! <laughs> I think our friend missed his profession. He should have been an actor. Mr. Valentine, Mr. Dimmick, I, I think he's fainted. Huh? Fainted? And his hair, uh, I think it's blood. Oh, what are you talking about? Uh, uh, Wait, my, my head. Let me get to it. George, he's not doing it. I'll light a match. Look at him. We've got to get him out of here, get him to a hospital. In, in my... He, he's trying to say something to you, Mr. Valentine. What is it, Dimmick? What is it? What are you trying to say? He, he, he in my pocket. Oh. Transfer. Yeah, yeah. Take it. Bus. Transfer. Hold on. Huh? We'll get a doctor, Mr. Dimmick. He'll take care of you. Here, strike another match, will you, Mr. Murch? He, 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 he can't guess. Uh, yeah, I don't think... Dimmick has much use for a doctor now, Brooksy. George. But, Mr. Valentine, this can't be true. Why, the things like this simply don't happen. I'm afraid this is an exception to the rule, Mr. Murch. Dimmick's been murdered. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about how to be kind to your starter. 
It's often the little things that make your day a good one or a rough one. The simple business of starting your car, for example. If it's obstinate and gives you a bad time when you want to get going, it can add up to a lot of irritation. For fast starts every time, and wherever you're driving, just try Chevron Supreme gasoline in your car. This premium quality gasoline is climate-tailored, specially adapted to each different climate and altitude zone in the West. Day or night, summer or winter, you can depend upon it for fast starts. And that's a saving, too, of the power in your battery. What's more, Chevron Supreme gives your car smooth acceleration and extra power for rugged hills. Get a tank full tomorrow at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, here's the situation. You take on a cockeyed job because that happens to be your business. A character actor wants you to provide him with some excitement because his psychoanalyst told him he's been playing the meek, timid type so long, it's beginning to affect his work. So, you give Peter Murch a ride for his money, including a ride through the tunnel of love in an amusement park. And then, murder strikes in the darkness. Valentine. Yeah, Lieutenant Riley. Usually people manage to get killed in bed, in their home, or on the street. But Dimmick gets murdered in his own tunnel of love. And you're right there with him. Oh, I know it sounds fantastic, Lieutenant. But believe me, we were just trying to introduce a little excitement into Mr. Murch's life. That's right. <laughs> he was all very innocent. Ah. Oh, well, how was George to know anything like this would happen? Miss Brooks, I'm just a public servant. I get paid a reasonable sum each month to maintain law and order. And I don't like it when somebody gets paid to promote pool room brawls and instigate other forms of public disturbance. All right, stop quoting the police, man. Your lieutenant. Yeah. Whatever happened here tonight would have happened whether I was in on this deal or not. It's just that my psychoanalyst Mr. said... Mr. Murch, uh, why don't you go somewhere and have a nice, quiet, nervous breakdown? Well, my psychoanalyst... When I'm through here, I'll come and join you. Uh, murder in the tunnel of love. Oh, lieutenant. Yes, Brennan. The doc just got through with Dimmick. Skull fracture. Blunt instrument. All right, I'll be right there. Uh, tell the boys to get some lights set up in that tunnel. We're going to go over it inch by inch. Yes, sir. Now, Valentine, I suppose you're going to go home to your nice warm bed. Oh, well, I'll be glad to stick around, give you a hand. No, 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 thanks. Thanks, I've got enough trouble. But I want to see you the first thing in the morning in my office. Sure. And you too, Miss Brooks. Yes. And Mr. Murch. Uh, yeah, yes. It uh, might give you a little extra excitement to see the inside of a police station. So be there at nine sharp. But looks like we're not wanted around here, so uh, come on, Mr. Murch. I still think I ought to drop you off at your hotel, Mr. Murch. Yes, you've had enough for one night. Well, uh, my wife and I are staying at the Fenmore right here on Grayson Avenue. But I can tell, Mr. Valentine, you're not just giving up this case like that. Oh, no. You're up to something, aren't you? Well, well, yeah, you stirred up a hornet's nest somehow or other, and I want to see what it's all about. And I'm going to be right there with you. Oh, hey, no, 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 there's no use arguing. George? Yeah, Brooksy? Well, that part of a bus transfer Dimmick wanted you to have, what do you make of it? I don't know yet. Well, why should anyone keep a piece of old transfer? Now, that's probably one of the most worthless things in the world. And only a third of a transfer at that. But that man insisted that you have it with his dying breath. It must mean something. Yeah, well, we'll see what the lieutenant makes out of it. I gave it to him. Told him what Dimmick said. But you've made something out of it already, haven't you, Doc? Come on, let's have it. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, you can you can tell a lot from a bus transfer, Brooksy. Even a third of a one, if you look at it real careful, like. Meaning what? That it was issued by the Orange Bus Company, route number 411. And the little punch holes, one for the year, one for the month. And even the day and the hours during which it was good. You, you noticed all those things? That transfer was issued July 29th, 1943, between the hours of 4 and 6 p.m. All of which still means nothing to me. Oh, me either at this point. But I have an idea that late Mr. Dimmick meant it to provide free transportation for his murderer to the end of the line. Hey, why are we turning off, George? Where are we going? <laughs> hey, you know something, Brooksy? Riley and I don't always agree, but he knows his business, and so do his boys. We're going down to police headquarters. Well, what for, Mr. Valentine? The police don't miss much, and when they do, they make a record of it so they'll never forget. 
And that's where we're headed, Mr. Murch. The Department of Unsolved Crimes. Time. Yeah, and this time I brought you a container of coffee, Dawson. Thought you'd need it. Well, the sleepier we can get down in this department, the better we like it. <laughs> Who are your friends? Oh, my assistant, Miss Brooks and Mr. Murch. How uh-huh. do you do? What do you want, Valentine? You know these files aren't open to the public. Well, I'm not just the public, Dawson. Uh, your boss, Riley, told me to be down here tomorrow morning and be sure I had the right information. He said that? Oh, yeah, sure, go on. Call him up. Check for yourself. Oh, no, as long as he said so. What do you want to know? If there were any unsolved crimes on July 29th, 1943. July 43, let's see. Oh, it's that file in the corner near the window. Okay, mm-hmm. thanks. Uh, just uh, what are you looking for, Mr. Valentine? The murderer, I hope. You and I ought to be used to being left in the dark, Mr. Murray. Let's see. Yeah, July 1943. Let's see what we got in this one. Stolen car, front of Grant and Company, burglary, and... Yes? And on July 29th, 5.35 p.m., $200,000 jewel robbery at Smith and Allenby Jewelers on 5th Street. The date on the transfer. Uh Uh-huh. And that picture, that's our Mr. Dimmick. Leonard Dimmick, 38, clerk at Smith and Allenby's. No suspicion of collusion and holdup. But Dimmick was operating a tunnel of love. A lot of things can happen in a man's life in five years, Brooksy. Let's see that, George. No getaway car used in robbery as far as known. Passerby observed man in gray suit carrying briefcase board orange bus outside jewelry store almost immediately after holdup. Witness positive man was running from store. Oh, dear me. This is just too much for me. Trace bus driver number 602, but no information on man in gray suit. Well, that's that, kids. Now we've really got to work with What's the rush, George? If we don't move fast, Brooksy, there's going to be another murder. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, as I told you, this is the busiest time of the day for us here at the depot. You know, getting the buses out on schedule. Yeah, I, I understand, Mr. Eldridge. But look, this is very important. Who was your bus driver, number 602, on July 29th, 1943? Oh, very well. If you can't wait, I'll look it up for you. You see, uh, we have a file here on every man who ever worked for us. Uh-huh. 44, 43, July the 29th. Oh, yeah, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, number 602. It was, uh, it was a Bob Gray. Still work for you? Oh, yeah, Bob's still with us. As a matter of fact, he's one of our steadiest men. There's nothing wrong, is there? I don't know yet. Well, where can I get hold of Mr. Graves? Why, I don't know. This is day off. All right, what's his address? Come on, come on. Uh, 1411 Dever Street. One four one one. Looks like a rooming house. Yeah, with the inevitable sign. No room. Could I could you take these steps a little slower, please? Oh, oh Mr. Murch, I almost forgot about you. Well, I, I'm not just as young as I used to be. Who is? <laughs> but right now I'm interested in seeing that someone else has a chance to grow a little older. Wait a minute, George. There's a name here under this bell. What does it say? Uh Bob Gray. That's our man. But the, who is Bob Gray? An honest toiler, Mr. Murch. To be more specific, a bus driver. To be more specific, bus driver number 602, who had a very busy day, July 29th, 1943. Yeah? Who is it? A friend of yours sent me over to talk to you, Graves. Go on, beat it. Get out of here. Okay, Bob. But Len Dimmick wouldn't like the way you treat me. What'd you say? Who are you? There's nothing much I can say with that gun stuck in my midriff. Never mind that. Who are these two? Just friends. What do you say we go inside and close the door? It'll be much easier that way. Okay. Well, what's this about Dimmick? Come on, come on, talk. I wish you wouldn't keep pointing that gun. It uh, makes me nervous. <laughs> nothing like excitement, is there, Mr. Murch? Look, mister, you said something about Dimmick. What about him? He's dead. He's... So what? You bringing me an invitation to his funeral? No. I'm just trying to postpone your funeral. What's that supposed to mean? Just this, listen. You're going to have a visitor any time now. I'm surprised he hasn't shown up before. I still see what's that supposed to mean. All right, friend, if that's your attitude. And I thought you had to have some brains to be a bus driver. How do you know so much about me? And being a bus driver, you should appreciate the value of a transfer. Even a piece of a transfer. Transfer? That's right. 
All right, spill it. And remember, I got this gun in your gut. George, be careful. Don't worry, Brooks. He's much too curious to shoot. Yes, but that gun may go off a- a- accidentally. Who's that? Did you bring the cops? I didn't bring anybody. That's your visitor. What? Cool down your trigger finger and listen to me. What's this all about? Are you a cop? I'm strictly on my own. But if I'm right, whoever's knocking on that door is here to kill you. I'm not kidding. Now. Well. And no one knows it better than you. You gonna do as I tell you? Huh. All right. Brooksy, you and Mr. Murch get over there in that corner. Wait in the door. Make it snappy. Yes, George. Come on, Mr. Murch. Now, Graves, open up. Try to be natural. Put that gun away. Yeah, yeah. I'll be standing right here in the back of the door. <laughs> well, Graves, I was beginning to think you were out. Ah, uh, you know how it is, Logan. My day off. I guess I fell asleep. Awful thing happened to Len Dimmick, didn't it? Yeah, I heard about it. Come inside, huh? And just when we were going to split everything three ways. Yeah, that's right. That makes the gravy all the richer for you and me, don't it? I don't get it. And if there was only one, there'd be nothing but gravy left. What are you talking about? You want me to interpret? Valentine, you... What Logan means, Graves, is he was going to kill you just as he killed Dimmick. Oh, uh, you're out of your mind. Maybe, but you killed Len Dimmick. When I heard about Len, I thought it was something like that. Don't listen to him, Bob. You were just too clumsy about it, Logan. I took Grayson Avenue coming back. It wasn't torn up at all the way you said. So what? You sent us the long way so you could get to the Tunnel of Love before us. That's right, George. And he'd be the only one to know that Dimmick would be inside the Tunnel of Love with us. He arranged the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. You sneaked into the Tunnel before us, Logan. You were waiting on the platform for the boat to pass. But in, in the darkness, it could, it could have been me. I could have had my head bashed in. I... I don't think I feel so good. No, it wouldn't have been you, Mr. Murch. Len Dimmick was doing all the talking. Made himself the perfect target. Graves, you're not going to believe this guy, are you? Yeah, I believe him. You killed Len and you came here to kill me so you could have all the gravy you was talking about. Put that gun down, Bob. Put it down. Double cross me, will you? Yeah, let me have that, Graves. You got a big enough rap against you now. George, let go. He, he shot Mr. Logan. And the first one who moves will get what he got. I'm getting out. Stay where you are. Drop that gun. Huh? I said drop it. That's better. Oh, oh Lieutenant Riley. Sergeant Dawson called and said you were snooping around the unsolved crimes department, so I had you tailed. Oh, uh, who's this guy on the floor here? How bad's he hurt? My, my arm. You should have blown your head off. Brennan, get this man out of here to a hospital, whoever he is. That's Mark Logan, Lieutenant. Ex-con. Now runs a pool parlor. Now, what's this all about? Well, Logan's one end of a triangle. Len Dimmick, former jewelry clerk, was the second. And Graves here, bus driver, is the third. They're the trio who waltzed through that Smith and Allenby job back in 43. How do you know all of this, Valentine? Lieutenant, I think that if you go through Logan's clothes when he gets to the hospital, you'll find a third of a bus transfer on him. Wouldn't you say so, Graves? I, uh... Uh, why not? Sure, we pulled that job, the three of us. Dimmick, Logan, and me. We decided to wait five years because the jewels were too hot to touch right away. Where are they now? Buried under the water in the Tunnel of Love. But uh, those t- transfers... Yes, what about them? Uh, lots of things can happen in five years. A guy can die, get put in jail. So we decided whoever showed up with a third of the transfer from my bus would get his share. Valentine, how did you stumble onto Graves? Well, Lieutenant, why a third of a transfer? Why not a quarter or a half? I knew about Dimmick and Logan. That makes two. But there was still one more to account for. I get it, and it had to be the bus driver. That's right, Brooksy. They wouldn't leave their getaway to chance. And they were sure the bus would be right there at the exact minute. Well, I'll be... Almost $70,000 for a third of an old transfer. No wonder Logan was willing to go to all that trouble to get rid of Dimmick and Graves. Well, is that enough excitement for you, Mr. Murch? Mr. Murch! What's the matter, Brooks? He... he's fainted. Well, here we are, Mr. Murch. Feeling better? Here's your hotel, Mr. Murch. <laughs> I, I don't know what you think about me mm. painting like that, but I really do feel like a new man. My psychoanalyst was so right. Think you're up to playing that star role now? Oh, yes, of course. And now that I'm convinced I'm the swaggering, masterful type at heart. Good for you, Mr. Murch. Oh, uh, here's... Mm. Oh, just one thing. Yes? Would uh, mm. you two mind coming upstairs with me? But Why? I, I stayed out so much later than I promised. Oh? Mm-hmm. You see, Mrs. Murch is such a forceful personality. He 
If you're planning a motoring trip, here's something you should do to make it a safe trip. Stop in at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station before you start out and have your tires inspected. If you find they're worn smooth, have risky cuts or bruises, don't take a chance. Play safe and get a new set of grip-safe Atlas tires. The wider, skid-resisting Atlas tread gives you greater driving protection. There's more rubber to grip the road to give you quick, safe stops and absorb road shock. With each new Atlas passenger tire, you get a full year's written warranty against damage to the tire from road hazards. No wonder Atlas is the tire known nationally for its safety, long life, and economy. Another tip, when you're on the open road, keep safe by keeping the right amount of air in each tire. And that's a job for the folks at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear Lieutenant Riley saying, Look, Miss Brooks, my feet hurt. Let's get back to the house. Oh, hmm? please, Lieutenant. George and Maude have been away so long, I'm really worried. Let's take one look up here in the lemon grove. Well, all right. Wait till I put the flashlight on. Look, over there. Valentine. George. Oh. Hello, everybody. I was just thinking of getting up anyway. Ooh. Somebody must have been staging an atomic test around here. Hey, where's Marta? Here's your answer, Valentine. She's right over here, but uh, no hurry. She couldn't move if she tried. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Mr. Murch, Joe Duvall as Logan, Paul Fries as Dimmick, Arnie Phillips as Graves, and Dick Ryan as the manager. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. On behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you need confidential help with anything you can't tackle alone, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, no doubt you have heard of me. My name is on circus billboards all over the city. Martha Dvorak, the most glamorous trapeze artist in the world. My work requires nerves of steel, but instead I'm shaking like a jellyfish. I have great fear, fear for my life, and cannot go to the police. Do not trouble to answer this. I will not take no for an answer. Take no for an answer. I may even be in your office before you receive this letter. Oh? So be sure to expect me. Hmm. Sign Marta Devorak. <laughs> well, the young lady on the flying trapeze has a quaint way of setting up her words. And have you seen those posters, George? I'll bet there isn't a male in the audience who doesn't sit there wishing Marta would fall into his lap. That's a very charming thought. 
But I wish she was more specific about this great fear for her life. Well, I'm giving odds there's a rejected suitor involved. Oh, come on, woman. Stop acting like a woman. If you read the tabloids, darling, you'd know Marta's left quite a trail of broken hearts. A femme fatale, huh? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I am Martha Dvorak. Oh. If you are Mr. Valentine, please ask this young lady to leave. We want to be alone. Oh, now look, Mr. Dvorak, this is Miss Brooks, my assistant. You have no objection to being alone with me? Besides... That is the only way I will discuss this business. Oh, honest, Mr. Vorak, I'm over 21, if that's what you're worried about. Well, Mr. Valentine? Uh, I am scrape, Brooksy. Huh? Hmm. Well, now, Mr. Vorak, what can I do for you? First, you can call me Martha. Oh, how nice. Martha? Well? From now on, until the death-defying Dvorak leave here, you must be with me at my side all the time. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's a tall order, Martha. Here. Read this note. Huh? Get $5,000 in small bills and wait for further instructions. You will either pay or meet with a bad accident. Don't take this to the police. You are being watched. Well, that's certainly to the point. So you see, I'm helpless, George. I'm like a little girl in a bad dream. Yeah. And as I get it, you want me to act as your bodyguard. Yes. You will bodyguard me every minute. Uh, look, why don't you stick close to your family, the other death-defying Dvorak? They wouldn't let anything happen to you. My family. They're not my family at all. Oh, well, live and learn. It just looks good on the circus posters. The three others. Sometimes I think they hate me. Oh, they're jealous. They know the people come to see me and not them. I see what you mean. I do not even stay at the same hotel with them. I've rented a little house up in the canyon. Well, look, you know, this may turn out to be just a crank note. The words are all cut out of magazines and newspapers. Somebody wishes to see me die, crushed, defeated. You would not let that happen to me, would you, George? Oh, no, look. You will bodyguard me. I will be so grateful. Many dollars grateful. Oh, well, okay, it's a deal. You've convinced me. Oh, that is wonderful. I think I will kiss you. Huh? No, I will not even think. I will kiss you. Oh, no. Wait a minute, Marty. You're... Oh, please, Marty. I'd... I'd rather have you as a friend. Oh, you're cute, George. Always you joke. Mm, yeah. Now, what are your plans for the day? I have a rehearsal right now at the circus. Will you meet me at the matinee? Yeah, I'll be seeing you. Come early so you can see my act. Oh, sorry. <laughs> of course you were not listening at the door. Oh, of course I was. In fact, I was peeking through the keyhole. Really? Au revoir, George. Yes, so long. Well, Casanova? Hmm? Oh, that kiss. Well, you know, Brooksy, these artists, so impulsive. Nice fight you put up. George. Oh, no, Angel, it's all business. Well, if you think I'm going to let you traipse around with that, that high-flying oh, she-wolf, oh, temper, temper, I'll temper, be temper. on your heels every minute. Oh, now, Brooksy, you can't do that. Oh, can't I? From now on, I'll be known as the Shadow. <laughs> well, Miss Brooks, after you phoned, I made a full check on the Dvorak game. I want to find out, Lieutenant Riley. Your little hunch was right. She's playing your boyfriend for a patsy in a little game known as space grabbing. Publicity. I see. She's either pulled or tried to pull this threatening note gag in every city where the circus stopped. She was driving the police nuts till they got wise to her. Yeah. But if I know George, it won't make any difference to him. He's as stubborn as a tray of ice cubes. He keeps saying, but suppose this note is on the level. <laughs> well, well, cheer up, cheer up. Nobody's going to take away Valentine's Dick Tracy button just for looking for a boogeyman who isn't there. Yes, but, Lieutenant, he's no more than a hired man with nothing to do. Nothing but hang around that international pinup girl and stare at that that man wanted sign in her eyes. <laughs> oh, Lieutenant Riley. <laughs> I know it's almost time for your act to go on, Mr. Devore. Whatever but... you want to know about little Martha, I can tell you, Mr. Valentine. People think I'm her father. Well, I am her father confessor, her teacher, 
The great Leo Dvorak, who taught her everything she knows today. Yes, but about that note... I'm heartsick about Martha. After everything I've done for her, she's thinking of leaving the act and going to Hollywood. The thought is not easy to bear. But, of course, I wish her all good luck. Of course I do. I don't know anything about that note, Mr. Valentine. But I'll tell you something. Well? Everything is Marta, Marta, Marta. But does anyone know there's a girl named Risa in Act Two? Did I go up there every performance? Yes, I'm sure you have a very important place in the act, Risa, oh, but... yes. I have the others build suspense for her big moment. So people will think of nothing else but what would happen to that beautiful body if she fell... Oh, don't talk to me about Martha. Teresa, you were going to tell me something. Yes, Mr. Valentine. I hate her. Yes, Mr. Valentine. I'm the one who catches Martha up there. Yes, Dorian, Leo told me. I have your life in my hands. One little slip, uh, an accident, and no one would know the difference. I tell her that when she makes a fool of me, goes out with other men, she just laughs. She knows I could never hurt her. I love her too much. Well, Dorian, you still didn't tell me if you know who might have sent her that letter. Letter? Oh, I'm sorry I know nothing about it. Now, if you'll excuse me, our cue is coming up. George! George, I've been talking to Lieutenant Riley, and I was right. That woman's a phony. This is a publicity stunt. Okay, Brooksy, okay. So I'm playing the fall guy in a publicity stunt. Mm-hmm. But it would make it a lot easier if you'd stop following me around. Oh, George. Oh, all right, come on. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please, for the thrilling highlight of the afternoon. That sensational European act. A breathless duel with the law of gravity. And there they are, ladies and gentlemen, 200 feet above your very head. The one and only death-defying the Morax. above her. I saw when Dorian reached out to catch her, she deliberately slipped one hand out of his. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, crazy. Teresa is right, of course. Martha. That is what I did, exactly. Just one hand, Martha. I might have dropped you. No, Dorian, darling. You would have let your arm come off before you let me fall. When will you learn to think of the act, the act? All those thousands of people will never stop talking about what they think nearly happened to me. And tomorrow... The newspapers, well, they will be beautiful. Shall we go, George? Alley up, Mr. Borak. All I can get is a nervous breakdown. I just love camping out in the lobby of your apartment house, darling. Mm. I suppose you think you're cute giving me the slip tonight. George, why have you got your hand over your eye? Oh, it's nothing. Well, let me see. Okay, nosy, look. Uh-oh. Uh-huh. A black eye, an overgrown mouth. Oh, I can see that, but where did you get it? Well, it seems someone else besides you decided to follow me. Oh? And after I dropped Marta off at the canyon, he caught up with me. Who's he? Oh, I don't know, Angel. I was tripping gaily past a dark alley, and I encountered a king-sized fist. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't put it past Marta to have someone pop you like that, just to keep you interested till the circus leaves town. Well, Brooksy, you'll be happy to know I told Marta I was off the merry-go-round. 
Well, it took you a week to say uncle, but congratulations. George, George. Uh-oh, the call of the wild. Oh, no, don't tell me. Is it fire, flood, or pestilence this Another time? Another no, George. Oh, no. I found it in my mailbox. Look, Marta, dear, won't your bodyguard black eye get you enough space in the papers tomorrow? What? Oh, George, I was so upset. I did not know. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Got a spare filly mignon in your pocketbook? Okay, what about the note? Here. Yeah. Oh, what do you know? So far, you have obeyed instructions. We know there is no circus tomorrow, so be at your house with the $5,000 and be there alone. But, George, I cannot be alone. I'm too frightened. Uh, pardon me for being cynical, but you don't frighten easy. Am I supposed to forget what you did on that trapeze to get another publicity story for your scrapbook? Oh, but I'm so sure something terrible would happen to me. Frankly, Marta, I don't believe a word you've told me. Hallelujah. George, how can you say that? However... Yes? I will stay with you out at the canyon tomorrow. But you just said you didn't believe a word she... I know, you... Brooksy, I know. But you see, I've had one eye closed for me tonight. Well? Well, strangely enough, I'm beginning to see things a lot clearer now with the other one. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about summer car care. If you sometimes find summertime motoring plenty warm, how about your car's engine? Upper cylinder walls, for example, take a terrific beating. Temperatures in there get hotter than a blowtorch. Ordinary motor oils would run away from hot spots, leave upper cylinder walls bare and exposed to wear. But RPM motor oil is tailor-made to guard vital parts. Special compounds in premium quality RPM keep a cooling coat of oil clinging on every inch of your engine, every second. Make RPM stick to the job. RPM also keeps a protective film of oil on parts even when your engine's idle. The oil is on working parts before you st touch the starter. There's no waiting for oil to pump up, no damaging startup wear. So to keep your engine safe at all times, get compounded RPM motor oil at independent Chevron gas stations or standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, George was convinced that Marta Dvorak, glamorous trapeze artiste, hired him as a bodyguard strictly for the sweet uses of a publicity. Then a black eye administered in the darkness by a person or persons unknown, strangely enough, opened his eyes to something that still remains to be seen. At any rate, George is back on the job. And he and Marta are alone now in her house on Canyon Road, just outside of town. Look, Marta, stop waving that $5,000 around like cigar coupons. It makes me nervous. Oh, I just thought I would have it ready for those people so there would be no, no unpleasantness. Yeah. How is it that last night you were quaking in your little open-toe sandals and today you're a blind spirit? How can I be afraid of anything when you are so near me? Uh, yeah. But not half so near enough. Now, if we were like this, huh? I could laugh in the face of anyone who came in that door. Anyone. Oh, hello, everybody. Now, isn't this just too cozy? So, you, Miss Brooks. Uh-huh. How dare you? Don't laugh so hard, Mark. Doesn't anyone have a kind word for a poor police lieutenant on his day off? Oh, I thought you always went fishing, Lieutenant Riley. Well, Miss Brooks here persuaded me it would be better sport to get a load of Operation Phony. Miss Brooks, this is your idea of humor. Oh, I know you didn't expect visitors, so I brought along the loveliest picnic basket. Liverwurst, knockwurst, pickle-lily. Oh, Martha, you have made me so happy. Leo, uh, who's a this? visitor. I cannot tell you how I felt when you invited me here for today. I invited you. I never did. But that is very strange. A young lady called the hotel and left a message. What young lady? Who could have done a thing like... Oh. Oh, uh, we may as well know each other. Mr. Dvorak, this is Lieutenant Ryle. How do you do? Harry, he is very happy, Martha. We have not been very close together lately. Oh, please, Leo. I wonder if I brought enough pika lily for everybody. Pika lily? What is this uh, pika lily, young lady? Why don't you come out and let me show you, Leo? I have to put these things in the refrigerator anyway. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, I'm always crazy for a quiet day in the oh, I could kill somebody. And I think I know who. Uh, me too. Well, Martha, here I am. Darling, not you too? And Risa? Yes, I met Risa getting out of a cab when I drove up. And I got her message inviting me to spend the day here. I decided no, to come. No, I will kill Just somebody. to see what it is you're up to now. But uh, these people, Martha, we, we're going to be alone. 
On the phone, that's what the young lady said. Oh, now, there's a young lady who gets around. Are you again making a fool of me, Martha? Please, darling, you're not one of your scenes. Ah, this fresh country air. Congenial company. Yes, Valentine, I think this is going to be a day to remember. I will not go back into that house. Oh, now, Moira, that's not being a charming hostess. It is already evening, and they just sit there. Oh, that should be all right with you. Have you forgotten that note? The safety in numbers, you know. Now, come on, let's get inside. Well, all right. Hey, hold it. Hmm? Didn't you take in your mail today? Of course. Why? Here's a letter in the mailbox. I'm in no mood for letters. Huh? Huh? Yes? Another one of those little love notes. <laughs> Impossible. Yeah, but here it is. But I told you, it is impossible. It cannot be. I did not... You... You didn't what? Never mind. Let me have it. Well, what does it say? It says, you did not live up to the bargain. You invited a house full of people. You know what to expect now. George... George. Oh, look, you don't have to put on that act for my benefit, Marta. We're all troopers now. But I tell you, this is real. You've I've been not... writing these notes to yourself, haven't you? I know I will not make you believe me. But I've got to get away from here, I'm afraid. Hey, wait a minute, Marta. I'm afraid of everybody. Hey, don't be a fool. I've got to get away from here. Okay, okay, if you want to see who can run faster. But this is your last temperamental fling with me. Look, Miss Brooks, look, I pounded the beat for 15 years before I became a lieutenant. My feet hurt. They're killing me. Come on, let's get back to the house. But Lieutenant George and Maude have been away so long, I'm really worried. Yeah, I worried they're smooching somewhere. Oh, maybe George was right and those notes weren't phony. Anything connected with that dame has to be phony. Now, come on, let's get back to the house. Okay. Well, let's take one look up here in the lemon grove. <sighs> all right, all right, but take it easy. Wait till I put the flashlight on. Lieutenant, what? look, over there. Valentine. George. Oh, wait till I have a look at him. Oh. Hello, everybody. Oh, George. I was just thinking of getting up anyway. What happened? I was with Marty, trying to talk some sense into her. Yeah? Suddenly somebody staged an atomic test right in back of me. That's all I know. Hey, where is Marty anyway? Here's your answer. She's right here. <gasps> How is she? I'll tell you in a minute. George. Look, that money scattered all over. Well, Lieutenant, she's dead. Strangled to death. Okay, the holiday's over now. Now you better get ready to answer a few questions. George, you want me to get you something to your head? Yeah, no one, Brooksy. Well, we'll start with you, Leo. You admit you were out of the house when someone ran for Cirque in the Lemon Grove. Yes, I began to worry about my little Martha. I walked everywhere looking for her. She meant so much to me. Oh, admit it, Leo. You knew that without her there would be no act. That's all she ever meant to you. Didn't you happen to be outside too, Risa? What have you got to say? I can afford to be frank. I kept walking and walking, trying to forget how much I hated her. As long as we are all being so honest. Dorian, why do you not tell the lieutenant what you were doing out of the house? Tell him how jealous of Martha you always were. Well, why not? Everyone knows about it. I loved Martha, and I was jealous of every move she made. Jealous of every moment except when she was flying through the air, her hands reaching for mine. Depending on me, of all men. I would never see her hurt. You remember when she said that, Valentine? Yeah, I remember. What about the question, Dorian? Why did you leave the house? Where did you go? Looking for Martha. We didn't have a minute together all day. She was always with Valentine. Oh, fine, fine. Everybody's out for a walk when Mayhem breaks out. You aren't even listening, George. Doesn't any of this interest you? Hmm, Brooksy? What are you doing with your nose in that magazine? Oh, it's the show world. Huh? I've learned some fascinating things from it. Oh, meaning what? Well, for instance, Brooksy and you were right, Lieutenant. Martha did send herself those two notes. You mean three notes, don't you? Uh-uh. 
The third note was the real McCoy, Lieutenant. Yeah? The business. What? And you found that out just looking at Marta's legs in that magazine? Well, in a way, Brooksy. Now, here. Just take a look at these three notes. I'm all eyes. What about them? All addressed to Marta Dvorak. Yeah, Canyon Road 58. Canyon Road 58 and 58 Canyon Road. That's the what? Uh-huh. Now, take a close gander at this third note. The words for it were cut out of this page of the Show World magazine. Well, so oh, that's right. I turn over said page, and presto, we have a full-page photograph of Marta herself. Yes, one of the most beautiful she ever took. But what are you trying to say, Mr. Valentine? This magazine was sent to Marta. Knowing her as well as we all do, I doubt that we can imagine her cutting up a picture of herself. Not in a million years. That is right. She kept scrapbooks of the smallest items about herself. She lived on public oh, right. All right, so, so what? what? That's why she was so terrified when she received that third note. It was one she didn't send to herself. Any ideas who did? Uh, ideas? The way I feel? Um, no, Lieutenant, it's, uh, it's all yours from here on in. Stepping aside, George? That roughing up you got must be more serious than I thought. Are you sure you're all right? Oh, well, uh, yeah, gosh, I, I don't know, Brooksy. I'd, I'd better find out. Now, uh, when I was a kid, every time I fell out of the apple tree, my mother used to say, she used to say, George, there's one sure way of telling if you're still all right in the head. Hey, what is this? Yes, this is no time to hear what your mother used to say. Yeah, Georgie, she'd say, uh, just try to remember the Mother Goose rhymes I taught you. But please, Mr. Valentine, how can you make jokes now? Now, uh, let's see if I can remember. Now, uh, how does that one go again? Which one, darling? Oh, you know, the, uh, Mary had a little lamb. It's wool. No, no, that's fleece. That fleece was white as uh, something or other. And wherever the little lamb would go, Mary would be sure to follow. Well, that's very cute, George, but not quite the original. Oh. Say, if I can't remember a simple nursery rhyme, I must be pretty bad. Hey, wait a minute. I'll try another. Why must we stand here and listen to this man talk and say nothing? That is right. Take it easy, friends. Take it easy. We'll have to wait till the car is through anyway. Go on, Valentine. Go on. I'm willing to wait for you to make sense. Yeah, well, I'll try. Um, Little Miss Muffet sat on a puffet? No. A roffet? No, that's not it. Hey, tuffet. That's it. Tuffet. Munching? No. Uh, Chewing? No, that's not it either. Eating her... Her curds and whey. Curds and whey. Any school child knows that, you fool. Now, let's stop this farce. You seem to forget Martha has been killed tonight. No, Dorian, no one's forgetting. You staged it too well. Oh, no, I... You know better than to say that. All right, Valentine. I've been patient up till now. Come on, give. Tell me, Dorian... Do you come from Wisconsin, Brooklyn, or Georgia? Not that that concerns you, but I was born in Switzerland. I've never been in America before this tour. Did all the school kiddies in Switzerland learn about Little Miss Muffet and her curds and whey? Well, I don't know. I, I suppose uh-uh. so. I... No European kid would know about curds and whey. And I think it'll be a pretty simple matter to prove you were born right here in America. No, I... All right. What of it? I went to school in Switzerland. I pretended to be a foreigner for professional reasons. There's nothing wrong about that. When you were a kid here in America, you learned more than nursery rhymes. When you addressed an envelope, you were taught to put the number of the house before the name of the street. That's something you never forgot. It stuck with you. And that's just what's going to hang you. Let's have that in nice, simple language, Valentine, huh? The kind of jewelry will understand. Okay, Lieutenant. The first two notes, the ones Marta wrote to herself, read Canyon Road 58. The third one she found tonight was written by Dorian, the only one in the troop not European. It read 58 Canyon Road. The number before the name of the street, Lieutenant. American style. You know, Valentine, in my job, I see a lot of human nature, but this Dorian guy... He's a breed all his own. You know, it was Marta I couldn't understand. Now I feel sorry for her. I think I know what you mean about Dorian, Lieutenant. He had every chance to kill her when he was up there on the trapeze and get away with it. Mm. Instead, he writes that letter and makes a super production out of it. Jealousy. Jealousy. Had it bad, Lieutenant. Bad enough to sock me in the eye for no other reason but that I was spending so much time with her. <laughs> well, how could anyone be jealous of a little thing like that? After all, it was just your job. Uh-huh. Now, the truth is, Lieutenant, a simple accident wasn't good enough for Dorian. 
Marta had to know she was dying and that he was killing her. That's the only way it would satisfy his bruised and battered ego. Uh, as good an explanation as any. You know, it's strange. Marta dreamt of having a story about herself in every newspaper in the country. She certainly tried hard enough. Yeah, Brooksy. And when she finally made it, it was only to let the world know that she'd never be heard of again. <laughs> If your car's battery has been acting like a mule, temperamental and balky, here's an easy way to cure it. Have your battery serviced at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station. They'll inspect the water level, cables, terminal clamps, and test the battery's condition. And they'll be frank. If it just needs a charge, they'll tell you. If your battery's really on its last legs, they'll explain how a new Atlas battery can save you money. Every Atlas battery has its certified power capacity stamped on the case where you can read it. And you'll find these capacities meet or exceed standards set by the Society of Automotive Engineers. The longer-lasting starting power of Atlas batteries, by the way, is backed by a written warranty honored everywhere by 40,000 Atlas dealers. Independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations are glad to service your battery, proud to offer you an Atlas battery when you need one. That's why they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... I got here as soon as I could, Brooksy. Edward's still in the club there? Yes, George, and getting very fidgety. All right, all right. Are you sure about that check he's carrying? Of course. I saw the signature, Agnes Eversole. Oh, good. Now go back inside and stick right with friend Daniel. But well, what are you going to do, George? Oh, that's the surprise, Angel, but hold your hat. Because in just about five minutes, I'm going to start the biggest commotion that nightclub has seen in years. <laughs> Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gene Bates as Marta, Louis Van Ruten as Leo, Don Diamond as Dorian, Peggy Weber as Risa, and Dick Ryan as the ringmaster. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. If it's safer, it's better. This is the key to accident prevention in Western living. The 3,000 delegates who will attend the 10th Annual Western Safety Conference in Hollywood from June 16th through June 18th will formulate safer procedures in every phase of public and private life. Their work will make your future safer. They say it's smart to be safe. Take their advice. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you're in trouble and need confidential help, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, ten years now I work hard to be good American. Soon I get citizen papers, but maybe I don't get them. Maybe judge will say what I am doing is wrong. But just the same, I cannot keep quiet, because inside I am already American citizen. You've got to help me. Because, because it, it is, is my home. whole life to be an American citizen. I live at 82 Barrow Street. I am yours respectedly.
State Park Karowski. Well, I'd say that's a little on the pathetic side, Brooksy. Yes, but what can it be that he doesn't know is right or wrong? Oh, probably nothing at all. Chances are Stepan Karowski is just over-worried about getting his citizenship papers. Well, it's pretty clear they mean everything to him. Well, I know. Anyone who can write a letter like this, and I don't mean the grammar, deserves a few minutes of another citizen's time. <laughs> Well, Mr. Karowski, we got your letter. I do not write so good. Well, you got across what you wanted to say, and that's all that matters. Oh, please sit down. Here, lady, sit, sit. Take this soft chair. Oh, thank you. I'm just bachelor, but I make good cup of tea. Almost like married missus. (laughs) No, thanks. Don't bother, Mr. Karowski. Uh, In the letter, you said something was worrying you. Now, what seems to be the trouble? I saw what you put in newspaper, but maybe I don't have enough money to pay you. Well, then it's my tough luck. Come on, let's have it. All right. I tell you the best I know. A couple of months ago, a man come to me and say, Karavsky, you are an important man in this neighborhood. Oh, I'm sure you are. Yes. I am the janitor, young lady. A pipe leaks, Karavsky. Husband beats up wife, Karavsky. Anything that goes wrong in the house, Karavsky. <laughs> okay, so you're a big man. Just like on the other side. I was mayor in the village. So people trust me. Like this man say. Yeah? He say, my company collects money from many people in this part of town. Every month, they will bring the money to you, and we will send somebody to get it from you. And you will get a few dollars, Karofsky. But money for what? The man didn't say. So I thought it was for furniture, radios, things like that. You know, people down here buy most time on stalling plans. Oh, you mean... Oh. <laughs> yeah. So people start coming with envelopes and the, the money inside. But they also look at me like they want to kill me. Some don't even talk to me in the streets no more. And that made you think something was wrong. That's why you got in touch with me, huh? No, Mr. Valentine. Something happened very bad, very bad. Mrs. Andello, I know her a long time. She said to me, this month I have no money. And she began to cry. I say, don't worry, you, you pay next month. Then what happened? Next day I find out Mrs. Andello, she go in kitchen and... Turn on the gas. Oh, oh, how dreadful. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe she had other troubles. No, no, this is why she killed herself. I know it. Maybe I'm helping break the law. Well, when this man comes around, why don't you just tell him you don't want to play anymore? They will just get somebody else to do the same thing. As good American, I cannot let that happen. But uh, that is where I'm stuck. Oh, I get it, Mr. Karowski. If you go to the police, they'll find out you were mixed up in this. And I don't get my citizen papers. I I try so hard to do everything right. So the judge is proud to make Karowski citizen. But this is some kind of racket, George. Mr. Karowski's on a spot. All right. Oh, it's a racket, sure enough, Brooksy. No collection agency would work this way. Say, when does this man come around the next time? The man only came first time. After that, it was young lady. She knows nothing either. She she gives money to somebody else. Oh, sure, I know. And he gives it to somebody else. So nobody knows who's at the top. Okay, but when does this gal come around? She come tomorrow, one o'clock. Only one good thing come from all this. What's that? Yeah? I meet a fine woman. Soon we get married. Well, good for you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean she pays off two each month and won't even tell you what it's all about? No, and that makes me even more worried. When I talk about it, she... Just look at me. Say nothing. Anna, make me promise to never ask her again. All right, let me have a name. I'll talk to her. Maybe she'll open up for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Anna Feder, a uh, widow lady. Uh, just around the corner over Baker's shop. All right, just sit tight. Uh, how can I thank you? Give it. Let's just say I'm trying to be as good a citizen as you, Mr. Karowski. <laughs> tell you nothing. Nothing. Mrs. Fader, what are you afraid of? You get out now. Go. Don't you see what this means to Mr. Karowski? We have to clear this thing up for his sake. Always the same thing. Stepan, the good citizen. He don't know what kind of trouble he's making. Now get out. Oh, but Mrs. Fader, will you listen? You... Whew. Golly, what did we get into, George? That woman's scared to death. Yeah, and I wonder how many more there are like her. Well, Brooksy, maybe we'll find out tomorrow when that girl makes her collections at Karofsky's. Uh, 
That's Miss Cover now. Always right on time. Okay, come on, Brooksy. Behind this curtain. And don't sneeze. Oh, why'd you have to say that? Now I know I do. Just a minute. I'm coming, please. How are you, Mr. Karlovsky? Fine, fine, Rayola. You look better today. Not so worried like always. What's the use of worrying? Have you got the envelopes? Yeah, they're right here. Good. I'll see you next month. Uh, Viola, wait, please. Yes? Don't you know even a little bit who gets this money and why? You look frightened like others. Worried. Frightened. Why do you keep saying things like that, Mr. Carves? Well, I... How many times must I tell you? I don't know any more about this than you do. No, I don't care to know. But we might be doing something wrong. Is it wrong to make a little money when you need it? You know I can't work much. Certainly delivering some envelopes, they can't hurt nobody. Well, I am sorry. So am I. Mr. Kowalski, it would be better for all of us if you don't ask questions. Much better. Goodbye. Goodbye, Viola. Well, that certainly didn't tell us very much. She's not as though she's in the same boat as Mrs. Fader. See what I mean, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, come on, Brooksy. Let's make sure we don't lose her. She's headed right for the Vondome apartments. Mm, pretty swank, huh? Pretty strange, too. Hey, wait a minute. She's going into the servants' entrance. And so are you. Find out where she's going, Brooksy. But how? Don't make believe you're a maid, hairdresser, or anything. Get going. Oh. Just a minute. Going up. I'll wait for you any day, sister. I'll even bring my own lunch if I have to. Oh, you're cute. Oh, hello. You work for someone in this building, too? Sometimes. This is my first day on a new job, and I'm just a bundle. You're so right. I meant a bundle of nerves. Well, as I was saying, the first day you're always nervous. That's just natural, isn't it? I suppose so. But it wears off the second day, and that's natural, too, because... Uh, what the... floor when you get a minute? Well, because being a personal maid, you get to know your people personal, like, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Look, beautiful. <laughs> We're almost at a penthouse where this lady wants to go. Well, imagine that. What could I have been doing passing my floor like that? Gabin. You're cute. George, Viola might be doing housework in the Armstrong penthouse and won't be down for hours yet. Yeah, well, I don't intend to wait for hours. Besides, it won't hurt to find out just who Maurice Armstrong is. And who are you going to be? Well, I'll think of something on the way up. I represent Mrs. Swenson's employment agency, and I'd like to speak to Mr. Armstrong about one of our clients. Why, Mr. Armstrong's secretary? Is it important? He's busy at the Oh, moment. yes, yes, indeed. It's very important. It concerns Viola Cober and some fees, which are very much past due. Miss Cober? Yes. What's this about Viola? Who is this man, Miss Wilson? He's from an employment agency, Mr. Armstrong. It seems Viola... Owes us some money, and if I could talk to the young lady, I'm sure I could make her understand Mrs. Swenson doesn't run her business as a hobby. I see. You understand I only have Miss Cover in now and then to do my special laundry. Oh, yes. You know, things I don't dare trust to the commercial establishment. Oh, of course. Uh, now, if I could see her for just a moment. Miss Wilson, will you ask for Ella to come in? She left some time ago, Mr. Armstrong. Oh, but that's impossible. I was waiting outside the service entrance. Oh, well, she wasn't feeling very well, so I had the houseman take her down in Mr. Armstrong's private elevator. Oh, come now. How much does she owe you, sir? $19.80. Uh, but you understand, this isn't just the money. It's the principle of the thing, and if I could have her address... Yeah, yeah, take this and forget about it. Oh, you're very kind, but I still have to make my report out for the Employment Agency's Credit Association, and it won't hurt the poor girl. No, no, it's just routine, you see. So if I can have that address... Very well, Miss Wilson. No, I believe I have it somewhere on my desk here. Oh, yes, here it is. Uh, 342 Morrow Street. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. 342 Morrow Street. <laughs> Sorry to inconvenience you folks, but you'd be surprised the things I have to do on my job. This is strange, Brooksy. You mean Viola's not being home? Yeah. If you were that sick, where would you head for? Home? If I could make it. Yeah, just what I mean, Angel. But it's no use hanging around. We'll get back here later. Oh, where are we bound for? Another blind alley? <laughs> oh, you're a pessimist, sweetheart. Blind alley? We made a lot of progress today. Hmm. We found out that one Maurice Armstrong is a big tub of lard who buys and sells rare books and has his dainties laundered by hand. 
Oh, I know how you feel, darling. We're going to talk to Mr. Karofsky some more. I mean, let him do the talking. He might say something which seems unimportant to him, but maybe just what we need to see some light in this case. door's unlocked. Yeah, wait, Angel. I'll put the light on. <gasps> George! Oh, they couldn't have done a better job if they used a bulldozer. Mr. Karofsky! Mr. Karofsky! Don't be naive, Brooksy. They didn't make rubble out of this place just for the exercise. No, they gave Karofsky this little party and took the guest of honor with them. George! Huh? Oh, come here, look. Yeah, blood. Oh, they couldn't wait, could they? They started working him over right here. Oh, but he's such a little man. We're up against a racket that thrives on little people, Brooksy. But what kind of a racket? What do they do to scare people dumb? Well, we'll keep running up those blind alleys till we find out. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about preparing for your vacation. A friend of mine found he was robbed on his vacation by a handful of weak spark plugs and a dirty air cleaner. He discovered that dirty, cracked, or chipped plugs can't fire properly, that they can waste up to one gallon of gasoline in ten. He learned, too, that a dust-clogged air cleaner can waste as much gasoline as driving with your choke out. Before you start on your vacation, prevent gasoline robbery by doing this. Have your spark plugs inspected at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station. If your present spark plugs have given you 10,000 miles of service, you may be money ahead by getting a new set of Atlas Champions. Atlas Champion spark plugs are precision made for accurate timing, full flash sparking, and trouble-free service. And don't forget to have that air cleaner serviced. It's a quick, inexpensive job. Get these two services at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. You meet a little man with one dream, to become an American citizen. You hear a fantastic story about him being innocently involved in what looks like a vicious racket. And you find your client has been beaten and kidnapped. So you start swinging in all directions, like sending Claire down to headquarters to Lieutenant Riley. And you end up talking to that strange girl, Viola Cober. You took a long time to get home after you left Mr. Armstrong's. Twas my day to work for him. Why, I should tell you anything. Well, Viola, let's call it a rehearsal before you talk to the police. Oh. Okay. You know the information I want. There's... Nothing to tell. Once a month, I get that money from Mr. Grovsky. I hand it to a man who's always waiting at the entrance to Hanover Park. Now we're getting somewhere. What man? He's a different man every time. Oh, now, that's pretty slick. They know what you look like, but you don't know them, huh? I'm not doing anything wrong. I need whatever money I can make. You see, I'm not well. I can't keep a steady job. Yeah. I take it you met this, uh, this uh, Mr. Rex on the way home from the Vendome. Yes, why, all I think you're holding on to me. I don't tell you anymore. I don't tell anybody I have reasons. What's that supposed to mean? Whatever you wanted to. They're not going to do to me what they did to Mr. Korovsky. Now, please leave me alone, please. Okay, well, okay. But here's my card, just in case you need a sympathetic ear. Please, I, I just need to be left alone. I'll be hearing from you. I'm sure of it. After I find somebody who will talk. <laughs> Well, how's it going, Bennett? Besides pictures, the old man's place, Lieutenant, nothing. Ah. Uh, well, see what you can find on the stairs going up to the street. Oh, I don't know what's keeping George, Lieutenant Riley. He said he... Come on, Mrs. No, Fader. No, I don't want to see it. No, no. Are you afraid it might make you talk, Mrs. Fader? Valentine, what's that, Captain? Lieutenant. Go on, go on. Take a good look, Mrs. Fader. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And everything was always so nice. So nice. Oh, stay palm. Stay palm. And over here, Mrs. Fader. Here's something that's not so nice. Oh, no. Yeah, that's right. Stepan's blood. Where is he? What are they doing to him? If you want to find out, and if you love him, you'll loosen up. 
Now, who were you paying that money to every month, Mrs. Fader? All right. All right. I'll tell everything. Good. Forgive the dramatic interest, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, Mrs. Fader. Hey, you better sit down over here, Mrs. Fader. Heaven on earth. That's the American expression, isn't it? Yeah. To a foreigner like me, it's more than that. It's a real heaven on earth, this country. You can't blame me if I would do anything to stay here. What are you trying to say, Mrs. Fader? I, uh, I'm not a citizen. Well, neither is Mr. Karamsky yet. But I can never be one. I pay to get across the border. Oh. I have no right to be here. Oh. Well, that's pretty serious, Mrs. Fader. I know. And they know it. That's why they make me and the others pay. All my life I would have to pay, or they would tell on me. Uh-huh. Well, there's our racket, Lieutenant. Oh, it's hard to believe. Yeah, this is getting to be bigger than us, Valentine. It calls for a trip to the federal building. Yeah. Please. Please, you must find Stepan. I don't matter about me now. We'll do everything we can, madam. Well, you can carry the ball from here, Lieutenant. But I've still got a client named Stepan Karofsky. Roxy, I'm going to stay right here in this office all night till I think of something. So go on home, get some rest. I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Oh, darling, you mustn't blame yourself. Oh, just I keep thinking of that little guy. Pike gets a week, Karofsky. Anything goes wrong, Karofsky. Oh, Brooksy, why don't I draw anything but blanks? Well, good evening. I see you've changed your mind. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Miss Cobra, this is Miss Brooks, my assistant. Hello. Don't make any difference now. I read the papers. Why are those people paying all that money? Oh, come now, Viola. You knew that all the time, didn't you? Yes, but I couldn't say nothing because I was just like all the others. Okay, okay. Now we both know. So what? The immigration people, they get me soon enough now. May as well tell you everything. Perhaps you can still find Mr. Karofsky before... What's uh, everything supposed to mean? I know who is man at the top. George. Go on, go on. I lied about meeting those different men in the park. I always brought the money directly to Maurice Armstrong. Why, that fat pig. What? It's bigger than you think, Mr. Valentine. He takes all he can get to smuggle people in the country and then blackmails them for the rest of their lives. Anybody's guess in how many other big cities he does the same thing? Uh-huh. Shall I call Lieutenant Riley, George? No, no, Brooksy. We'll pick him up on the way to the Von Dome. It's his party, but I want the pleasure of making Armstrong tell me what he's done with Karofsky. Mr. Valentine, I, I'm afraid of what they do to me. You'll be okay, Viola. We'll drop you off at your place first. Lock yourself in and stay put till you hear from me. Now, come on. Let's get going. <laughs> That's the nice thing about police headquarters. You can always find a place to park. Mm. Oh, I feel so sorry for Viola, George. Mm. She looks so cowed, beaten. Always looking down, away from you. Well, she's been under a lot of pressure, Angel. She doesn't even care how she looks. Beautiful blonde hair is beginning to look like a wig. Isn't there anything that can be done for her? <laughs> Besides sending her to a beauty parlor? I don't know, Brooksy. It's not our job. Hey, put me through to Lieutenant Riley's office, will you, Hennessy? Sure thing, Valentine. Take it on that phone over there. Okay, thanks. This is George Valentine. Let me speak to the lieutenant. Out where? Say that again. Uh-huh. Found dead, huh? Okay, thanks. What is it, George? Another blind alley, Brooksy. Only this time there's a body at the end of it. Well, Valentine, there he is, sprawled over his desk, the gun still in his hand. No doubt about it, Armstrong killed himself. Yeah. 
After what you told me, my guess is he thought we were closing in on him. Well, there goes our last chance to find out what happened to Mr. Karofsky. I've, uh, I've got the boys going through this penthouse with a fine-tooth comb, but no records at all on this alien racket. Oh, they'll find something because Viola put a finger right on him. Who reported the suicide, Lieutenant? Well, the houseman came in to say goodnight and found him like this. I remember the name from what you told me yesterday, so I beat it right over. I just heard about Mr. Huh? Armstrong. <gasps> oh. Who are you? Uh, Louise Wilson, uh, Mr. Armstrong's secretary. I mean, I was... The girl on the switchboard called my apartment and told me what happened. Oh, I see. <clears throat> well, uh, Miss Wilson, just what were your duties as Mr. Armstrong's secretary? Did you notice anything strange about his activities? Well, no, he was a very well-known rare book dealer. Kept records of his transactions, cataloged the volumes, and to dealers with him. Mm -hmm. I, I did notice he was very nervous and irritable the last few days. Oh? How do you mean? I don't know. He acted as though he were afraid of something. Uh, was there anything, Miss Wilson, to make you suspect that he might have been interested in something else besides old books? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Valentine, I I've sometimes wondered about some of the people who came to see him, I mean. Huh? Oh, yeah? They, they were practically all foreign-born. Of course, so many book dealers are. Well, okay. Now we'd better get a hold of that girl, Viola, so she can identify Armstrong before we take him down to the morgue. Oh, I'll pick her up, Lieutenant. Oh, I, I just thought of something else. Well, let's have it, Miss Wilson. About a week ago, Mr. Armstrong gave me a package to keep in my place. He told me if anything ever happened to him, to mail it to a certain address he gave me. Well, for the love of heaven, why didn't you think of that before? I, I could have it here in half an hour. All right, all right. Get going, please. Yes, Lieutenant. Well, what's the matter, George? Why don't we get going for Viola? Hmm. Oh, there's no hurry, Brooksy. What do you mean, there's no hurry? We want to get through here tonight. Well, that's been the trouble with me up to now, Lieutenant. I've been trying to cover too much ground too fast. But now, now I'm beginning to get a nice, clear picture of this whole deal. If you don't stop talking in riddles, I'll... See you in a little while, Lieutenant. <laughs> And so, Miss Cobra, you absolutely identify this man as the one you delivered the money to? Yes, sir. Mr. Armstrong. Ah, mm -hmm. Well, that settles that. Now, uh, now you can run along. Oh, uh, just a minute, Viola. Yes, Mr. Valentine? Uh, remember the first time I met you in your room? You said you didn't want them to do to you what they did to Mr. Karofsky. Oh, yes. How did you know that anything had happened to Mr. Karofsky? Well, Miss Brooks uh... and I were the only ones who knew that. You have must have misunderstood what I say. Well, maybe I did at that. Valentine. Lieutenant, I wonder why Miss Wilson isn't back yet. She's been gone more than an hour. Would you have any ideas on that, Viola? Of course not. Why should I? Isn't it a safe bet to say that Miss Wilson could never get back here until you've gone? George, you're trying the lieutenant's patience and mine, too. There's yeah. another question you might be able to help me with, Viola. I... I don't understand. Miss Wilson only knew me as the man from Mrs. Swenson's employment agency. Now, why wasn't she surprised when she saw me here tonight? And why did she call me Mr. Valentine? Lieutenant, what did she say? I don't know. Remember, Brooksy, you remarked about Viola's hair? Hmm? What a pity it was that such a beautiful blonde locks were beginning to look like a wig. Well, that's what it is. Oh, what the you, devil? She's a brunette. And if you took a handkerchief and rubbed some of this theatrical makeup oh, off like George, this... George, take your hands Underneath, off you'll find Miss Wilson. So You're right. Oh, yes. And not Mr. Armstrong's secretary, his boss. Wait. Well, Valentine, this tops them all. And she's all yours, Riley, after she tells me where she's got Karofsky. Brooksy. Oh, uh, nurse, uh, may we see Mr. Karowski now? In a few minutes. If you will just sit here, I'll call you. Okay, thanks. Oh, still hard to believe. Hmm? What's that, Angel? The whole elaborate plan. Viola, I mean, Miss Wilson, killing Armstrong and making it look like suicide. Well, think of what she had at stake. A nationwide racket, smuggling in aliens, then bleeding them for the rest of their lives. And the silence of the victims almost guaranteed. Until Karowski's conscience began to bother him. <laughs> she fooled me completely. So then she got rid of Armstrong, who was just a figurehead. Everybody'd think the trail ended there. 
And with all the records nice and safe, she could go right on under any other name. Mm-hmm. You can go in and see Mr. Kurofsky now. Okay, thanks. Let's go, Puss. All right. How do you feel, Mr. Kurofsky? Oh, outside, not so good, Miss Brooks, but inside, beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Valentine. Oh, oh, thank me. Coming from a guy who took the beating you took? That's a laugh. We spoke to Lieutenant Riley, and you don't have a thing to worry about, Mr. Kurowski. You've practically got your citizenship papers now. Well, I, I am very happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's another thing. Yes? Uh, you know, there are a lot of things a new American citizen can do. Uh, for instance, if it's all right with the judge... The moment he gets his papers, he can be married. Huh? And uh, if the lady isn't a citizen, she becomes one, too. That is, uh, after she spends a little time, say, in uh, Canada or Mexico. You mean Anna and me? Let me be the first to congratulate you, Mr. Carras. Oh, my, my, this is a wonderful country. <laughs> Did you know that your car's worst wear can begin after you turn the ignition off? Experts say hidden rust inside cold cylinders causes as much as 80% of motor wear. Here's the way to beat that number one enemy hidden in your car's engine. Just make sure you use compounded RPM motor oil. The compounds in this premium quality oil act to prevent rusting of your engine parts. Where ordinary oils run off finely polished parts, RPM clings to the job, fights off rust when your car is standing cold and when it's running hot, too. No wonder RPM is the choice of Western motorists two to one over any other motor oil. Get this rust fighter tomorrow. Ask for RPM motor oil at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Now, look, Thorpe, I don't like to return such a very pretty check, but I'm here to call it quits. You... Oh, now, listen, you're not that busy. You can at least turn around when I... What's the matter with him, George? Just a minute, Brooks. Hey, you'd better go on outside. If he could turn around, it would be the neatest trick of the week. He's got a letter opener stuck in his chest. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson as Viola, Louis Van Ruten as Kurowski, Yana Delos as Mrs. Fader, Alan Reed as Armstrong, and Harry Bartell as the elevator boy. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If it's so far over your head you can't even reach it with a sky hook, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details.
Dear Valentine, here's a laugh. A private dick falling for that screwy ad of yours. Her name is Joe Logan. We ran across each other a couple of times, but that's not important. Here's the deal. I'm meeting somebody at the Half Moon Motel tonight. I'm not the sensitive type, but something about this ring's phony. So if you read about me in the obituary column tomorrow, I want you to cry murder, good and loud. And close with a hundred bucks for your trouble. A hundred bucks for your trouble. But if you hear my sweet gravel voice over the phone before noon tomorrow, forget the whole thing and buy yourself a drink. <laughs> Sign Joe Logan. Uh-uh, I'm not buying that, Angel. It's too pat. Joe Logan knocked off by a hit-and-run driver last night of all nights. Yeah, but don't forget it says here that Mr. Logan had his customary snoopful when he was clipped by that car on a deserted stretch of Whitman Highway. And not too far away from the Half Moon Motel. Better put your ear stoppers in, Brooksy. Huh? Yeah. I'm going to cry bloody murder the way my client wanted it. Good and loud. Look, Valentine, I don't want to be antisocial, but the only thing I've got eyes for this morning is a report just sent in. Frank Potter, prominent banker and philanthropist, was murdered. How about one Joseph Logan? I think he was murdered, too. You think, but this I know. Frank Potter was murdered, and he happened to be a close friend of the police commissioner. Oh. Yes, sir, and the commissioner doesn't like his friends being bumped off unless I can produce the miscreant five minutes later. So call me tomorrow. Oh, that's a fine attitude, Lieutenant. The only safe way to get murdered in this town is to be a friend of the commissioner's. Yeah. Oh, now look, Miss Brooks, why don't we talk this over on my day off when I can afford to be a gentleman, huh? Oh. Right now, I want... Ah, uh, now. Yes, Riley. Huh? Eh? Okay, I'm on my way out there now. What's that? What's the name of that place? Go on, go on, I'm listening. And you say this Mrs. Cronin identified the man she saw with Potter? Okay, Sergeant. Okay, I'm as good as there right now. Well, Brooksy, I guess they're too busy for us today. Yeah. Here, we'll uh, be back, Lieutenant, when this storm is over. Uh, no, you don't, Valentine. You're not leaving here. Well, what's the matter with you anyway? Do you know where Frank Potter was murdered? Look, I'm not my usual psychic self this morning. Where? The Half Moon Motel. George! Go on, Lieutenant. Yes, the Half Moon Motel. And a dame out there, a Mrs. Cronin, identified your client, Joe Logan, as the man who did the killing. <laughs> I'm surprised, Mr. Valentine. The police didn't get around to me yet. Any time now, Maggie. They know that in a racket like Logan's, the secretary knows more about a boss than anybody else in the world. Maggie, don't you have any idea what Mr. Logan might have been afraid of last night? I just know that Joe's death was no accident. I, I didn't even know he wrote that note. Not that it matters to Logan now, but that letter to me puts him right there in the Half Moon Motel with Potter. Why does it? Joe had other clients. Whenever he didn't want to meet somebody here at the office, he'd call up the Half Moon Motel. I know the police would love to pin this on Joe, but I'm not going to let them out. I'll cut it, Maggie. Let me have that. What? Yeah, that page from the appointment pad. You're too nervous for any sleight of hand today. Uh, Eight o'clock. Frank Potter. Half moon. Oh, so you knew he was going to meet Mr. Potter, didn't you? All right, I did. But Joe didn't kill anybody. All right, maybe I believe it. But that's not good enough, Maggie. You've got to make sure. Now, what about the deal your boss had with Potter? I uh, don't know anything about it. Oh, you don't. Okay, come on, Brooksy. We're wasting our time. Wait. You want to play this hand face up with me? It's the truth. I don't know what Potter wanted with Joe. Or perhaps what Joe wanted with Potter. Whichever way it was, but they did have a quarrel right here in the office yesterday morning. That just makes the case stronger against Logan. I couldn't hear what they were fighting about. Finally, Potter slammed out of here in a rage. I see. Just one more point, and let's face it. The medical examiner reported that Joe was a little more than slightly crocked when that car sideswiped him. Joe never drank so much he didn't know what he was doing. Just the same. How about a list of his favorite bars? It might help if I knew where he was before he went to meet Potter. Joe's favorite bars? How do you want them, from A to Z? Oh, George, can't you see she's all upset? Could have been Johnny's Place near City Hall or Chris's on West Laredo Street or, or it could have been... Uh... Mort's Paddock Bar on Whitman Highway? What's that, Brooksy? Look at this book of matches in the ashtray. Mort's Paddock Bar, where good sports meet. Yes, that's another place Joe used to like to sit and talk to more. Whitman Highway. That's on the way to that motel. And Mr. Logan was run down on Whitman Highway. Yeah. See you later, Maggie. (laughs) 
Well, Mr. Valentine, should I be forthright? Oh, by all means, Mort. If it was anybody else, Mr. Logan, uh, I uh, would have said he was uh, well under the influence when he left my place last night. But uh, seeing it was, Mr. Logan, uh, what would you say? Well, you see, he's one of those good-looking strapping men who will, uh, you know, just get convivial, so to speak. Well, that's a nice way of putting it, Mort. You know something, miss? Mr. Lowing's going to leave an empty place at my bar. You know, he was a swell talker. I picked up a lot of new words from him. Yes, I guess you'd say Mr. Logan was epigrammatic when it came to uh, uh, repartee. <laughs> the poor fella. Yeah, I see what you're trying to say. But uh, tell me, Mort, uh, what time did he leave here last night? Oh, about eight, I'd say. Before or after eight? Well, couldn't be sure, but he did say he was leaving his car in my parking lot till he got back. Well, didn't he say where he was going? No, miss, but it must have been near here because he said he was going to walk it. Ironical, isn't it? Just this time, when he decides not to use his car, he meets up with a pedestrian's face. Not just ironical, Mort. It's more than that. Yeah, now, you see right out that window? Down the highway a couple of hundred feet? That's where it all happened, on the right-hand side there. Just by that first telephone pole. The oh, poor fella. Okay, thanks a lot, Mort. You've been a great help. I'm afraid I didn't have very much to say. But you did, believe me. Well, drop it again. Always like to talk to people. Well, darling, do I ask questions, or are you going to let me in on the brainstorm? Take another look down the highway, Brooksy. What do you see? A pretty highway. Credit to the state. One lane going east, the other going west. An island of trees in the middle. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yourself. I see what you mean. Yeah. Joe Logan left the panic bar and started to walk down the highway on the right-hand side, walking toward the Half Moon Motel. Not away from it. Well, if you're right, George, Logan never even got there to kill Potter. Which should simplify things for us, but doesn't. I've got a hunch you ever killed Potter ran Logan down. Yeah. Well, what next? Well, I understand there's a Mrs. Potter. Have a talk with her, Brooksy, huh? See if she knows what business her husband had with Logan. Okay, where will I meet you? Back at the office. In the meantime, I'm going to scrape up an acquaintance with this Mrs. Cronin, who swears she saw Logan at the Half Moon Motel. Look, Bob, since you ain't a dick, beat it. I got business with Mrs. Cronin. So have I, goon boy. I said beat it. Now, boys, remember, I do have neighbors. You leave this to me, Sheila. Are you getting out of this doorway, or do I have to step over you? Look, you do as I told you. <laughs> so I step over you. You know how to make an impressive entrance, don't you? I don't think I'm forgetting this, mister. If you do, I'll be glad to refresh your memory. Oh, you shouldn't have done that to Charlie. Huh? After all, he's just a bookie trying to squeeze out a living. Well, from all these racing forms around, you seem to be one of his best customers. And I owe him $3,000 just for yesterday. And Charlie's getting a little impatient. You don't have $3,000 on you, have you? Just a few pennies shy. Uh, now, Mrs. Cronin... If you were to call me Sheila, what would I have to call you? <laughs> well, that depends on your vocabulary. After I called you a liar. I liked you the moment you came in. Can I get you a drink? You didn't see Joe Logan here last night, did you? Strange how it happened. I just looked out the window, and there he was in that cabin across the court. How come you knew Logan at all? What did you ever have to do with him? I needed a private detective once. Someone told me about Joe. What kind of a deal was it? Strictly confidential. Had nothing to do with this. The police let it go at that. Why don't you relax? You're still lying, Sheila. Whatever you say, George. No one who could afford to lose three grand a day at Jungle Up at a cheap motel like this. Oh, you're so understanding, dear. But why don't you forget it? It'd be easier if I knew how come you were here so conveniently to identify Logan. That was just an accident. I'm supposed to be with a girlfriend in Seattle. That's what my husband thinks. Oh? I gamble too much. Just like other people do other things too much. Once in a while, I take a room like this and splurge. Bet on anything. Bet all the time. The bigger the odds against me, the better. It's in my blood... It's like a disease. Must be an expensive disease. <laughs> Poor darling. I talk too much, don't I? I want you to make me forget that I never win. I bet you can do that. What odds do you want? Oh, that's, uh, that's very nice, Sheila. But not good enough. What better odds do you want, you? <laughs> oh, thanks. Now that you've cleared the air, we can get back to business. Oh, George, I'm so sorry. Did I hurt you? What time did you tell Lieutenant Riley that you saw Logan? Eight o'clock. How come you're so sure? Well, Charlie just phoned to give me the result of the last dog race in Miami. I happened to notice the time. 
You're not still angry with me? You want to bet? Y- you're not leaving. Sorry, Sheila. I expect to be a very busy boy. Oh, George. First a phony accident, then a number. A murder. And now you. Yes? You going all out to make me stop wondering if you frame Logan. And somehow I think it all ties together. Now all I got to do is prove it. <laughs> Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about a very important matter of motoring. If your car's battery has been acting like a mule, temperamental and balky, here's an easy way to cure it. Have your battery serviced at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station. They'll inspect the water level, cables, terminal clamps, and test the battery's condition. And they'll be frank. If it just needs a charge, they'll tell you. If your battery's really on its last legs, they'll explain how a new Atlas battery can save you money. Every Atlas battery has its certified power capacity stamped on the case where you can read it. And you'll find these capacities meet or exceed standards set by the Society of Automotive Engineers. The longer-lasting starting power of Atlas batteries, by the way, is backed by a written warranty honored everywhere by 38,000 Atlas dealers. Independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations are glad to service your battery, proud to offer you an Atlas battery when you need one. That's why they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure, George Valentine. A private detective of all people mails you $100 and tells you to cry murder if he's among the missing tomorrow morning. Sure enough, the gentleman, one Joe Logan, is run down by a car during the night. Then a prominent banker is found dead in a cheap motel. And an incredible blonde who prides herself on betting on anything puts the finger on your dead client as the murderer. All of which makes you decide to ask Joe Logan's secretary a few more important questions. Come on, Maggie, think. What truck did Logan have with Sheila Cronin? It was just a routine case, Mr. Valentine. It was more than a year ago. Nothing involving that hot tip addict could be routine. She's too far out of this world. Now, let's have the facts. Well? I suppose he did go out with her a couple of times. She kept after him. Was it serious enough to make Sheila feel she was the woman scorned? Make her want to frame Logan? Joe could never be serious about any woman. There were too many of them. All right, so he was a Casanova. What about the case? The insurance company hired Joe to investigate Mrs. Cronin when some of her jewels were stolen. Everything proved to be on the up and up. Joe was only on the case a couple of days. Hmm. That doesn't give me much. That hot-eyed blonde is the key to this fancy frame-up. But why? That's what i got to find out. You uh, wanted to know about Mrs. Potter. Yeah? Uh, Joe never had her for a client. I even looked through all his personal papers. Which also gets us nowhere. Unless Brooksy comes up with something on Mrs. Potter. <laughs> Miss Brooks, can't you see I'm dressing to go out? Oh, I just thought, Mrs. Potter, that since your husband had some dealings with Joe Logan, you might know something about him. I told you. I never heard of Joe Logan. Anyway, what right have you to question me like this? I just thought you might be interested, if it might help solve Mr. Potter's murder. I'm sure the police are doing all they can about it. Well, you might make it easier for them if you tell them all you know about Logan. What makes you so sure I know this, Miss Joe Logan? He was killed, you know. Well, that's just too bad. But he's not the first man to be knocked down by a hit-and-run driver. Now, get out. Oh, then you did know Joe Logan. What? Well, that's pretty obvious. There were only a few lines in the paper about his hit-and-run accident. Not the sort of thing you'd remember about a stranger. You know, Miss Brooks, I should have obeyed my first impulse and had the butler throw you out. (laughs) All right. I hired Joe Logan once. Why didn't you tell that to the police when they questioned? It has no bearing on this case. Does that satisfy you, Miss Brooks? Oh, not quite, but it's a good beginning. Well, I won't keep you any longer. I know you're anxious to get out and celebrate. What did you say? Get out of here. Go on, get out. Good work, Angel. I don't know what it means, but Mrs. Potter must have a good reason for denying that she knew Logan. Well, it's hard to know what she's thinking. 
Vivian's a cold dish with a memorized smile. Our friend Logan seems to have gone in for females who insist on being characters. Mm. Anyway, why can't we find any record of this deal with Mrs. Potter? Maybe it's uh, something you just don't put down on paper, huh? Could be, Brooksy. Well, all we know up till now is that Potter and Logan had a quarrel. Yeah, and that's right. both true. Sheila and Vivian were Logan's clients at one time or another. Oh, make something out of that if you can. Okay, Valentine. You said you want to see me? Well, Charlie, you're a good sport. I didn't think you'd show. Uh, the information you asked for over the phone, Valentine, I got it. Well... How does it get me the three grand Sheila Cronin owes me? Look, Charlie, I'm not guaranteeing anything. But you'll stand a better chance at collecting if you play along with me. Well, I Business don't know. is business, Charlie. Okay. I don't know why it's so important, but it was 9 o'clock when I called Sheila about the last dog race in Miami. Sure it wasn't 8? Couldn't be. Races ain't over till almost 9. Now we know Sheila was lying. Yeah, but why? And what answers have we got if she just says I made a mistake? Yeah, now, look, chum, about the three grand... Talk to you later, Charlie. Right now, I got to get over to that paddock bar and see what use I can make of Mort Fisher's garrulity. Is what? Don't look shocked, Charlie. That just means love of conversation. Well, it's sure good to see you, Mr. Valentine. You know, I was hoping you'd drop in. How are you, miss? Hi, Mort. Say, look, you like to talk, Mort. I thought if we sort of sat around a while, you might remember something Logan said last night that could help us. Why didn't you tell me this morning that the police think Mr. Logan bumped off this Potter guy? Then, ironically like, mean up with an accident. Oh, you found out, huh? Oh, sure. Why, it's in the evening papers, miss. And piling irony on irony. Yeah? Look what happens to here right here in my own bar tonight. Did you ever see anything so, well, uh, fortu uh, fortuitous, you know? Uh, you know, uh, you, well, look, you know who's sitting down there in the number one booth all by herself? No, who, Mort? Why, Porter's young wife, drowning her sorrows with champagne cocktails. Except she doesn't look too unhappy, if you ask me. Then you know Mrs. Potter. Ah, uh, that's more of the irony, miss. She used to come in here with uh, Mr. Logan. Oh, hey, now we're getting somewhere. But that's not all. Two minutes after she comes in, that good-looking blonde from the Half Moon shows up. You know, the one who identified Mr. Logan? Recognize her from the pictures in the paper. You run a popular bar here, Mort. Oh, just thanks. But it's uh, mostly, of course, the location. Last bar on the highway for the next five miles. Don't be so modest, Mort. Say, would you mind keeping Miss Brooks entertained? Hey, but wait. I have got something else to tell you. I'll be right back, Mort. Hello, Sheila. Well, look at you. Now, George, I was just getting lonely. No, thanks. What I've got to say won't take that long. Besides, I've got to make another stop. Do you want to bet I can make it more interesting? Why did you lie about Logan? You never saw him at the Half Moon Motel. He never reached there. I like my story better. The dog race is not over in Florida till nine. So I made a mistake. Why did you lie? Did somebody make you do it? I'm getting fed up with this place. Let's go somewhere else, George. Or did you frame Logan because he had something on you? Was that jewelry hold up a fake with Logan playing both ends against the middle? What are you talking about? I mean, get the insurance money and sell your jewels. So you could pay off characters like Charlie the Bookie. <laughs> you know something? I'm betting you could never prove that. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Tell me, Mrs. Potter, what kind of a job did you hire Logan to do for you? I made one slip today with your secretary. That's par for the court. Your husband was some 30 years older than you. You stood a lot to gain by his death. Go on, you're doing the talking. If Logan had anything to do with it, you'd want him out of the way, too, wouldn't you? Sorry, Mr. Valentine, but you bore me. Good night. <laughs> Well, what'd you find out, George? Tell you later, Brooksy. Hey, you didn't let me finish before, Mr. Valentine. What's that, Mort? You know, talking about quirks of fate, last night about a half hour before he left, I was right here at the bar, you know, with Mr. Logan. So you said. And who should come in from, for a short, quick, when you know, but Mr. Potter. Now, I know it was him from his pictures. Did you hear what they talked about? Oh, they didn't so much as converse. I don't think Mr. Logan even knew the guy. Oh, you must be wrong, Mort. Oh, you could be very right, which is something I want to talk to Riley about. Now, let's see if we can nail him before he leaves the Half Moon Motel.
Why didn't we take the car, George? Well, it's just a short walk, Angel. Yeah. Anyway, I have to have time to think. Try and make some sense out of this thing. So it doesn't sound too fantastic to Lieutenant Riley. Mm. Better keep to the side of the road, darling. Yeah. Brooksy, when we get to the motel, call Maggie at home. Yes, George? Tell her to meet us at Logan's office. There's just one thing I want to clear up. Then I think we'll have this thing late. George, look out that car! Get out of the driver! Ah! Hey, you all right, Angel? So this is what gravel tastes like. And that car was trying to run us down. The same thing that happened to Logan. Yeah, and almost in the same place. A baby blue convertible, a big one. Say, I noticed that before. Parked on the lot next to the paddock bar. And that's where we're going right now. Tell me something, Mort. Hey, yeah, Mr. Valentine. In the short time I was away, did you notice whether Mrs. Potter or Mrs. Cronin left your place? I can't say with any exactitude, Mr. Valentine. Oh. But it seems I do remember both ladies being up and moving around. Of course, we're crowding up now, and... Go ahead, George. Lieutenant Riley's going to stop by here and pick up the two, uh, ladies. And I left that message for Maggie to be over at Logan's office. And that baby blue convertible of Mrs. Potter's is still in the parking lot. Good, good. Now, if we don't find out what really happened, we never will. Okay, Valentine, what's your story? The one we got says uh, Logan killed Potter, and the commissioner likes that version, too. Just a minute, Lieutenant. Oh, Brooksy. Hmm? Call into the outer office and see if Maggie's ready to take all this down. Okay, George. So you think this is a photo finish between me and Mrs. Potter? Is that it, George, dear? Lieutenant Riley, I've answered this man's questions all day. Do I have to go through this now? If you don't mind, Mrs. Potter, yes. You ready, Maggie? Yes, Miss Brooks. Okay, go ahead, George. Okay. Okay, Riley, here's the way I see it. Joe Logan makes a deal with a woman who always needs money because she bets too much. Cooks up a deal with her to cheat the insurance company. Then blackmails her. But I didn't kill him. Logan also talks to a pretty young matron, much younger than her husband. So you think I'm pretty? Thank you, Mr. Valentine. She wants Logan to help her get rid of her husband without involving her, and so she can still get a big chunk of his money. I discussed that with Logan. That's as far as it went. Uh, keep going, Valentine. Well, a wonderful plan is born, Lieutenant. Somebody makes an appointment for Logan to meet Potter at the Half Moon Motel. When Potter arrives, he's murdered. Then Logan is deliberately run down on the road. And you know, Lieutenant... Dead men tell no tales. Yes, that much we know. Yes, do get to the point, George. Then enters what Mort would call the ironical touch. We're told that Logan and Potter had a violent quarrel the very day of the murder. Who should know better than the secretary who overheard it? Is that right, Maggie? That's right, Mr. Valentine. Then Mr. Potter does a very human thing. On the way to his appointment, which he knows he has to do with his wife... He stops in for a quick drink at Mort's bar. He stands almost next to Logan, but they don't say a word to each other. Because they've never met before. Ah, uh, look, look, you've got to make more sense than this, Valentine, because uh, I don't get it. Oh, you'll get this, Lieutenant. Why were we told there was a quarrel? Because that would supply the motive for Logan to kill Potter. And who'd know enough about Sheila to force her to place Logan at the motel when he wasn't there at all? A lot of questions, Mr. Valentine. How about some answers? Coming to that, Mrs. Potter, coming to that. But just one final question. If Logan were proved as your husband's murderer, who would be in the position to hold you up for the rest of your life? What? Someone who had the proof that you were dickering with Logan. Maybe you weren't talking murder, but it might sound like it. Getting all this down, Maggie? You got that proof, haven't you? That's why you committed two murders. Maggie! What? Didn't what? you, Maggie? Yes. You've got your facts all straight, Mr. Valentine. They make a wonderful confession. I may as well sign it now. <laughs> proof, Mr. Valentine, about life being ironical. What's that, Mort? Oh, George, I don't know if I can stand much more irony in one case. Well, just after you left, I mean, after you asked me about Mrs. Potter and Mrs. Cronin, I checked with the waiters. And? They said neither one of the ladies left the place at all. And there you were, suspecting the both of them. 
Well, that's all cleared up now. Yeah, there was another lady who borrowed Mrs. Potter's car, Mort. She tried to run us down. We were getting a little too close to the truth for her comfort. Hey, you know, folks, we've been through a whole lot together. Say, uh, how about dinner tonight with me? You know, on the house. Hey, how about that, Brooksy? Oh, I think that would be perfectly ironic. Good, good. Maybe we can stir up some exciting conversation. Uh, it gets uh, awfully dull around this place sometimes. Dull? Oh, Mort, you can't mean that. So help me, Miss Brooks. I don't know why you're giving me that look of quizzicality. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be willing to bet there's not one car owner in a thousand who could lubricate his car thoroughly. For there are more than 20 vital wear points on the average car, and if most of us tried to find them, it would be pure guesswork. Even the expert lube men at the independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations don't rely on experience alone when they grease your car. Instead, they follow a precise lubrication chart recommended by the manufacturer of your car. And they use RPM greases and oils, each one tailor-made to protect those key wear points. Tailor-made, too, to smooth out road shocks and give you easier riding. So for low-cost maintenance and better riding, get a lube job with RPM greases every thousand miles. Get it at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear Lieutenant Riley saying... Now, Valentine, uh, you say your client was held up Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh-huh. Well, uh, according to this report, the only crimes that took place in our fair city on Tuesday night were uh, a pickpocket apprehended at 7th and Duncan, and... What's the matter, Lieutenant? Uh, I should have remembered myself. The Hafey murder... Killer still at large. Victim previously married to... Here. Here, Valentine, you can have the honor. You've earned it. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gloria Blondell as Sheila Cronin, Virginia Gregg as Vivian Potter, Betty Lou Gerson as Maggie. Dick Ryan as Mort, and Tony Barrett as Charlie. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Ghost on Bliss Terrace, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you're crowded into a corner and you can't fight your way out alone, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, there's no such thing as a haunted house. You know that, and I know it. Still, a great many people in our neighborhood are convinced that a certain empty house on this terrace is occupied by a ghost. 
I've persuaded a group of my saner neighbors to join me in raising a fee so we can prove once and for all. Prove once and for all that it's all so much poppycock. You can find me at home any morning. It's signed Mrs. Angela McCauley. Hmm. A haunted house, no less. Well, I know how we can earn that fee in a hurry. All right, Angel. I'll play straight man. How? Just put out a for rent sign. Oh. Whatever ghosts happen to be around will be trampled to death. Brooksy, you take this too lightly. Hmm? Now, this isn't just one person's fanciful whim. This is a community project headed by a solid citizen named Angela McCauley. Hmm. We can't turn our backs on a civic enterprise like this. Oh, all right. But what standard equipment for a job like this? Hand-tailored bed sheets, old props from an Abbott and Costello picture? No, Angel. Just pride in our work and a normal amount of curiosity. And as I've said, Mr. Valentine, although we're ordinary middle-class families, we take great pride in our neighborhood. Uh, yes, you've told us that, Mrs. McCauley. You can't imagine the effect all this talk about the Mitchell house has had. What do you mean? Oh, it just stands there empty. Nobody will rent it. Nobody will buy it. An eyesore for the whole neighborhood. Well, uh, outside of saying boo to the ghosts, uh, what do you expect me to do? It's entirely up to you, Mr. Valentine. We just want you to prove that all those stories about the Mitchell house are false. Well, just what are these stories, Mrs. McCauley? Well, there was the milkman, Fred Horton. He swears that when he was delivering milk one morning, he saw a curtain swing back and a face suddenly appear in the window. I see. Well, is that all that happened? Well, Tommy Koenig, that's Martha Koenig's little boy, he says he saw a face in the window, too. Well, anyway, that's two people that saw it. Hmm. I certainly wouldn't take Fred Horton's word for anything. And Tommy, that boy can dream up anything with his imagination. Um, you know, uh, I doubt very much if a group of substantial people like yourself would have asked me in at all just because a milkman made a few wayward remarks and a little boy seconded the motion. Are you sure you're not leaving anything out, Mrs. McCauley? Not a thing. As I told all the others, this never would have happened if Sam Mitchell hadn't been murdered. Murdered? Oh, well, this might be the thing you left out. Uh, did you say Sam Mitchell was murdered? Yes, that's right. About a month ago. It was never solved. Why didn't you say that at the beginning? What a way to tell a story. An unsolved murder is an afterthought. And just because Sam Mitchell was hit over the head by some passing tramp, it doesn't mean the whole neighborhood should be given a bad name. Yeah, I know, and I saw Young man, do you or don't you want to accept this assignment? Oh, yes, Mrs. McCauley. Yes, I'd like to take it on. Good. I don't know why. Maybe, as Miss Brooks said, it's just the fascinating way you tell a story with murder as an afterthought. <laughs> Okay, Valentine, okay. I don't see why this Mitchell case has to be a private nightmare. Oh? Nightmare? Well, what would you call it, Miss Brooks? Sam Mitchell, railroad engineer, devoted husband, coming up for pension after 40 years of faithful servant. Hasn't got an enemy in the world. Suddenly we find him beaten to death in the home he worked and paid for. Yeah, we found out that much, Lieutenant. There wasn't anything stolen. Everybody loved the guy. We can't find a murder weapon. How about Mrs. Mitchell, Lieutenant? Eh? Uh, Oh, well, she was visiting her sister when her husband was murdered. He was hit over the head repeatedly with a blunt instrument by someone who apparently couldn't do the job right the first uh, time. Just and... a minute, Riley. Huh? Yeah? I told you my only job is to prove that the house on Bliss Terrace isn't haunted. I know, I know. Ghosts. Ah, that day Mrs. McCauley's been in my hair, too. Well, what about it, Lieutenant? We've been through that house with a fine-tooth comb. We've watched it from the outside. Nobody could have got in or out without us seeing them. Oh, you know how people are when they start talking. Yeah, ghosts. Of all the cockeyed jobs you've ever taken on, Valentine, Take this it is easy, the... Lieutenant. Take it easy. God. Suppose I look for ghosts and you try to find the murderer. <laughs> I understand you deliver milk in the neighborhood of Bliss Terrace, Mr. Horton. That's right, mister. Well, now, just exactly what did you see? Uh, well, like I've been saying, a face in the window around dawn one morning. Uh -huh. A man or a woman? Oh, couldn't tell. It was a, a, a thin face, like it was almost all bone. Long, stringy hair. You've seen it for a minute. <laughs> Look, you believe me, don't you? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Go on, go on. Well, not only that. One morning, I heard music coming out of the Mitchell house. What's that? Yeah, a guitar or banjo or something. 
Uh, it went something like this. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> you believe me, don't you? Oh, yeah, every word. <laughs> I was just marveling at the way you carry a tune. Thanks for the information, friend. <laughs> somebody in the Mitchell house, and I'm going to prove it, too. <laughs> okay, Tommy, take it easy. Well, tell us about it, dear. What kind of person was it? Well, lady, it was getting dark. I put my face up to the wind on the porch, and gosh, all of a sudden, there was another face looking right at me. Hmm. I bet that must have thrown a scare into you, Tommy. <laughs> me scared? Not me, lady. I just kept looking right back at him. I'd say it was me who scared the daylights out of him. Hmm. So it was a man, huh? Golly, I, I don't know for sure. He had long hair like a lady, but... Well, anyway, it was real, like Mr. Horton said. Just wait till I prove it, too. Well, that's a job we both got, son. Only it looks as though you've got a head start on me. I know it can't be easy for you to talk about this, Mrs. Mitchell, oh, but... I don't mind at all. Really, I don't. Oh, that's very nice of you. Tell me, dear, do you like this perfume? It's lilac. Oh, uh, it's lovely, do yes. Do you think I have too much on? I've always used lilac since I was a girl. As Sam used to say, it made me seem even smaller and more fragile than I am. Uh, yes. Now, about the house, Mrs. Mitchell, you were saying... After Sam was... Well... After he passed away, I tried to go back, but I couldn't stay there. You see, there's someone there. I felt it. Footsteps in the night. And once I heard... Music? Yes. How did you ever guess, Mr. Valentine? Oh, I'm psychic on my mother's side. That's nice. It was an old, old song. It reminded me of the days before Sam and I were married. And moved into that house on Bliss Terrace. You know, I was quite a belle, Mr. Valentine. Yes, well, that's easy to imagine, Dances, but if... The mandolin club every Sunday. Canoe rides. Oh, those were happy days. I could have married someone more romantic than Sam. Like Paul Hart. Now, look, Mrs. Mitchell, I understand you were away at the time of your husband's death. I was staying here at my sister's. I'm afraid that Sam and I had a little tiff. Oh, about what? If you'd care to tell me. Sam was getting his pension in a few days. He wanted to live quietly on Bliss Terrace. But I wanted to use the money to see all the wonderful places I've only read about. Poor Sam. Now I suppose I'll have to do that alone. Yeah. Mrs. Mitchell, I wonder if you'd let me have the key to your haunted house. I'd like to take a look around. You know, George, we could sit here in the car and watch that house all night and still not see anything happen. Yeah, you're so right, Angel. I don't even know what I expect to see happen. Darling? Mm hmm. Well, when we went through the house before, I, I did get sort of a funny feeling. Oh, not you too, Brooksy. That's Mrs. Mitchell's private routine. Oh, well, I kept getting the feeling that I was in a honeymoon cottage that hadn't been changed in 40 years. Oh, how do you like that? A honeymoon cottage, bliss terrace, and a murder. What a combination. Oh, George. Hmm? Maybe I'm imagining things, but isn't the curtain in that window on the porch moving? Yeah. Come on, Brooksy, that's our cue. Brooksy, somebody was moving the curtain in this room. There are no windows open. It couldn't have moved itself. Well, nobody seems to be here now. Yeah, well, we're going to keep right on looking. Come on, we'll start with the dining room. Okay. The light should be here on the wall somewhere. No, you don't. Huh? Stay where you are. Huh? George. Okay, you ask for it. What the... Oh, 
All right, Tommy. You can put away your machine gun now. Huh? Oh, it's only you guys. Uh, Say, how did you get in here anyway? Oh, one of the windows in the back. You would find the one I haven't overlooked. Well, I had to prove I wasn't lying when I said I saw somebody in here. Now, look, fella. I told you we're both trying to prove the same thing. How about giving me a break? Well... Oh, I, I know you're better at this sort of thing than I am, but it happens to be my living, my job, so, uh... How about going home, huh? Yes, your mother's probably wondering where in the world you are. Come on. He knows I can take care of myself. Hey, I'll be in the kitchen, Brooksy. Oh, what a deal. Mrs. McCauley, why didn't you stay out of my life? You and your citizens' committee for the prevention of ghosts. Oh! George? Oh, George? Oh, that's Tommy. Come on, characters. Well, he's a character. Well, don't you believe in light? <gasps> oh, George! Oh, don't be a oh. Just a childhood habit sprawling out in the kitchen floor. What happened? You frightened off a remarkably agile ghost. I got tapped before I could even turn on the light. But it it can't be. Yeah, well, this bump is no make-believe. But where did this this thing go? Couldn't get out. There's no place to hide. Tommy was playing around in here, and we were watching the house from the outside. And somebody tried to give me the same kind of scalp massage Mitchell got. Oh, what goes on here? Brooksy, we're not leaving this Victorian love bower until we find out. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about waste. No motorist would deliberately drive with a choke out. It would be like throwing gasoline away. But some folks let the air cleaner under the hood get so dirt clogged that it can waste just as much gas as a pulled out choke. Even worse, a dirty air cleaner means that some road grit and dust is mixing with the gasoline. And that can raise cane with finely polished engine parts. So take a summer driving tip. Have the air cleaner on your own car serviced. It's an inexpensive job that you can have done quickly at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station. While you're there, let them help keep your engine cooler by cleaning out the radiator. That's another simple, speedy service which repays its cost many times over by maintaining proper engine temperature, better all-around operation. Ask for radiator and air cleaner service tomorrow at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, a committee of interested neighbors hires you to prove that a certain house isn't haunted. Oh, yes, you discover almost accidentally that there's been a murder committed in said house, a brutal, unsolved murder at that. Finally, you have to be knocked unconscious before you're convinced you're dealing with anything but a ghost. So, just like George Valentine, you change your tactics. Well, let's face it. Somebody was right here in the kitchen with me, and he didn't have a chance to leave the house. Oh, we keep going over the same thing. All right, Angel, all right. Let's be very simple. Why should anybody want to jump me like that? Well, I'd say whoever it was didn't want you to find him in the kitchen. Ah, now you're being very nice and simple. Thanks. Since I took him by surprise, he wouldn't be carrying a shillelagh around in his hand. He probably reached out for something that he knew would be there, something nice and handy, something like... Hey, what could be handy here? What are you doing, George? This poker hanging on this old-fashioned coal stove. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And Brooksy. It's got blood on it. Yeah, Riley. This is Samuels down in the lab, Lieutenant. And about that stove poker. Well, let's have it. We checked and talked to the medical examiner. That was the weapon used on Mitchell, all right? We're working on the fingerprints now. Well, good. Well, that does it, Lieutenant. Whoever killed Mitchell was there in the house with us tonight. Now, wait. Don't go jumping at conclusions. Well, you don't think it's just a coincidence that of all the things in the house, he used that stove poker on George. He knew just where it was. He used it before. Well, okay, okay. I'm going to buy that. And what's more, I'm going back to that house with you. I don't know what else we can find there that's... That's what has me stumped. Well, if I have to, I'm going to tear that place apart with my bare hands. George, I'm sure we turned all the lights off when we left. Yeah, so am I. But there's a, a light in the parlor, all right. Come on, come on. Wow. 
What in the name of heavens is that? Sure. Horton, the milkman. He hummed it to me. He swears he heard somebody playing it on a banjo or something when he passed the house one morning. Well, let's go inside and find out what this is all about. Oh, goodness. What must you think of me sitting here and singing to myself like this? I uh, thought you were staying at your sister's place, Mrs. Mitchell. Why did you come back here tonight? Oh, let me see. Oh, yes. These two nice young people and I were talking about the old times. Just this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. The songs we used to sing. And that naturally reminded me of the mandolin. You can understand that, Lieutenant. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. I uh what mandolin, Mrs. Mitchell? The mandolin, of course. Oh. Look, Valentine, I don't give up easily, but this is getting out of hand here. Wait a minute, will you hold it, Lieutenant? I'm very interested in that mandolin, Mrs. Mitchell. Ah, oh, you young man. Paul Huff gave it to me when I married Sam. Paul Huff? He was one of your beaux, wasn't he? He was so handsome. And he adored me. No one could play the mandolin like Paul. I'm sure of that. He was the leader of our club. I've always felt that Paul gave me that mandolin so I'd never forget him. Or the dreams. We had together. Uh, I uh, don't know why, but let's get back to that mandolin. Huh? Well, now, that's just it, Lieutenant. It's gone. Huh? It's the only thing in the whole house that's missing. If it was a tramp who killed Sam, why would he just steal a mandolin? Oh, you'd be surprised how many questions I can't answer, Mrs. Mitchell. Come in the next room, Valentine. I want to talk to you. Come on. Okay. You can understand, Miss Brooks. Valentine, a weird thought just occurred to me. You mean that Mrs. Mitchell might be our ghost and murderer? Well, she had a choir with her husband. The milkman says he heard something that sounded like a mandolin, and the old girl plays one. Uh -huh. Ordinarily, if you wanted to kill somebody with a stove poker, just a couple of smacks on the head would have done it. Lieutenant, Mrs. Mitchell is small and fragile. Yeah, yeah. And it took a lot of blows on Mitchell's head to make her a widow. Now, I've kicked that around, too, Lieutenant. But if I don't come up with anything better than that, I'm going to buy me a mandolin and play on street corners. Well, I'm going to get Doc Farrell down here. Police psychiatrist? Yeah, yeah, maybe he can get her to make some sense. I know I can. <laughs> To you, Dr. Farrell. You don't mind the others being here? Oh, no. No, not at all. All right, then. We'll go on. Uh, years ago, when this house was built, you meant it to be a sort of, uh, well, dream castle. That's exactly right, Doctor. It's strange how you should know. But in back of your mind, you didn't mean it to be for you and Mr. Mitchell. Oh, but you're wrong, Doctor. Sam and I lived here for 40 years. Uh, what I mean is that you were thinking of someone else all the time, whether you were willing to admit it to yourself or not. What about that, Mrs. Mitchell? You leave me alone. Get away from now, me. Ah, wait a minute. I Don't get excited. I you, Doctor. You guessed my secret. Take it easy, Mrs. Mitchell. There's nothing to be afraid of. I never let Sam know how I felt. I tried to make him happy. Believe me. Oh, I... yes, we do believe you. Now. Uh, just a minute. I didn't hear, Riley. All right. What do you make of it, Farrell? Well, Valentine, I wouldn't say she's crazy. Well, okay, Doc, what would you say? You've heard of people who stop growing physically, others mentally. Yeah. Well, some stop growing emotionally. She's one of them. Oh, don't go technical on me. I that. mean, for some 40 years, that woman has tried to remain a romantic young woman, holding on fiercely to a love she had to turn her back on. It's as simple and complicated as that. And one day she couldn't stand it any longer and bumped her husband off, huh? <laughs> The answer to that, Lieutenant, is your job. And I don't think you need me anymore. Good night. Oh, good night, oh, Doc. Doc. Well, it's all wrong, Riley. What? What's all wrong? It finally came to me, a matter of arithmetic. Play around with it all you want. Five never equals six. Oh, listen, haven't I had to unravel enough double talk here tonight? Mrs. Mitchell is not even five feet tall, and I'm over six. She couldn't hit me over the head with that stove poker. But it couldn't be anybody else. Unless he's hiding behind a molding somewhere. And if he is, we'll find him. What do you say we really take your advice and start tearing this house apart? But, George, 
George, we've been through this closet before. All right, so we'll look at it again. What are you looking for, gentlemen? I might be able to help. Uh, please, Mrs. Mitchell. Well, I only wait a minute, wait a minute. That patch up there in the ceiling. Huh? That's funny. I never noticed that before. What, that little square? Well, even if it was an opening, it wouldn't lead anywhere. Uh-huh. Well, it couldn't be more than a few feet between the ceiling and the roof. Here, wait a minute. Let me have that umbrella. Oh. That does open. Well, if somebody could squeeze in and out of that hole, how, how, how could he stay up there? Well, why don't you give me a boost? Maybe I can take a look. Hey, how about that, Lieutenant? Can we borrow your flashlight? Uh, all right. Here. Okay. Up you go, Brooksy. Oh. Well, what do you see? Let me get the flashlight on, will you? Yeah, Brooksy? Oh, George! Huh? Huh? Oh, let me down quick! I got you, Angel. Oh. What is it? What is it? Oh, there's a man crouched up there. Oh, it's horrible. Paul? How could it be Paul? <laughs> Say, Valentine, I... What? Remember, Lieutenant, you're in a hospital, not down at headquarters. Oh. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. And sorry. the nurse is likely to throw you out. Well, I'm sorry. But look, Valentine, look, uh, <clears throat> you and I are on this case together, aren't we? Well? Well, I just got a confession from this Paul Huff character. He admits he killed Mitchell. Well, that's that, then. Just a minute, Miss Brooks. He must talk some more. But he keeps freezing up on me. Oh, Valentine, uh, see what you can get out of him, will you, huh? Well, okay, Lieutenant. Mr. Valentine, it's so important that someone know I didn't plan it. I didn't mean it to happen. I... You sure you want to go on? Oh, yes, yes. yes I must. You see, I, I never made anything out of my life. I never knew just what I wanted. Except a few times I'd come back here to town and pass that house on Bliss Terrace. And then I knew what I always wanted. But I never could have. You mean you've been coming back here all these years? Oh, they never saw me, but... This one time I knew I was getting old and old and sick. And I went into the house when they were out. Yeah? I wanted to see what life was like for them, living it so calmly and so peacefully. And suddenly I heard someone come in. I, I didn't know what to do. I ran into the closet and there was that opening in the ceiling. Somehow I climbed up there and... And that's where I've been staying. But how long? Oh, weeks. I don't know. It's hard to say. I, I don't think I could have stood it if I didn't hear her moving about. But Sam Mitchell was your friend once. You could have talked to him. I thought of that, too. But one night when she was away, he walked in and he saw me in the kitchen. Yes, and I was scavenging for food just like a tramp. He didn't even know who I was. Oh, don't try to sit up, Mr. Huff. Suddenly I felt nothing but hatred and envy. And I grabbed the stove poker and... and... I had no place to go. I... I went on living up there. When you found me in the kitchen last night, you felt I was the intruder and you belonged in that house, huh? And to think that she kept my mandolin for... Forty years. That's a long time, isn't it, young lady? Yeah, yes, a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to tell you. Sorry, but I'm beginning to feel very tired. I'll see that the lieutenant gets your story straight. Uh, well, thank you. Sir. Yeah. And I'll tell Mrs. McCauley there'll be no more ghosts on Bliss Terrace.
that finely polished and precision-built engine that gives your car all its go can't be neglected. In fact, it needs more attention when you're asleep than when you're driving. And the reason for that is internal engine rust, which goes to work when condensed moisture begins to settle over parts. Nearly any ordinary oil can fight off rust when your car is running and there's full circulation of the lubricant. But RPM motor oil is compounded to protect the engine when it's running hot and when it's standing cold. Unlike ordinary oils, RPM doesn't run away from its job when you cut the motor. A special adhering compound in RPM keeps a tough oil film on all engine parts, protects the interior of your engine from rust. And that's another reason why Western motorists choose RPM motor oil two to one over any other motor oil. Get RPM at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear Lieutenant Riley saying... Valentine, when you tell me there was a girl sitting in this chair when you came in and that she had committed suicide, mm. natural curiosity makes me ask, where is the body? I don't know, Lieutenant, but she was there. <laughs> uh, if you ask me, my friend, somebody's taking you for a ride. And if you ask me, my friend, I'll keep saying it's Marsha Palmer who's been taken for a ride. And, Lieutenant, I intend to find out where and why. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Sarah Selby as Mrs. McCauley, Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Mitchell, Stanley Farrar as Dr. Farrell, Howard McNear as Paul Huff, and Alan Reed Jr. as Tommy Koenig. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Corpse That Took a Powder, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If life's tossing curves you can't handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, they say that if you think about suicide twice, you won't go through with it. Well, I've thought of suicide over and over again. Tomorrow evening, I'm going through with it. Unless by then you can find some way of freeing me from this horror and the fear that's driving me to this. Hurry. Please hurry, Mr. Valentine. I need somebody's help so badly. I need somebody's help so badly. I'm desperate. And it's signed Marsha Palmer. Afton Apartments, 4A. All right, Brooksy, we'd better get on our bicycles. Wait a minute, George. Huh? Well, don't you think this note sounds, well, a little hysterical? Offbeat? Yeah, that's what I meant. Come to think of it, let's change that to motorcycles. Well, I meant something else. Why don't we telephone the Afton Apartments? Tell the young lady just to stay put till we get over there. Uh-uh, Angel, too much of a chance. 
Suppose we aren't persuasive enough. It might rush things along. Well, still, I... It may not be easy to explain a great horror of fear in so many words on the phone. Yeah, well, maybe you're right. So come on, Brooksy. There's only one way to tell. Excuse me, Mother. Oh, oh, young man. You nearly frightened me out of my wits. Oh, sorry. We just wanted to get to one of those bells. Oh. Funny how you fall into a routine, miss. Uh, first, I shine up the mailboxes in the vestibule. Then I work on the brass around the buzzer. Yeah, well, that's a very nice system, but... A little uh... intelligence doesn't hurt, even if you're only a scrub woman. Oh, no truer words were ever spoken. What was that apartment number again, George? Of course, I haven't always done this kind of work. I wouldn't be doing it now if I weren't at liberty. But when you've got a job to do, you do it the best you know how. Yeah, you're so right, Mother. But how about letting us at Marsha Palmer's bell? Miss Palmer? That's what the gentleman said. Hmm. Yeah, I've been worried about that girl the last few days. Worried? Why? Oh, you know how it is with people's appearances. You can always tell. She's afraid of something. Yes, sir, afraid. Uh-huh. Well, we'll try to take care of that. Which one of these bells do we ring? Oh, you don't have to press the bell. Just take the elevator up. It's self-service. It's the third floor, 3A. I know she'll be glad to see friends, the poor soul. 3A? Hey, are you sure it's 3A? Young man, I haven't worked here for a long time. I have. I should know where the tenants live. Of course, I'm only a scrub woman. All and... right, Mom, all right, sorry. 3A it is. What's the matter, George? Nothing. I just think more than ever we ought to hurry. Maybe Miss Palmer has thought of suicide once too often. Here we are, George. 3A. Yeah. She's just got to be in, Brooksy. Well, that's a good sign. I heard somebody moving inside. Good. Uh, Hello? Oh. Uh, Miss Palmer at home? I haven't the slightest idea. What? Well, I've been trying to work up enough nerve to find out that very thing for myself. Well, you certainly should be in a position to know. This is her apartment, isn't it? Huh? (laughs) Look, did I meet you people somewhere with Marcia? Here at my place at a party, perhaps? Hey, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this your place? Well, that's what the lease says. Uh, the name is Glenn Stratton. I'm a commercial artist when I work. Well, where does Marsha Palmer live? Right over my head, just like an angel. <laughs> Apartment 4A. Sorry. It seems we got the wrong information. Yeah, there's nothing wrong, is there? I've been worried about Marsha lately. She hasn't seen herself. Yeah, she? I know. Afraid of something. That's exactly it. Come on, let's get upstairs, Brooksy. Oh, if you see her, old man, would you tell her that her persistent suitor would love to have dinner with her? The charge will be a dollar for ten words, Mr. Stratton. All right. Come on, honey, no use waiting for the elevator. Mr. Stratton is quite a boy. Any minute you expect him to step back into Esquire. Yeah, that's right. I wonder why Mother, down in the vestibule, gave us a bum steer about the apartment number. If anybody, she should know where people live in this place. Well, let's be charitable and say she's slightly pixelated. This must be it. Here, Angel. I'd better try it again. Obviously, Marsha hasn't any fear of the outside world. The door's open. Miss Palmer? Let's try the living room. Did you say living room, Brooksy? She's... Yeah, that stuff all over the front of her isn't red ink. Oh, George, maybe we better... Ah, Brooksy, don't touch. But This I... is a deal for the police. Anyway, she was considerate enough to leave a note right here by the gun. Oh. What does it say? Please forgive me. I hope this doesn't hurt anybody too much. But I really can't go on any longer. Marsha. Oh, maybe if we'd come sooner. She must have a telephone somewhere around here. Usually they belong on desks. Oh, maybe it's in the bedroom. Oh, if we only knew what she meant by the fear that was driving her to this. There's a lot of things we don't know about Marsha Palmer. There's the phone on the bed table. Oh, good. I don't know how I'm going to explain this to Lieutenant Riley. Hello? 
And O'Reilly's office, please. This is Valentine. Well, it seems simple enough to explain, but when you're all through, somehow you don't believe Oh, me. hello, Riley. Yeah, me. I'm at the Afton Apartments, 45 Lorraine. Yeah, I know you're happy to know where I am. Now, look, a client of mine, Marsha Palmer, has committed suicide. Okay, okay, I know it's a big town and you can't go poking into every suicide, but... Oh, sure, I could report it through the ordinary channels, but believe me, there's something offbeat about this case. It... Okay, if you don't want to bother, I'll just take care of this myself. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we can expect the lieutenant, Brooksy. Good. Now, let's get inside and see what we can find around here. Well, I don't think I'd like to look at her again if I can help it. Well, just take it easy, Brooksy. I... I don't think you're going to have to look at her. What do you mean? She isn't there. But that's impossible. I know. She, she couldn't have just walked out of here. And the note's gone. Oh, Riley's going to love this. Well, anyway, the gun is still here. There's something I'd like to know right now, Brooksy. What do you mean, George? Do I or don't I have a client? Well... And if I do, where is she? Dead or alive? Oh, hey, you. You're the janitor here, aren't you? I'm the superintendent here, if that's what you mean. Oh, I'm sorry, Chief. Uh, not that I believe anything like this happened, but uh, did you notice Miss Palmer leave the building within the last few minutes? Oh, the motto? Oh, whatever she was. Did you see her? No, and I've been working on this lawn for the last half hour. And if she did, I certainly would have... Young lady, did you say whatever she was? Skip it, Chief. Now, did you see anyone else come out carrying, a, say, a large bundle and driving off with it? Nobody. This is a very quiet time of the day around here. I see. Hey, look, who are you people, anyway? Say, I want to talk to that elderly lady who cleans the halls for you. I'd have you understand that I do every stitch of work around here myself. That's why it's so neat and clean. But we talked to a scrub woman when we came in. In the flesh. We don't have a scrub woman here. The way I keep this place, you can eat off the floor. But I just... We have no scrub woman. <laughs> Valentine, aside from being a cop, I'm trying to be a logical, understanding man. When you tell me there was a girl sitting in this chair when you came in and she committed suicide, mm -hmm. natural curiosity makes me ask one simple question. Where's the body? We don't know. Stop repeating yourself, Miss Brooks. But she was there. Mm -hmm. And while you were telephoning me in the bedroom, the corpse walked out on you. Well, I don't know why I should let that upset me. That sort of thing happens every day. Well, it happened today. Well, what about this letter she sent me, Lieutenant? And there's the gun, still on the desk. Valentine, half the people who write you should be rounded up with a butterfly net. The huh? gun, Lieutenant? Yes, we'll look at that right now. Careful, like, so we won't destroy the all-important fingerprints in this amazing case. There. Do you see what I see, Mr. Valentine? <sighs> yeah, yeah. Not one shot's been fired. Mm hmm. And from the looks and uh, smell of this murderous instrument, I'd say it hadn't been used in weeks. All right, all right. I admit I'm stumped. And this is the gun the girl who isn't here used to commit suicide. Yeah. How do you know she was even dead? Did you examine the body? That's not fair, Lieutenant. You know you're not supposed to touch the body. And where is this, this female Harvey who loves to polish mailboxes and doorknobs, but who doesn't work here? Don't rub it in, Lieutenant. But I'm going to find an answer to this. Oh, it's all yours. I'm going to have one of the boys track down your Miss Palmer for you, but if you ask me, my friend, somebody's taking you for a ride. Well, if you ask me, my friend, it's Marsha Palmer who's been taken for a ride. <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about conservation in your car. If you're not getting full gasoline mileage from your car, better have the spark plug serviced for dirty, chipped, or cracked plugs. Often waste as much as one gallon out of every ten gallons of gasoline. That's throwing away quite a bit of money, even if you buy only ten gallons of gas a week. To help your spark plugs do their job... And they do have to fire a million times in every thousand miles. Get them cleaned and reset. For this money-saving service, depend on the men who have a reputation for expert car care at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations. 
If your spark plugs have given you 10,000 miles of service, you'll be money ahead by getting a new set of Atlas Champions. These spark plugs are precision made for accurate timing, full flash sparking, trouble-free service without fuel waste. And you can get Atlas Champion spark plugs at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, a young model threatens suicide, so you darn quick get over to her apartment. But she's already dead. You go into the bedroom to call Lieutenant Riley on the phone, but when you come back, the body isn't there at the desk anymore. All of which makes no sense at all, but if you're like George Valentine, you find yourself face-to-face with, of all things, a theatrical agent. No, 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 Max. None of the ladies in these pictures is the one I'm looking for. Oh, what are you saying, Georgie? Every one of these ladies spent the better part of their lives scrubbing floors in front of audiences. Yeah, I'll take your word for it. But Edna you... Tremaine. Look at her there. In one place, she spent two full acts on her knees scrubbing floors to send her son through medical school. Uh-huh. And then, in the third act, when he's the president of the same medical school, he passes her in the corridor. You don't even recognize it. Pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I'm all choked up, Max. But will you listen to me? Uh, wasn't I all the time? No, I told you I feel pretty sure that someone hired a woman and a darn good actress to play the part of a phony scrub woman at the Afton Apartments. Ah, how can you be so sure she was an actress, Georgie? A phrase she used, Max. She said she only worked there because she was at liberty. Now, that's a theatrical term. You know that. At liberty. <laughs> how I hate those words. The more I hit them, the more money I don't make. Come on, come on. Think hard, Max. I described it to you. She has a thin, hatchet-like face with eyes that try to smile at you, but you couldn't quite believe it. Wait a minute, Georgie. I got a few more pictures. People I ain't used for years. I'll let you see them. Hold it till I call my secretary. (laughs) Who am I kidding? I ain't got a secretary. Oh, Oh, same old Max. Hey, there's room for ten bucks on the expense account if you can be of help. Must be down here in this drawer. Here, take a look, Georgie. Okay, all right. No, no, no. Uh, That one, it wouldn't be. Very versatile. Well, it's strictly burlesque. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Who's this? You recognize her? She's a one, all right. What's her name? Where does she live? I'll get you that information in a minute, sir. I'll just get my secretary... Max! Yeah. Who am I kidding? Oh, I used to have a secretary. Anyway, on the back of it, it says her name is Amy Randall. Address? Hotel Raleigh. Character parts. All dialects. Glad to audition, age over 21. <laughs> they all say that. Okay, thanks, Max. I think I found just what I want. I don't know how you found out where I live, Mr. Valentine. And I don't know what you want from an old scrub woman. Do you mind if I hold your hand a minute, Mom? Now, young Such man, I... soft, well-kept hands. Not the hands of a scrub woman. Huh? Come on, Amy. Give it to me straight. I know all about you. You're an actress. Oh. <laughs> and I thought I played my part so perfectly. Oh, that you did. You did that. You deserve three curtain calls. But come on now. Who hired you to be there just when we arrived? When you've been out of work as long as I have, Mr. Valentine, you don't ask any questions. Fifty dollars for an hour's work is a lot of money. Who was a man? He never said. He gave you a check, didn't he? No, it was all cash. What did he look like? Well, he... He was rather short and stout, uh-huh. and he had just a kind of fringe of gray hair on his head. Yeah. Told me he saw me on the stage once and looked me up. He said he was playing a practical joke on somebody. I just had to say I was worried about Miss Palmer and put on an act. Uh-huh. For a moment there, didn't you really believe I was a scrub woman, didn't you? <laughs> I told you before, Mom, you were slightly terrific. <laughs> you don't know what it means for me to hear you say that. And you don't know just what kind of part you played in a little drama today. What? But then again, that makes us even, Mom. I don't know that either. All right, all right. If that's the way it has to be, the three of us will sit down here in the lobby until Miss Palmer gets home tonight. I don't know why you're here at all, Lieutenant Riley. 
I thought you were convinced that this was all a weird joke and somebody was taking George for a ride. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, practically your own words, Lieutenant. Valentine, I can handle you alone. And, Miss Brooks, I don't have too much trouble with you either. But when both of you gang up on me like this, I... I... Yes? Well, the truth is we haven't been able to find the Palmer Dame all afternoon. And I just didn't put one man on the job, but six. I covered all the places she usually hangs around, too, and nobody's seen her. If you just stop blustering and pouting, Lieutenant, I'd like to say thanks for coming back. Yeah? Well, I'm not doing you any favors. Every time you get a case like this, I get a headache. Let's say I'm here just because I can't afford to buy any more aspirin. Well, how do you figure it, Lieutenant? Somebody went to a lot of trouble to hire an actress so she could create an appropriate atmosphere for the so-called suicide. I know, Miss Brooks, I know. Lieutenant... Lieutenant Riley. Stratton, I told you the first word I got about her, I'd let you know. Oh, thank heaven you're still here. What's the matter with you? What happened? She, 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 she's up there. Huh? Miss Pop? Up where? In her apartment. She, she's sitting there at the desk. I thought for a moment she'd speak to me, but she didn't. Okay, she, she don't didn't. fall apart. Let's have it in clear, simple language. Huh? In words of small syllables. She, she's dead. She killed herself. <laughs> No question about it now. She's good and dead. What were you doing here anyway, Stratton? I, I thought I heard footsteps, so I came up. You see, we'd, we'd had a little argument last night. I just wanted to tell her I was sorry. What kind of an argument? The kind two people have when they love each other. No reason for it, but... I don't know when you want to make up for it. Suddenly, it's just too late. All right, Stratton. We'll talk about that sometime later on. Why the fake suicide this afternoon? And then to come back here tonight and go through the whole thing for keeps. Hey, this might mean something, Lieutenant. What's that? There's a smear of blood on the light switch over there. Oh, I must have done that. You see, it was dark and fumbling for the light. I, I must have touched the desk first. Didn't even notice it because as soon as I this, saw it... This just... gun on the desk, the one Miss Palmer used. Have you ever noticed it around here before? Yeah. I told Marcia she was a fool to keep it around... She had a license for it, and she felt she was safer with it. Any reason why she should write me a letter like this? Go on, Stratton. Take a good look at it. It's Marsha's handwriting, all right. I'm sure of that. I, I, I can't understand what she could have meant. Didn't you yourself say she seemed to be afraid of something? I said she looked as though she did, and she really did, but I, I still don't know what it could have been. Okay, Valentine, I know there might be a lot more to this, but for the time being, I've got to accept the obvious. Obvious, he says. Miss Palmer wrote you a letter threatening suicide. She went through with it. That's all we've got to work on for the time being. Oh, uh, Stratton. Yes, Lieutenant. Be at headquarters at 10 in the morning. We want to get your story down straight. <laughs> that happens to be a very convenient hour for me, Lieutenant. You see, I'm unemployed. Oh, uh, one more thing, Stratton. Yeah. Marsha was a model. Where did she work? Oh, she modeled clothes for a big firm downtown called the Mold Modern. Uh-huh. Which brings me to you, Brooksy. Huh? I fail to see the connection. We'll talk about it later. But you also have a date tomorrow morning at 10. <laughs> I'm Miss Gavron, the head model here. Well, I know you're going to think I'm just perfectly mercenary. Aren't we all? I mean, to be here at the Mode Modern the first thing in the morning after reading about what happened to that poor Marsha Palmer. Wasn't it perfectly awful? Yes. It was quite a shock to all of us here. Well, I thought there might be an opening for me here. After all, I'm a perfect 12, and I've had loads of experience modeling. You can check with Mr. Gillespie at High Style Incorporated or Mr. Farbstein at the... Well, even if Mr. Moore Wyatt were here, he's the head of the firm, you know... I doubt if this would be the right time to talk about taking Marsha's place. I think he was more upset than any of us about what happened. Well, like I said, wasn't it perfectly awful? The paper said there was a note. She was afraid of something. That I don't believe, Miss Brooks. You don't? Marsha and I were quite close. She wasn't afraid of anything. She was always happy and cheerful. Especially yesterday when we had lunch together. You don't say? I even asked her what there was to be so happy about. Oh, she said it was a joke. And she'd tell me about it some other time. A joke, huh? Isn't that just perfectly... I know. Awful. Now, if you'd like to leave your name... Well, I would like to talk to Mr. Wyatt. I'm afraid you can't. 
He won't be in at all today. He's being honored at a luncheon at the Commodore, his club. How perfectly exciting. He even has a picture in the paper. Oh? Here. Oh, my, he looks so friendly and chubby. <laughs> <laughs> Marsha and I call Mr. Wyatt Cupid. Oh, but never to his face, if you know what I mean. Shall I tell him that you'll get in touch with him, Miss Brooks? Oh, but definitely. <laughs> Well, your little interview at Mode Modern, Angel, only makes this case screwier than ever. Well, as soon as I heard about Mr. Wyatt and saw his angelic countenance in the paper, I thought he might fit in somewhere. Yeah, short, chubby little man hired our actress for him to play scrub woman. Oh, he fits in all right, but not with the facts. What do you mean, George? Just a minute, Brooksy. Let's go and see Riley and see what he's got out of Stratton. Oh, Valentine. I, uh, I've been expecting him. Good morning, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. Oh, so, so. Well, here's the way it stacks up this morning. The medical examiner goes along with the suicide theory. Gun, fingerprints, everything. Stratton here tells a straight story. Thank you, Lieutenant. So that's about it for now, Valentine. Uh, just one thing's been puzzling me. Yeah? Stratton, apartment 4A where Marsha lived has exactly the same layout as yours in 3A, hasn't it? Well, I, I suppose so. You know, these apartment houses, not much imagination. But you said you fumbled for the light switch. And got blood on it because you were over at the desk first. That's exactly what you said, Stratton. Well, I, I suppose so. I, I don't remember. Three of us were there when you said it. Now, why did you have to fumble for the light switch? It's exactly in the same place in Marsh's apartment as in yours, right next to the door. Well, maybe I, I didn't explain myself just right. You were right, planting but I... Marsh's body at the desk where it was and the gun, too. No, no, That's you're wrong. That's what you wanted to do in darkness. Then you put on the light and went running downstairs. That's why Hold you... it, Hold it, Valentine. Hold it. I'll take it from here. Look, Lieutenant, you've got to listen to me. That I'm not... smear of blood on the light switch put you square on the spot, fella. Now, the less you say now without a lawyer, the better. I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. Well, you'll have to pardon us. Brooksy and I have a luncheon date at the Commodore. Huh? huh? Have we? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, wait a minute, Valentine. I want to talk to you Maybe about... Maybe you're I... happy about this way this case washed out, Lieutenant. But I'm not. Go on, keep talking, Mr. Wyatt. I... I... I don't know what to say. I should be inside in, in the ballroom, Mr. Valentine, ta talking to the fellows. How can you even think of your silly club now, after everything that's happened? All in all, it was a pretty elaborate job, even hiring a character actress to build suspense. Yes, I, 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 I tried to think of everything. You did? Oh, it was a clever stunt, all right, getting Miss Palmer to write that letter to me. It amounted to a suicide. Huh? I knew I couldn't afford to overlook a thing. I, I'm sorry. Sorry I ever got involved in the whole mess. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Wyatt, don't take it so hard. You better get back to your luncheon. And, uh, oh, yeah, go easy on the cream chicken. George, I'm still reeling. Yeah, I can see what you mean, all right. Oh, I know children can be children. But a grown man like Mr. Wyatt... Oh, not a mere man, Angel. The new president of the Liars Club being honored at the Commodore, no less. <laughs> Fantastic. You see, Brooksy, he had to have the tallest story ever heard for this inaugural. And he probably would have had. I'll say. A suicide that wasn't a suicide. A missing body and all the trimmings. He knows all the names, facts, and answers. But still, there he was, free and unfettered to address all his fellow liars. Boy, can you top that one? Not at the moment. But maybe Marsha wouldn't have been murdered at all if Mr. Wyatt hadn't dreamed up that gag. No, Brooksy, we can be pretty sure she would have. You read Glenn Stratton's confession. He was insanely jealous. He was just waiting for the right opportunity. Mm, thinking back, it makes me shudder, George. To fool us, Marsha went down to Stratton's apartment, probably laughing at the joke. Then he killed her and brought her back upstairs. Yeah. Wyatt must have cooked up the deal with his favorite model down at Stratton's apartment. That's why Wyatt told the phony scrub woman it was 3A. Darling, Riley's never going to forgive you for leaving him up in the air, not knowing whether he had the murderer or not. Yeah, but I had to talk to my client, Brooksy. Client? Well, can you think of anybody else in the case I could pin for a fee, except the biggest liar in the world? Oh. 
George, I have an idea. Hmm? Let's present him with a bill that will make even Mr. Wyatt scream, It's a lie! It's often the little things that make your day a good one or a rough one. The simple business of starting your car, for example. If it's obstinate and gives you a bad time when you want to get going, it can add up to a lot of irritation. For fast starts every time and wherever you're driving, just try Chevron Supreme gasoline in your car. This premium quality gasoline is climate-tailored, specially adapted to each different climate and altitude zone in the West. Day or night, summer or winter, you can depend upon it for fast starts. And that's a saving, too, of the power in your battery. What's more, Chevron Supreme gives your car smooth acceleration and extra power for rugged hills. Get a tank full tomorrow at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Hey, look, Barney, what was the idea of dragging me into this doorway when that car came up? Boy, Mr. Valentine, did you see him turn around and beat it when he started getting to work? What huh? works? What happened? Oh, we figured you might be followed when you left the Swede, so the Bearcats were ready on the roof with ash cans, bricks, cans of garbage, stuff like that. Boy, they let him have it. I suppose I should say thanks. Ah, nothing to it. Say, uh, what'd you find out about Danny? Oh, nothing much, kid. Except that there are at least two characters who do anything to keep me from finding out. Well, don't you worry. They won't. Not with the bear cats on the job. Next adventure, George Valentine, has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jacqueline DeWitt as Gloria, Tony Barrett as Glenn Stratton, Glenn Delano as the scrub woman, Ralph Moody as the janitor, and Harry Lang as Max. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. A minor case of murder, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're on a spot nailed there tight, you need my kind of help, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, Esquire... One of the members of our Bearcat Social Club suddenly finds himself in a very embarrassing predicament. With more exactitude, he is in the can for murder. Now, knowing this fellow Bearcat as we do, we are convinced that he is innocent. Therefore, we are hiring you to prove same. As a starter, there is a hundred bucks in it for you. If that isn't enough, there's more where that came from. The address of our headquarters, the address of our headquarters is 19 and a half Duane Street. And it's signed Chuck Wilson, acting captain. Well, George, this sounds like a letter a kid wrote. But to quote from this provocative communique, a fellow bear cat is in the can for murder. That's not kid stuff, Brooksy. That depends on just how old this fellow bear cat is. Oh, uh, they get old early down there around Duane Street. Well, we haven't had a social evening in a long time, darling. 
Would you suggest we drop in at the club? Uh, with great exactitude, I answer. Yes. <laughs> Golly, I hate to think where they dug up that money for your fee. Oh, stop sounding like a policewoman, Angel. All the bear cats just got together and raided their piggy banks. Nice place you got around here, Chuck. Ah, it's just an empty store we fixed up. Yeah, but look at that furniture we got. See that red plush chair? Right out of the lobby of the Piccadilly apartment. Oh, shut up, Barney, will you? Valentine, I believe in getting right to the point. And that's the way I like to do business, too, Chuck. What's on your mind? Now, look, Dan Corey is the real captain of the Bearcats. Uh -huh. The cops got him jugged for shiving his stepfather. For what? Uh, it's shiving him, lady. You know, pushing a knife in him. Oh. Yeah, but he didn't do it, Valentine, even if he said he did. Oh, he admits he did, huh? Now, just what kind of a miracle do you expect from me, fellas? Uh, just to believe what I'm saying and find out what really happened. Well, I'm here to listen. Well, the Bearcats have our own special rules, see? And we don't go back on them. Yeah, that's right. L let me read them to you, Valentine. Uh, yeah, okay, Barney. <clears throat> uh, the guy that goes looking for trouble, unless it comes your way, is going to get their tails kicked in. Well, there's nothing wrong with that rule. Uh, try never to cop anything unless it's from an enemy gang. The fine for violating this rule is one buck. Well, there might be some question about that rate. Well, get to the one we're talking about, will you, Barney? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, lead pipe, baseball bats, and other harmless things is okay. But don't carry dangerous weapons. You might be tempted to use them and give the club a bad name. Oh, yeah. Nothing like trying to stay out of trouble. Uh, violate this rule and you get thrown right out. Yeah, now, Danny made that up himself, see? And he'd rather let you break his arm than break one of his own rules. Okay, Chuck, let's say I believe you. And Danny confessed to the police for reasons of his own. Yeah, that's right. Now, can you think of anyone in the neighborhood who'd want to kill Danny's stepfather? <laughs> Just about everybody. His stepfather was nothing but a phony. Always pushing people around, even Danny's mother. Yeah, but who oh, did the babes go for him? Look, why don't you drop dead? Don't you see we got a lady present? Huh? Oh, don't let me cramp your style. What else about Corey? Well, he was in some kind of a racket with Leo Sudan, see? They worked out of the Swedes pool room on uh, Malone Street. Uh-huh. Well, well you going to take it on, Valentin? Um, what would you say, Brooksy? Well... George, I'd say if so many of the other guys are so sure about Danny being innocent, they may have something there. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking something like that myself. Brooksy? Yeah? You drop in and see Danny's mother. Uh, she lives just down the block, number 33. And while you do that, Angel, I'll get out of the jail and have a talk with Danny. <laughs> Just what did happen that night, Danny? The story's the same every time they make me tell it. Uh, I came home that night from the club. The key was in the door, so I just walked in. Yeah? Well, my... I mean, the man who married my mother was leaving. He had his bags all packed. I knew right then he was throwing her over. So yeah, I... I know. But how is it the police didn't find the knife? Well, I threw it in the river. Yeah? Why'd you go to all that trouble, Danny? And then walk up to the cop on the beat and confess? I don't know. I... Guess I was just half crazier. Oh, I see. So now you know. I don't think I know anything about you yet, Danny. I think you're holding out on me. All right, never mind about me. But do you think you're playing fair with Chuck, Barney, and the others? <laughs> think of those guys. Getting up all that dough and then hiring you. Well? Ah, oh, they're nuts, all of them. And don't think I'm sorry for what I did. Corey had it coming to him. You don't treat any woman the way you treated my mother. I ought to know. After the swell way my real father always acted, before he... All right, Danny, all right, take it easy. You're just wasting your time, Mr. Valentine. Forget it. Uh-uh, Danny. I can be just as tough as you. I'll be seeing you, kid. I know Danny admitted he killed Phil. But if anybody's to blame, it's me. Oh, mothers have a habit of blaming themselves, Mrs. Corey. Yeah, but I knew how he worshipped his own father. And yet I married a man like Phil. A man who lived his days in a pool parlor. He wasn't the father I should have picked for my boy. 
But you had the right to make your own choice. Oh, Danny and his stepfather fought right from the beginning. There was no peace in the house. That's when Danny became an altogether different boy. Started that gang of his. Oh, I suppose I should have known something like this was going to happen. Why do you say that, Mrs. Cole? A few weeks after we were married, Phil was coming upstairs from that pool parlor. Danny was waiting for him. He pushed Phil down the stairs. I opened the door just in time to see him. All Danny did was look at me and walk out. Well, that's just going to make it look all the worse for Danny when he comes up for trial. Oh, I know. I know. Everybody thinks he did it, but I can't believe it. Oh, oh I didn't know you had company, Mrs. Corey. Sorry. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Ravel. Come in. Uh, this is Miss Brooks, a good friend. <sighs> How do you do? Hello. Oh, I do hope you've been able to talk some sense into Mrs. Corey. She can't just sit around moping all day. Oh, you've been very kind. Kind, my foot. I know what it means to feel you're all alone in the world. You forget I spent half my life in hall rooms in the strange towns when I was in the chorus line. I, uh, I think I'd better be running along. And you don't have to worry about Mrs. Corey. Not a bit, dearie. Uh, like I told her, as long as I own this rooming house... There'll always be a place for her here, and I, I own it outright. Best kind of security for someone in show business. Like my late oh, husband used to say... Everybody tries to be so kind. Oh, now, now. All you need is a good sleep, and I'm going to see that you get it. That's good advice, Mrs. Corey. You'll want to look your best when you see your son. See him? Well, Dan won't talk to me. He won't let me visit him in jail. Well, sometimes things change awfully fast, Mrs. Corey. So suppose we just wait and see. Dan? Yeah. Who are you? Let's go somewhere and talk. Don't you see I'm in the middle of a fool game? What you trying to do, jinx me? Hey, wait a minute. How'd you know my name? i never seen you before. Yeah, 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 I'll be right with you. I asked you a question, friend. And what gives? I thought we might have a little talk about what happened to Phil. You know, your business partner. You a dick? No. But I'm not just the inquiring reporter, either. Okay, whoever you are, scram. I got five bucks on this game. What was the deal between you and Corey? The numbers, rackets, slot machines? What was it? I said beat it. Wouldn't you be at all curious if I told you maybe it wasn't Corey's kid who knifed him? Me? <laughs> I ain't got a curious bone in my body. Okay. Have it your way, Sudan. But I think you can tell me a lot outside. I got one thing to tell you. This looks like the only way. Wait, Hold it. Get the pool cue down, Leo. <laughs> now tell me what to do, sweet. I'll Give me it. that cue. That's better. <laughs> I try to run a respectable place. Yeah, talking about that, you better put the pool ball back on the table, too, Mac. Mm. Oh, this. Yeah. I'm glad you reminded me. Leo almost got it between his teeth. Sweet. This guy's been asking me about Phil Corey. You don't say. Hey, look, be a nice fellow, Mr. Run Along. Leo wants to finish his game. You and him got a beef, see him later. Somewhere else. Okay, you win. I know when I'm not wanted. But don't get me wrong, pal. Nothing against you personal. Just that I pride myself on running a nice, peaceable recreation parlor. You know, Swede, you're a man with ideals. I like that. But I got a few broken down ideals, too. What's that supposed to mean? I never get kicked out of the same place twice. I mean, and still leave it nice and peaceable. Hi, Valentine. Huh? Oh, Barney. Yeah. Where'd you come from? Oh, I was in that alley there all the time. Oh? Yeah, I was waiting for you to come out of the Swedes' place. Now, what do you call this? Bear cat protection? Oh, no, no, no. I just thought you liked some company, that's all. <laughs> hey, what are you carrying there, anyway? It's, it's a camera. Yeah, you ought to see some of the pictures I took with it. Hey, that's a pretty expensive deal. Where'd you get it? Oh, don't worry, Valentine. It's mine, all right. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Now, what's the real gag, Barney? Huh? 
One of your club members going to be on my tail all the time? Oh, no, nothing like that. We, we know you can take care of yourself. I just happen to uh, be loitering in the alley, that's so. all. Hey, quick, Valentine, huh? get the doorway. Hey, Barney, what is it? Don't ask me no questions. Come on. Oh, you mean all that noise? Yeah. You're dragging me in the doorway. Hey, look at that car turning around. It's getting a works. I wish I could take a picture of it. Hey, what works, Barney? What's going on, Gibbs? Well, 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 Chuck figured you might be followed when you left the Swedes, see? So the bear cats were ready on the roofs up and down the street. They must have seen that car was trailing you. How do you like that? But all that stuff out there on the street. Oh, the street cleaning department will clean that all up in the morning. Nothing but ash cans, bricks, cans of garbage, things like that. <laughs> I suppose I should say thanks. <laughs> We wasn't going to let anybody wake you over. And you notice we didn't use no guns or knives. Oh, yeah. Perfect little gentleman. Yeah, that's right. But what did you find out about Danny, huh? Nothing much, kid. Except now there are at least two characters who'd do anything to keep me from finding out what really happened to Phil Corey. <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. But first, a word to the wise motorist. If you have an oil filter on your car, remember it needs a little attention now and then. In fact, the filter element should be replaced every 6,000 miles. For after you've had that much service from your oil filter, you'll find the element is bulging with two or three pounds of dirt, most of it carbon and metal particles. And then it can no longer clean the engine oil. So to keep the engine oil in your car cleaner for longer periods... Just make sure the oil filter element is replaced every 6,000 miles. It's another speedy service they're glad to do for you at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, you find yourself working with a gang of rough kids called the Bearcats, just about as tough as they come. They won't believe that one of their members, Dan Corey, is guilty of murdering his stepfather. You play along because you don't believe young Danny did it either. And that's why, like George Valentine, you find yourself with Brooksy in the one-room headquarters of the Bearcats right now, addressing the membership. Come on, Daddy, come on. All right, all right now, all you guys, clam up. Come on, stop yapping, will you? I mean, the meeting will come to order. We've got some official business to discuss. Okay, Mr. Valentine, the floor is yours. Oh, oh, thanks a lot, Chuck. Well, fellas, before I get started, uh, what do you say about unloading some of those uh, harmless weapons your Constitution allows you to carry? Okay, I'm waiting, fellas. Come on now, put them on the table. Well, come on, fellas. You're not afraid to walk down the streets like everybody else without all that stuff. Or are you? Okay, okay, you heard what the lady said. Come on, get clean, will you? That's good. Thank you, Angel. Hey, did you hear that? He called her Angel. <laughs> all right, all right, forget it. All right, Valentine, what about Danny? I'm coming to that right now. I don't have anything like real proof to clear him. Huh? What? Hey, look, look, we're paying you a hundred bucks. You're supposed to have all the answers. Yeah, that's right, like you said in that ad you had in the paper. Please, boys, let Mr. Valentine finish. You see, fellas, it isn't as easy as you think. Before I can help Danny, you've got to have absolute proof of his innocence. Well, after you left the Swedes and talked to Sudan, somebody tried to get you. That ought to be enough for you to work on. It'd be a lot easier if I was sure we were telling each other all we know about this thing. The truth is, unless I'm sure of that, I'm pretty much of a blind alley. Now, somebody here knows what I mean. Uh, you win, Valentine. Here. No, Josh, no. Josh got the shit. That's an ugly-looking knife. Uh, you see, Danny's old man brought it back with him when he came home to the Pacific. He got it off a of Jap. And where did you get it, Chuck? Uh, I may as well tell you the whole thing. See, I was standing on the corner that night right next to the candy store, and Danny went upstairs for something, and the next thing I know, he was giving this to me. He said, uh, Make sure you ditch it, Chuck. Then he goes right over and gives himself up to a cop. Well, weren't you afraid that if this knife were found with Danny's fingerprints on it, it'd make the case really open and shut? Yeah, yeah, I thought of that, Angel. I, I mean, Miss Brooks. Then why were you so careful to preserve the fingerprints, Chuck? I see you got it all wrapped up in a handkerchief. Look, I got more than half a brain, Valentine. If they convicted Danny and he didn't have a chance, I was going to come up with this. 
Maybe there'll be some other fingerprints on it besides his. Uh huh. Smart thinking, Chuck. Hey, uh, Brooksy, take this knife down to Lieutenant Riley and ask him to check the prints. Oh, George, you know he's bound to ask questions. Tell him I'll talk to him later. Right now, I gotta get to work. But first, Barney. Yes? Yeah? All these harmless weapons. Get rid of them, will you? Throw them in the river. Throw them in the river? What's, what's your idea? Now, look, it's up to you guys. Either get rid of this stuff or I forget I ever heard of Danny. Wait a minute. He's right. Come on, he's right. Good, that's the idea. Now, with what you told me about the knife, Chuck, maybe I can really start getting places. I told Chuck to get rid of that knife. What's he trying to do to me? Danny... Wasn't that the knife your father brought back from the Pacific just for you? Oh, he brought back all kinds of other souvenirs, too. It was hanging over the mantelpiece in the front room. You were very proud of it, weren't you? I, I saw it hanging there. So when I got mad at my... Uh, I mean, at him, I... I grabbed it, and I let him have it. You're lying through your teeth, Danny. The police believe You're me. trying to protect somebody. You went right out and gave yourself up. But first, you made very sure you got rid of the knife. Now, why? He asked me that before. Yeah, but this time, I don't need the answer. So long, Danny. I'll still be seeing you. Swede, you and Sudan had me followed last night because you were afraid I might find out you were making book on the racism back of this joint. What are you talking about? I told you, Valentine, I run a peaceable pool party. Or on the other hand, I don't think you would have gone to all that trouble just for that. Maybe it was because the police didn't find just a railroad ticket, the key to his place, and things like that on Corey. They also found quite a wad of toe. The police never overlook anything, do they? Was he trying to get out of town with your cash, boys? Listen, Valentine, I never like to oh, get one more tough, thing. but... Now stop shoving me with that oversized bay window of yours. Speak your piece and get out. Okay. I found the murder weapon, the knife. Now, that ought to tell us who the murderer is. You don't say. Ah, excuse me. I got to get back to my pool game. You, my friend, you're getting out of here. Go on, you heard me? Go on out. Not before I give way to an impulse I've had since I first saw that big beer belly of yours. <laughs> Well, Brooksy, there's nothing we can do but wait here in the hall till Danny's mother gets back. Uh, may as well sit here on the stairs and make ourselves comfortable. Uh-huh. You don't know the job I had persuading Lieutenant Riley to let me bring this knife back with me. Why'd you want it anyway, George? Oh, just a hunch, Angel. May come in handy. Hmm. About Danny. When they arrested him, all they found was a key to the door and a couple of dollars in change. But those fingerprints, I don't Wait see how... Hold they... it, Angel. Oh, hello, Mrs. Corey. Oh, Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Valentine. Remember, I was telling you about him. Oh, how do you do, how do, you do? Mr. Valentine? Now, look, Mrs. Corey, there's no time to waste. Dan's trial begins tomorrow. Oh, I know. I know that's why I've been out walking and walking, trying to think what to do next. Mrs. Corey, your son thinks you killed your husband. Are you sure, George? What are you saying, Mr. Valentine? When he came in that night, your husband was already dead on the floor. Dan saw the knife. He was sure you did it. Oh, no. He knew the police had reasoned that only two people could be inside here along with Corey, you and he. So he took the blame. That's why it was so important to Dan to get rid of the knife. He didn't want any suspicion to point to his mother. Oh, but what am I going to do? I didn't kill Phil, and neither did Danny. Where were you that night, Mrs. Corey? A good, tight alibi would help. Oh, I don't know where I was. Just like today, I left the house and started walking. Didn't matter where. Phil told me he was going to leave me. I'd lost my son and my husband. I'll get it. Oh. oh, oh, sorry, Miss Corey. Seems I keep walking in when you have company. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ravel. Hello. Uh, George, this is Mrs. Corey's landlady. Oh, I'm glad somebody's with you. I wanted you to have this nice hot soup. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to knock on the door and disturb you, but I didn't have my key. Now, just sit down and have some of this. Oh, uh, Mrs. Ravel. Yes? I'd like to talk to you a minute. Could we go in the other room? Oh, I'll take that tray for Mrs. Corey. Uh, talk to me about what, Mr. Valentine? Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Ravel, I'm doing all I can to help Mrs. Corey and Danny. 
And I know you are, too. Well, I've done my best. Well, maybe you can do me a favor. You know we found the murder weapon. Oh, you did? Well, I hope it means something. Or something good. Yeah, I hope so, too. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. The knife is wrapped in a handkerchief. You'll find it in the desk of the store at 19 and a half Dwayne Street. The Bearcat Social Club. What? I want you to go over there and get it and bring it back here. But why me, Mr. Valentine? Well, because I can't leave here and neither can Miss Brooks. You see, we're expecting Lieutenant Riley of the police and a couple of other people. Now, if you'll do this little thing for me, you'll be saving me an awful lot of trouble. Oh, sure. But it'll take me a few minutes to make myself presentable. Well, take your time, Mrs. Rebell. The important thing is, what happens after you come back with that knife? Brooks, see you know what to do. Now get on it. I got to use that hall phone here. I suppose it would be impolite if I asked what was going on. No time, Angel. I have to call Lieutenant Riley, ask him to have a squad car pick up Sudan and the Swede and bring him over here. Oh, that's all very enlightening. Now get going. Mrs. Ravel is not going to take forever to make herself presentable. Now if I can only get Barney on the phone. So be sure you got it straight, Barney. Remember, I'm depending on you. You're the only one who can do this thing for me. And get over here as soon as you can. So long. All right, Swede, Sudan, you may as well sit down. Why'd the cops pick us up and bring us here? Oh, we'll get to that. Oh, Mrs. Corey, you didn't have any of that soup. She'll have it some other time, Mrs. Ravel. Valentine, nobody's got anything against us. You can't hold us here. Uh-huh. Gentlemen, I told you about the murder weapon. Well, here it is. What are we supposed to do? Faint? Oh, Mr. Valentine, what is it? I can't stand it much longer. I hope you won't have to, Mrs. Corey, and I... Oh, there you are, Mr. Valentine. Took me a little time to get that picture developed. Hey, what picture, George? Hey, let me see that, Barney. Here you are. Huh? It's the first time I took a picture from inside a closet. <laughs> Turned out good, huh? Yeah, very good, very good. Picture of you, Mrs. Ravel, taking the knife out of the desk. What? Well, you told me to do that. You sent me there. I didn't tell you to wipe off the fingerprints as you're doing here in this picture. And that's what she is doing, George. Wait, 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 wait. You were afraid your fingerprints would be found on the knife, weren't you, Mrs. Ravel? I never saw that knife before. Sorry, but that won't explain away what you were doing in this picture. Besides, the fingerprints were already taken off the handle down at headquarters. Oh, Mrs. Ravel, I can't believe that you'd... Don't be a fool. <laughs> Imagine me calling you a fool. There wasn't a good-looking woman in the whole neighborhood Phil didn't try to make time with. I thought he was going to leave you for me. Then when he told me he was going away, alone, I killed him. And if you didn't, sister, we might have. Corey was taking it on the land with our dough. But, George, Lieutenant Riley found only one set of fingerprints. Just Danny's, I know, yeah. He wiped off what he thought were his mother's fingerprints. Then my fingerprints weren't... No, no. You were quite safe, Mrs. Ravel. Although I suspected you, I had to have proof. And you supplied it. Will you? Hey, stop yapping. I, I mean, the banquet will now come to order. <laughs> hey, listen, before we get started, Chuck, I got something to say to Mr. Valentine, and I want the rest of you guys to listen to, will you? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I already told you, Mr. Valentine, how I feel after what you did for me, but there's something else. Nobody but you would have gone along with a gang like us. You, you believed everything Chuck told you. You trusted Barney and all of us. You stuck by us. I, I guess the Bearcats have been a little off the beam. But you can take my word for it. After this, we're going to straighten up and fly ride. We're going to start a baseball team and use those bats the way they were meant to be used. Well, I, uh... Well, fellas, after that, I, I don't think there's anything to add. Except, uh... Well, let's see. Sure. And don't worry about the food, Mr. Valentine. We paid for it with our own money. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Valentine, how did you suspect that Mrs. Ravel anyway? Well, it was all a matter of keys, Barney. Whoever killed Corey had to be inside the apartment. Yeah? When Danny came upstairs that night, he found a key in the door. The police took it as evidence. Mrs. Corey had her key. Oh. Phil Corey's key was found on him. And you, Danny, they found your key on you and you were arrested. Now, the only person who didn't have a key had to knock to get in... 
was, of all people, the landlady. The landlady? How do you like that? Yeah, yeah. Order, order. Come on, everybody. Wait a minute. I, I got a motion, hey. What this club needs is an honorary captain. We already decided who it's going to be, huh, fellas? Yeah. 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 Oh, no. Now, wait a minute, fellas. Wait a minute, fellas. You don't... You don't have to do that. After all, uh, I... Sorry, Mr. Valentine. We was really thinking about Angel. I, I mean, Miss Brooks. <laughs> what really makes your car go? The big three factors, of course, are ignition, air, and fuel. And that last one, fuel, is mighty important. Most any gasoline mixed with air and then ignited will furnish enough power to make your car go. But to get the most out of your car, try Chevron Supreme gasoline, the premium fuel that's tailored to each different climate and altitude zone. Chevron Supreme has special blending agents that make your car start with a snap. These blending agents also give your car speedy pickup in stop-and-go traffic and smooth, steady power on the open highway. Next time you start out, Get peak performance from your car by using Chevron Supreme gasoline. It's available at every standard station and independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... George, the woman's asleep. Maybe it'd be better if we came back in the morning. Brooksy, even when people sleep, they manage to breathe. Huh? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Look, George. Maybe this empty bottle on the bed table means something. I don't know. But this note does. When you will find me, I am dead. I could not tell you the secret of the Montoyas and go on living in peace and honor. Forgive me. Maria. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little, Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Irene Tedrow as Mrs. Corey, Gloria Blondell as Mrs. Ravel, Tommy Cook as Danny, Tony Barrett as Chuck, Sidney Miller as Barney, Herb Litton as Sudan, and Jack Crushin as Swede. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Father who had nothing to say. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If you perch behind the eight ball and can't see the clear, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, for ten years now, since I was 14, I've lived with a secret. The fact that I'm the son of a murderer convicted for life. Now I'm going to take a step I know may threaten everything that means happiness to me. Still in all conscience, I must take it. And I can't think of anyone who can help me, except perhaps you. Suppose we talk this over as quickly as possible. Quickly, as quickly as possible, so I can supply what you so blithely call full details. <laughs> Fine, Ralph Lochner. Uh, Brooksy? Yes, George? Without knowing any more about the young man and what he says in his letter, I think I'd like to knock myself out trying to help him. But aside from the startling fact that his father is a convicted murderer, he didn't say very much. Yeah, but the way he said it, Angel, take a step that threatens his happiness, and he must take it in all conscience. <laughs> That's a nice phrase, in all conscience. Well, if things have worked out for him in the last ten years, well, why doesn't he leave well enough alone? Well, that's what we're going to find out, Brooksy. 
Oh, I suppose that means we're on our way. Uh Uh-huh. Could we do anything else? I mean, in all conscience. Mr. Valentine, some cynical people would say the best thing in the world happened to me when my father was convicted of killing that woman. Well, that's a sweet way of looking at it. Well, what did happen to me? I lived with my father in a basement room of an apartment hotel. He was a handyman there. Not very much to look forward to. Well, men have started much lower in life than that. But then my father suddenly becomes a front-page sensation. The murder of Lillian Wayne. And I get put in an orphanage. That's what you'd say. But it wasn't. Go on. But then all sorts of wonderful things happen to Harry Peterson's kid. That's me. Mr. and Mrs. Lochner adopt me. I get sent to the finest schools. My name's legally changed so that the secret is dead and buried. But, uh... You still can't forget your real father, can you? No, I... No, I can't, Miss Brooks. I can only think of him as a pathetic little man who did all he could for me, not as a murderer. But you were only 14 then, Ralph. You naturally wouldn't want to think anything like that of your father. But the court. I know. Guilty. With a recommendation for mercy. Well, he got a fair trial, didn't he? Yes. And I can appreciate how fair. You see, my foster father, Carl Lochner, let me choose whatever profession I wanted. The next month, I'm going to be admitted to the bar. Yeah? Well, I've gone all through the records of my father's trial, the testimony of the witnesses. Yes, he he got a very fair trial. Well, what's on your mind? What's this step you've got to take, the one you mentioned in your letter? Well, knowing something about the law, I've decided that damning as the evidence was against my father, most of it was circumstantial, and he never did admit he killed that girl. But... Well, if this is just a feeling you have and the case is ten years old... Look, Ralph, you ought to know it's going to take something a lot more concrete than that to get past the receptionist at the DA. Yes, but at least I'll feel I've done all I can. Oh, son, is this Mr. Valentine, the gentleman you told me about? Oh, yes, Father, and this is Miss Brooks. Oh, how do you do? do? Dad, I I told Valentine everything, and I hope you still don't feel that... No, Ralph, I thought it over. I think you're right. Well, frankly, Mr. Lochner, I don't know what good I can do. And digging around in the past always involves a risk. I I mean, publicity. Yes, And my secret may not remain a secret. Father and I have been all through that. You can understand my anxiety, Mr. Valentine. Ralph's starting out in a career that holds a great deal of promise. He's engaged to Irene Masterson, a lovely girl from a fine family. If she has to find out that I'm the son of a murderer, then... Well, that's the way it'll have to be. You just do what you think is necessary, Mr. Valentine. Valentine, the warden told me you're going to try to prove I'm innocent. I want you to do nothing. Get out. Now, wait a minute, Peterson. I don't want you to reopen the case. You will not find anything different. Aren't you changing your tune after ten years? Not once did you admit you killed Lillian Wayne. Just the same. You stay out of this. And do not come back to see me again. Wait, take it easy, Peterson. we still got a few minutes. You heard what I said? Yeah. I may as well tell you, no matter how you feel about it, I'm going to find out the truth. Why do you do this when I tell you no? Your son wants it that way, Mr. Peterson. Ralph? Yeah. Look at me, Valentine. You see, a very happy man. I don't believe it. Prison has been good to me. Here I learned to read and write. I'm in charge of the books in the library. Your life's complete, huh? Ten years ago, I fixed it so my son gets everything I could never give to him. Now in the newspapers, I read he's marrying big society girl. He is happy. I am happy. Well, you poke your nose in. Don't you like to see people happy? Oh, Peterson, let's stop kidding each other. You'd rather throw away a chance to get out of this place than to have people find out that Ralph Peterson and Ralph Lochner are one and the same. You you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Have it your way, Peterson. But if you didn't kill Lillian Wayne, it's my job to find out who did. And believe me, I'm going to give it a good try. Twelve good men and true decided that beyond any reasonable doubt, Harry Peterson murdered Lillian Wayne. I know, Lieutenant, but George called up and asked me to come over and see if you have any additional information. Well, just what I gave you there. Copy what you want. Okay. It's all a matter of public record. Uh, say, just a second, Miss Brooks. Hold it. Hmm? Is there something Valentine knows about this case that I don't know? Huh? I mean, uh, just being a member of the police force. Oh, I couldn't tell you. The last time I heard from him, he was calling from the penitentiary after he saw Mr. Peterson. What? 
You mean he went all the way up there to... to... Oh, another one of his hunches, huh? Say, what's the name of this witness here, Lieutenant? You can read, Miss Brooks. But I tell you, there can't be anything to it. Five witnesses put Harry Peterson on the scene of the crime. His fingerprints were all over the table lamp that was used to knock her off. And, uh, what about motive, Lieutenant Riley? Well, to pull it, uh, delicately, Miss Brooks, <clears throat> this little shrimp gets a yen for Lillian Wayne, who's, by the way, of being a gorgeous model. She can't see him, he can't take no for an answer, and... Zowie. Very delicately put, Lieutenant. Why? Well, I... well, if it's as open and shut as all that, George will just come up with the answer you've got here. Well, of course, of course, there's only one answer. He's just wasting his... Hmm. Oh, never mind. I'm just whistling in the dark. Yeah? Mr. Donnelly? Shh, not so loud. Huh? What's the matter? Look, miss, did you ever have a baby? Oh, wrong question, huh? Well, anyway, come on in. But try to be quiet. Hey, what's this all about? Oh, it's the kid. The wife's out shopping. You should have seen the time I had getting that baby to sleep. Say, who are you anyway? And how'd you know who I was? Look, where can we talk above a whisper? Oh, uh, well, well, come on in here. Okay, now what do you want? I'm just checking on exactly what happened to Lillian Wayne the day she was murdered. Who? who? Lillian Wayne. Yeah, yeah, I heard you. But why are you bringing that up? Look, who are you, mister? Just someone who's not so sure Harry Peterson killed this way. Oh, I don't know anything about that. I told the police my story. Sure, I had a fight with Lillian, but that was all. And they let it go at that? They had to. Well, I went down the elevator an hour before the chambermaid saw Peterson go into the apartment. Uh, what was the fight about? Uh, just me waking up to find out what a sucker I was. Hey, translate that, will you? Well, I was a pretty sharp middleweight those days. Dame's a dime a dozen. But Lillian says she's only got eyes for me. And like a school kid, I believed her. Oh, then you found out about the little black book. Yeah, yeah but that I didn't know till later. Peterson's trial. All I knew then was that some guy was sending flowers to her every day from the flower shop around the corner. So we had a fight, and I... Well, I guess I lost my temper. How badly did you lose it? Well, I, uh... I guess I poked a one. Oh. Uh -huh. Well, if it weren't for Peterson, then you would have been tagged for suspect number one. Don't remind me, pal. And for Pete's sake, don't let this get back to my wife. She don't know anything about me and Lillian. Oh, don't worry, Donnelly. I have to be good at keeping secrets. Oh, thanks. You don't know my wife's temper. If she ever found out, she'd knock my ears off. <laughs> Now, uh, Mr. Valentine, just who sent you to see me? I I'm very busy. I have an elaborate floral wreath to make up. No one sent me, Mr. Jeffries. Your name just happens to be on the list of witnesses in the Lillian Wayne case. Oh? And Mike Donnelly mentioned that you own this floor shop near Lillian's apartment hotel. Mike Donnelly? Mm -hmm. that, that thug. I, I was hoping by now he had his head knocked off in the ring. Oh, oh my, my, such unruly passions, Mr. Jeffries. Yes, what have you got against Mike? That man actually assaulted me in the corridor during the trial. Just because I told the truth. Which is? It was Donnelly who bought the flowers I was delivering to Miss Wayne that day. I keep a record of every transaction in my store. A very methodical man. That's very interesting. I don't know why I should have gotten so excited. The police cleared him of any connection with the murder. Yeah, yeah, that was hard gratitude, was it, Mr. Jeffries? Well, or what do you mean? Well, it was mostly your testimony that placed Harry Peterson in the dead woman's apartment at the time of the murder. There was no question about that. It was Peterson who came to the door and accepted the flowers. But it seems stupid, doesn't it, to answer the door when you have a corpse on your hands? Oh, not at all. Peterson worked there. He knew that I'd have the manager let me in so I could place the flowers in the water. And something equally stupid, I mean, allowing himself to be seen. Oh, he tried not to show himself, but he had to sign a receipt. That's when I got a glimpse of him. Oh, it was Peterson, all right. Receipt? Uh, why, why, yes. That's right. You didn't mention a receipt in any of your court testimony. I assure you, I had all I could do to answer the barrage of questions they kept throwing at me. I see. You, uh, you said you were a methodical man, Mr. Jeffries. I guess you kept that little memento of the Wayne trial. Well, I... I... I probably have it in the envelope with the clippings of the trial. Uh, somewhere in that desk drawer there. Uh-huh. Naturally, Peterson didn't sign his own name. 
He thought he was being smart, scribbling down a phony one. Larrabee, as I remember. I see. Well, that's it, I guess. Uh, thanks for your cooperation, Mr. Jeffries. <laughs> Don't mention it. Now maybe I can finish that floral ring. All right, George, let's have it. Why'd you give up so easily? I mean, about the receipt. Just being cautious, Angel. But you said yourself it would be so conclusive, one way or the other. Just comparing the handwriting with Peterson. Yeah, I know, Brooksy. But as I said, let's take it easy, like. Jeffries is lying through his teeth, but I can't afford to scare him off until I find out why. You mean he actually framed poor Peterson? I'm sure of it. You see, Angel, Peterson couldn't possibly have signed that receipt. Huh? He didn't learn to read or write until after he was sent to prison. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meantime, here's some exciting, valuable news for today's car owners. Atlas Tire Engineers have produced a new tire that gives the softest ride you ever had, even when you're on the roughest roads. It's the Atlas Grip Safe Cushion Air, kind of big brother to the famous Atlas Grip Safe Tire. Cushion Air is a big brother because it has the same quality, extra safety, quietness, and steering ease of Atlas Grip Safe Tires. Plus, more air at lower pressure to put your car on a cushion of air. And it's backed by the most valuable warranty in the tire industry, the written Atlas warranty that's good at 38,000 stations in 48 states and Canada seven days a week. Ask about extra low-pressure Atlas cushion air tires tomorrow. They're made especially for new cars and can be adapted to many older models, too. Ask at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station where they say and mean... We'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, a very intense young man named Ralph Lochner says he wants you to make sure, one way or the other, if his father is guilty of the murder he was convicted of ten years ago. Finally, if you play it like George Valentine, you arrive at the unshakable conviction that the father is innocent. And in effect, that's just what you're telling Ralph and his foster father, Carl Lochner, right now. It's as simple as that, gentlemen. Well, I what do you mean? Understand. I know Mr. Peterson didn't kill Lillian Wayne. I might even be able to prove it. But it would be a lot easier and a lot surer if first I found out who the murderer really was. Why didn't that fool Jeffrey say something about a receipt? Of course my father could never have signed it. I remember as a kid how ashamed I was because he couldn't read or write. I know how you feel, Ralph. It was a terrible oversight. Oversight? Ten years of someone's life gone just like that because some stupid florist forgets to mention a receipt? Well, Jeffries might have forgotten that little thing, but he was deliberately lying when he identified the man at the door as your father. Well, let's do something about it. Turn him over to the police. Now, hold it, will you, fella? They'd shake the truth out of him. I'd like to be the lawyer for the prosecution. I'd see what that if he, he got... said he made an honest mistake? After all, there were other witnesses. What do you propose to do, Valentine? Well, I'd like to know why Jeffries put the finger on Mr. Peterson. Whom he was trying to protect... Do you think uh, he's at all suspicious? Oh, he's bound to be a little, but I tried to ease out of it. I'd feel a lot better if we had that receipt. Oh, it's safe enough. It's in the middle drawer of the desk in the back of his florist shop. Mm hmm. I agree with your thinking, Valentine, but just the same, you're up against a pretty impossible job. The name Larrabee is patently fictitious, and this is a murder that's ten years old. Where do you start? With the obvious, Mr. Lochner. And I can't think of anyone more obvious than our ex pugilist friend, Mike Donnelly. <laughs> Miss Brooks, did you ever see a kid like that? Always balling. Your wife out shopping again, Mr. Donnelly? Yeah. Thursday night, she's got a bingo game. Oh, excuse me a minute. Huh? Okay. Yeah, that's better. Now we can go on talk. Well, you don't mind giving us your signature so we can compare it with the one on Mr. Jeffrey's receipt. Oh, why should I mind? That's fine. Here. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Hey, uh, just what did that guy tell you about me anyway? Well, he said you ordered the flowers for Miss Wayne the day she was murdered. Oh, he did, huh? Go on, what else? And, uh, that you and he had a little fight in the courthouse during the trial. A little fight? I nearly killed him. And I'll tell you why. Because of my interest, you, Miss Brooks. Yes. Of course, it makes me look like a dope, but here it is just the same. I knew he was getting flowers and presents from somebody. 
So I used to stall around downstairs to see who it was. I see. All I saw was Jeffrey's delivered flowers. The owner of the flower shop himself, mind you, not one of the boys. Then it dawned on me. It's also beginning to dawn on me. Yeah. He was making time with Lillian, too. She admitted it. That's why we had to fight the afternoon she was killed. So there was room in Lillian's big, generous heart for our Mr. Jeffries as well. Yeah. Hmm. Among others. You know, Mr. Donnelly, I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't given me a lot more than your signature. Didn't I tell you not to come back? Look, Mr. Peterson, the man who killed Miss Wayne signed a receipt for some flowers. And you didn't learn how to write till you came here. That's true. Well, don't you see there's enough doubt now to get you another hearing? It's bound to come out that Ralph Lochner is your son. So how about working with me instead of against me? If I could only believe after all these years I, I could be together with my son again. Used to know he don't have to be ashamed of me. <laughs> I'd do anything, Mr. Valentine, anything. Good. Now tell me, Mr. Peterson, just what did happen that day? It's true what all those people said, the chambermaid, the elevator boy, the others. I was in Miss Wayne's apartment to fix the Venetian blinds. She called downstairs in the morning. Go on. I rang the bell. When she didn't answer, I used the pass key. And there she was on the floor, dead. Didn't know what to do. I picked up the lamp, put it back on the table, and just stood there looking at her. And that's how your fingerprints got on the lamp. Now, tell me, did Jeffries, the florist, make a delivery while you were there? No, nobody. When I made myself understand what happened to the lady, I ran downstairs to my room. He was sitting there when the police came. Poor Ralph, he was such a young boy then. He didn't understand what it meant when they took me away. You got a fine son, Peterson. Well, tell me, if they let me go, could I be with my Ralph again? Oh, your son will be a lawyer soon. He'll think of something. I leave everything to you, Mr. Valentine. I have just one more stop to make when I get back to town, Mr. Peterson. And I'll feel a whole lot better when that's out of the way. Come on, quick, Brooksy, close that door. We don't want the cop on the beat to spot the light back here. Oh, we'll just tell him we're a couple of flower lovers. What do you think of Donnelly's story about Jeffrey's being on Lillian Wayne's bandwagon, too? More about that, Angel. Right now, I want to get a picture of that receipt. If I can get Riley working on it without Jeffrey's getting suspicious... George, look. The desk. Hey, yeah. Uh, a very clumsy job. Oh. I wanted Jimmy to open the drawer with much more finesse. It's only a formality, but let's see. Uh-huh. Yeah. Just about everything else on the Wayne trial, but no receipt. Oh, I outsmarted myself, Brooksy, and missed the boat. Well, one sure thing, George. Jeffries wouldn't break into his own desk. Why not? If he wanted to make it appear that someone else stole that all-important piece of paper. Hmm. If it meant so much to somebody, he probably destroyed it by now. Yeah. He... Hey. You know, hmm. Angel, maybe I didn't miss the boat after all. Maybe what? it just looked that way. It wasn't going out. It was coming in. Well, funny, things don't look any rosier to me, darling. Well, uh, that's because it's late. You're tired. You need some sleep. Oh, now, George, wait a now, minute. Now, uh, be careful when you get to the end of the alley. Be sure oh. nobody sees you. Then grab a cab, and I'll be in touch with you later. You, but what about you? I'll be going back to the office in a few minutes. I'm sure I'm going to have a visitor. Now, scram. Hello, operator. I want you to call the police and report a burglary. Jeffrey's Florist Shop, 937 Grant Boulevard. Who, me? Oh, just put down a public spirited citizen. Huh? Well, if it isn't nature, boy, I was just about to give you up. You were in my shop tonight, weren't oh, you? Oh, why don't you give up, Jeffries? You don't stand the chance of a deep freeze salesman in Siberia. You've just been lucky for ten years. Where's that receipt, Valentine? What makes you so sure I've got it? You're the only one who knew where it was. Let's have it. Uh-uh. That's my lease on life. You think I'm joking, don't you? On the contrary. But I know you won't let that thirty-eight in your hand go off until you find out what happened to that Don't receipt. be too sure about that. I haven't any time to waste on you. You're a many-sided character, my friend. It was a real shock when I found out that you were another one of the boys in Lillian Wayne's male harem. You're a liar. Liar? Now you're writing slander to perjury. Get up. Now, put your hands up. If you have that receipt on you, I'm going to find it. 
Doesn't it ever make you sick to your stomach having to live with yourself? Shut up. Didn't you ever think of Peterson in the prison laundry of the cute mill while you were flouncing around up to your hips and flowers? It's got to be here somewhere. You're trapped, Get back. Jeffries. You're trapped. Peterson couldn't sign anything. He didn't know how to read or write. What? What was that? What did you say? I knew I'd get a rise out of you. I'll, I'll kill you. Better drop it, Jeffries, if you want to I use this arm again. Oh. All right. So, what are you going to do? I was just wondering how to make you stay put while I make a couple of phone calls. You can't. Uh huh. I think Harry Peterson would like it done this way. No. Yeah? Oh, your timing is perfect, Angel. The visiting? Oh, he's here, but he's out. <laughs> Never mind. Sure, come on over. Join the party. Sure, this calls for a party, Brooksy. Less than five minutes ago, I found out who really killed the fair Lillian. Valentine, I know it's probably just an oversight... But I've never been advised the Homicide Bureau has been moved over here to your office. Well, I thought we could clean this thing up faster over here, Lieutenant. I never killed that woman. And I'm not saying another word until you let me talk to my lawyer. You're going to need two lawyers, Jeffries. I hate to interrupt this delightful discussion, but uh, Mike Donnelly's in the outer office, fussing and fuming. George, it seems when you called him, you woke up his baby. Sorry, but he has the answers to a lot of questions that'll have to be asked. <laughs> what right do you have to keep me here? What's the charge? There isn't any. That's why you won't let me get to my lawyer. Oh, so I have no charge to hold you on, huh? Well, uh, forgetting about suspicion of murder, there's a little matter of perjury. Then there's illegal entry, forcing your way into a respectable citizen's place of business. Thank you, Lieutenant. Assault and battery on this defenseless citizen. No charge, huh? Who are you? Hennessy! Take this monkey downtown. Yes, sir. You won't get a thing out of me, no matter what you do. And watch him, Hennessy. Now, Valentine, there's still a few questions I have to ask you. Oh, just a minute, Lieutenant. I think someone just came in the outer office. It's probably the Loch Ness, Brooksy. Valentine, what'd you find out? I just saw them take Jeffries away. Oh, wait, he got here as soon as we could. Just what has happened? This is Lieutenant Riley, gentlemen. Oh, how do you do? Oh, hello. hello. We're just getting to that, Mr. Loch Hey, what about me, Valentine? Okay, Donnelly, come on in. Uh, the wife's at a midnight movie. I had to get a neighbor to stay with the kid. Please, you know, Valentine, I'm... what'd you find out about Jeffries? The name of the murderer. Uh, what? Hi. Jeffries didn't have the receipt, and I didn't take it from his shop. Well, how does that tell you who the murderer was? Oh, the simple process of elimination, Lieutenant. I don't follow you, George. I told only two people where that receipt was. You, Ralph, and you, Mr. Lochner. I'm afraid I don't understand. Yes, what are you driving at, Valentine? Paying blackmail to Jeffries all these years, even adopting Harry Peterson's son, can't change one fact, can it, Mr. Lochner? You kill Lillian Wayne. <laughs> Hey, hey, come on, Brooksy, come on. Get your head up off the lieutenant's oh. desk. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't sleeping. Oh, no, no. You were just trying to see if you could look through your eyelids. Well, come on, kids. I'm going to have me a gallon of coffee. It's been a long night. Did you get a statement from Lochner and Jeffrey? Yeah, yeah, it's all sewed up. Victim of circumstance. You keep reading that corny phrase, but you only appreciate it when you run up against the Harry Peters. Oh, come now, Lieutenant. It wasn't just the hand of fate. It got a couple of assists. Yeah, yeah. Jeffries delivers some flowers to his girlfriend. The rat hangs around downstairs to see who his rival is. It turns out to be the wealthy Mr. Lochner. So, Jeffries helps put Peterson away and then blackmails Lochner plenty for keeping quiet. You know, I was wondering, Lieutenant... Hmm? What's that? Did it really ease Lochner's conscience adopting Peterson's kid? Ah, uh, the longer I'm in this game, the less I know about people. You know, I was wondering about something, too. Robert? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if poor Donnelly had much trouble getting his baby to sleep. <laughs> oh, you're punch drunk, Angel. Let's get that coffee. <laughs> Some folks claim that one motor oil is just like another until a mechanic tells them they need a new set of piston rings. 
But folks who use RPM motor oil find piston ring troubles are few and far between. This premium quality motor oil is compounded to keep a cooling lubricant on upper cylinder walls at all times. Whether your car is standing cold for hours at a time or running hot, RPM clings to vertical engine parts left bare and exposed to wear by ordinary oils. And because RPM is always on the job, your chances of engine trouble caused by rust are reduced to about zero. That's mighty important when you remember that hidden rust causes as much as 80% of engine wear in the average car. No wonder RPM motor oil is the choice of Western motorists two to one over any other motor oil. For trouble-free operation and longer car life, get RPM tomorrow at Independence Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Oh, uh, Brooksy. Oh, George, I've been worried about you. Where are you? Well, I, uh... Careful what you say, buddy. Yeah, see what you mean. Oh, uh, Brooksy, I just want to tell you not to worry if I'm away for a couple of days in this job. Huh? Uh, I know I can leave everything to you. George, something's wrong. I'm going to call Lieutenant Riley. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's enough, Valentine. Hang up that phone. If you know what's good for you. Yeah, I know, all right. Uh, good night, Brooksy. I'll be seeing you. I hope... Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Harry Lewis as Ralph, Herbert Butterfield as Lochner, Louis Van Ruten as Peterson, Eddie Marr as Donnelly, and Robert Jellison as Jeffries. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The hearse was painted pink. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're up a blind alley and nobody can help you, give yourself another chance and call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, how much do you charge for making a play for a beautiful dame? There's more to it than that. I may add the lady is dynamite. I may also add that the money is going to be okay. Also this. If everything works out, you'll be helping a lot of people out of that blind alley you mentioned in your ad. If you happen to be interested, let's do it. Happen to be interested, let's talk it over. I'm in room 918, Hotel Somerset. The name is yours truly, J.C. Collins. <laughs> oh, Brooksy's never going to forgive herself for being late this morning. Huh? What? Oh, who is this? Me, Angel. What goes with you this morning? Oh, it's you, George. Oh, shucks. You guessed. Mm, I guess I overslept. We were out so late last night on the McMillan job. Well, just stay right where you are, Angel. I just wanted you to know where I was going to be. Where's that, George? 
Oh, just having a chat with one J.C. Collins at the Hotel Somerset. Yeah, it seems we have a very distasteful assignment, Brooksy. I have to go out and make love to a beautiful dame, it says here. George, I'm on my way down to the office right now. What's more, it says here she's dynamite. I'm getting into something right now, George. (laughs) Hold it, Brooksy. Take it easy. Let me see what this is all about, and I'll talk to you later. (laughs) Did you hear that, Raymond? This guy thinks there's actual a J.C. Collins. Uh, that was the general impression we tried to create in that letter, Ernie. Sit down, sit, Valentine. Hey, now, look, I'm not a country cousin who just got in yesterday. Yeah. I don't work for guys like you, Gorman. That's what you think. As far as anyone's concerned, you'll just be working for J.C. Collins. But be smart. As far as I'm concerned, I'd be working for a grade-A rat. Huh? And, Raymond, that's never smart. Don't get up, Valentine. You're not going nowhere. Ah, I know I can take your word for that, Gorman. So I'll just listen. Yeah, well, I'll give it to you straight. There's another guy in this town. I mean, the town's not big enough for both of us, and consequently... Uh, uh, well? Wades, I got no use for Wades. Tell him what I mean, Raymond. Well, it's really very simple. As you know, Mr. Gorman owns a lot of property, including this hotel. He also has a great many business interests. <laughs> yeah, don't I? Yeah, I know. Some narrow-minded people call them rackets. Let's not be irrelevant. Anyway, it seems another businessman, Frank Granby by name, aspires to supplant Mr. Gorman in his various enterprises. Granby? I thought he was mistaken for a clay pigeon the other night. Oh, that was no mistake. But it was embarrassingly bad marksmanship. Frank was wounded, but he got away, and now he's hiding somewhere. And he must be smoked out. Yeah. And fair. Look, fellas, I know confession is good for the soul, but why pick on me? How did you know I won't leave here and reiterate some of these little intimacies? Well, what do you say, Raymond? Well, not to oversimplify, Mr. Valentine doesn't want to play ball. Tell him what I mean. What Ernie means is you can help us smoke out Granby. Ernie's very basic in his thinking about these things, but uh, I believe he's got something. Uh, Not to be precocious, I gather this has something to do with the beautiful dame who's also dynamite. Lila Parker. Sings at the glass hat. Yeah, Granby is nuts about her. If he thought she was playing around, he'd... He'd... Well, he'd... Go on and tell him what I mean, Raymond. All oh, the luxuries of life. Someone to translate your English for you. What? Uh, he's just being sarcastic, Ernie. But you're right about the dame, Valentine. Personally, I'd envy you this job if I didn't know Granby cares more for her than he does for his own life. You're going to make a play for her, Valentine. More than that, she's going to... She... uh, Raymond... More than that, you've got to make her like it. Sorry, boys, no deal. You've got no choice. Raymond, call that number. Right, Owen. Maybe Valentine will get what we're driving at. Here, Valentine, you take this. Huh? Hello? Brooksy. Well, who else would you call this number? Where are you, darling? What's this about? Uh, skip it, Angel. I'll talk to you later. You get what I mean? George, where are you? Uh, I, uh, careful what you say. Uh, just wanted to tell you not to worry if I'm away a couple of days on this job. I know I can leave everything to you, Brooksy. Well, of course That's you can. That's all I can tell you right now, Angel. So long. All right, William. Well, you're not so good at translating. Just what does Gorman do? Ernie, make him let me go. Hey, well, you got no choice. Let go of him, Valentine. Hey, you see, Valentine, Miss Brooks is our insurance that you do just like as uh, like I say. Now go on, Raymond, tell him. Brooks, you've heard of hardened criminals, haven't you? Yes, Lieutenant Riley, but what does this have to do with George? Well, I'm a hardened cop. I only deal in facts. Well, I've been giving you facts. I know, I know. You didn't like the way Valentine sounded on the phone. He called the office and seemed so surprised when I answered the phone. What's so what? Sometimes I forget what number I'm calling. Well, he sounded so strange when he said that was all he could tell me, and then he hung up. Oh, look. Look, are you sure it isn't this business about a beautiful dame that's getting you so excited? Oh, don't be ridiculous. I know, George. So does Mrs. Riley know me, but even she has her doubts sometimes. Can't you see I'm serious? I even went to the hotel. There was no J.C. Collins ever registered at the Somerset. Who sent George that letter? 
Uh, now, look, Miss Brooks, I keep fighting back the impulse, but I like that guy of yours. Me too. Well, still, I'm a public servant, and I can't go flouncing around after him every time he gets himself into trouble. Well, I'm going to do some flouncing around, Lieutenant. That I know, and I can expect the worst. Well, Lieutenant, if that's all you have to say, I'll... Uh, just a minute, just a minute. Yes? If Valentine is really in some kind of trouble... I'll leave word here where you can reach me day or night. Mr. Valentine? Yeah. Gus, the piano player, told me you wanted to see me. That's right, Miss Parker. Won't you sit down? Gus said you were one of my greatest admirers. My singing, no doubt. Singing? Well, that never occurred to me. <laughs> That's a new approach. I think I will sit down. Well, Mr. Valentine, if it isn't my singing, just what is it about me that you admire so much? Oh, don't you know? Yeah. I've known since I was 14. And you're one of the few women who'll be hearing that when you're 40. Is that supposed to be so good? <laughs> May I order you something? I'm happy the way I am. What do you want? Oh, I'm just a lonely guy feeling sorry for myself in a strange town. Same line, but I can't say I've heard it read any better. What are you doing after your last show? Going home and rinse out a few things. I'll be waiting for you in the parking lot when you're through. You can grow an awful long beard waiting for somebody who isn't going to show up. Often wondered how I'd look with a beard. Listen, mister, and listen carefully. Hmm? Why don't you be good to yourself and go home? And hate myself for the rest of my days? All right. I know I look like something in a pastry window I shop to you. I that way. That's very good. Believe me, I'm poisoned. And you won't do a thing for my ego if you hang around and prove I'm right. Now stay away from me. See you later, Lena. You'll recognize me by my beard. I'm afraid you've picked yourself the wrong boy, gentlemen. The fair Lila seems particularly allergic to me. What? What do you say, Raymond? Uh, they don't get along together, honey. Uh, don't give me that, Valentine. You're a pretty good-looking guy, and Lila, she isn't used to being lonely. Just keep trying, Valentine. The sooner Frank Granby finds out you have designs on Lila, the sooner this unpleasant little job will be over. Well, uh, I, I do have a sort of one-sided date to meet her here later in the parking lot. Hey, see, Raymond, he's doing okay. But don't try to play cute, Valentine. There'll be somebody watching you every minute. They'll be... Tell him what I mean, Raymond. I think he knows what you mean. Coleman, as you've said several times, I don't have any choice. I have to play the game your way because you have all the cards. Yeah, it makes sense. But look, if anything happens to Miss Brooks, you better make sure I'm dead first. Because I'm going to be out looking for you. You didn't think I was going to be here, Lila. How much do you want to bet? Oh, let's say an old Dick Tracy button. Move over. How'd you know this was my car? The parking lot attendant said this pink convertible dreamboat belonged to you. Oh. Where do we go from here? Oh, you're only hitchhiking, mister. You've got to take your chances. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But I can give you this much of a hint before we start. Well, that's a... Uh... That's a pretty good start in any man's language, Lila. But why the sudden change of heart? Suppose we say I'm curious about a man who's so willing to take poison. Hey, look, maybe I'm only a hitchhiker, Lila, but you're going over 75 now. I'll be doing faster than that if you don't answer my question. Well, how do you know anybody hired me to make a play for you? All right, it won't be any loss if we both go off the road. Now, wait a minute. Take it easy, Lila. Was it Gorman? Why don't you answer? What are you talking about? You don't have to answer. So it is Gorman. Now I know. Lila! Oh, this is going to be just fine. Yeah, what's that supposed to mean? Exactly where are we, George? Across the road from a gas station you almost didn't miss. I mean, exactly where does this whole mess leave us? Why don't you tell me? All right. 
You and I are going to make sure Frank thinks he's got everything to be jealous of. Hey, aren't you supposed to be in love with a man? Gorman wants to make Frank show himself so he can kill him. I want to know where Frank is so I can save him. What? I know what happened the other night. He's somewhere hurt, wounded, maybe dying. Oh, great. That gives me a very cozy feeling. Like walking around with a target on my back and another one on the front. Who's going to get me first, Frank or Gorman? There's a risk in everything. To gamble whether you live or not the moment you're born. Well, before you get too philosophical, Ella, maybe I can sneak in a phone call from the station. But it's closed. There might be a booth in the back. Maybe there's a way to get both of us out of this jam. What makes you such an optimist, George? Let me have police headquarters. Lieutenant Riley in homicide. Uh huh, that's right. Yeah, I'll wait. Oh, sorry. Look, mister, you Better have to. Better hang up, Valentine. I think you've got the wrong number. Well, I'm glad you know how to take advice. You make it very easy, Raymond. You insist on pointing a gun at people. Come on out, Valentine. Oh, it just wouldn't be an act without you, eh, Gorman? You're too smart, Valentine. You're too. Tell him what I mean, Raymond. You... And to think words were unnecessary. Oh. <laughs> That's right, Raymond. Wake him over. But don't let us show. We have to keep him nice and pretty for Miss Parker. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, here are some interesting figures. Did you know that the Navy calls its five-inch gun the workhorse of the Navy? And that this gun has to be relined after firing about 2,000 times? But that's nothing compared to the work done by spark plugs in your car. They have to fire more than a million times in every 1,000 miles. And if you've driven 10,000 miles, those spark plugs have fired 15 million times in white-hot temperatures. Dirty, cracked, or chipped plugs are often the cause of hard starting, lagging in traffic, waste of gasoline and power. So if your car has gone 10,000 miles without a new set of spark plugs, better ask for a set of Atlas Champions tomorrow. The accurate timing and full flashing sparking of quality Atlas Champions repay their cost many times over in superior car performance. Ask for them at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station where they say... And mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And here's the situation. You're promised a fat fee to romance a beautiful nightclub singer named Lila. Very pleasant assignment. If you didn't find out that Lila is a decoy in a gun-happy feud between two racketeers. Yes, and that their insurance against you making a single wrong move is the girl you happen to love. That's why, like George Valentine, you pick your words carefully now as you talk to life. You know we're being watched, don't you, Lila? That character over at the bar makes it pretty obvious. What do you say we give him his money's worth? You're supposed to find me very fascinating. <laughs> I'm doing all right. In a quiet sort of way. At least he thinks so. Hmm. Frank ever saw me look at another man like this. Drive him crazy. Yeah, I, uh... I see what you mean. If he ever saw me light a cigarette like this, take the first puff and give it to you to smoke like this. What the? It would be murder, darling. How are we doing? I don't know. But I can see how you can lose an awful lot of ground this way. <laughs> you still haven't told me why you're working for Gorman. Before you answer, try to look romantic. It's expected of us. I'm in this thing for love's sweet sake, Lila, just like you are. So what do you say we leave it that way? George, I've got to find out where Frank is so I can help him. Gorman wants Frank to come out, too, only he wants to kill him. Have you got an answer? No, not much of a one. But it may be worth playing. Well, why don't you, then? All right, here we go. Oh! oh. <laughs> that was very clumsy of me. Lila, I'm awfully sorry. Oh, wait a minute. It's nothing, George. Just a Water? Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Will you take care of this, please, waiter? Of course, right away. It'll only take a minute. Well, you shouldn't dismiss a minute like that, friend. It's 60 seconds long. You can get a lot done in that time. Are 
Are you sure Mr. Valentine isn't in his apartment? Oh, I see. And you haven't heard from him since yesterday? No. No, this is Miss Brooks. I'll phone back later. I'm getting nowhere fast. Maybe there's a J.C. Collins in the city directory. Hi, Miss Brooks. Oh, hi. Thought I'd drop in and see what's wrong with Mr. Valentine. Was that Leo? Have you seen George? When? This morning. He bought a paper for me, like always. You mean he was right outside the building and never came upstairs? Oh, I was with some big tough guy who was watching him every minute. Oh. But did Mr. Valentine say anything to you, Leo? Nah. Just took a paper and give me this instead of a nickel. He ain't getting absent-minded or something, is he? Here, let me see that. He started to say something to me. He gave me a look that froze me up tight. So I figured I'd come up and talk to you. Oh, Leo, you're a few months ahead of time, but you're a real Santa Claus. Huh? I am? You don't know what a wonderful present you brought me. Uh, I did? The first real clue I've got. You sure you're feeling okay, Miss Brooks? That's nothing but a union button. Every waiter wears one in every restaurant. <laughs> Lieutenant, I told you I was going to do some flouncing around. I know, and you did. Now, what's this about the waiter's button? I checked with the union. It was issued to Mike Spiegel, who works at the Glass Hat. He reported it lost this morning. I see. And you're sure Valentine slipped it to the newsie for a reason? A good reason. Lieutenant, did you know that Hotel Somerset is owned by Ernie Gorman? Oh, so what? Even a thug like Gorman can own real estate as long as he pays his taxes. Then Gorman could have told the clerk to say there was no J.C. Collins registered there. Mm, yeah, I suppose so. In the letter George got, there was there was much to do about a beautiful dame. Well, there's a beautiful dame named Lila Parker singing at the Glass Hat. Oh, there's a lot of beautiful dames singing in a lot of nightclubs. But Lila happens to be the girlfriend of Frank Branby, who in turn happens to be Ernie Gorman's biggest rival in this town. Say, that's a thought, Miss Brooks. It sort of interests me. In fact, uh, uh, I like it. Uh, uh, say, where's that waiting button? Where are you going, Lieutenant? Well, now, now it's my turn to do some flouncing around. I hope you don't find this routine. I mean, sitting here with me. Too boring, George. Somehow, Lila, I have a feeling that tonight isn't going to be boring at all. I think I'd like my coffee now. It's almost time for me to do my number. Sure, sure. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. What can I do for you, sir? Huh? Oh, uh, you must be new. Uh, yes, sir. I'm taking Spiegel's place. Just for tonight, sir. Uh, that coffee, George. Oh, well, no, not not just plain coffee. Not tonight, Lila. No? No, no. Something more lavish than that. Uh, Cafe Valentino. Huh? Uh, do you think you'll be able to remember this way to I'll do the best I can, sir. Oh, now, look, it'll take some mocha, a dash of ginger, a touch of Tabasco, a few drops of Benedictine. Oh, yes, and of course we uh, have look, to have... Look, sir, look, uh, would you mind writing it down here on the pad so they get it uh, just right back in the kitchen? Oh, certainly, certainly. Yeah. It's really not as complicated as it sounds. Well, I just wanted to make sure we understood each other, sir. Oh, I don't think there'll be any question about that. Huh. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. <laughs> you certainly go all out to get what you want, don't you? Well, some things are worth a little extra effort, Lila. I see Gorman has a new boy watching us tonight. Yeah, well, that's good. Nothing like variety when every time you turn, there's a gunsel on your tail. George, why doesn't Frank make a move? He must know about us by now. I don't know, Lila. We've been sitting here for three nights now. Word must have gotten back to him about us. I don't think I can stand this much longer. Lila, we have company. Oh, yes. I uh, hope this is right, sir. They said they did the best they could. Fine, fine. And I'll take the check. Yes, sir. Oh, there goes Gus with my number. It's a wonderful treat. We'll have to wait, George. Oh, it'll be here, Lila. Now, let's see what the Cafe Valentino made the check look like. Don't worry about Miss Brooks. You stick with Gorman and Granby. We'll be behind you all the time. Riley. <laughs> Sorry to drag you out of the glass hat the way we did, uh, Don Valentine, aren't we, Raymond? Personally, I'm filled with remorse. Oh, yeah, I can just see the tears in your baby blue eyes, Raymond. I don't like taking you out of the company of a beautiful thing, but the time has come. It's here. Uh, uh, tell what I mean, Raymond. 
Granby's going to stop hiding tonight. He's coming out. How do you know? We caught up with one of his boys after a little persuasion. <laughs> yeah, it's good persuasion. Uh, he told us. Granby knows what a Casanova Lily thinks you are, Valentine. So he can't hold out anymore, and he's going to pay her a little visit after she gets through singing at the glass hat. They're going away together. And that's when you're going to get your chance at him, huh? Congratulations. Well, what do you say, Raymond? Just being sarcastic again. Oh, is that what you call it? Anyway, you're not true yet, Valentine. Surprise. I didn't think I was. You see that Lila goes right home after the club. Then you meet me across the street. I'd like us to be together to see how this thing winds up. You're so good to me. Oh, Ernie. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, shall I bring Langley in now? Yeah, yeah, but you talk to him. I don't want to know nothing what happens except that it's done right. See you later, Valentine. I'll be downstairs at the barber's, Raymond. Well, you got a very sensitive boss. He does all right. Well, Langley, come in here. It's about time. Got me flying from Detroit. How long am I supposed to wait? Not long now. You, Gorman? No. You're going to deal with me. Who's that guy? Oh, I'm just sitting here passing the time of day. Now, if you listen carefully, Langley, you can be back in Detroit tomorrow morning. What do I do? Somebody getting the complete treatment? The full course. Mm. Now, you park your car in the 800 block on Sierra Avenue. Yeah. Sometime after midnight, a pink convertible is going to pass you. You can't miss it. It's a big custom job. Mm. I don't have to tell you what to do then. Hey, Raymond, wait a minute. You can't... What about Lila? Well, now who's being sensitive? Are you sure Lila's up there? Why don't you ask your boys, Gorman? They followed us here from the glass hat. I want to be sure. That's why I parked down the street and come over here. Well, you can see the light in the window. And you can't mistake that pink convertible of hers across the street. Yeah, that's right. You know, Gorman, I have a hunch Granby got in touch with Lila at the club tonight and told her he'd be in the apartment. Huh? What makes you think that? Oh, when we got back here, she was in such a hurry to get upstairs, she jumped out and left the keys in her car. Yeah? And all the boys got to do now is wait. We'll stay right here in this doorway. The other boys. <laughs> Look what goes here, Valentine. I don't like the way you're acting. What are you cooking up? My, my, what a suspicious nature. I just know what I like, that's all. Say, what happened to Raymond? You got something else to do. My usual stay out of things like this, but green beef. And this I gotta see for myself. Wait a minute. The light just went out up there. I must be coming downstairs. You stay here, Valentine. I'm going to get a little closer. I want to see him better when he comes out with it. I knew you'd be there, Gordon. What? See what you can do about this. She's trying to kill me. Lila, stop it. Don't be a fool. Go on, Gordon. Try one. When are you going to hide in that deep street? Oh, please, Lila, don't. L -l -l Let me talk this over with Frank. Frank's up here, but he just died. This is the first time I ever saw a hearse painted pink and the corpse behind the wheel. Valentine, when you called that car a pink hearse, you weren't far wrong. I just had a good look at Gorman down at the morgue. Yeah, well, as you know, Lieutenant, I tried to stop him. Lieutenant, I thought you had men planted all around that street. I did, but they weren't fast enough to keep Langley from killing the man who hired him. Anyway, he and Raymond are going to be out of circulation for a long, long time. What about Lila? Well, what do you want me to do, Valentine? Arrest a woman because she's a bad shot? <laughs> Let the D.A. decide what he wants to do. Well, that's that, Brooksy. Oh, uh, Lieutenant, would you join us in some Cafe Valentino? Why, you... Say, say, I've been meaning to ask you. What kind of a concoction is that? Oh, just a little thing I dreamed up, Lieutenant. But I'd sure hate to drink it. <laughs> You 
you can bet a successful contractor knows profit and loss just as well as a banker, a baker, or yourself. J.R. Armstrong, contractor in Oakland, California, keeps a sharp eye on costs when it comes to car operation. That's why he switched to RPM motor oil eight years ago. Today, Mr. Armstrong says, quote, I haven't had an engine breakdown since I started using RPM in 1940, unquote. An unusual record? Well, it's no surprise to RPM users, for compounds in this premium quality motor oil actually stop rust in your car's engine, protect hot spots left bare by ordinary motor oils, prevent costly foaming and corrosion. The low-cost operation Mr. Armstrong enjoys is typical of RPM users throughout the West. Another reason they prefer RPM 2 to 1 over any other motor oil. To cut your car expenses, ask for RPM motor oil at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... There are probably darker places than this, George. I can't think of any. Yeah. We're almost up to the top floor now, Brooksy. You know, I could have sworn I heard somebody downstairs in the hall. Oh, probably just plaster falling off the ceiling. Oh, I can't imagine anyone living here. Uh, just stay right behind me, Angel. Mm-hmm. Oh! George! George, where are you? Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louise Arthur as Lila, Ed Max as Gorman, Louis Van Ruten as Raymond, and Jack Crucian as Langley. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Little Man Who Was Everywhere. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you can't handle it alone without getting hurt, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, a man is trying to drive me mad, and it's very annoying. He's a little man with big glasses. I see him everywhere I go. What would you do if you kept seeing the same little man staring at you, sending you threatening notes? He has no right to do this to me. It's most inconsiderate. You must do something about it. Does exist if he writes threatening notes. Uh-huh. Okay, Angel, I'm intrigued. Let's go and see about this little man who is or isn't there. I'm the executor of the Carnuke Estate. Uh, that was Vivian's father. 
And it's probably a good idea that I'm here. What do you mean, Mr. Wilton? Oh, just to make sure you understand what Vivian says. Oh, what's the matter? Doesn't she speak English? <laughs> That's just it. Decidedly. She always speaks it. Her father used to say Vivian has a grasshopper mind. The way she jumps... Yes. It's about the only time I feel... Uh, oh, Vivian. Uh... What? Oh, oh I, I didn't know you brought company with you, to drive me out of my mind. Harry Sterner? You mean you know who this man is? Oh, yes. Yes. Davis, show Mr. Valentine those notes. Uh, they used to come every day. Uh, just a few words scribbled on them. Uh -huh, let's see. Vengeance shall be mine. You mean just that, George? Uh-huh. Here's another one. You shall perish in the flames of your own conscience. Did the thought of her keep you awake last night, too? And more in the same group. Say, who is this, Turner? Uh, you see, Mr. Valentine, the Yukama estate uh, consists almost entirely of uh, a number of apartment houses down in the old river flat section. Apartment houses? Isn't that giving those eyesores a rather fancy name, Mr. Wilton? Well, I admit they were built uh, quite a few years ago, but many people are satisfied to live in them. Uh, about Mr. Sterner? Uh, some months ago, there was a regrettable fire in our place at 39 Morton Street. Unfortunately, Mrs. Turner was lost in it. Oh, how dreadful. Oh, now I'm beginning to see what this is all about. Well, of course, I, I'm terribly sorry for this poor man, Mr. Valentine. But why does he blame me? I had nothing to do with it. Miss Newcomer, did you ever show these notes to the police? Oh, yes, yes, and they spoke to him. He stopped sending the notes, but he goes right on popping up everywhere and just looking at me in that frightening way. Say, uh, come to think about it, uh, haven't there been several fires recently down in that section? That's the other side of this problem. After the one in 39 Morton Street, there have been three others, all in our building. Luckily, the damage wasn't too great. Sterner? We don't know, but uh, we'd like to. Oh, you must do something about that man, Mr. Valentine. Okay, okay. Now, this Sterner, where can I find him? Uh, the poor fellow keeps sneaking back into the house at 39 so he can stay in the apartment he had with his wife. The building is boarded up, but he gets in and out. <laughs> we overlook it. You must force this man to realize how unhappy he's making me, Mr. Valentine. Oh, I'm sure he realizes that, Miss Newcomer. I'm just wondering how unhappy he plans to make you. <laughs> I don't care who you are. How did you get in here? Look, what I want to know, Sterner, is how do you live in this place? No lights, the windows all boarded and up. And the stench of burnt wood. And that's what I like most. It doesn't let me forget what happened. Not for a moment. Why do you torture yourself like this, friend? It can't do any good. I look around this burned-out tenement and I think of my wife. And when I think of Irene... I think of Miss Newcomer. Okay, I'll take and it. And then I find out where she is and I go there. And I stand just looking at her. She's beginning to crack under it, isn't she? Why don't you face it, Sterner? Miss Newcomer isn't going to let this go on. Oh, what can she do? The streets are free. That's one thing her money can't change. Look, if you carry this thing too far, a couple of guys in white jackets are going to suggest a pad itself for you. Is it insane to want to teach a woman some respect for human life? All her buildings are fire traps. She knows that. But still, she doesn't do anything about it. Now, look, I can understand how you I feel, but... Mean... Irene, she didn't have to die. That fire didn't have to sweep through here like it did. It was plain murder. You don't let a known murderer get away with it, do you? Those other fires in the Nokoma buildings, is that part of your little campaign, too? The police too? weren't able to prove anything. Oh, yes. Since the last when they've been following me. Oh, yes, I know. Now, you listen you to me, You go sir. back to Miss Newcomer and tell her she can go on wondering what I'm going to do next. And there's nothing you can do about it, Mr. Valentine. Miss Brooks, if it has to do with fires, the arson squad takes care of it. Homicide keeps me busy. 
So you can tell Valentine I've got a perfectly good excuse to stay off his merry-go-round this time. Oh, but you were sweet enough to go to all the trouble to get the information George wants. Yeah? Well, yes. But you can tell him if it took me more than five minutes, I wouldn't have. Information, please? Yeah. Tell him Sterner used to be your watchmaker till he got arthritis. Couldn't handle the tools after a while. Oh, what does he do now? Now he's a watchman in one of the loft buildings in River Flats. Now, about those fires... Oh, it's hard to believe any man would deliberately set fire to a crowded tenement. The arson boys say they were definitely the work of a pyromaniac, a mm. firebug. Oh. The jobs were too sloppy to be professional. Well, and that seems to point to Sterner. Okay, if Sterner's playing with matches, they're gonna nail him. And if he keeps making faces at Miss Newcomer, he's gonna end up in the booby hat. Yeah, Yep, at long last, a nice, simple job for our friend. Except for one thing. Well, I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Nothing Valentine's in the middle of ever stays simple. Sir, Mr. Valentine, yours truly, Edward Beasley, selling insurance for almost every company in the world, covering any risk except your chances of surviving an atom bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very cheerful thing. Uh, we haven't got our statistics ready on that yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To come to the point, Beasley. Uh, yes? I understand you wrote the fire insurance and the newcomer properties. Yeah, that's right. Now tell me. Would the amount of the insurance tempt someone to put the torch to them one by one? Well, as a matter of fact, it's quite a sizable amount. Of... Hey, wait a minute. Are you implying that Miss Newcomer... Oh, was... I just have an inquisitive nature, that's all. But that's exactly what you are implying. If those fires weren't started by some crazy firebug, as everybody knows they were, it would have to be done by someone who stands to profit. Well, just a thought. There are times when all of us can use some ready cash. Now, look, young man. You're barking up the wrong tree. If you ask me, this Sterner fellow's at the bottom of all this. I don't happen to believe that. Uh, what? Oh, I'll admit he has a screw loose because of what happened to his wife. But that's the very reason he's not a firebug. Well, that's the darndest reasoning I've ever heard. Sterner's had too much tragedy in his life. He wouldn't risk letting the same thing happen to a lot of innocent people. Well, there may be something to that. Uh, have you told your clients about the way you feel, Valentine? Seems to me that would be only ethical. I'm going to do that little thing right now, Beasley. Then I'm going to see Sterner again. In effect, uh, you're putting me and Miss Newcomer under suspicion. I only know the way I feel. Sterner didn't set those fires, and they weren't started by any wild-eyed pyromaniac either. There's a purpose and a reason behind them. So now, what do you want me to do? If I told you to get off the case, Valentine, I'd only be admitting that there's something wrong. So I want you to stick with it. I believe I speak for Miss Newcomer, too. Okay. I still think you'll find that Stern is your man. But the important thing is to stop him from hounding Vivian. She may not sound it, but she's a thoroughly frightened woman. Indeed, on the verge of a breakdown. Okay, I'll do what I can. I just thought you'd better know how things stand before I go to work on Stern again. A very frank young man. Oh, oh, Vivian. I just wanted to tell you, I think you made an admirable choice in Valentine. He was just here. He said he doesn't believe Stan had anything to do with those fires. And naturally, I told him to go right ahead. I think everything will be all right. <laughs> Probably darker places than this, but I can't think of any, George. Yeah, but see, I should have remembered to bring a flash. Wait a minute, I'll light another match. Mm. Yeah, we're almost up to the top floor now. I know, George, I could have sworn I heard someone downstairs in the hall. Oh, probably just plaster falling off the ceiling. I can't imagine anyone living here. You can imagine Sterner doing it. Ouch! Hey. Time off for another match, Angel. By all means, let there be light. Well, that's the door just ahead. You know, it's very interesting what Riley had to say about Sterner. 
I thought it was strange that a man as well-spoken as he should be living down in this section. Hey, Sterner, this is Valentine. Look, I got a few things to tell you. Come on, open up. Might be he isn't home, if you can call this home. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, we just have to wait for him. Oh, no, not up here we won't. I have a sudden desire to fill my lungs with good, fresh air. All right. I think we can find our way down without this match. Now, you stay right behind me, Angel. You don't have to worry about that. George, huh? can cats really see in the dark? Oh. You better stay away from this newcomer. You're beginning to sound like her. Oh, I don't know. Cats and dark darkness. Oh, she... George! George! <laughs> we'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about playing it safe. When you shop for meat, you're confident of quality because you know you're protected by health department regulations. But how can you be sure of quality when you're buying a battery for your car? The National Society of Automotive Engineers established protection for you when it established three rigid battery tests. Atlas batteries excel in all three of these tests required by the Society. Next time you look at an Atlas battery... Notice the certified capacities embossed on the back panel, which also shows the number of plates in it. So for a sure starting battery with greater capacity through a longer service period, make sure it's an Atlas battery. You can get one at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. Certified Atlas batteries and expert battery service are two reasons why independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations say and mean... We'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, a slightly pixelated lady complains that a man has been deliberately driving her out of her mind. The man? You find a pathetic, grief-stricken husband who's lost his wife in a tenement fire. Like George Valentine, you can't believe he's also a half-demented firebug, as everyone else suspects. So along with Brooksy, you find yourself on the darkened stairs of a boarded-up tenement. Suddenly, something sends both of you hurtling down to the landing below. And then... Are you sure you're all right, George? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, just great. What about you? I'm still all in one piece, I think. Oh, I landed right on top of you, poor darling. Oh, good for something, anyway. Hey, what the devil was that on the stairs, anyway? Oh, well, never mind that now. You just stay where you are. I'll go get some help. Uh-uh, Angel. We came into this place together. We're going out the same way. Here, give me your hand. Fancy seeing you, Lieutenant. Oh, I just happened to be in the neighborhood, Valentine. Couldn't resist dropping by at the office and seeing how quickly you heal. I thought you were going to stay off the merry-go-round this time, Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, well, this is just a duty call on a sick friend. Thank you very much. The abrasions are numerous but superficial. I warn you, Lieutenant, he's in a very sour mood. Yeah? Well, maybe this will cheer you up. Why, thank you, Lieutenant. You know, I've always wanted to have a piece of wire for my very own. Now, what is this? This is what was stretched across the stairs. Let me see that. After you called me, Miss Brooks, I went down to Morton Street and had a look-see. Of course, George. There was somebody in the hall. And whoever it was put the wire there while we were fussing outside Sterner's door. And I can tell you who it was. Sterner. Huh? All right, now make me believe it. Valentine, this is a special kind of wire. Yeah. Very fine, very strong, and it's used almost exclusively by watchmakers. I checked. And Sterner used to be a watchmaker, George. All right, yeah, I know. And I can tell you why he wanted you out of the way. Go on, Lieutenant. This is strictly your party now. Well, here's something we all overlooked. All four of the fires down in River Flats happened on the 8th of the month, beginning with the one that got Mrs. Sterner. Lieutenant, are you trying to say that these fires are a sort of anniversary present from Sterner to the newcomer estate? Well, that's the way a firebug's mind would reason. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Today is the eighth of the month, too. Well, don't you see? He wants you off the scene. I take it you've questioned Stern and Lieutenant. Yeah. Yeah, and he denies everything. And we don't have enough to pin it on him. But now we'll detail an extra man to follow him. Just a minute, Lieutenant. Okay. Yeah, hello? What? Now, wait a minute. Who is this? Oh, yes, Miss Newcomer. One thing at a time. What does your French poodle have to do with it? What's that? Oh, I see. Yeah, okay, I'll be right there. Now what does she want? Yeah, come on, let's have it. It seems my word-happy client has had a change of heart. Now she wants me off the case. Darling, dear. Uh, please, Vivian. I know how attached you were to the dog. But what's done oh. is done. Exactly what has been done, Mr. Wilton. Why, that fiend. He poisoned Pierre. Now, my dear, we're not sure. Well, who else could it be? That Sterner's way of saying that I'll be next. Oh, what will I do about Pierre Davis? Shall I have him cremated or, or buried in a pet cemetery? I think that he would have walked... Yes, I'm sure he would have. Now, what's this about me? Oh, we want you to drop the case. Give him his check, baby. Here you are, Valentine. I'm sorry. Oh, I see. Had it already, huh? Well, don't you see, Mr. Valentine? Sterner knows that I hired you. That, that's why he killed Pierre. If I don't dismiss you, I'm sure he'll do away with me. Thanks for the check, but I'm still on the case. Oh, now, really, that's young right. man. From here on in, I'm working for Sterner. Well, how can you work for a man who goes around killing dogs? Mrs. Sterner died in a fire that could have been prevented. Now, hold on. You think I... I'm stretching a point to say that the person responsible is worse than a man who killed a dog? I see we're not going to have any trouble with booby traps this time, Andrew. I bought the biggest flashlight I could find. George. Yeah? Have you any real reason to believe Sterner didn't poison that dog? No, Brooksy. It could be that Miss Newcomer or Wilton used the dog as an excuse to get me out of the picture. I might be getting too close to the truth. George! George! Cut it out. It's crazy fire, but I'll drag him out the street by his neck. I told you to let him go, but you don't seem to understand. Oh, oh. All right. All right. Uh, Beasley was in here when I opened the door. They're all against me, but I'm stronger than all of them put together. And I'll show you. Keep them. quiet, Sterner. What's this all about, I George? I'll find out. Well, I was waiting for him here. I had enough of this nonsense. If something happens to him in here, the insurance company's going to be responsible. Well, you don't have to go about it that way, do you, Beasley? Oh, there's no use talking to this loon. All he can do is babble about me taking him away from his wife. What kind of talk is that? Look, George, I found this on the floor. Huh? This spool of wire belonged to you, Sterner? Mine? Oh, no, 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 no. I never saw it before. Okay. I don't know about you, Valentine, but I'm through coddling him. I'm going to the police and have him thrown out and kept out. No, no, no. No, no, you can't. I've got to stay here with Irene. Come on, Brooks. Step outside. George, it's cruel to leave him in there like that all alone. I'm not leaving him, Angel, but there's something I want you to do. Yeah, what's that? Get a list of all the newcomer tenements. Then drop by each one and write out a detailed description. Well, that'll take some time. Well, hop to it. I have a few things to do myself. Valentine, you know I just can't go and lock Sterner up for the night. Find an excuse, Lieutenant. I want to prove that even with Sterner locked up, there'll still be a fire tonight as scheduled. I'm sorry, no can do. Miss Newcomer, get a warrant sworn out against Sterner for poisoning your dog. You'll want to see him in jail, don't you? And what will he do to me when he gets out? Oh, no. No, I won't. George, you're just guessing. You couldn't tell just by looking at this list. The answer to everything is right here, Angel. Tonight, there's going to be a fire at 63 Ferris Street. See anybody we know going to 63? No, it's all quiet, George. Oh. Well, it's a cinch nobody can get in or out of that place without us seeing him. There's only the front entrance. And if no one shows? Someone will, Brooksy. 
And I'm betting it won't be Sterner. Now I see all the lights are out in the warehouse next door. Mm Mm-hmm. The last truck went out a few minutes ago. Empire Fabrics Corporation must be working overtime. No. George. Uh Uh-huh. Down the street, just turning the corner. Here, let's get back in the doorway. Oh, no. I couldn't have been there. Couldn't have been. It's Sterner. How did he ever shake those detectives? I don't know. Well, he's going into 63, all right. Well, i got to stop him. Sterner! Wait a minute, Sterner! Uh, What are you doing here, Mr. Valentine? I'm asking you that. I thought you told me you were going to work tonight. I, I, I did, but I thought of something I had to do. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Now, look yeah, here. Let go of me. I've got to go in here. There's something I've got to find. Sterner, you... Stern... What did he say, Stay George? here, Brooks. See, I have to go in and drag him out. Oh, you wouldn't dare start a fire now that he knows we've seen it. In his frame of mind, I don't know what he'll do. I'll go with you. Shh. Be quiet, Brooks. Yeah, looks like he's headed for the top. Come on. George. Get out of here, Brooksy. Would you... Get over to the corner. Put in an alarm. Oh, be careful, George. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. I gotta get to the top floor. You never get past this place. Ah! Trapped here on the top floor, but there's a window just below this one. Yes, yes. yes. I'm going to let you down outside as far as I can, then I'll swing you in. No, 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 no. I'm afraid. You prefer the fire? No, no, no. I'll do it. Anything you say. All right. Now climb outside. Don't worry. I won't let you fall. Yes, but you. I'll take my chances with this drain pipe. All right, won't he, George? Yeah, it's mostly shock, Brooksy. Once they get Sterner to the hospital, he'll be okay. Oh, the way he kept mumbling about his wife. Finding an answer here tonight. Just one more errand for you, Angel, and we can call it a day. Yeah, what's that? Get hold of Lieutenant Riley and meet me at the hospital. <laughs> George, I'm so glad you got here. Mr. Sterner keeps calling for you. Oh, how is he? Oh, it's pathetic. The guy thinks you can help him. He doesn't seem to realize that all you can do is land him in the state hospital for the criminally insane. How'd you make out, George? Eh? Yeah. Where were you anyway, Valentine? Well, you'd call it illegal entry, Lieutenant. Here's what? a present. What's this? Allied Fire and Ingenuity Company. Amount of insurance. $800,000? Wow. Name of insured Empire Fabrics Corporation. But that's the name on the warehouse, right? Right Mr. next to the tenement where the fire was tonight. The idea was for both of them to burn down. But uh, go on, Lieutenant, the line on the bottom. Name of agent. What's this? Huh? huh? Edward Beasley. Yes, Beasley. The firebug who was crazy like a fox. <laughs> Yeah, it would have done your heart good, Angel, to see Beasley. Yeah, Miss Brooks. He folded right up when I shoved that policy under his nose. Well, George, just what was the racket? I don't quite understand. Well, Beasley took advantage of a tragedy. When Sterner began to hound Miss Newcomer, Beasley saw a chance to create the myth of a firebug. He knew the Empire Fabrics people were having money trouble, so he cooked up a deal to split the insurance money with them. Well, I'd say it was pretty slick if it weren't so, well, grim. Beasley uh, phoned Sterner and tricked him into showing up at number 63. If Sterner died in the fire, everybody would say the pyromaniac was caught in his own trap. No doubt about it being a professional job. It was all the fire department could do to keep the flames out of the warehouse. Then all those trucks last night, they must have been removing everything that was really valuable. Oh, Beasley didn't miss a trick. From the wire on the stairway to Miss Newcomer's French poodle. Yeah, well, while on the subject of that lady, I must remember to buy a pair of glasses. Glasses? All right, I'll play straight, man. Why? Every time she turns around, she's going to find me staring at her. Until she does something about those fire traps she owns. Say, incidentally, what's the penalty for driving someone back? <laughs> well, in this case, Miss Brooks, the biggest bouquet of roses you can buy on a cop's pay. <laughs> Now, 
that summer is officially over, I'd like to pass along a money-saving tip for your autumn driving. Chances are your car has purred through many a cloud of road dust in the past few months, and the air cleaner under the hood may be as clogged up as a freshly used tea strainer. If that's the case, you may be wasting as much gasoline as you would be with the choke out all the time. And the fact that a dirty air cleaner lets dust and road grit mix with the gasoline is equally costly, maybe more. So, for driving economy, ask the independent Chevron gas station or the standard station to service your air cleaner tomorrow. While you're there, ask them to tell you how to get rid of grease and foreign material in the cooling system. Both of these services are speedy and inexpensive. And helping you maintain low-cost operation is another reason standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll find George faced with a new problem and a new client. Dear Mr. Valentine, I know I must be about 18, but I may as well have been born yesterday. My mind doesn't go back any further than that. I don't know who I am or what I might have done. I'm in trouble, Mr. Valentine, so please hurry. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Howard McNear as Sterner, Sarah Selby as Vivian, Pedro de Cordoba as Wilton, and Franklin Parker is Beasley. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Seven Dead Years, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're crowded against a wall and you can't punch your way out alone, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, for almost seven years I've been hunting a man who killed his own wife. I can't prove that he did. And all of a sudden I can't afford to spend any more time floundering around. Next week he's going to get $200,000 because I failed. And that's something that's keeping me awake nights. I've dealt with plenty of crooks in my life. Plenty of crooks in my life and didn't need anybody to help me. Plenty of crooks in my life and didn't need anybody's help. But this is different, and I don't mind admitting it. How about giving me a ring? It's signed Samuels. Samuels? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm overwhelmed, Brooksy. Why? Who's Samuels? Oh, just about the shrewdest insurance investigator in the game. But I thought he was retired off somewhere in the Florida Keys, fishing. Well, according to this letter, all he's doing is staying awake nights. Oh, seven years, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, time's running out for Samuels. Why did he put it just that way, Angel? Say, what do the words seven years mean to you? Oh, seven-year itch. Seven lean years. Seven years it might take a salmon to make seven honeymoon trips up the Columbia River. All right, without making funny, Brooksy. Seven years also means the legal period after which a man or woman is declared dead. It's poetically called the Enoch Arden Law. Oh, well, then this this Samuels is in a race against time. Uh Uh-huh. And if he is in such a hurry, it'd be a shame if we wasted time on this end, wouldn't it? This man, McLean, killed his wife and got rid of the body. I know it. 
Well, according to all this, Marion McLean just wrote a suicide note and disappeared. And if the husband is walking around enjoying good fresh air, the police must have given him a clean bill of health. That's okay for the police, but not for me. Well, what makes you so hard to satisfy? This McLean Dane gets in short for $200,000 and conveniently vanishes from the face of the earth. Besides, whenever I meet up with a crook, my belly turns over twice. And this guy McLean has been giving me a nervous stomach for seven years. Seven long years. Well, as I get it, Mr. Samuels, you're retired. If the insurance company is willing to pay the $200,000, I don't see It's a matter of pride, Miss Brooks. When I first turned into the report on the McLeans, I said it was a phony. It's the only case in my career I feel wasn't washed upright. I think I know what's bothering you, Samuels. Do you? Yeah, the body. It was never found. Yeah. The hardest thing in the world to do is to get rid of a body. And don't look so amazed, Miss Brooks. That's the truth. Oh, I wouldn't know. Well, you can't burn it. Something's always left over. Buttons, bridge work, teeth. And you can't drown it. It comes up to the surface sometime or another, and you bury it, somebody finds it when they're digging post holes. <laughs> well, Samuels, if you've been searching for the corpus delicti for seven years, I don't know what I can do. Take a look at this ad in the paper. Wanted by sculptor. Male professional model. Must be exceptionally muscular and broad-shouldered. To pose for heroic figure in important civic memorial, Frank McLean. Oh, is this the same McLean we've been talking about, Mr. Samuel? Yeah, he has a house and studio a few miles out of town in Roxbury. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. I go out there... I'll pay you for it out of my own pocket. It's worth it to me. And while I'm not posing, I'm supposed to go up in the attic or dig out in the garden to find a corpse. It's not going to be anything as obvious as that. I've been at it seven years trying to find out what he did with his wife. He knows my face as well as his own. I can't work on this deal anymore. That's why I want you. Well, George, you do have the shoulders for it. Uh, okay, Samuels. I don't know how I'll look as Atlas holding up the world or a Spartan youth, but I'll give it a try. I take it, Mr. Valentine, you've posed for other well-known sculptors? Oh, yes, of course. But back east, New York. I just got in town and saw your ad. I see. Oh, darling. Uh, Yes, Nana. Is that man still there? Are we going to work anymore today? My very favorite model, Valentine. Oh? No, Nana, we won't work anymore today. Here, Valentine, you might be interested in seeing some of my work. Sure, fine. Now... Here's something in bronze I did in 1936. I call it age. Uh, All I see is a little girl, asleep. She's a dead little girl, which makes her older than any of us. Oh. Well, that's one way of looking at it. You'll have plenty of time to see my other stuff, but here, here's what I'm working on. Looks like quite a project, Mr. McLean. It's going into the town square at Porchester to memorialize the 100th birthday of that little hamlet. Aside from artistic merits, it has to be able to withstand the passage of time and the critical comments of migratory birds. Is this where I fit in? Yes. You'll be the figure of man in capital letters. You're reaching upward for ultimate perfection. As you see, the figures of health, love, and spiritual attainment are already finished. The statue in the middle will be eternal life, which Nana is going to pose for. Well, when do I start working? Take off your coat and your shirt. What? Oh, yeah, sure. I have a very definite conception of this man's physique. After all, to the good people of Porchester, he's supposed to symbolize all mankind. <laughs> well, that's quite a responsibility. Uh, how do I shape up? Mm. Um, turn around. Well, well, what have we got here? All of mankind, lady. Yes, and with hair on your chest. This is Nana. As I said, Valentine, she's going to portray eternal life. In the meantime, she abuses the privilege of being the eternal feminine. Mm, You love to make with words, darling, but you ought to know by now that you can't insult me. Certainly not till after we're married. That will be all for today, Miss Kenyon. Same time tomorrow. My, aren't we businesslike? (laughs) Beware of him, Mr. Valentine. He's a creature of moods. Goodbye, darling. So long, Mr. Man. Um, your fiancé is a very charming girl, Mr. McLean. Her charm is only an added attraction, and she knows it. Now you and I better get started, Valentine. Uh, stretch your arm up toward the skylight over there. Like this? Yes, and hold the pose. Say, 
How long do I have to stand like this? You're not getting tired. I haven't even finished making my rough sketch. Don't we get time out for a cigarette, McLean? What kind of people have you been posing for, anyway? We've just been working a short while. Oh, sorry, but I can't hold up my arm like this anymore. Oh, it was beginning to weigh a ton. Whom do you think you're fooling? Huh? How stupid do you think I am? Well, that's a question that invites all kinds of answers. I had to find out. You're not a professional model. If you were, you could have held your arm like that much longer without getting tired. I, I guess I wasn't very good. Samuel sent you here, didn't he? Well, you can tell that human bloodhound he's still wasting his time. Okay, I'll deliver the message, friend. But I doubt if he's going to be convinced. Would you mind turning around while I put on my shirt? Darling, McLean could be right about Samuel's having a blind spot, an obsession. Yeah, but before I tell him what a flop I was as a model, I'd like to try something. Such as? Well, first of all, let's take it for granted that Samuel's is right. It's next to impossible to get rid of a human body. Well, then, maybe there never was a body. Oh, in other words, Mrs. McLean is very much alive somewhere. Yeah, it could be, Angel. Waiting for seven years to pass. So McLean can collect that dough and join us somewhere in Europe, let's say. Oh, well, that's a pretty wild notion, George. Two people separating for seven years like that? Yeah, but a very profitable separation. They'll be getting roughly $30,000 a year for it. Okay. Say we even buy that. What do you propose to try? I'll take this hypothetical situation. You're my wife. Oh, must it be hypothetical? You love me very much. Oh, Jack. Love me enough to endure seven years of hiding and separation so we'll have enough to live on for the rest of our lives. All right. Supposing. Then you read in public print that I have intentions toward a gorgeous model by the name of Nana Kenyon. Now, what would you do? I'd come halfway around the world and scratch your eyes out. And that wouldn't be hypothetical. <laughs> Especially with a payoff at hand, so McLean could disappear with all the moolah and the luscious Nana. Well, how are you going to get this world-shaking piece of gossip into the paper? Leo Mensch in the bulletin. His column is syndicated in 650 newspapers. Nana is pretty colorful. <laughs> Some pun. Besides, Brooksy... Leo owes me a favor. I'm a patient man, Valentine. I've waited for seven years. I can stand it a few more days. Good. But how do you know this item in Mensch's column is going to pay off? I don't know. But if Mrs. McLean is alive and has the usual feminine instincts, it'll work. Valentine, I'm not too sold on this theory of yours. I still say McLean got rid of the body. But how, where, that's what I've got to find out. You'll be coming into that money next Tuesday. Yeah. Let me have that picture and description of Mrs. McLean. I want to get it around where it'll do the most good. Now, let's see. Five foot four, 125 pounds. Brown hair, scar on left cheek. Middle finger of left hand severed at first joint. Fair complexion, brown eyes. Mr. Valentine, i got to see you a minute. Huh? I think you owe me 50 bucks. Oh, George, this is one of the cab drivers I spoke to at the airport. Mike uh, Kozlenko, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, one of the Boston Kozlenko. Did you see Mrs. McLean? Well, if it wasn't, she's got a twin. Scar on her cheek and all. Oh, when'd she show up? Where'd you take her? Well, she got off the plane early this morning. Come in on one of them DC-6s. Well, you sure took your time getting here. I had to haul a guy all the way out to the racetrack and wait for him. I tried calling you, but your line was busy. Okay, okay. Where'd you drop her off? What was the address? Well, she didn't give me no address. I took her out to Roxbury. That's where McLean is. I let her off on the corner of Sycamore and Dean. She looked boiling mad. Come on, Brooksy. We've got to move fast if we're going to keep Samuels from being right. What do you mean, George? Well, if this is Mrs. McLean, she's an uninvited guest. After all these years, I'd hate to have to go looking for her body. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about protection. Most motorists quite naturally believe that automobile engines wear out faster when they're running. But that's not true. Your car faces its biggest wear test when it's standing cold. For that's when rust, caused by condensed moisture inside cylinders, can start to work. And that's where RPM motor oil helps you avoid a repair bill. RPM special compounds keep a protective oil film on all engine parts all of the time. 
Whether your car is running hot or standing cold, RPM clings stubbornly to vital wear points. And consequently, rust never has a chance to get started in your car. No wonder it's the two-to-one choice of Western motorists. Next time you need oil, ask for rust-fighting RPM motor oil at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. It's something you knew all the time. After seven years without the well-known corpus delicti, a person is declared legally dead. So you're not particularly surprised when an over-conscientious insurance investigator, now retired, hires you to find the body of one Marion McLean, missing just about that long. Then, surprise, she comes waltzing back into town, big as life. If you're like George Valentine, sensitive to rude shocks like this, you pay a visit to the studio of Frank McLean, sculptor and husband of said lady. I know I'm going way out on the limb, McLean, but I was told your wife is here in Roxbury. Oh? Who told you, Valentine? Another ghost? My wife is dead. Or hasn't Samuels told you? Dead or alive, this was a frame-up from the beginning, McLean. I'm still going to prove it. Uh, the ghost you mention happens to be a very earthy character. A cab driver with a nice earthy name like Koslenko. Yeah, one of the Boston Koslenkos. He claims he picked up your wife at the airport early this morning and dropped her off here on the corner of Sycamore and Dean. Your Koslenko boy is wasting his time driving a cab. He should be holding seances. Come Tuesday, my wife will be dead exactly seven years. You keep track of time very carefully, don't you? What do you do? Check off the days on the calendar? Oh, I may have an artistic temperament, but I'm practical enough to know what you can buy with $200,000. Any other questions, gentlemen? The same one I've been asking all these years, McLean. Now, let's say Valentine is right. Your wife showed this morning. What'd you do with her? Poor Samuels. How does your mind work? Now you're saying I killed Marion today. How about your theory that the hardest thing in the world to dispose of... He's a human body. I still say that. Well, unlike you, Samuels, I'm a reasonable man. My life is an open book. Go on. Look around anywhere you like. I do want you to be happy. Okay, okay. You can stop being glib, McLean. You said we have your permission to look wherever we want. That's right. What's on your mind, Valentine? Well, something that comes to you when you think about it hard enough. Like all simple things, you might walk right by it. It's so obvious. But don't look so startled, gentlemen. Mr. Valentine loves to be cryptic. You'll get to the point. Oh, I can't wait. Children know the principle very well. When you play hide-and-seek, the one place you're least likely to be discovered is where you just got through trying to hide. Uh, well, what do you mean by that, Valentine? Samuels, I understand you had the cellar dug up when Mrs. McLean first disappeared. Yeah, and there was nothing there. Well, there may be this time. You know, kid stuff. <laughs> Sorry you didn't find anything in the cellar, Valentine. You had such a fascinating theory. Yeah. Well, there are still a lot of places around here to look, McLean. Oh, to be sure. But do let me be the gracious host and mix you all a drink. Well, a party. <laughs> I'm glad you dropped in, Nana. We're playing a big game. Body, body. Who's got the body? Well, aren't we a little old for parlor games? <laughs> Samuel's here doesn't think so. Yeah, I'm a child at heart. You know, Mr. Valentine, I almost didn't recognize you with your shirt on. Yes, that mole on his left shoulder does something for him, doesn't it? I see you noticed that too, Miss Brooks. Oh, we've gone to the beach together many times. But here you are, everybody. Drink hard, eh? Oh, thank you. Uh, here's to you, Samuels, and, uh, and a happy retirement. Thanks. Oh, I see you've done a lot of work on your masterpiece for the Porchester Town Square. It's almost finished, Valentine. We're just missing the figure of the man. I understand the figure in the middle. Eternal life is supposed to be you, Miss Kenyon. My solitary contribution to American culture. Oh, come on, Valentine. Let's get going. If I were you, Miss Kenyon, I'd sue somebody for libel. That figure is nowhere near as glamorous as you really are. Well, thank you for the compliment. I'm sure you didn't mean every word of it. Goodness, Frank, you certainly poured this drink with a heavy hand. Mm -hmm. I could use a little more soda. Uh, so could I. Wait, Nan, I'll join you. I didn't think these were too bad. Did you, Miss Brooks? Oh, no, everything's just perfect. 
Now, if we could only get Samuel to think back. <laughs> no, that would be too much to ask. Uh-uh, not for me, Nana. All right, soulmate. If it isn't soda you want, what is it? You've been around, Nana. Yes, I've been around. I didn't think my travel scars were so prominent. Well, let's be corny and say it's something stronger than both of us. Something we can't resist. The eternal feminine and the equally eternal masculine. You handle words real nice, partner. Oh, I'm real smart. I bet I could even remember an address if I had to. 420 Montrose. If you ring the bell and there's no answer, yeah? there just might be a key under the flower pot on the back porch. <laughs> Maybe this was a wild goose chase, but it's not now. Uh, uh, well, what are you doing here, Miss Brooks? Oh, well, Mr. Valentine couldn't make it, Nana. He asked me to convey his deepest regrets. And there was that key under the flower pot. Why, that... Oh, what you were going to say. What have you got? Give me those tickets. I was just admiring them. I've always dreamt of a holiday in South America. I said, give them to me. Tickets for flight 114 next Wednesday. The day after Frank McLean collects the insurance on his wife. The tickets bought right here at the airport in Roxbury. I'm not going to ask you again. Let me have those tickets. It may not mean anything at all. But it's worth checking. Just who bought these tickets and why. Sorry, but you're not leaving here. (gasps) No fair, Nana. You didn't say put them up. I'm not finished with you yet. That's better. I like to be warned. Now I can forget I'm a lady. Well, you... You remember selling these tickets, don't you, mister? Seats four and five, flight 114, Wednesday? Oh, yes, I remember it very well. Oh, good. Would you be able to identify the man if you saw him again? Ma'am? But it wasn't a man, it was a woman. Oh? That's why I do remember it so distinctly. Oh, you mean she had all the reasons why men would look at her twice? I didn't think of it quite that way, miss. I meant the little scar on her cheek. Scar? Wait a minute. Is this the woman you sold the tickets to? The one in this picture? Why, yes, that's her. Mrs. McLean bought those tickets. If Mrs. McLean bought those airplane tickets, Brooksy, that means for sure she's back here in Roxbury. And not just on the testimony of one of the Boston Kozlenkos. Well, what do you make of it, Samuels? If McLean and Nana got those tickets from her, you can bet your life she didn't just hand them over on a silver platter. No, not till her husband and his lady fair could go flying down to Rio. Hey, look, Brooksy. Yes, George. I think Nana must be a chastened spirit by now. Drop by her place again and let her out of that closet. Oh, must I? <laughs> yes, you must. And bring her out to McLean's. For one thing, she's got to answer some questions about those tickets. Now, there's a cool cookie for you, that McLean. Imagine him using the same tickets his wife bought. He probably figured that was one way no one would know his plans, where he was going after he collected on the insurance. Well, I'd better be going. See you later, Brooksy. Now, you know something, Samuels? Now, what's that? If McLean wanted to get rid of his wife, he wouldn't necessarily plant her right there on the home ground. He wouldn't risk taking her anywhere else. Like I always say, the hardest thing in the world to get rid of. Yeah, I know, I know. But we were all over the place. I wouldn't know where else to go looking tonight. Wait. There's one place we didn't look. Huh? On the back part of that property is an old well. All overgrown with shrubbery and stuff. That's why we passed it by. Go on. I looked there seven years ago, and if your idea about hiding things where people look before okay. is... Okay. What's keeping us? <laughs> We got enough rope up there, Samuel. Plenty. This well looks deeper than we thought. Be careful. Can you use your flash? Better wait till I get farther down. Yeah, that might be. Uh, Samuel! The rope! Samuel! George! George! We'll have him up here in a minute, Miss Brooks. Uh. Lucky he didn't bring the whole rope down with him when he fell. Well, you know if there's any water down there? No, I don't. Well, let me give you a hand. Now, wait till I get a hold of that Ginzo who sneaked up oh. behind him and slugged me. Oh, McLean? Who else? Wait. 
There. It's near the top, I think. Oh, oh George. Oh, here, honey, I'll help you. Come on now, fella. Up and over. Oh, you okay, darling? Oh, with reservations. I feel as though I've been dragged not too gently through a meat grinder. Somebody walked up behind me in the dark and let me have it. Yeah, I found Samuel's lying here when I went out to look for you two. Uh-huh. Now, let's get inside and see McLean, eh, hey, Valentine? Maybe it's time to do something about that well-groomed pan of his, like you said. You took the words right out of my mouth, friend. I've just come to a very interesting conclusion. I was wondering about that thousand-watt look in your eye. Yeah, Brooksy. To do some real profound thinking, there's nothing better than lying around on the bottom of a well. It's real nice and cozy, folks, to have everybody around like this. We might even toast marshmallows if I didn't have something more important on my mind. Mm -hmm. As a rule, I, I don't believe in petty tantrums on the part of grown men. But I owe somebody a fractured jaw. Now, look here, Valentine. What Samuel said about me sneaking up behind That's him... That's you, McLean. Step aside till the teacher gives you permission. What brought this on, George? I do believe he's going to hit somebody. Yeah. You, Samuels. Hey, what's the matter with you, Valentine? You gone nuts? Yes, you, Samuel. Oh, oh. George. Oh. Okay, Valentine, I'm coming at you, and I'll ask questions later. Fine, fine. I was waiting for an excuse to do this again. Oh. Oh. Be careful. All right, come on. Get up, get up. Nice work, Valentine. I've never seen my studio put to better use. Shut up, you. My, he's mad at everybody. George, what is this about Samuel? Yeah, what's the idea? What did I ever do to you? You tried to kill me. Nobody slugged you except yourself to make it look good. What do you mean, Bad George? slip of logic, Samuels. You were McLean's personal nemesis. If he were getting really desperate, he'd want to get rid of you, not me. He'd make good and sure you were dead. Oh, that's crazy. Why should I want to knock you off? I hired you. How could Samuels possibly have anything to do with Mrs. McLean's disappearance? Samuels, you know where that woman's body is, don't you? You know it tonight when you suggested I go plumbing the depths of that abandoned well because you were too fat to do it yourself. You're way off the beam, Valentine. You were afraid I'd find out too sooner or later. And you weren't going to take any chance. Now, look. With me dead, you could blackmail the real murderer for a long time to come. I see. I still remain the suspected murderer. Don't be so glib, bub. You're exactly that. When will somebody get around to making sense here? I'm getting used to being the suspected murderer, Nana. But still I say, where is the body? You know, you've got to produce that to prove there was a murder. Samuels knows where it is, don't you? I, you uh, caught on a little quicker than I did. That's because you've been living with this case for seven years. Well, uh, I don't like being ghoulish. But do you really know where Mrs. McLean is, George? Take a look at this impressive group of statuary. My best effort yet. Statues, George? The one in the middle, particularly, Brooksy. Eternal life. You yourself said it didn't do its model, Nana, justice. And no wonder. There's only one thing Mrs. McLean has in common with Nana. They're both women of about the same size. There's no telling where that weird imagination of yours will lead you, Valentine. You don't need imagination, McLean. Just the plain observation that Samuels had, too. You were in such a hurry to make a plastic cast with your wife's body in it that you forgot one little defect that might have been overlooked after seven years. What's that? I mean specifically the middle finger of your wife's hand. It severed at the first joint, and the plastic cast preserved it that way. No. I couldn't have forgotten that. I couldn't. Yes. Ironic as it is, McLean, there's death inside the statue of eternal life. When you shop for meat, you're confident of getting good quality because you know you're protected by health department regulations. But how can you be sure of quality when you're buying a battery for your car? The National Society of Automotive Engineers established protection for you when it established three rigid battery tests. Atlas batteries excel in all three of these tests required by the Society. Next time you look at an Atlas battery... Notice the certified capacities embossed on the back panel and the number of plates. So for a sure starting battery with greater capacity through a longer service period, make sure it's an Atlas battery. You can get one at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. Certified Atlas batteries and expert battery service 
are two reasons why independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll find George faced with a new problem expressed in a letter that has just come to his desk. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm a freshman at Western State University. I'm majoring in botany. And I've suddenly found that flowers can smell of murder. Please give me a chance to tell you the whole story. I live in Quonset Hut Number 8, University Road. Signed, Louise Durain. Next Monday night, a new case for George Valentine. The flowers that smelled of murder. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor, Herbert Little Jr., and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Samuels, Jay Novello as McLean, Louise Arthur as Nana. Don Diamond is the cabbie, and Bob Bruce as the clerk. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Houston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Stand in for murder, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If life is throwing you a sneak punch and you don't know how to dodge, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Valentine... I bet you never heard this one before. I've got to commit a crime to keep from being a criminal. No use kidding anybody. What I've got to do involves murder, and I'm the fall guy, the clay pigeon. All the way here on the train, I try to figure out of the frame. Well, there's no way unless I can get some help. You can't get in touch with me, so I'll be dropping in on you. The name's Bill Moran. It doesn't matter what I did in the past. Valentine. Well, it's fairly important to me, Moran, if I'm going to take this case. Okay, okay. I can tell you this much. I happen to be innocent, but the evidence stacks up against me. That's an old and familiar refrain, isn't it? Yeah, but it happens to be true, lady. They just have to see the police on me, and I'll be eating my meals off a tin plate. Uh, who are they, in quotes? Oh, some boys back east. You could call them uh, gamblers, except they never bet on anything but a sure thing. Uh, I see. In other words, they're blackmailing you into this job you've got it to. And it's the only way they'll let me get out of the rack and make them forget what they have on me. Okay, suppose I take this thing. Uh, just suppose, that is. What is it you've got to do? That's just it. I don't know, Valentine. But you said something in your letter about murder. And I'm not even guessing, lady. They wouldn't be sending me all the way across the country for anything else. Well, you must have gotten some instructions. Sure, sure, right. Show up in Suite 817 at the Hawthorne tonight. The door will be open. I'm supposed to go inside and sit down until somebody shows up. That's all I know. <laughs> Sounds like a new prowl again. I'm one of those conservative uh, gamblers who save some of his money. So whatever it's worth for you to take my place, just name it. You can do it because nobody in this town knows me. Oh, he can do it all right, Mr. Moran. But don't you think that anyone who's stand in for a dead duck should have his head examined? <laughs> I didn't say this was going to be a picnic, lady. Well, Valentine... Well, that's a nice scenario you got there, Moran. Do you want to get out of the racket, settle down, go straight? 
You haven't bought a chicken farm, too, have you? Okay, forget it, Valentine. I didn't expect you to believe me. I didn't say I didn't believe you. It's just hard to believe. Oh, here. Perhaps you can believe this picture. Yeah. She's very attractive. And she doesn't look like she's out of the chorus at the Copacabana. She works in a real estate office, 35 bucks a week. And she lives with her mother in Brooklyn. And to make it real corny, her name is Mary. <laughs> well, maybe I'm a sucker, fella, but I think you sold me. Well, you may be buying more than you can handle this time, darling. Why don't you think it over? I have, Brooksy. If Moran is telling the truth, he deserves a break from somebody. Thanks, Valentine. Let me have your wallet and any other means of identification. Okay. Where are you located in town? Well, I was supposed to get in this morning, but I made it a day earlier, so I'd be sure I'd have nobody on my tail. I'm holed up in a cheap rooming house on Montgomery Street. Okay, now here's what you do. Here's a key to my place. Write down the address, Angel. Okay. Don't even go back to that rooming house, Moran. Yeah, but all you my things You can use my things. The... Anyway, you're not going anywhere. Just sit there and play solitaire till you hear from me. Here you are, Mr. Moran. Sam at the switchboard will see that no one disturbs you. He'll also know if you go out. Don't worry, I'll stay put. All right, get going, Moran. You'll hear from me sometime tonight, I hope. Take care of yourself, Valentine. Oh, this is fine. What am I supposed to do? Knit one, curl two, and worry myself sick until this is over? George, this is... Look, see, I have a very important job for you. You've got to follow somebody. What? Yeah, me. Oh. For one thing, I want you to be outside the Hawthorne tonight when I go up to meet somebody I don't know and who fortunately doesn't know me. Anything you say, Mr. Moran, crazy lunk. Hmm. Well, the door opened without a time bomb going on. Uh-huh, so it begins. Hey, hey, what's wrong? Let me help you. The knife. I'll get that thing out of you and call a doctor. Hold on now. Too too late. Mr. Clayton, I found the rest of papers in the file, and according to... Hey, will you stop screaming? It's not going to wake him up. He's dead. Don't come near me. You've got no reason to kill me, too. What are you talking about? Look, if you leave me alone, I'll just tell the police I found him that way. Tell them I didn't see who did it. What do you mean, you... Oh, I guess this does look bad. Knife and hand, body on the floor. Who are you anyway, sister? Come on, talk. Mr. Clayton's secretary. We were working late. He wanted to get off on a vacation in a few days and... Oh. Now what? Why the delay take? You must be Moran. Oh, I get it. This frame is beginning to look so perfect you could put a picture on it. You wrote him all those threatening letters. And I suppose they're all nicely tucked away for the cops to find. Stay away from me. Help, somebody. Go ahead, baby. Blow your top. Sorry I can't stick around for the double cross. The man I'm supposed to have killed, Brooksy, is Charles Clayton, vice president of the Colonial Savings Bank. Oh, do you still want to go on with this little masquerade? I'm going to call Lieutenant Riley. Um. But you stay right here and keep your eye on the entrance of that hotel. Well, what'll I do? Count the times the revolving door goes round? No, you're going to wait till the cops get through with that secretary, then stick with her, see where she goes, everything she does. Well, unless she's wearing a typewriter cover for a hat, how old I know her? You can't miss her, Angel. She's got red, coppery hair down to her shoulders, the Hollywood version of the perfect secretary. In other words, you wouldn't be expecting her to take short hair. Okay, I'll keep in touch with you through the switchboard at your place. Good girl. And there's my cue to get going. Valentine, it costs the taxpayers a lot of money to train police officers. Look, Lieutenant... If you're going to take law enforcement all in your own little hands, they'll just have to sit around and get rusty. Now, you wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? Oh, it wasn't a question of enforcing the law, Lieutenant. I was just trying to protect my client. Well, we might have been able to help you in our awkward, unprofessional way. Why didn't you come to us first when this Moran guy waltzed in on you? Because nothing happened first. Yeah. The only thing to do with you is to give you a desk space here at headquarters. At least that way we can keep an eye on you. Now, look, you. Yes, Lieutenant. We made a quick check, see? The guy you saw up at the hearth on was Clayton's secretary, all right? And the guy was trying to get things cleaned up so he could get off on a vacation. Those are facts and nothing's wrong with them. Yeah, well, here's another fact. I was kissed off and left a freeze against the cushion. Why? 
This isn't penny ante stuff, Lieutenant. You're only guessing when you suspect the secretary and you know it. Oh, come on, Lieutenant. This thing is too pat. I walk in at the appointed time. There's a guy gasping on his last with a knife in him. Uh, and right then, Theo, baby, wanders in from the next room. Mm. So we have a batch of my fingerprints, a witness. And I understand some letters in the file supposedly written by Moran. Yeah. You know, if it was anybody else but you, I'd slam you in the can so fast it would take your breath away. Look, Lieutenant, let me have until tomorrow, just one day. Okay. Okay, but if you don't come up with something by then, I'm going to have to ask you to hand over that client of yours. It's a deal, but one more favor. What do you want now, my badge? The secretary, Theo Brown, will give you a description of Moran. And that description will be me. Huh? Let it stay that way. Uh, are you out of your head? You'll have every cop in town on your tail. Yeah, maybe, Lieutenant. But I'm betting there'll be more than one character tipping his mitt when he finds out that Bill Moran, wanted for murder, is still on the loose. George, I'm really beat around the edges this morning. There you are, Angel. Have some of this coffee. Thanks. I was back watching Theo Bungalow at 7 a.m. No leads? Not unless you can read something into them. About 8.30, Theo drove over to the Colonial Bank. Well, sure, she works there. Oh, well, she must be taking the day off. She got as far as the entrance, and she suddenly stopped. Huh? Looked a little frantic to me. Yeah, well, what then? She made a beeline to the Sandra restaurant on Doris Boulevard. Well, that place doesn't open till 6 o'clock. Well, Theo sashayed in as though she had a half interest in the place. Chick Hollis doesn't give away a half interest to anybody. Well, she certainly wasn't visiting the porters or the scrub women. Well, why not Chick Hollis himself? Hmm? Yeah, sure. He's just the kind of a boy who likes these big, elaborate deals that would be hard to trace to him. Yeah. There may be a connection between Theo and Hollis. Aha. Uh-huh. Things are beginning to open up, Brooksy. And if Hollis is behind it... I think I know a way to find out what this is all about. Hello, Theo. Huh? What? what are you doing here? Close the door. Now, if you start screaming again, you're going to suddenly lose your voice. You didn't answer my question, Moran. What are you going to do? I'm asking the questions. Nice place you got around here. Wasn't half bad waiting around all day to see you. That gun on the coffee table doesn't scare me. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just cleaning it. I'll put it away. Well, what do we do? Just sit here? No, I got other plans. I've been looking through your closets and other places. And I found out a lot of things. I hope my dainty washables met with your masculine approval. Never mind that. What I want to know is how can a secretary afford three fur coats like I saw in a closet full of expensive dresses? Maybe I saved my money. Or maybe there's a simpler explanation. I think I'll make myself a drink. I mean Chick Hollis. What? Never heard of the man. Look, Theo, suppose you stop lying. Go on, <laughs> sit down in that chair. You don't care how you manhandle women, do you, Mr. Moran? Now pick up that telephone. Call up Chick. But be sure you dial the right numbers. I know what they are. What do you expect to get out of this, Moran? Just wait and see. You might be surprised. Now, just say, Moran is here with me, Chick. What? If you say any more, I'll put a period on the sentence with his gun. All right. Hello? Moran is here with me, Chick. That's all, Theo. Now you can make yourself a short drink. I don't think we'll have to wait very long. Why doesn't Hollis use his key, Theo? Or is he playing it safe? I, Stay where you I... are. Theo, what do you mean by calling You're me? You're in the right place, friend. All right, you got muscles. Well, so a, what? There's a third act, sister. A guy like Hollis wouldn't come here alone. Well, little man, don't you want to come in, too? What did you do to the boss? Why, I... You're not going to do anything. Okay, I'll take that gun. All right, now the three of you. Go on, sit on that couch. I think I'm about to make a speech. Now, wait a minute, Moran. Certainly we can uh, 
come to an understanding about this. You'll hide me wrong, Hollis. I said I was going to do the talking. Jake, if you told me it might be like this, I could have done something about that monkey. Best thing you can do, Squeaky, is keep your mouth shut. Right now, he's got all the cards. Yeah, and I'm going to improve my hand as I go along. Hollis, you're a grade-A sucker. You don't think anybody's smarter than you, and that's bad. All Theo said on the phone was that Moran is here, and the next minute you were leaning on the front door buzzer. Well, Chick, have you got any answers? That's wait till he's through, huh? If you never showed, Chick, I'd be left high and dry because I was only guessing. But now I know. You know what? I know this much, Squeaky. The big frame was on, and I was in the middle of it. If one of you doesn't tell me how I can get out of it, I'm going to kill the three of you. Chick. You see, Theo, I got nothing to lose. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about power. Have you ever driven up San Francisco's famous hill streets like Powell, Taylor, and Jones? Some hill. But try any hill with Chevron Supreme gasoline in your car and you'll say, some gas. For this premium quality gasoline specially blended to give your car its fullest, smoothest power on the steepest hills. Chevron Supreme means faster starts, too. And extra pep for quicker pickups in heavy traffic driving. Best of all, this premium quality gasoline is climate-tailored to give your car peak performance in each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. Why not try a tank full first thing tomorrow? Get Chevron Supreme at any independent Chevron gas station or standard station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. It's bad enough to play stand-in for a fall guy. It's really bad when the frame-up involves murder. Worse yet, if you're as stubborn as George Valentine, you carry on the masquerade even when you know that your client, Bill Moran, is being sought for murder. All of which leaves you, gun in hand, facing three desperate characters who'd like nothing better than to see you good and dead. Oh, what's the matter with you three? Didn't you ever go to school? Can't you talk? I, uh, I think we can come to terms, Moran. I'm afraid you were framed and deserve some consideration. Oh, now, Mr. Hollis, you're so good to me. You can make any arrangements you want, Chick, but get this straight. None of this is coming out of my share. I work too hard setting things up for the kill. <laughs> I like your choice of words, Theo. If you just had to told me, Chick, I'd have come here prepared for this guy. I know you feel naked without your arsenal, boy soprano, but sit down. You hear what he called me? Someday I'm going to get him and nobody will even recognize him when I'm through. Sit down, Squeaky. You too, Theo. Look, I'm a businessman, Moran. I settle when I have to. Especially when a gun is pointed at you. Go on, keep talking. Well, here's my proposition. I'll see that you get out of the country. A private plane and a pilot who knows where to set you down in Mexico. Uh-uh, not good enough. What am I going to do? Eat friolis for the rest of my life? Five grand? Oh, I want to be able to afford a lottery ticket once in a while. Ten grand. Let's not quibble about pennies and make it twenty grand. But if I do win a lottery, I'll send you half of what I make. That's very funny. Now, come on, I'll stow you away for the night so nobody can find you. You can get started in the morning. Oh, I got a place to stay. Right here. Chick, you're not going to leave me here. Not with Moran. I always do what I have to. You know that, Theo. Don't worry, sister, you're safe. The worst that can happen is my snoring. If you close the door of your bedroom and stay there, it's all going to be peace and quiet. Isn't he a regular little gentleman? Oh, Hollis, be sure to take that vest pocket gunsel with you. Squeaky likes to take care of me. And I like to take care of myself. Nobody's going to look for me in the apartment of the late Mr. Clayton's secretary. All right, Moran, you're calling the shots. Oh, uh, Theo. Yes? I think you better let me have the key. Maybe safer for everyone. If you're worrying about me, don't. Just the same, you'd better give it to me. I said I'm going to keep it, Chick. Good night. Didn't you hear what I... All right, good night. Come on, sweetie. That guy thinks he's through with me. Even if I do find you loathsome, Moran, do you mind if I sit down next to you and have a brandy? I don't care what you do. Hey, what are you doing with my pocketbook? Give it to me. <laughs> I always wondered why women didn't carry knapsacks instead of pocketbooks. Uh-huh. What, no ham sandwiches? Let me have that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Where are you going? Just want to see something. Yeah. Now, 
friend Squeaky is holding up a lamp post down there. You think he might be waiting for you? Does it make you feel better, Moran? I haven't felt good since I met you yesterday. Now, up you go. What are you going to do with me? You're going into that closet, sister. You won't freeze with all those fur coats in no. there. No, no. Hello? It's me, Brooksy. Safe. <laughs> like a babe nuzzling in his mother's arms. Now listen carefully. I'm at Theo's place and I could use some help. So get over here as soon as you can. Yes, Lieutenant, I know I only have till 12 o'clock. But if you'll just do this, maybe I'll have the answer by then. You. Yeah, you, trying to hold up that lamppost. Oh, me? Yeah, get in the car. But I didn't do anything. All it time. don't matter, bub. I'm arresting you for loitering. Well, Bill, here she is, Miss Theo Brown. You have no idea what trouble it was getting her here. Oh, I smoked ten packs of cigarettes today, Miss Brooks. Where's Valentine? Oh, well, that shouldn't be as important to you as Theo. She's the one who put the finger on you, Mr. Moran. Moran? But who is Did the... you do that to me, lady? Now, Bill, why? just sit down. I'm going to find out why, even if, if I have to If you do, give Bill, a... you're going to have to walk over me to get to her. What? That's what I said. If you want everything to come out even for everybody, including Mary back in Brooklyn, you'll listen to me. Oh, all right. You and I are just going to see that Theo stays right here in George's apartment. That shouldn't be long. George may show up any time between now and the next century. Come on in, Hollis. Come on in. This is your office. Make yourself at home. What are you doing here, Moran? Any reason I shouldn't be here? Unless you told Squeaky I shouldn't be. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, let's skip that. Don't tell me this is merely a social call. Anything but. I came to tell you you'll have to take more money out of the bank. Look, Moran, what do you think I'm made of? You got no choice but dig it up. If you want to see Theo again. Where is she? Where she can scream as loud as she wants and it won't make any difference. How much more do you want? I want to be sure about that trip to Mexico without any fancy byplay. And I could use 10,000 more. In fact, I'm going to have it. How would you like to have 20,000 more? I don't quite get the lyrics, but the tune sounds okay. Get rid of Theo. Get rid of her for good. Oh, now I recognize the tone. It's the funeral march. It's important to me. You may as well be hiding out for two murders as for one. <laughs> oh, it's nice doing business with you, Hollis. As long as I never have to turn my back on you. All you have to do is kill her. And bring me the key ring you'll find in her pocketbook. Okay. But we'll play it my way. Which is? You go and get the money. You'll find me waiting here for you. How do I know? I can't afford to double-cross you. All right, Moran. Just stay right where you are. There's a man with his heart in the right place. Hello, Riley. This is Valentine. The trap's all baited and the rat is on his way. Yeah, I'll be down there as soon as I can, Lieutenant. After that, I think we'll have all the answers. So long. <laughs> if Riley ever decided to throttle me, I think the jury would call it justifiable homicide. You reach for your gun and I'll kill you. Huh? Well, when did you get out, Squeaky? I got friends. I can get bail. You had me picked up, didn't you? Valentine. Who's Valentine? I've been in the next room listening. You just called the cops. I'm going to do chicken me a favor and kill you. <laughs> You're an all-around boy, aren't you, Squeaky? Using a gun now. I never killed that banker. But you gave me an idea. I think I will use a knife on you. I always knew I was lucky. It'll be nice and quiet. You're through wise, Crack and Valentine. Hey, now, wait a minute. Put that gun away. 
You couldn't cut a piece of cheese, you boy soprano. Don't, don't you call me that. Boy soprano, I'll show you. You ought to know by now when you lose your temper and you only see red. George, oh, I was worried about you. I just saw Hollis leave the building... Oh. Yeah, the gentleman on the floor, Brooks, he didn't like being called a boy soprano. What are you doing here anyway? What a man. First he tells me to follow him, and when I finally catch up with him, he asks questions. Oh, oh. oh, I guess you ought to be in on the payoff, Angel. But we'll have to wait. The bank doesn't open till 10. Where do you intend to spend all that nice, crisp money, Hollis? Huh? What's that? Lieutenant Riley, homicide. No, 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 no. Leave that safe deposit box out so we can take a good look at it. Oh, uh, sure. What's all this about, Lieutenant? I'm a respectable businessman. I run a restaurant yeah, tonight. you also know how to kill and have someone else pay for it. All right. Don't lose him too quickly, George. He may die of shock. The name is Valentine. All right, your name's Valentine. What's the gag? Moran's my client, and he didn't want to be framed. And you really dreamt up a few what have you been doing? Taking goof pills? Mr. Hollis doesn't seem to take you seriously, George. You better convince him. The first mistake you made, Hollis, is when you made such a commotion about a key when you were at Theo's place. Now, that made me curious. Strange how your curiosity doesn't interest me. I got a good look at Theo's key ring. There was a key to a safe deposit box on it. That's what you were haggling about. Can I call my lawyer, Lieutenant? The Lieutenant seems to be occupied, Mr. Hollis. I traced the key down here to the Colonial Savings Bank. The box is in your name and Theo. What's wrong with that? Oh, nothing ordinary. But on the first of the month when the bank examiners come around, they might just find that Vice President Clayton has been stashing away all sorts of money for his vacation with Theo. Suddenly I can't hear a word you're saying. That was nice long-range planning, getting Theo into the bank so she could make Clayton forget what they taught him in Sunday school. <laughs> 150,000 bucks in here. Well, that's a nice round sum. Enough for you to split with Theo. Even after you paid to import a guy to take the rap for killing Clayton. Now tell me, Hollis, did you wait until you heard me coming down the hall to put the knife in him? And did Theo let you out the back way? I didn't kill Clayton. Well, Squeaky says he didn't. So you two boys will have a chance to fight it out for the yard. And with Squeaky and Theo both singing, you're going to be a dead duck, Hollis. Uh, you know, George, a horrible thought just occurred to me. What's that, Brooksy? Well, either Hollis or Theo could have come here yesterday morning. Taken the money and gone somewhere to live happily ever after. Uh uh-uh. uh. That couldn't happen. Huh? huh? What made you so sure? How come you knew you had a whole day to work in? Because Hollis and Theo overlooked something. I never overlooked anything. <laughs> when you go to the trouble to kill the vice president of a bank, you run the risk of closing the next day in respect to his beloved memory. <laughs> Why are we going to the household fixtures department, Angel? You'll see. George, I just thought of something. Mm. The reason Theo was so upset. Mm. I mean, when she stopped at the front door of the bank and then made a beeline for the sandwich. I wasn't close enough to see the sign, bank closed. <laughs> Came the door. Mm. Yeah, but what are we supposed to do among all these pots and pans? Buy a wedding present for Bill Moran and Mary back in Brooklyn. Oh, Miss... How much are these chimes? Twelve fifty, and a very good buy. Listen. Oh, nice! I'll take two of them. Well, I hate to ask this, but Angel, who's the other one for? If I live long enough, you'll find out. Imagine driving around the world not once, but four times without an engine repair? Well, in actual mileage, one man has driven even farther than that on compounded RPM motor oil and without an engine repair. His name is George M. Hollingsworth, an insurance agent in Bakersfield, California. Here's what Mr. Hollingsworth said, quote, One of my cars has gone 123,000 miles on RPM without engine repairs, unquote. And lots of Western motorists have told us they've driven seven and eight years on RPM without engine repairs. Thousands of others have learned that RPM pays its own way many times over. 
For RPM is compounded to stop carbon trouble, to guard engine hot spots left bare and exposed to wear by ordinary motor oils, and to keep the whole engine system cleaner. Try RPM motor oil tomorrow. Get it at any standard station or any independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll find George faced with a new problem in a letter that reads... Dear Mr. Valentine, how do you explain this in a man? At 38, he's retired, a millionaire. Yet he steals a trinket from a five and ten cent store, makes sure he's caught, and then merely laughs. This man is my husband. I must find out what's happening to him. Please come to my home as soon as possible. Signed, Edna Pallister. Next week... A new case for George, The Malignant Heart. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gene Bates as Theo, Gerald Moore as Hollis, Robert Jellison as Squeaky, and Eddie Marr as Moran. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Death in Fancy Dress, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If life's tossed you a wet blanket and you're trying to stagger out from under, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. My dear Mr. Valentine, because of a hobby that's dear to my heart and certainly innocent enough, I've received several threats on my life of late. I'm aware that this can't be of world-shaking importance, but it is a confounded nuisance to me. If you decide to take pity on me and come to my rescue, please drop in at my apartment, the Hampshire House. Apartment at the Hampshire Towers tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Would you verify this appointment by phone? Signed, Lloyd Bascom. Oh, um, dear old Bascom, whoever he is. Several threats on his life and he loses composure completely. Well, at least he did admit it was a confounded nuisance. I suppose if some scoundrel sprayed him with a shotgun, our friend would say it was a blasted annoyance. Yeah, well, what intrigues me is this gentleman's hobby. What does he collect, atomic secret? (laughs) Hey, you know, Brooksy, I've always wanted to find an exciting pastime for my spare moments. Go on, Angel, verify the man's appointment. Well, here we are. My trophy room, uh, you might call it. Mr. Bascom, all I see is a lot of junk. (laughs) Yes. Now, take this particular piece of uh, junk. A broken wine glass. The one with which Lucy Graham plunged her coming out party into a furor. She practically gouged Tony Warren's eye out with it while she was deep in her cups. Uh Ah. I bought it from the caterers. As you see, I have it all neatly tagged. The occasion, the date, etc. And this, uh, 1945 license plate, Mr. Baskin? Uh, Oh, yes. The very proper and respected Mrs. Arlington Mackenzie was dragged into court on a hit-and-run charge. That's the plate of her Duesenberg. I bribed her chauffeur to get it. Oh, it was a beautiful scandal. Ah, 
Well, I can see where this sort of thing wouldn't make you the most popular boy in your set, Bess. I could not help being born with a silver spoon. But there's nothing to prevent me from reminding my friends of their more scandalous escapades. Now, look here. This lovely lock of red hair. A very lurid story goes with this. If you like, you gentlemen can retire to the smoking car. Oh, no, this little affair was quite well publicized. Celeste Dupre, the nightclub singer who was accused of the murder of Malcolm Gardner, the broker. She was acquitted. Dear me, I wonder whatever happened to the dear girl. Now, over here... Yeah, well, uh, we get the general idea, Bascom. This is your private wax museum of dead scandals you like to keep alive. Oh, well put, Valentine. I must remember that phrase when I show off my collection at my next party. You mean you deliberately keep bringing up all this? Oh, pardon me. I'll see who's at the door. Huh. Man after my own heart. Yeah. If you're not careful, Angel, he'll cut it out and put it in his collection. What surprises me is that Mr. Bascom's been allowed to go on breathing this long. What's the matter with you, Ben? I didn't come here to talk. What is the matter? Have you lost your mind? Sure. Yes, maybe I have. Stop it, Reynolds, you fool! Very time! Kill you! Come on, boys, break it up. You heard me, Frank. Get off of him. Get out of my way. Now listen, Buster, don't make me hang you up to dry. I'm a peace-loving man. What else have you got here that belongs to my wife, Bascom? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. You see, I found those letters you left under the Christmas tree. Very well, you found them. I'm as good as my word. I promised Donna I'd let her have them back as a present. But too bad you had to find them. The package wasn't addressed to you, Reynolds. Never mind that. I burned them without telling her I saw them. That's too bad. Donna must be very distressed at my breach of faith. Now, Reynolds, if you don't mind, I do have company. Oh, don't mind us. I don't know how much Donna paid you for them. Lord knows she's the one with the money. I don't care. But if you have anything else of hers that you can hold over her, I swear I'll break your filthy neck. Just remember that. See what I mean, Valentine? No. Suppose you draw me a diagram. You've already earned part of your fee when you haul Reynolds off me. That was on the house, Bascom. Uh, what do you mean? I think he means it's no go. If you want protection, you better call out the National Guard. To put it another way, I don't like your idea of fun. I don't like your museum, and I particularly don't like you. Now, wait a minute, Valentine. Let's get going, I... Brooksy. I don't want to be late for my paper route. Hey, hold on a minute, Angel. What is it, George? Anything wrong, Reynolds? What? Oh, I... I was just sitting here trying to calm down. I had a few drinks before and... Yeah. Yeah, you look in pretty bad shape. Hey, let me have the wheel. I'll take you home. Hop in the back, Brooksy. Really, Mr. Reynolds, you didn't have to bother inviting us in. Well, the least I can do is offer you and Mr. Valentine a drink. Say, look, Reynolds, uh, don't worry about that little scene of it, Baskin's going any farther than us. Thank you. I, uh, I'm not in the habit of washing my dirty linen in public. Uh, just make yourself comf comfortable there in the drawing room. Uh, I'll call Donna. Yeah, thanks. George, I don't know about I you, know, but... I know, I know. I'm not too comfortable either. We'll just waltz through the formalities and blow. Darling, over there, huh? look. Oh. Yeah. Uh, come to think of it, Valentine. Donna said... Hey, wait a minute, her. Reynolds. Uh, could we go across to that room for a minute? Huh? Why? What's the matter with you two, anyway? Why are you standing there like I this? I just think it's better that you don't come in here right now. What are you talking about? What happened? Please, Mr. Reynolds. Get out of my way. Let me in here. Donna. Donna. Take it easy, Reynolds. Don't. But she... She's dead. dead. Here, you better sit down. No. No. Ask him drove her to this. Might just as well have pulled the trigger himself. I felt like killing you before. Now I will. You can't do that. Let go of me, you... How can you look at her lying there and say that? Let go of me. Somehow Bascom will get what's coming to him. Not Bascom. He never does anything he has to pay for. The law can't punish him. That's why I've got to do this myself. Sorry, Reynolds. i got to hold you right here till you pull yourself together. Brooksy, call Lieutenant Riley. All right, Valentine, here it is. Yeah, Lieutenant. Between the medical examiner's report and my amateur sleuthing, it's just what you thought it was when you walked into that room across the hall. Suicide, pure and simple. 
I wasn't questioning that. What? Then what were you questioning? Why did you drag me into the case? Just for old Lang Syne? Oh, well, it just seemed a good idea at the time. It isn't easy, Lieutenant, to know that a man has driven a woman to suicide and not try to do something about him. Okay, Valentine. I know your heart's in the right place, but... But look, chum boy, why don't you grow up? There's a lot of slimy characters in this world. But, Lieutenant Riley, we know Bascom was blackmailing Mrs. Reynolds. Oh, do we? All I know is she wrote him some silly letters and he was gallant enough to return them to her as a Christmas present. If anything, that makes him out just a uh, ginger peach. You know, I'd give a lot to get something on that guy. Go to it, chum boy. Go to it. But remember, keep it legal. Now I gotta mosey along. Oh, Reynolds. Uh, leaving, Lieutenant. Uh, yes, yes, there's nothing more for me to do. I'm sorry about everything. Well, so long, Valentine, and good luck. So long. I suppose I should thank you for holding that before, Valentine. I, I don't know what I would have done. Skip it. But there's something else, Reynolds. Yes? Nobody can go racketeering with other people's lives without making at least one bad slip somewhere along the line. It seems there are others who feel like you do and would like to see Bascom dead. I want to find out why. What's that? I want you to hire me to look into our friends, past and present. See if I can find that one little slip. Is it a deal? I, I suppose so, sure. Okay, you got yourself a dollar a year, man. <laughs> it may take you years. That's okay, Reynolds. This is going to be a labor of love. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word from a wise motorist. Can you imagine driving around the world not once, but four times without an engine repair? Well, in actual mileage, one man has driven even farther than that on compounded RPM motor oil and without an engine repair. His name is George M. Hollingsworth, an insurance agent in Bakersfield, California. Here's what Mr. Hollingsworth said, quote, one of my cars has gone 123,000 miles on RPM without engine repairs, unquote. And lots of Western motorists have told us they've driven seven and eight years on RPM without engine repairs. Thousands of others have learned that RPM pays its own way many times over. For RPM is compounded to stop carbon trouble, to guard engine hot spots left bare and exposed to wear by ordinary motor oils, and to keep the whole engine system cleaner. Try RPM motor oil tomorrow. Get it at any standard station or any independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure, George Valentine. Your would-be client turns out to be, among other things, a blackmailer responsible for the suicide of one Donna Reynolds. So in a complete reversal, you find yourself pitted against the gentleman, determined to find just one slip-up somewhere in his checkered career. If you're like George Valentine, you're as patient as a terrier watching a gopher hole. But you get nowhere, except to Lieutenant Riley's office down at headquarters, where you've been rudely summoned. I think you know this gentleman, Valentine. I wouldn't admit it to anybody but you, Lieutenant. Hiya, Bascom. How are you enjoying your incursion... Into my life. I've had pleasanter assignments. What do you want with me, Riley? Well, <clears throat> as you know, uh, we're a close little family down here at headquarters. Uh, you better give me the next line. I forgot my cue. Sergeant Olson downstairs told me that this gentleman would like to swear out a warrant against you. Oh. Uh -huh. So I thought we'd better talk it over first. Now, uh, Mr. Bass, You're doing very well, Lieutenant. Go ahead. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Complaint number one, illegal entry. Valentine, have you been prowling around in Mr. Bascom's apartment? Well, I never. Yeah, An yeah. apartment? Why, I thought it was a museum. Such fascinating exhibits, broken wine glasses, old license plates. I thought it was open to the public. So, as I remember, I did drop in. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Complaint number two, questioning Mr. Bascom's friends and causing him unwarranted embarrassment. Oh. No, that's, that's not fair, Lieutenant. Sure, I talked to a lot of people who knew this uh, gentleman, but not one of them would admit to being his friend. Come now, Valentine. Let's not have a battle of wits. 
You're so unequipped. <laughs> Touché, Mr. Baskin, touche. Cliché, Mr. Valentine, cliché. What the devil's going on here? In two words of two syllables, Lieutenant. If he doesn't stop bothering me, I shall expect that warrant to be served. I think that will be all. Good day. Lieutenant. Did you get that? Can you tie that monkey? Uh... Now, look here, Valentine. We've, we've broken bread together. Mrs. Riley likes you, well, like a son. Yeah, and I think of her every time I hear an Irish tenor. I told you to keep it legal when it comes to Bascom. He and the commissioner have mutual friends. I've got to find a lead. There's got to be one. Well, why do you keep saying that? Just because of some letters between him and the late Mrs. Reynolds, this, this drawing room character suddenly becomes Jack the Ripper. What have you found anyway? Oh, no, nothing much, Lieutenant, nothing much. We checked most of the people on those tags in his collection. They all hate his guts, but won't say anything. <sighs> okay. Okay, but remember, pal, I warned you. Hello, Lieutenant. May I come in? Oh, Brooks. Sure. You told me to meet you downstairs. Yeah, yeah, I know. Sometimes I'm just an old chatterbox. What'd you find out, Angel? Well, the last anybody heard of Celeste Dupre was yeah? two years ago. She was working in Jake Swansea's cocktail bar out on Fulton Boulevard. Celeste Dupre? How's mm -hmm. she mixed up in this? One of her beautiful Titian locks is in Bascom's collection of mementos. Remember, she was accused of murder once? I was going to stop by at Swansea's new club. I thought I'd better talk to you first, Don. Good girl, Brooksy, good girl. We'll go over and have a talk with Jake right now. Swansea says for you to wait at the bar. He'll be right down. Okay, thanks. Come on, Brooksy, let's go. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter, George? Wouldn't that be Reynolds talking to himself at that corner table? Oh, yeah. Looks like he's drowning his sorrows. Coming up for the last time. Yeah. Better see if I can get him out of here. Hello, Reynolds. Huh? Don't you think you ought to go home? Oh, Valentine. Would you like us to call your cab, Mr. Reynolds? What I'm doing, I can do better right here. Thank you, Miss Brooks. You know, getting crocked isn't going to help anything, Reynolds. Tell me something, Valentine. Did you get anything on Baskin? Skeleton up in the attic. Trunk full of counterfeit thousand dollar bills. When do I come to his trial? Okay, Reynolds, you win. But take it easy, will you? Hey, is Swansea waving over here at me or you? Oh, I think that's our cue, Mr. Reynolds. Look, Valentine, if Reynolds is a friend of yours, maybe you can get him home. He's been here like that every day. Oh, he'll snap out of it. Look, Swansea, maybe you can help me. Sure, sit down. Can he get you anything, Miss Brooks? No, thanks. What can you tell me about Celeste Dupre? Well, Swan. Cigarette? Uh, you didn't answer my question. Why don't you leave that kid alone? Didn't she have enough trouble back there being accused of murder and everything? Didn't she work for you once? Yeah. After it happened, I was the only one to give her a job. What well, if you want anything, it's on the house. Sit down, Swansea. Now, I asked you, what happened to Celeste Dupre? Where do I find her? Can't you see? I don't feel like talking. You know I'm going to find her sooner or later anyway. And when I do, I may come back. I want to know why you didn't tell me. Okay. But don't build any fires under. Make that a personal favor to me. I don't like to see anybody hurt, Swansea. Red lives at the Shelby Arms. Only now her name is... Seal Dawson. Police? Not exactly, Celeste, or do you prefer Seal? Does it matter? Well, my name's Valentine. I'd like you to answer a few questions. Just whom do you represent? In this case, Valentine, as much as anybody else. I can't keep you from asking questions. Why did you give Lloyd Bascom a lock of your hair? What did you... And when did he give you for it? He usually pays for mementos like that. I... Why don't you leave me alone? I hate to come at you from left field like that, but sometimes it gets results. Oh, during my trial, Bascom asked me for a lock of my hair. I, I didn't see any harm in giving it to him. Uh-uh. The one I saw looked like a recent acquisition. But we'll let that rest. No, it's not too bad. What do you mean? Well, you've done pretty well for yourself, Celeste. This teepee you live in must run you quite a nut. What do you do for a living? I model clothes. <laughs> the wampum a model gets wouldn't rent a doghouse in this neighborhood. Now, suppose we get out of... Excuse me. 
Hello? Yes. Yes, that's right. I didn't expect you to call. Oh, yes, you did. Take your hand off the phone. Say what I tell you, Celeste, and I'm not fooling you. Valentine just left. Go on. Uh, Valentine just left. What's that? I'm telling him you want to see him. Get right over here because it's important. No, nothing's wrong. But I wish you'd come over. Yes, very important. Goodbye. I believe you would have hit me if I didn't play parrot for you. Could be, Red, could be. I'm not on my best behavior these days. You don't know who that was. Could have been my cousin from 29 Palms. However it was, Celeste, I'll be waiting downstairs in front of the house to greet him. didn't waste a minute getting here, did you, Baskin? Valentine, I thought... You look so grief-stricken. Celeste didn't cross you. She had to say what I told her. Oh, dear, you're turning into quite a problem. Yeah, well, let's go up and join Celeste. We have a lot to talk about, you and I. Including why you called her to see if I was here. Uh, you first, Baskin. Yes, I could stand a drink of that. As I recall, when we first met, you were wondering what became of Celeste Pray. Oh, that... Well, there you are, Baskin. Hey, Reynolds. I was waiting for you. I'm going to kill you. Don't hey. Don't drop it, Reynolds. Stop that. Let go of me. He's getting away. I got out of him here. You want did you let oh. one of those bullets nearly had my name on it. You hurt. I didn't expect you. Come on, it's just a scratch. Now let's get out of here. Cops will be flocking around here any minute. Yes. Yeah. I'll talk to you later. Take it easy, Brooksy. All the pieces of the puzzle are there, but it's still a puzzle. All right, but hold your arms still. Bascom is in the middle of something big. It may be genteel, but it's against the law. Now, what could it be? Do you think that... Ouch! Hey, look, Angel, stop fussing, will you? It's only a scratch. Well, it could have been more than that. Darling, why don't you let this thing ride? Somebody's going to make a little hole in you yet. Uh-uh. Anyway, Reynolds isn't going to rest till he gets Bascom, and there's nothing you can do about it. Think of him, hiding there in the lobby, waiting. If only... Sure. Sure, that's it. Just like that. Wham, sorry. Are you off on another tizzy? What is it now? Go on, Brooksy, beat it. Take a walk for yourself. Buy yourself some saltwater taffy. Will you get off the banter wagon and tell me what this is all about? If you want to find out, meet me at Lieutenant Riley's in about an hour. Now, go on. All right. But I don't like taffy. Do you mind if I make it cough drops for this cold? <laughs> cough drops. Oh, Brooksy, baby, you put your finger right on it. Ooh, you doll. Hey, operator, let me have the phone number of Jake Swansea's Club 18. Look, Valentine, you could have come over to the club if you wanted to see me. Oh, no, Swansea. You wouldn't want anything like this to happen in your club. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Hey, what? What is that for? What's the play? I got to get you in the mood to talk about the tie-up between you and Celeste and Baskin. You see, around town, you're a little buzz-headed. And I never believed it before. Come on, how do you talk? Or do we have ourselves a game of ping-pong first? I don't mind. I don't you don't want to bite my head, Jake. You keep him up there. <laughs> I know. What about it, Swansea? What about it? Uh, smart guy, huh? I'll put my knee right through you if you don't open up. All right, all right. Okay. Just lay there. Catch your breath. Hurry. What do you want to ask me? First, I'm going to tell you. Yeah? What? You're not just mixed up in blackmail, Muster. There's murder involved. Go on. You know about it. You profit by it. That's being an accessory after the fact. They lock you away for that. Yeah. I see what you mean, Valentine. Okay, now you're being bright. If you play it smart, maybe they'll go easy on you. You win. I guess this calls for a drink. Yes, yeah, Swansea. And a little trip down to headquarters. Okay, Swansea, okay. You've been very eloquent. Just wanted to be helpful, Lieutenant. Oh, yes, yes, I know. 
Well, now you can join Mr. Dupre uh, in the other office. Oh, Sergeant, send Baskin in here. I'm right here, Lieutenant. Well, well, sit down. Thank you. Very oh, time. You look a mess. Fighting again? <laughs> yeah. But it was worth it just for this one little occasion. Ask him, you met Celeste during a trial. What of it? You were looking for mementos for your collection. You didn't get one until some time after. Well, you and she got to know each other, uh, rather well. But don't expect any comments from me. You're spinning this fairy tale. All right, then, Bascom, shut up. So sorry. In fact, you and Celeste became so chummy that somehow she found herself in a perfect spot. You had arranged all the unpleasant details, Bascom, and she could sit back and blackmail you groggy. And Swansea was just a boy to see that you paid off. Come on, son, come on. Get to the point for the man. The murder. The murder? Oh, you know all about that, Bascom, don't you? After all, you worked it out. Deliberately fancy, but very neat. Classy picture of suicide, motive and all. Yet it was murder. Lieutenant, I'm beginning to resent the unrestrained use of that word in connection with me. Yeah? Well, I'll just take my chances on your being angry with me, too, Mr. Bascom. I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. On what evidence? With what Mr. Prey and Swansea will have to say, I'll risk being wrong. Mr. Reynolds just arrived, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah? Well, I suppose he ought to know what's been going on, so we uh, haven't come in. I should like to call my attorney, Lieutenant. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for that. Come on in, Reynolds. You missed the fireworks. Why? What's happened? Well, this should give you some satisfaction. We're holding Bascom for the murder of your wife. What's that? Did you say murder? Yes. Oh, Sergeant, take this guy away now. Huh? All right, come on now, this way. Oh, wait a minute, hold it, Sergeant. I don't want you to make two trips. Uh, what's this, Valentine? Don't rush me, Lieutenant. Tonight, when you were pouring shots at Bascom, you were really trying to kill me, Reynolds. What are you saying? Why would I do that? You didn't follow him to Celeste's place, as you said. You couldn't have. You were already inside the lobby. Miss Brooks reminded me of that. Then everything fell into place. I still want to know what reason I'd have for doing anything like that. What about it, Valentine? A man will do anything to get away with murder, Lieutenant. It was Reynolds who killed his wife. Ouch. Oh. <laughs> oh, will you stop it, Brooks? Oh, be still. You're just a big baby. <laughs> Nothing but a little iodine. Oh, a little iodine, a little iodine. <laughs> Lieutenant, do something. She's torturing. <laughs> oh, you live, chum boy. Fine thing. I fix your arm and you have to go and get into a fight. Yeah. Uh, I guess people never will learn. I mean about murder. If they want to kill, why don't they just bash somebody over the head without being fancy? Why, what a fine way for a lieutenant to talk. Oh, they'll get caught, sure, sure. But think of all the trouble they'd save. Oh, but don't forget the creative touch, Lieutenant. Means a lot to a man like Bascom. Think of the setup. Months back, he introduces his charming pal Reynolds to the wealthy Donna. She marries Reynolds all according to the plan. Ouch! Oh, quiet, Junior. Then it's all a build-up to our entrance, Angel. We were there to witness the clash between the aggrieved husband and the supposed blackmailer. And all the time, the poor woman was lying home dead. No threats on Bascom's life? No letters for Reynolds to burn? No blackmail? No nothing? Just a plain, unsimple murder. Reynolds gets the money from the estate, divides it with Bascom, then Swansea and the girl get their cut from him. That's settled. Mm. Don't tell me you're through, Brooksy. Yes, sissy. I can see that when little George falls off his scooter, I'll have to render first aid. Uh, what's that, little George? And when his baby sister tumbles out of her high chair, I'll have to... Oh, George Valentine, sometimes you get me so mad I could... Oh, I could... oh, 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 oh Brooksy. Oh, what? That's no way to talk to the father of two children. With 1949 just four days away, probably you've got your list of New Year's resolutions well started. But how about putting this resolution near the top of your list? Why not promise yourself to get the most out of your car? To do this, make sure you ask for Chevron Supreme gasoline, the premium quality gasoline that you can get at all standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations. The reason Chevron Supreme allows your car to do its very best is that it's fortified with high-octane blending agents. 
These blending agents give your car smoother acceleration on the straightaway, smoother power and extra power on the steepest hills. Also, Chevron Supreme's climate tailored to each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. Tailored to give you fast starts and speedy pickup in stop-and-go traffic. So for best motoring in 1949, why not make a resolution right now to give your car peak performance by getting Chevron Supreme gasoline at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next Monday night, a new case for George, murder and one to go. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jay Novello as Lloyd Bascom, Louis Van Ruten as Reynolds, Gloria Blondell as Celeste, and Ken Christie as Swansea. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week for Murder and One to Go on Let George Do It. Remember, next week, those listeners who are now in standard time states will hear this broadcast one hour later. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Murder and One to Go. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If life's giving you so much punishment you're buckling at the knees, you need my help. George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, do you remember Carol Gordon? Once she was as glamorous and famous as any movie star you can name today. Then some 18 years ago, when talkies came in, she faded out of the limelight. Dead, perhaps. But if she isn't, I must find her. The only clue I have is that someone thinks he saw Carol Gordon about a year ago, down on Skid Row. The enclosed check is a return. Retainer, and if you succeed in finding her, there will be a substantial bonus. Sincerely yours, Henry Crichton. Ah, Henry Crichton, business management and artist representation. Carol Gordon. Ah, uh, 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 careful! Don't say you remember her, Brooks. He'll give your age away. Well, I don't remember. Two world-shaking events took place in the twenties: the stock market crash and Carol Gordon. Her autograph always gets you two of Wallace Reed in the trade. And now Skid Row. Well, maybe this Mr. Crichton knows of a small part for her. Well, if he's gambling with $250 just to play Good Samaritan, I'd like to shake hands with that gentleman. And if he isn't, it might be a good idea to find out what's on his mind. Mmm. Pretty swank. Ah. Courier and Ives Prince right out in the hall. The Dorset Building. The agent's paradise. The house the 10% grows. George! Hey, I think that's coming from our client's office. Brooks, oh. he's... He's dead! He's dead! In there! Oh, oh it's horrible. All right now, sister. All right, take it easy. Get hold of yourself. What? Try to calm down. Who's dead? Mr. Crichton. I just came back from lunch. I found him lying there on the floor. The fire poker next to him. His head is... Oh, won't you please call 
Valentine, I know you were put on this earth to keep me from being bored, to see that I don't fall into a rut. But uh, please, let's keep this murder nice and simple. But take another look at this letter, will you, Lieutenant? You must admit Crichton might have been killed because he was determined to find Carol Gordon. Miss Brooks, I used to be a Carol Gordon fan. Why, it got so Mrs. Riley wouldn't let me go to the movies when her pictures were playing. Why, Lieutenant? But nobody's even thought of that woman in years and years. Right and dead, Lieutenant. Well, being just a plodding, unimaginative copper, I'm going to have to stick to facts. Namely, Crichton got his head bashed in with a poker from which all the fingerprints were carefully wiped off. Well, that's quite a fact to be stuck with. There was a struggle, and the plug of the electric clock on the desk was pulled out of the wall. Now, that sets the time of the murder at 12.35. And a half a dozen people saw Miss Jackson Crichton's secretary in the coffee shop all through the lunch hour. A lieutenant, I understand Crichton had quite an imposing list of clients. Yes, sir, and I'm going to talk to every one of them. No flights of fancy for me, pal. Uh, oh, incidentally, Valentine. Yeah? Uh, how are you going to go about tracing uh, Carol Gordon? Obviously, she doesn't want to be found. And she probably doesn't look anything like she used to. And Skid Row is a pretty big place, you know. George, I think the lieutenant is trying to imply that it's going to be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, what's so hard about finding a needle in a haystack? Well, huh? that's what I... What? All you do is get a magnet. The needle comes to you. Now, look, Mr. Cabranian, what'll it cost me to have you run this picture in your movie house tomorrow afternoon? You mean you're going to pay me, fella? What's wrong with it, fella? Oh, nothing's wrong with it, Mr. Cabranian. It was a super colossal production back there in 1928. Yeah, Romance in April, starring Carol Gordon. Never heard that one, fella. You? In the movie business and never heard of it? In 1928, I was running the coffee pot. I wish I was still running it. Well, anyway, you wouldn't mind showing this picture for... uh... $50, would you? There's just one thing we ought to tell you, Mr. Yeah, I knew this was coming, fella. Uh, there's no sound, no music in this picture. It's uh, a silent. Well, something new, huh? You don't think for a moment I'd talk you into anything that would damage the reputation of Gabrenian's cameo theater, the gym of Skid Row? Are you kidding? I don't even advertise the picture we're playing. I just hang out a sign, soft seats, open all night, 15 cents. Oh, oh. Then this ought to be right down your alley. The slumber of your selected clientele won't be disturbed by any noises coming off the screen. Just a little piano music for mood. You might got something there. This is a gal who knows all the angles. Yeah. On her, they look good, too. Too bad the cameo ain't barbecue house like it used to be. You're a real nice filly, lady. Why, thank you, Mr. Gabrenian. I don't know whether to blush or whinny. What's that? Uh, Now, what about it? Does romance in April play here tomorrow? It plays. Money in advance, fella. No objection to me selling the tickets? You sell, but remember the tickets are numbered. I'll know just how many people go in. Oh, you're a trusting soul, Mr. Gabrenian. <laughs> you said it. Yes, sir. I should take a cigarette right in. Oh, thank you. Well, business is pretty slow, darling. Uh Uh-huh. Well, you can't say Mr. Gabrenian didn't advertise the revival of Romance in April. Yeah, with the late Mr. Crichton's money. So far, your magnets attracted nothing but the usual Skid Row characters. Maybe the whole thing... Oh, wait a minute. Hold it, Brooksy. And you tell me if the features started yet. In just a few minutes, sir. Good. One, please. Thank you. George, didn't you recognize... Yeah, Brooksy, yeah. We're beginning to draw a better class of people. Anthony Chapman, the movie heartthrob. Now, what would he be doing in a place like this? And trying to look inconspicuous. An interesting question, Angel. I bet the answer's even more interesting. I called up before, young man. I understand romance in April goes on at 2.15. Is that correct? Yeah. You've got two minutes to make it. Just like to be sure, time is money. At 15 cents? Is that correct? And I understand the picture runs an hour and 12 minutes. Yeah, that's correct. Someone else out, Sonny. <laughs> a little man in a big briefcase. Brooksy, what's your guess? Vice president of a bank? A successful insurance salesman? Or just a lover of the silent cinema? Uh, you know, I got a definite feeling we started something here. It wasn't. Hey. Oh, 
Look what we've got now, George. The carriage trade drawing up. Now I'm sure we ought to change prices before six. You can call for me in about an hour, Ralph. Yes, ma'am. One seat in the loge, please. Loge? I uh, doubt if we can build you one at a moment's notice. What? Oh, well, whatever you've got. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. I'd say that was about $5,000 worth of mink on the hoof. Hey, look, a Brennan actually opened the door for it. I don't blame the man for being overwhelmed. Looks like all kinds of people don't mind coming to this popcorn cove to see romance in April. Uh, one ticket, please. It's 15 cents, isn't it? Yeah, and you're just in time for the picture. See, 11th, 12th, 13, 14, 15. Hope you don't mind the pennies. That's all I have. Oh, they add up just the same. They are. I hope you enjoy the picture. Yeah, I'm sure I will. I take it you're a Carol Gordon fan. Yeah, and her severest critic. Did you hear that, Booksy? That's an angel, I think. Carol Gordon? Oh, that couldn't be, George. Well, I could be wrong. But there was something about her eyes. But she seemed so old and pathetic. Come on, Booksy. Cabrillian can take over the box office now. We're going inside and make sure. Must have broken Gabrenian's heart to hire a piano player for the day. That girl on the screen, Angel. Look at it carefully. Don't you see some resemblance between her and the woman we saw before us at the box office? Mm, sorry, George. I can't talk myself into it. Mm, yeah. Maybe I am punching a little too hard. Oh, she was beautiful, wasn't she? Even in that costume with her waistline down to her knees. And not a bad actress to compete with these titles. Ellen looked at the faded flowers and thought of the waste of her own life. <laughs> oh, brother. No! No! George. No! Oh, the waste of life! My life! What did I do? It was Carol Gordon. What happened? Come on, stick with me, Brooksy. Get out of here. It's right down the hall here, folks. Yeah, see, Brooksy, I told you she didn't just vanish. We were about giving up hope, mister. We've been over this block with a fine-tooth comb for the last hour. Hmm. can imagine the places you've been in, miss. Now, this here hotel don't rightly belong down in this neighborhood. Why do you know we change bed sheets and towels twice a week? Yeah, well, bully for you, but what, what did you say was the name she was using? Uh, Ethel Mills. That is, if it's the woman you've been describing... And you know, funny thing. What's that? Huh? Well, about 20 minutes ago, while I was away from the desk, somebody left a bottle of champagne for her. Champagne? Yep, yep. All wrapped up fancy, too. Brought it right up to her. No other hotel around here gives room service like we do. Well, uh, here it is. Hmm. She's in there all right. And I think I know what happened. What do you mean? Well, if Ethel has the bottle around, it don't last long. Well, something might have happened to her in her frame of mind. Yeah, we better take a look, friend. Yeah, that's right, young fella. Don't want anything bad happening to the reputation of the hotel. Uh-oh. Mm, I'd like a light. Well, don't just stand there. Where are those towels you're so proud of? All right over there. Hey, uh, oh. Come on. Try to sit up. I... I can't. It hurt. Mm. Usually she don't oh. feel like that until the next day. Oh. And the bottle's only half empty. Seems somebody left a card with it, too. Let me see oh. To Carol Gordon. Oh. On the day of her triumphant return to the screen. Oh. Wait, it's wet towel oh. to help her. No time for that, Brooksy. We have to get her to a hospital. But, George, she's only... Only been poisoned. Oh. One sniff of this bottle will tell you that. Uh. Poison? Somebody else followed her here from the cameo. Somebody who wants to see Carol Gordon dead. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about winter driving. 
you find the January days are kind of chilly, don't forget, cold weather is rough on your car, too. It may mean a lot of grinding starting wear, an extra drain on your car's battery. But a sure way to get fast starts, to keep your battery from working overtime, and to keep operating costs down, is to use Chevron Supreme gasoline. For this high-octane motor fuel has special blending agents that give fast starts and speedy warm-up every time you use the starter. Besides lending a helping hand to your battery, Chevron Supreme gives fast pickup in traffic, smooth acceleration, and the extra power that makes your car great on hills. It's a premium quality gasoline, and it's climate tailored for each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. That means you can depend on it the year round for fast starts and smoother extra power wherever you motor. Get a tank full of Chevron Supreme gasoline tomorrow. Get it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations, where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Someone hires you to trace down an old movie star named Carol Gordon. Even before you can get started, your client is found murdered. You pick up from there and finally locate the once famous beauty in a cheap Skid Row hotel. The payoff there is that someone's tried to kill her, too. If you're like George Valentine, you won't rest till you find out why murder is singing such a merry song of mayhem. Valentine, I don't care where you've got Carol Gordon. Get her down here to headquarters. Well, you can't blame the lieutenant for hiding her out when she left the hospital. Somebody's out to get her. Now, look, chum boy, I'm not too sure the lady didn't try to poison herself. Yes, yeah, so you've been saying, with bullheaded regularity. Well, you forget the elevator boy in Crichton's building. He recognized Carol Gordon's picture, put her right on the seat of the crime. Now, guilty conscience. I want to talk to her. Uh-huh. Maybe you got an answer for those three strangely out-of-place characters who showed up at the revival of Romance in April. Oh, Tony Chapman and Miss Ferris are both movie people. Maybe... Maybe morbid curiosity brought him down there. Who knows? Uh Uh-uh, Riley. It seems a little more than coincidence that just when Crichton hired me to find Miss Gordon, those two should decide to take in one of her pictures at the cameo. Well, Also, both Chapman and Miss Ferris were managed by Crichton. And what makes it even more screwier, they just became engaged to each other. And yet they show up at their theater at different times. I don't care how it sounds. Chapman has an alibi for the time of Crichton's murder. The attendant in the garage of his department house vouches for the time. As for Miss Ferris, well, as far as she's concerned, she has no motive. And the mousy little man who showed up at the revival. The one with a briefcase under his arm. I told you I saw him hanging around the hospital, too. (sighs) Okay, okay. If and when we find this little gnome, I'll talk to him. In the meantime, you get Carol Gordon down here and fast. Here you are, Miss Gordon. My car is parked right over here. There's, there's really nothing I can tell the lieutenant, Mr. Valentine. Well, you just tell him the truth, Carol. And if he growls at you a little, don't let him upset you. Okay, here we are. The three of us can fit into the front seat. Oh, I, I know my story sounds a little weak, but I did drop in to see Henry Crichton on a personal matter. Once we were good friends. When I found him like that, I didn't stop to think. I hurried down the stairs and out of the building. Yes, yeah, sure, I understand. I don't know if I can turn around here on the hill. I think it's the quickest way back to headquarters. What's the matter? Hey, George! We're rolling down the hill. Somebody's been monkeying around with the brakes. They won't hold. Oh, try to keep it straightened out, George. We're going faster! We're going up on the sidewalk! Hang on, on. I'm going to crash. Oh, Oh. it's too close for company. Everybody all right? What Don't about you, Miss Gordon? I'm Bye, just sorry. shaken up. Good thing I picked out a wooden fence. What happened? Looks like somebody tried to get all three of us this time. Yes, doesn't it? Oh, oh wait a minute. Huh? What's the matter? You see that Miss Gordon gets to headquarters. I just spotted someone I want to talk to. Okay, George. Hey, let me through here, will you? One side, please. Hey, you come back here. A few questions I want to ask you. No, no, no. Let go of me, please. I, I don't know anything. There's nothing I can tell you. Now, look, Buster, I've been dreaming about you in that briefcase. What makes you pop up all over the place? Well, I, I've been following you just to see that Miss Gordon was all right, that nothing happened to her. Come on, come on. Who are you? The name is Moody, sir. Walter Moody, you see? Here, here's my card. Walter Moody, 6th Street Grammar School, principal. I don't get it, friend. 
I am the oldest and the most faithful member of the Carol Gordon fan club. I venture to say the only member after all these years. Are you kidding? Oh, she was a fine actress. I have a great big shelf just full of scrapbooks. Her pictures, almost every line that was ever written about Miss Gordon. Hey, you know, this is just cockeyed enough to turn out to be useful. I beg your pardon. Would you help Miss Gordon if she were in real trouble? Oh, I'd do anything, sir. Anything. Okay, Mr. Moody. Let's begin by taking a look at that five-foot shelf of yours. You mean Carol actually used to correspond with you, Mr. Moody? Oh, yes. <laughs> My, personally. I used to send the information in a newsletter to fans all over the country. Hmm. This must have been a big event in their life, according to this communique. My dearest number one fan, something has happened here today in this beautiful little town that's made me the happiest girl in the world. Soon I hope to be able to tell you all about it. I've always been curious about that, Mr. Valentine. What did she mean? Hmm. Eudora, California, December 9th, 1929. You know, Mr. Moody, I may be able to satisfy your curiosity. Nineteen twenty-nine, December. Yep, right here in Marekas. December 9th. Ethel Mills and Anthony Switzer. I can remember them two very well. Well, first couples are married as justice of the peace. Anthony Switzer could be Tony Chapman. Why not? Huh? Look here, son. What's all the shooting about, anyway? Mm, what do you mean, Pops? Well, just last week, a fellow was here. Named Crichton. He's with a young lady. <laughs> Long, blonde hair. He wants the same information. I think you've really given me something to wedge with, Pops. Thanks a lot. Naturally, I can't deny it, Valentine. It's a matter of record. Maybe you didn't deny it, Chapman, but you certainly have done everything to keep your marriage to Carol Gordon a secret. Don't make me out a heel, will you? When talking pictures came in, Carol simply disappeared. After a while, I thought she was dead. You know, it would be a terrible shock to your fans, Chapman, to find out that you let your wife simply disappear when she may have needed you. Don't I know that? And now engaged to beautiful and blonde Miss Ferris. No one can say I haven't tried to find my wife. When I heard about one of her pictures being shown, I even went to the theater thinking she might turn up. Uh-huh. And when she did, did you follow her and leave a bottle of champagne so she could celebrate her triumphant return to the screen? Uh, but... What? I don't know what you're talking about. I lost her in the crowd after she ran out. It... You know, Chapman, you'd fit in nicely as the murderer of Crichton if you didn't have such a perfect alibi. I've been through all that with the police. The attendant downstairs in the garage saw me drive in at 12.30. Yeah, I know, I know. You told him you weren't locking the car. Which I always do, but I'd lost my key. Still haven't got around to getting one, as a matter of fact. Okay, Chapman, okay. I'm just checking. Anyway, now I can work out something with Carol. Get a quiet divorce. Maybe... Tony, I've been waiting hours for you down in the lobby. What in the world Oh, uh, Valentine, I'd like you to meet Arlene Ferris, my fiancée. Tell me, Miss Ferris. Do you make it a practice to become engaged to men you know are married? What? Why Tony. did you have to do that, Valentine? Arlene didn't know, and there's really no reason why she should. The whole thing might have been smoothed over. But you did know about Carol Gordon, didn't you, Arlene? You must be out of your mind. You and Henry Crichton paid a little visit to Eudora shortly before he was murdered. Arlene. Now, what was the deal? Were the two of you going to shake Chapman down after I located Carol? This isn't true, is it, Arlene? Why should I deny it? Seemed a very good idea at the time. Good Lord. Do you think I was infatuated with your worn-out boyish charm, your toupee, what? the caps on your teeth? Shut up, you... Who do you well, think you are? Well, if you two are going to have an emotional wing-ding, you probably want a little privacy. Good day. Hey, Lieutenant. We can use this office and back of the garage. Go on in, Miss Gordon. Tell me, Valentine. Why a garage? Why didn't you call up and ask me to meet you in a Turkish bath? Oh, 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 please, Lieutenant. The ladies. Ah. 
Now, what's this all about? Well, I didn't think you'd have any objections to Miss Gordon making a phone call. Oh, for the love of Mike, why couldn't she have done it from my office? It wouldn't have worked that way. Oh, I... I don't know if I can say the things you told me, Mr. Valentine. I hate Tony. Hated him ever since he didn't lift a finger to help me. When he knew I was desperate. But just do your best, Carol. As an actress, your best is better than you think. I'm sure of it. Okay, here's his number. I'll dial it for you. Well... Oh, all right. Hello, Tony. This is Carol. Yes, I know this must be a shock to you. But listen, dear, let me do the talking. Tony, I've been unfair to you all these years. I should have come back and let you have the divorce. It must have been dreadful for you. Couldn't we do that now, quietly, so that no one need ever know? Then you'll be free. Yes. Uh, meet me in five minutes on the corner of State and McGovern. Please hurry. Goodbye. Oh, you were wonderful. Yeah. That ought to get Mr. Chapman down here in the garage with the speed of light. Light? <laughs> Why don't you try shedding some once in a while, Valentine? There shall be light, Lieutenant, I hope. Now, you ladies stay here in the office. Come on, Riley. Here's Chapman's custom job over here. Well, what do I do? Just stand here and admire it? What the... Come on back here, Lieutenant. We want to see this act without being seen. Now, why'd you do that? Just a pious hope. And if I'm wrong... I'll... Wait a minute. There's Chapman. Get back in his car. The attendant must have locked it anyway. Well. Having trouble, Buster? What? I'll take those keys. This one in particular. The one you said you'd lost. Your fancy alibi. Let go of this. Remember your manners, Chapman. Let Chum Boy have the key. What is this? A frame-up? Oh, famous last words. Ah, that's the trouble with elaborate alibis. People are so forgetful. Or to say it another way, friend... You just put the finger on yourself. George Valentine will be back in just a moment to explain his reasons for naming Chapman as the killer. Meanwhile... Quite a few folks have the impression that the only values an artist knows are color values. But not so with artist Ren Wicks of Beverly Hills, California. When it comes to economy and car operation, Mr. Wicks knows the value of RPM motor oil. Here's Mr. Wicks' statement, quote, It takes a lot of things to keep a car running. One thing is good motor oil. That's why I selected RPM years ago. It reduces wear, cuts repair bills, unquote. RPM motor oil will save wear in your car, too. Will bring a new economy to your car operation. For this premium quality motor oil was developed precisely for modern high-speed engines. Chemical compounds in RPM keep your entire engine cleaner. They protect those finely polished, close-fitting parts. Protect them from corrosion, gum, lacquer, and carbon. If your car is about due for a drain and refill, give it a new lease on life by getting RPM motor oil. Remember, it's better for your car and for your pocketbook. Get RPM at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. How did George Valentine come to suspect Chapman? Right at the moment, that's a question that's also troubling Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, if I played hunches like you do, I, I'd be laughed out of the department. I have to stick to facts. Well, that's the advantage I have, Lieutenant. When a hunch doesn't pay off, there's only Angel here to do the laughing. Oh, I only snicker. How long are you two going to talk shop? For instance, the one hunch about running Carol Gordon's picture brought a lot of other things to the surface. Chapman must have come down to the cameo all ready to follow Carol if she showed up. He and his lethal champagne. Yeah, he also made a scooter out of my car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, quite a mechanic. 
Old lover boy even knew how to stop the clock in Crichton's office at the right time to make his alibi stick. George, I still don't know why you hunched Arlene out of the picture. Oh, she had too good a deal with Crichton, blackmailing Chapman to spoil it. Everything would have turned out as planned if Chapman hadn't found out what his business manager was cooking up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, don't be so depressed, Lieutenant. I'll try to teach George a healthier respect for facts. <laughs> you shouldn't be bothering your lovely head with facts, Angel. Not with your corner on the market when it comes to figures. Why, darling. Oh, just stating a fact, sweetheart. Oh, you can say the sweetest things, dearest. <laughs> well, I've got a great big hunch my stomach can't stand much more of this, so goodbye, kids. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jeanette Nolan as Carol Gordon, John McIntyre as Chapman, Virginia Gregg as Arlene... Howard McNear as Moody, Louis Van Ruten as Gabrenian, and Dick Ryan as the manager. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. <laughs> 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 